Polly cut off her hair in front of the mirror, feeling slightly guilty about not feeling very guilty about doing so. It was supposed to be her crowning glory, and everyone said it was beautiful, but she generally wore it in a net when she was working. She'd always told herself it was wasted on her, yet she was careful to see that the long golden coils all landed on the small sheet spread out for the purpose. If she would admit to any strong emotion at all at this time, it was sheer annoyance that a haircut was all she needed to pass for a young man. She didn't even need to bind up her bosom, which she'd heard was the normal practice. Nature had seen to it that she had barely any problems in this area. The effect that the scissors had was erratic, but it was no worse than other male haircuts here. It'd do. She did feel cold on the back of her neck, but that was only partly because of the loss of her long hair. It was also because of the stare. The Duchess watched her from above the bed. It was a poor woodcut, hand-coloured mostly in blue and red. It was of a plain middle-aged woman whose sagging chin and slightly bulging eyes gave the cynical the feeling that someone had put a large fish in a dress. But the artist had managed to capture something extra in that strange, blank expression. Some pictures had eyes that followed you round the room. This one looked right through you. It was a face you found in every home. In Borogravia, you grew up with the Duchess watching you. Polly knew her parents had one of the pictures in their room, and knew also that when her mother was alive, she used to curtsy to it every night. She reached up and turned this picture around so that it faced the wall. A thought in her head said, No. It was overruled. She'd made up her mind. Then she dressed herself in her brother's clothes, tipped the contents of the sheet into a small bag that went into the bottom of her pack along with the spare clothes, put a note to her father on her bed, picked up the pack, and climbed out of the window. At least. Polly climbed out of the window, but it was Oliver's feet that landed lightly on the ground. Dawn was just turning the dark world into monochrome when she slipped across the inn's yard. The Duchess watched her from the inn sign, too. Her father had been a great loyalist, at least up to the death of her mother. The sign hadn't been repainted this year, and a random bird dropping had given the Duchess a squint. Polly checked that the recruiting sergeant's cart was still in front of the bar, its bright banners now drab and heavy with last night's rain. By the look of that big fat sergeant, it would be hours before it was on the road again. She had plenty of time. He looked like a slow breakfaster. She let herself out of the door in the back wall and headed uphill. At the top, she turned back and looked at the waking town. Smoke was rising from a few chimneys, but since Polly was always the first to wake, and she yelled the maids out of their beds, the inn was still sleeping. She knew that the widow Clambers had stayed overnight. It had been raining too hard for her to go home, according to Polly's father, and personally she hoped for his sake that she'd stay every night. The town had no shortage of widows for Nuggan's sake, and Olga Clambers was a warm-hearted lady who baked like a champion. His wife's long illness and Paul's long absence had taken a lot out of her father. Polly was glad some of it was put back. The old ladies who spent their days glowering from their windows might spy and peeve and mumble, but they had been doing that for too long. No one listened any more. She raised her gaze. Smoke and steam were already rising from the laundry of the girls' working school. The building hung over one end of the town like a threat, big and grey with tall, thin windows. It was always silent. When she was small, she'd been told that that was where the bad girls went. The nature of badness was not explained, and at the age of five Polly had received the vague idea that it consisted of not going to bed when you were told. At the age of eight she'd learned it was where you were lucky not to go for buying your brother a paint box. She turned her back and set off between the trees, which were full of birdsong. Forget you were ever Polly. Think young male, that was the thing. Fart loudly and with self-satisfaction at a job well done, 
walk like a puppet that had had a couple of random strings cut, never hug anyone, and, if you meet a friend, punch them. A few years working in the bar had provided plenty of observational material. No problem about not swinging her hips, at least. Nature had been pretty sparing there, too. And then there was the young male walk to master. At least women swung only their hips. Young men swung everything, from the shoulders down. You have to try to occupy a lot of space, she thought. It makes you look bigger, like a tomcat fluffing his tail. She'd seen it a lot in the inn. The boys tried to walk big in self-defence against all those other big boys out there. I'm bad, I'm fierce, I'm cool. I'd like a pint of shandy and me man wants me home by nine. Let's see now. Arms out from the body as though holding a couple of bags of flour. Check. Shoulders swaying as though she was elbowing her way through a crowd. Check. Hands slightly bunched and making rhythmical circling motions as though turning two independent handles attached to the waist. Check. Legs moving forward loosely and ape-like. Check. It worked fine for a few yards until she got something wrong and the resultant muscular confusion somersaulted her into a hollybush. After that, she gave up. The thunderstorm came back as she hurried along the trail. Sometimes one would hang around the mountains for days, but at least up here the path wasn't a river of mud, and the trees still had enough leaves to give her some protection. There was no time to wait out the weather anyway. She had a long way to go. The recruiting party would cross at the ferry, but Polly was known to all the ferrymen by sight, and the guard would want to see her permit to travel, which Oliver Perks certainly didn't have. So that meant a long diversion all the way to the Troll Bridge at Tubes. To the Trolls, all humans looked alike, and any piece of paper would do as a permit, since they didn't read. Then she could walk down through the pine forests to Plune. The cart would have to stop there for the night, but the place was one of those nowhere villages that existed only in order to avoid the embarrassment of having any large empty spaces on the map. It was just what she wanted. No one knew her in Plune. No one ever went there. It was a dump. It was, in fact, just the place she needed. The recruiting party would stop there and she could enlist. She was pretty certain the big fat sergeant and his greasy little corporal wouldn't notice the girl who'd served them last night. She was not, as they said, conventionally beautiful. The corporal had tried to pinch her bottom, but probably out of habits like swatting a fly, and there was not enough for a big pinch at that. She sat on the hill above the ferry and had a late breakfast of cold potato and sausage while she watched the cart cross over. No one was marching behind it. No lads had been recruited back in Munns this time. People had kept away. Too many young men had left over the last few years, and not enough had come back. And of the ones who'd come back, sometimes not enough of each man had come back. The corporal could bang his drum all he liked. Munns was running out of sons almost as fast as it accumulated widows. The afternoon hung heavy and humid, and a yellow pine warbler followed her from bush to bush. Last night's mud was steaming when Polly reached the Troll Bridge, which crossed the river in a narrow gorge. It was a thin, graceful affair, put together, it was said, with no mortar at all, and it was said that the weight of the bridge anchored it ever more deeply into the rock on either side. It was said to be a wonder of the world, except that very few people around here ever wondered much about anything and were barely aware of the world. It cost one penny to cross, or one hundred gold pieces, if you had a billy goat. Trolls might not be quick thinkers, but they don't forget in a hurry either. Halfway across, Polly peered over the parapet and saw the cart far, far below, working its way along the narrow road just above the white water. The afternoon's journey was downhill all the way, through dark pines on this side of the gorge. She didn't hurry, and, towards sunset, she spotted the inn. The cart had already arrived, but by the looks of it, the recruiting sergeant had not even bothered to make an effort. There was no drum banging like there had been last night, no cries of, Roll up, my young shavers, it's a great life in the ins and outs. There was always a war. Usually they were border disputes, 
the national equivalent of complaining that the neighbour was letting their hedge grow too long. Sometimes they were bigger. Borogravia was a peace-loving country in the midst of treacherous, devious, warlike enemies. They had to be treacherous, devious, and warlike, otherwise we wouldn't be fighting them, eh? There was always a war. Polly's father had been in the army before he took over the Duchess from Polly's grandfather. He didn't talk about it much. He'd brought his sword back with him, but instead of hanging it over the fireplace, he used it to poke the fire. Sometimes old friends would turn up, and, when the bars were shut for the night, they'd gather around the fire and drink and sing. The young Polly found excuses to stay up and listen to the songs they sang, but that had stopped when she'd got into trouble for using one of the more interesting words in front of her mother. But now she was older and served the beer, it was presumably assumed that she knew the words, or would find out what they meant soon enough. Besides, her mother had gone where bad words would no longer offend, and, in theory, never got said. The songs had been part of her childhood. She knew all the words of The World Turned Upside Down, and The Devil Shall Be My Sergeant, and Johnny Has Gone For A Soldier, and The Girl I Left Behind Me. And, after the drink had been flowing for a while, she'd memorised Colonel Krapsky and I Wish I'd Never Kissed Her. And then, of course, there had been sweet Polly Oliver. Her father used to sing it when she was small and fretful or sad, and she'd laughed to hear it simply because it had a name in it. She was word-perfect on the words before she'd known what most of them meant. And now... Polly pushed open the door. The recruiting sergeant and his corporal looked up from the stained table where they were sitting, beer mugs halfway to their lips. She took a deep breath, marched over, and made an attempt at saluting. "'What do you want, kid?' growled the corporal. "'Uh, want to join up, sir?' The sergeant turned to Polly and grinned, which made his scars move oddly and caused a tremor to shake all his chins. The word fat could not honestly be applied to him, not when the word gross was lumbering forward to catch your attention. He was one of those people who didn't have a waist. He had an equator. He had gravity. If he fell over in any direction, he would rock. Sun and drink had burned his face red. Small dark eyes twinkled in the redness like the sparkle on the edge of a knife. Beside him, on the table, were a couple of old-fashioned cutlasses, weapons that had more in common with a meat cleaver than a sword. "'Just like that,' he said. "'Yes, sir.' "'Really?' "'Yes, sir.' "'You don't want us to get you stinking drunk first? It's traditional, you know.' "'No, sir. I haven't told you about the wonderful opportunities for advancement and good fortune, have I?' "'No, sir.' "'Did I mention how the spanking red uniform will mean you'll have to beat the girls off with a stick?' Don't think so, sir. For the grub? Every meal's a banquet when you march along with us. The sergeant smacked his belly, which caused tremors in outlying regions. I'm the living proof. Yes, sir. No, sir. I just want to join up to fight for my country and the honour of the Duchess, sir. You do? said the corporal, incredulously. But the sergeant appeared not to hear this. He looked Polly up and down, and Polly got the definite impression that the man was neither as drunk nor as stupid as he looked. "'Upon my oath, Corporal Strappy, it seems what we've got ourselves here is nothing less than a good old-fashioned patriot,' he said, his eyes searching Polly's face. "'Well, you've come to the right place, my lad,' he pulled a sheaf of papers toward him with an air of bustle. "'You know who we are?' "'The Tenth Foot, sir.' "'Light infantry, sir, known as the ins and outs, sir,' said Polly, relief bubbling through her. She'd clearly passed some sort of test. "'Right, lad, the jolly old cheesemongers, finest regiment there is in the finest army in the world. Keen to join then, are you? Keen as mustard, sir,' said Polly, aware of the corporal's suspicious eyes on her. "'Good lad!' The sergeant unscrewed the top from a bottle of ink and dipped a nib pen in it. His hand hovered over the paperwork. "'Name, lad,' he said. "'Oliver, sir. Oliver Perks,' said Polly. "'Age?' Seventeen come Sunday, sir.' "'You're right,' said the sergeant. 
You're seventeen, and I'm the Grand Duchess Anna Govia. What are you running away from, eh? Got a young lady in the family way? He'd have to have had help, said the corporal, grinning unpleasantly. He squeaks like a little lad. Polly realised she was starting to blush. But then, young Oliver would blush too, wouldn't he? It was very easy to make a boy blush. Polly could do it just by staring. Don't matter anyway, said the sergeant. You make your mark on this here document and kiss the Duchess and you're my little lad, you understand. My name is Sergeant Jackram. I will be your mother and your father, and Corporal Strappy here will be just like your big brother. And life will be steak and bacon every day, and anyone who wants to drag you away will have to drag me away too, because I'll be holding on to your collar. And you might well be thinking there's no one that can drag that much, Mr. Perks. A thick thumb jabbed at the paper. Just there, right? Polly picked up the pen and signed. What's that? said the corporal. My signature, said Polly. She heard the door open behind her and spun around. Several young men, she corrected herself, several other young men, had clattered into the bar and were looking around warily. You can read and write too, said the sergeant, glancing up at them and then back to her. Yeah, I see. A nice round hand too. Officer material you are. Give him the shilling, corporal, and the picture, of course. Right, sergeant, said Corporal Strappy, holding up a picture frame on a handle, like a looking glass. Puck her up, private parts. It's perk, sir, said Polly. Yeah, right. Now kiss the duchess. It was not a good copy of the famous picture. The painting behind the glass was faded, and something, some kind of moss or something, was growing on the inside of the cracked glass itself. Polly let her lips brush it while holding her breath. Ha! said Strappy, and pressed something into her hand. What's this? said Polly, looking at the small square of paper. And I owe you. Bit short of shillings right now, said the sergeant, while Strappy smirked. But the innkeeper will stand you a pint of ale, courtesy of her grace. He turned and looked up at the newcomers. Well, it never rains, but it pours. You boys here to join up too? My word, and we didn't even have to bang the drum. It must be Corporal Strappy's amazing charisma. Step up, don't be shy. Who's the next likely lad? Polly looked at the next recruit with a horror that she hoped she was concealing. She hadn't really noticed him in the gloom because he was wearing black. Not cool, styled black, but a dusty black, the kind of suit a person got buried in. By the look of it, that person had been him. There were cobwebs all over it. The boy himself had stitches across his forehead. Your name, lad? said Jackram. Igor, sir. Jackram counted the stitches. You know, I had a feeling it was going to be, he said. And I see you're eighteen. Awake! Oh, gods! Commander Samuel Vimes put his hands over his eyes. I beg your pardon, your, your grace, said the Ankh-Morpork consul to Slovenia. Are you ill, your grace? What's your name again, young man, said Vimes. I'm sorry, but I've been travelling for two weeks and not getting a lot of sleep, and I've spent all day being introduced to people with difficult names. That's bad for the brain. It's Clarence, your grace. Clarence Chinny. Chinny, said Vimes, and Clarence read everything in his expression. I'm afraid so, sir, he said. Were you a good fighter at school? said Vimes. No, your grace, but no one could beat me over the one hundred yard dash. Vimes laughed. Well, Clarence, any national anthem that starts with awake is going to lead to trouble. They didn't teach you this at the patrician's office? Er, uh, no, your grace, said Chinny. Well, you'll find out. Carry on, then. Yes, sir. Chinny cleared his throat. The Boragravian National Anthem, he announced for the second time. Awake, sorry, your grace. Ye sons of the motherland, taste no more the wine of the sour apples. Woodsmen, grasp your choppers. Farmers, slaughter with the tool formerly used for lifting beets the foe. 
thrust straight to the endless wiles of our enemies, we into the darkness march singing against the whole world in arms coming, but see the golden light upon the mountain tops. The new day is a great big fish. Ad, uh, Vim said, that last bit, that is a literal translation, Your Grace, said Clarence nervously. It means something like an amazing opportunity or, or a glittering prize, Your Grace. When we're not in public, Clarence, sir will do. Your Grace is just to impress the natives. Vimes slumped back in his uncomfortable chair, chin in his hand, and then winced. Two thousand three hundred miles, he said, shifting his position, and it's freezing on a broomstick, however low they fly. And then the barge, and then the coach. He winced again. I read your report. Do you think it's possible for an entire nation to be insane? Clarence swallowed. He'd been told that he was talking to the second most powerful man in Ank Morpork, even if the man himself acted as though he was ignorant of the fact. His desk in this chilly tower room was rickety. It had belonged to the head janitor of the Connect garrison until yesterday. Paperwork cluttered its scarred surface and was stacked in piles behind Vimes's chair. Vimes himself did not look to Clarence like a duke. He looked like a watchman, which, in fact, Clarence understood he was. This offended Clarence Chinney. People at the top should look as though they belonged there. That's a very interesting question, sir, he said. You mean the people? Not the people, the nation, said Vimes. Bora Gravia looks off its head to me, from what I've read. I expect the people just do the best they can and get on with raising their kids, which, I might say, I'd rather be doing right now, too. Look, you know what I mean. You take a bunch of people who don't seem any different from you and me, but when you add them all together, you get this sort of huge, raving maniac with national borders and an anthem. It's a fascinating idea, sir, said Clarence diplomatically. Vimes looked around the room. The walls were bare stone. The windows were narrow. It was damn cold, even on a sunny day. All that bad food and that bumping about and sleeping on bad beds and all that travelling in the dark, too, on dwarf barges and their secret canals under the mountains. The gods alone knew what intricate diplomacy Lord Vetinari had pulled off to get that, although the low king owed Vimes a few favours. All of that for this cold castle over this cold river between these stupid countries with their stupid war. He knew what he wanted to do. If they'd been people scuffling in the gutter, he'd have known what to do. He'd have banged their heads together and maybe shoved them in the cells overnight. But you couldn't bang countries together. Vimes picked up some paperwork, fiddled with it, and threw it down again. To hell with this, he said. What's happening out there? I understand there are a few pockets of resistance in some of the more inaccessible areas of the keep, but they are being dealt with. For all practical purposes, the keep is in our hands. That was a, a clever ruse of yours, your... Uh, sir. Vimes sighed. No, Clarence, it was a dull old ruse. It should not be possible to get men into a fortress dressed as washerwomen. Three of them had moustaches, for goodness sake. The... Borogravians are rather old-fashioned about things like that, sir. On that subject, we appear to have zombies in the lower crypts. Dreadful things. A lot of high-ranking Borogravian military men were interred down there over the centuries, apparently. Really? What are they doing now? Clarence raised his eyebrows. Lurching, sir, I think. Groaning. Uh, zombie things. Something seems to have stirred them up. Us, probably, said Vimes. He got up, strode across the room, and pulled open the big heavy door. Wretch! he yelled. After a moment, another watchman appeared and saluted. He was grey-faced, and Clarence couldn't help noticing when the man saluted that the hand and fingers were held together with stitching. Have you met Constable Shoe, Clarence? said Vimes cheerfully. One of my staff. Been dead for more than thirty years and loves every minute of it, eh, Reg? Right, Mr. Vimes said Reg, grinning and revealing a lot of brown teeth. "'Some fellow countryman of yours down in the cellar, Reg,' said Vimes. "'Oh, dear! Lurching, are they?' "'Fraid so, Reg.' 
I shall go and have a word with them, said Reg. He saluted again and marched out with a hint of a lurch. Fellow countryman, he's uh, from here, said Chinny, who had gone quite pale. Oh, no, no, the undiscovered country, said Vimes. He's dead. However, credit where it's due, he hasn't let that stop him. You didn't know we have a zombie in the watch, Clarence? Er, uh, no, sir, I haven't been back to the city in five years, he swallowed. I gather things have changed. Horribly so, in Clarence Chinney's opinion. Being consul to Slovenia had been an easy job, which left him a lot of time to get on with his business. And then the big semaphore towers marched through all along the valley, and suddenly Ank Morpork was an hour away. Before the clacks, a letter from Ank Morpork would take more than two weeks to get to him, and so no one worried if he took a day or two to answer it. Now people expect a reply overnight. He'd been quite glad when Borogravia had destroyed several of those wretched towers, and then all hell had been let loose. "'We've got all sorts in the watch,' said Vimes. "'And we bloody well need them now, Clarence, with Slovenians and Borogravians scrapping in the streets over some damn quarrel that began a thousand years ago. It's worse than dwarfs and trolls, all because someone's great to the power of umpteen grandmother slapped the face of someone's great ditto uncle.' Borogravia and Slovenia can't even agree on a boulder. They chose the river, and that changes course every spring. Suddenly the Clax Towers are now on Borogravian soil. Or mud, anyway. So the idiots burn them down for religious reasons. Ah, uh, there is more to it than that, sir, said Chinny. Yes, I know. I read the history. The annual scrap with Slovenia is just a local derby. Borogravia fights everybody. Why? National pride, sir. What in? There's nothing there. There's some tallow mines, and they're not bad farmers, but there's no great architecture, no big libraries, no famous composers, no very high mountains, no wonderful views. All you can say about the place is that it isn't anywhere else. What's so special about Borogravia? I suppose it's special because it's theirs. And, of course, there's Nuggan, sir, their god. I bought you a copy of the Book of Nuggan. I looked through one back in the city, Chinny, said Vimes. Seemed pretty stu- That wouldn't have been our recent edition, sir, and I suspect it wouldn't be our uh, very current that far from here. This one is more up-to-date, said Chinny, putting a small but thick book on the desk. Up-to-date? What do you mean, up-to-date? said Vimes, looking puzzled. Holy writ gets written. Do this, don't do that. No coveting your neighbour's ox. Um, Nuggan doesn't just leave it at that, sir. He, um, updates things, mostly the abominations, to be frank. Vimes took the new copy. It was noticeably thicker than the one he'd brought with him. It's what they call a living testament, Chinny explained. They, well, I, I suppose you could say they die if they're taken out of Borogravia. They no longer get added to. The latest abominations are, are at the end, sir, he said helpfully. This is a holy book with an appendix. Exactly, sir. In a ring binder? Quite so, sir. People put blank pages in, and the abominations turn up. You mean magically? I suppose I mean religiously, sir. Vimes opened a page at random. Chocolate, he said. He doesn't like chocolate. Yes, sir, that's an abomination. Garlic? Well, I don't much like it either, so fair enough. Cats! Oh, yes, he really doesn't like cats, sir. Dwarfs? It says here, the dwarfish race which worships gold are an abomination unto Nuggan. He must be mad. What happened? Oh, the dwarfs that were here sealed their minds and vanished, your guess. I bet they did. They know trouble when they see it, said Vimes. He let your grace pass this time. Chinny clearly derived some satisfaction from talking to a duke. He leafed through the pages and stopped. The colour blue? Correct, sir. What's abominable about the colour blue? It's just a colour. The sky is blue. Yes, sir. Devout Nuggenites try not to look at it these days. Um... Chinny had been trained as a diplomat, some things he didn't like to say directly. 
Nuggan, sir, um, is rather... Tetchy, he managed. Tetchy, said Vimes. A tetchy god? What, he complains about the noise their kids make? Objects to loud music after 9pm? Um, we get the Ankh-Morpork times here, sir, eventually, and, uh... I'd say, um, that Nuggan is very much like, uh, the kind of people who write to its letter column. You know, sir, the kind who sign their letters disgusted with Ankh Morpork. Oh, you mean he really is mad, said Vimes. Oh, I'd never mean anything like that, sir, said Chinny hurriedly. What do the priests do about this? Not a lot, sir. I think they quietly ignore some of the more, um... Extreme abominations. You mean, Nuggan objects to the dwarfs, cats, and colour blue, and there are more insane commandments? Chinny coughed politely. All right, then, growled Vimes. More extreme commandments. Oysters, sir. He doesn't like them. But that's not a problem, because no one there has ever seen an oyster. Oh, and babies. He abominated them, too. I take it people still make them here. Oh, yes, you're... Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. But they feel guilty about it. Barking dogs, that was another one. Shirts with six buttons, too. And cheese. Um, people just sort of, um, avoid the trickier ones. Even the priests seem to have given up trying to explain them. Yeah, I think I can see why. So, what we have here is a country that tries to run itself on the commandments of a god who the people feel may be wearing his underpants on his head. Has he abominated underpants? No, sir, Chinny sighed, but it's probably only a matter of time. So, how do they manage? These days, people mostly pray to the Duchess Anagovia. You see icons of her in every house. They call her the Little Mother. Ah, yes, the Duchess. Can I get to see her? Oh, no one sees her, sir. No one except her servants has seen her for more than thirty years. To be honest, sir, she's probably dead. Only probably. No one really knows. The official story is that she's in mourning. It's rather sad, sir. The young Duke died a week after they got married, gored by a wild pig during a hunt, I believe. She went into mourning at the old castle at Prince Marmaduke Piotr Albert Hans Josef Bernhard Wilhelmsberg, and hasn't appeared in public since. The official portrait was painted when she was about forty, I believe. No children? No, sir. On her death the line is extinct. And they pray to her, like a god. Chinny sighed. I did put this in my briefing notes, sir. The royal family in Boragravia have always had a quasi-religious status, you see. They're the head of the church, and the peasants, at least, pray to them in the hope that they'll put in a good word with Nuggan. They're like living saints, celestial intermediaries. To be honest, that's how these countries work in any case. If you want something done, you have to know the right people. And I suppose it's easier to pray to some picture than to a god you can't see. Vimes sat looking at the consul for some time. When he next spoke, he frightened the man to his boots. Hold inherit, he said. Sir? Just following the monarchy, Mr. Chinney. If the Duchess isn't on the throne, who should be? Um, it's incredibly complex, sir, because of the intermarriages and the various legal systems, which, for example, owes the smart money on Mr. Chinney said Vimes wearily. Um, Prince Heinrich of Slovenia. To Chinny's astonishment, Vimes laughed. And he's wondering how Aunt is getting on, I expect. I met him this morning, didn't I? Can't say I took to him. But he is a friend of Ank Morpork, said Chinny reproachfully. That was in my report. Educated, very interested in the clacks, got great plans for his country, they used to be nugganatic in Slovenia, but he's banned the religion, and frankly, hardly anyone objected. He wants Slovenia to move forward. He admires Ankh Morpork very much. Yes, I know. He sounds almost as insane as Nuggan, said Vimes. Okay, 
So, what we've probably got is an elaborate charade to keep Heinrich out. As this place governed, there isn't much. A bit of tax collecting, and that's about all. We think some of the senior court officials just drift on as if the Duchess is alive. The only thing that really works is the army. All right. How about coppers? Everyone needs coppers. At least they have their feet on the ground. I believe informal citizens' committees enforce nugganatic law, said Chinny. Oh, gods. Prod noses, curtain twitchers and vigilantes, said Vimes. He stood up and peered out through the narrow window at the plain below. It was night time. Cooking fires in the enemy camp made demonic constellations in the darkness. Did they tell you why I've been sent here, Clarence? he said. No, sir. My instructions were that you would, um, oversee things. Prince Heinrich is not very happy about it. Oh, well, the interests of Ankh Morpork are the interests of all money love. <laughs> Oops, sorry, all freedom loving people everywhere, said Vimes. We can't have a country that turns back our mail coaches and keeps cutting down the clax towers. That's expensive. They're cutting the continent in half. They're the pinch in the hourglass. I'm to bring things to a satisfactory conclusion. And frankly, Clarence, I'm wondering if it's even worth attacking Boragravia. It'll be cheaper to sit here and wait for it to explode. Although I notice... Where was that report? Oh, yeah. It will starve first. Uh, regrettably so, sir. Igor stood mutely in front of the recruiting table. Don't often see you people these days, said Jackram. Yeah, run out of fresh brains, have you? said the corporal nastily. Now then, corporal, no call for that, said the sergeant, leaning back in his creaking chair. There's plenty of lads out there walking around on legs they wouldn't still have if there hadn't been a friendly Igor around. Eh, hey, Igor? Yeah. Well, I heard about people waking up and finding their friendly Igor had whipped out their brains in the middle of the night and buggered off to flog them, said the corporal, glaring at Igor. I promise you, your brain is entirely safe from me, corporal, said Igor. Polly started to laugh and stopped when she realised that absolutely no one else was doing so. Yeah, well, I met a sergeant who said an Igor put a man's legs on backwards, said Corporal Strappy. What good's that to a soldier, eh? I could advance and retreat at the same time, said Igor levelly. Sergeant, I know all the stories, and they are nothing but vile calumnies. I seek only to serve my country. I do not want trouble. Right, said the sergeant, nor do we. Make your mark, and you've got to promise not to mess about with Corporal Strappy's brain, right? Another signature? My word, I can see we've got ourselves a bleeding college of recruits today. Give him his cardboard shilling, Corporal. Thank you, said Eagle. And I would like to give the picture a wipe if it's all the same to you. He produced a small cloth. Wipe it? said Strappy. Is that a lad, Sergeant? What do you want to wipe it for, mister? said Jackram. To remove the invisible demons, said Igor. I can't see any invis... Strappy began, and stopped. Just let him, all right, said Jackram. It's one of their funny little ways. That seemed right, muttered Strappy. Practically treason. Can't see why it'd be wrong just to give the old girl a wash, said the sergeant shortly. Next. Oh. After carefully wiping the stained picture and giving it a perfunctory peck, Igor came and stood next to Polly, giving her a sheepish grin. But she was watching the next recruit. He was short and quite slim, which was fairly usual in a country where it was rare to get enough food to make you fat. But he dressed in black and expensively, like an aristocrat. He even had a sword. The sergeant was, therefore, looking worried. Clearly a man could get into trouble talking wrong to a knob who might have important friends. "'You sure you come to the right place, sir?' he said. "'Yes, Sergeant, I wish to enlist.' Sergeant Jackram shifted uneasily. "'Yes, sir, but I'm sure a gentleman like you. Are you going to enlist me or not, Sergeant?' "'Not usual for a gentleman to enlist as a common soldier, sir,' mumbled the Sergeant. "'What you mean, Sergeant, is, is anyone after me? Is there a price on my head? And the answer is no.' "'How about a mob with pitchforks?' 
said Corporal Strappy. He's a bloody vampire, Sarge. Anyone can see that. He's a black ribboner. Look, he's got the badge. Which says not one drop, said the young man calmly. Not one drop of human blood, Sergeant. A prohibition I have accepted for almost two years, thanks to the League of Temperance. Of course, if you have a personal objection, Sergeant, you need only give it to me in writing. Which was quite a clever thing to say, Polly thought. Those clothes cost serious money. Most of the vampire families were highly knobby. You never knew who was connected to who. Not just to who, in fact, but to whom. Whom's were likely to be far more trouble than your common everyday who. The sergeant was looking down a mile of rough road. "'Got to move with the times, Corporal,' he said, deciding not to go there. "'And we certainly need the men.' "'Yeah, but supposing he wants to suck all my blood out in the middle of the night,' said Strappy. "'Well, he'll just have to wait until Private Eagle's finished looking for your brain, won't he?' snapped the sergeant. "'Sign here, mister.' The pen scratched on the paper. After a minute or two, the vampire turned the paper over and continued writing on the other side. Vampires had long names. "'But you can call me Maladict,' he said, dropping the pen back in the inkwell. "'Thank you very much, I must say, sir, uh, Private. Give him the shilling, Corporal. Good job it's not a silver one, eh?' <laughs> "'Yes,' said Maladict. "'It is.' "'Next?' said the sergeant. Polly watched as a farm boy, breeches held up with string, shuffled in front of the table and looked at the quill pen with the resentful perplexity of those confronted with new technology. She turned back to the bar. The landlord glared at her in the manner of bad landlords everywhere. As her father always said, if you kept an inn, you either liked people or went mad. Oddly enough, some of the mad ones were the best at looking after their beer, but by the smell of the place, this wasn't one of those. She leaned on the bar. Point, please, she said, and watched glumly as the man gave a scowl of acknowledgement and turned to the big barrels. It'll be sour, she knew, with the slop bucket under the tap tipped back in every night, and the spigots not put back, and yes, it was going to be served in a leather tankard that had probably never been washed. A couple of new recruits were already knocking back their pints, though, with every audible sign of enjoyment. But this was plume, after all. Anything that made you forget you were there was probably worth drinking. One of them said, "'Lovely pint, this, eh?' And the boy next to him belched and said, "'Best I've tasted, yeah!' Polly sniffed at the tankard. The contents smelled like something she wouldn't feed to pigs. She took a sip and completely changed her opinion. She would feed it to pigs. "'Those lads have never tasted beer before,' she told herself. "'It's like Dad said.' Out in the country there are lads who join up for an uninhabited pair of breeches, and they'll drink this muck and pretend to enjoy it like men. Hey, up we supped some stuff last night, eh, lads? And then next thing... Oh, Lord, that reminded her. What would the privy be like here? The men's one out in the yard back at home was bad enough. Polly sloshed two big pails of water into it every morning while trying not to breathe, there was weird green moss growing on the slate floor, and the Duchess was a good inn. It had customers who took their boots off before going to bed. She narrowed her eyes. This stupid fool in front of her, a man making one long eyebrow do the work of two, was serving them slops and foul vinegar just before they marched off to war. This beer, said Igor on her right, tastes of hoarf pith. Polly stood back. Even in a bar like this, that was killing talk. "'Oh, you'd know, would you?' said the barman, looming over the boy. "'Drunk horse piss, have you?' "'Yes,' said Igor. The barman stuck a fist in front of Igor's face. "'Now you listen to me, you lisping little—' A slim black arm appeared with amazing speed, and a pale hand caught the man's wrist. The one eyebrow contorted in sudden agony. "'Now it's like this.' said Maledict calmly. We're soldiers of the Duchess, agreed. Just say arg. He must have squeezed. The man groaned. Thank you. And you're serving up as beer a liquid best described as foul water, Maledict went on in the same level conversational tone. I, of course, don't drink horse piss, 
but I have a highly developed sense of smell, and really would prefer not to list aloud the things I can smell in this murk. So we'll just say rat droppings and leave it at that, shall we? Just whimper. Good man. At the end of the bar, one of the new recruits threw up. Maledict nodded with satisfaction. The barman's fingers had gone white. "'Incapacitating a soldier of her grace in wartime is a treasonable offence,' he said. He leaned forward. "'Punishable, of course, by... death,' Maledict pronounced the word with a certain delight. "'However, if there happened to be another barrel of beer around the place, you know, good stuff, the stuff you'd keep for your friends, if you had any friends, then I'm sure we could forget this little incident.' Now I'm going to let go of your wrist. I can tell by your eyebrow that you are a thinker. And if you're thinking of rushing back in here with a big stick, I'd like you to think about this instead. I'd like you to think about this black ribbon I'm wearing. Know what it means, do you? The barman winced and mumbled, Temperance League? Right. Well done, said Maledict. And one more thought for you, if you've got room. I've only taken a pledge not to drink human blood. It doesn't mean I can't kick you in the fork so hard you suddenly go deaf. He released his grip. The barman slowly straightened up. Under the bar he would have a short wooden club, Bolly knew. Every bar had one. Even her father had one. It was a great help, he said, in times of worry and confusion. She saw the fingers of the usable hand twitch. Don't, she said. I think he means it. The barman relaxed. Bit of a misunderstanding there, gents, he mumbled. Got the wrong barrel in. No offence, meant. He shuffled off, his hand almost visibly throbbing. I only said it was half pith, said Igor. He won't cause trouble, said Polly to Maledict. He'll be your friend from now on. He's worked out he can't beat you, so he's going to be your best mate. Maledict subjected her to a thoughtful stare. I know that, he said. How do you? I used to work in an inn, said Polly, feeling her heart begin to beat faster, as it always did when the lies lined up. You learn to read people. What did you do in the inn? Barman. There is another inn in this hole, is there? Oh, no, I'm not from round here. Polly groaned at the sound of her own voice and waited for the question— then why come here to join up? It didn't come. Instead, Maledict just shrugged and said, I shouldn't think anyone is from around here. A couple more new recruits arrived at the bar. They had the same look, sheepish, a bit defiant, in clothes that didn't fit very well. Eyebrow reappeared with a small keg, which he laid reverentially on a stand and gently tapped. He pulled a genuine pewter tankard from under the bar, filled it, and timorously proffered it to Maledict. Igor, said the vampire, waving it away. I'll stick with the hoarf, Pith, if it's all the same to you, said Igor. He looked around the sudden silence. Look, I, I never said I didn't like it, said Igor. He pushed his mug across the sticky bar. Same again. Polly took the new tankard and sniffed at it. Then she took a sip. Not bad, she said. At least it tastes like it's... The door pushed open, letting in the sounds of the storm. About two-thirds of a troll eased its way inside, and then managed to get the rest of itself through. Polly was okay about trolls. She met them up in the woods sometimes, sitting among the trees, or purposefully lumbering along the tracks on the way to whatever it was trolls did. They weren't friendly. They were resigned. The world's got humans in it. Live with it. They're not worth the indigestion. You can't kill them all. Step around them. Stepping on them doesn't work in the long term. Occasionally, a farmer would hire one to do some heavy work. Sometimes they turned up. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they'd turn up, lumber around a field pulling out tree stumps as if they were carrots, and then wander off without waiting to be paid. A lot of things humans did mystified trolls and vice versa. Generally, they avoided one another. But she didn't often see trolls as trollish as this one. 
It looked like a boulder that had spent centuries in the damp pine forests. Lichen covered it. Stringy grey moss hung in curtains from its head and its chin. It had a bird's nest in one ear. It had a genuine troll club, made from an uprooted sapling. It was almost a joke troll, except that no one would laugh. The root end of the sapling bumped across the floor as the troll, watched by the recruits and a horrified Corporal Strappy, trudged to the table. "'Gonna enlist,' it said. "'Gonna do my bit. Give me shilling.' "'You're a troll!' Strappy burst out. "'No, no, none of that, Corporal,' said Sergeant Jackram. "'Don't ask, don't tell.' "'Don't ask, don't ask! It's a troll, Sarge. It's got crags. There's grass growing under its fingernails. It's a troll!' "'Right,' said the Sergeant. "'Enlist him!' "'You want to fight with us?' Strappy squeaked. Trolls had no sense of personal space, and a ton of what was, for practical purposes, a kind of rock, was looming right over the table. The troll analysed the question. The recruits stood in silence, mugs halfway to mouths. "'No,' said the troll at last. "'Gonna fight. We an army. God save the... The troll paused and looked at the ceiling. Whatever it was seeking there didn't appear to be visible. Then it looked at its feet, which had grass growing on them. Then it looked at its free hand and moved its fingers as if counting something. Duchess, it said. It had been a long wait. The table creaked as the troll laid a hand on it, palm upwards. Gimme shilling. We've only got bits of paper... Corporal Strappy began. Sergeant Jackram jabbed an elbow into his ribs. "'Upon my oath, are you mad?' he hissed. "'There's a ten-man bounty for enlisting a troll!' With his other hand, he reached into his jacket pocket, pulled out a real silver shilling, and placed it delicately in the huge hand. "'Welcome to your new life, friend. I'll just write your name down, shall I? What is it?' The troll looked at the ceiling. Feet. Sergeant, wall, and table. Polly saw its lips move. Carborundum, it volunteered. Yeah, probably, said the sergeant. Uh, how would you like to shave, uh, to cut off some of that uh, moss? We've got a uh, sort of regulation. Wall, floor, ceiling, table, Fingers, Sergeant. No, said Carborundum. Right, 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 said the Sergeant quickly. It's not a regulation as per such, actually. It's more of an advisory. Silly one, Tui, I've always thought so. Glad to have you with us, he added fervently. The troll licked the coin, which gleamed like a diamond in its hand. It actually did have grass growing under its fingernails, too, Polly noticed. Then Carborundum trudged to the bar. The crowd parted instantly, because a troll never had to stand at the back of the press of bodies, waving money and trying to catch the barman's eye. He broke the coin in two and dropped both halves on the bar top. Eyebrows swallowed. He looked as though he would have said, Are you sure? except that this was not a question Barman addressed to people weighing over half a ton. Carborundum thought for a while, and then said, "'Gimme drink!' Eyebrow nodded, disappeared briefly into the room behind the bar, and came back holding a double-handed mug. Maledict sneezed. Polly's eyes watered. It was the, the kind of smell you sense with your teeth. The pub might make foul beer as a matter of course, but this was eye-stinging vinegar. Eyebrow dropped one half of the silver coin into it, and then took a copper penny out of the money drawer and held it over the fuming mug. The troll nodded. With just a hint of ceremony, like a cocktail waiter dropping the little umbrella into a double entendre, Eyebrow let the copper fall. More bubbles welled up. Igor watched with interest. Carborundum picked the mug up in two fingers of each shovel-like hand, and swallowed the contents in one gulp. 
He stood stock still for a moment, then carefully put the mug back on the bar. You gentlemen might like to move back a bit, murmured Eyebrow. What's going to happen? said Polly. It takes them all differently, said Eyebrow. Looks like this one's... No, there he goes. With considerable style, Carborundum went over backwards. There was no sagging at the knees, no girly attempt to soften the fall. He just went from standing up, one hand out, to lying down, one hand up. He even rocked gently for some time after hitting the floor. "'Got no head for his drink,' said Eyebrow. "'Typical of the young bucks. Wants to play the big troll, come in here, order an electric floor-banger. Doesn't know how to handle it.' "'Is he going to come around?' said Maledict. "'No, that's it until dawn, I reckon,' said Eyebrow. "'Brain stops working.' "'Shouldn't affect him too much, then,' said Corporal Strappy, stepping up. "'Right, you miserable lot. You're sleeping in the shed out the back, understand? Practically waterproof, hardly any rats. We're out of here at dawn. You're in the army now.' Polly lay in the dark, on a bed of musty straw. There was no question of anyone getting undressed. The rain hammered on the roof and the wind blew through a crack under the door, despite Eagle's efforts to stuff it with straw. There was some desultory conversation, during which Polly found out that she was sharing the dank shed with Tonka Halter, Shufty Manacle, Wazza Goom, and Lofty Tute. Maledict and Igor didn't seem to have acquired repeatable nicknames. She'd become Ozza by general agreement. Slightly to Polly's surprise, the boy now known as Wazza had taken a small picture of the Duchess out of his pack and nervously hung it on an old nail. No one else said anything as he prayed to it. It was what you were supposed to do. They said the Duchess was dead. Polly had been washing up when she'd heard the men talking late one night, and it's a poor woman who can't eavesdrop while making a noise at the same time. Dead, they said, but the people up at Prince Marmaduke Piotr Albert Hans Josef Bernhard Wilhelmsberg weren't admitting it. That was because what with there being no children, and with royalty marrying one another's cousins and grannies all the time, the ducal throne would go to the Prince Heinrich of Slovenia. There, can you believe it? That's why we never see her, right? And there hasn't been a new picture all these years. Makes you think, eh? Oh, they say she's been in mourning because of the young duke, but that was more than seventy years ago. They say she was buried in secret, and... At which point her father had stopped the speaker dead. There are some conversations where you don't even want people to remember you were in the same room. Dead or alive, the Duchess watched over you. The recruits tried to sleep. Occasionally someone belched or expelled wind noisily, and Polly responded with a few fake eructations of her own. That seemed to inspire greater effort on the part of the other sleepers, to the point where the roof rattled and dust fell down, before everyone subsided. Once or twice she heard people stagger out into the windy darkness, in theory for the privy, but probably, given male impatience in these matters, to aim much closer to home. Once, coasting in and out of a troubled dream, she thought she heard someone sobbing. Taking care not to rustle too much, Polly pulled out the much-folded, much-read, much-stained last letter from her brother, and read it by the light of the solitary, guttering candle. It had been opened and heavily mangled by the censors, and bore the stamp of the duchy. It read, Dear all, we are in blank, which is blank with a blank big thing with knobs. On blank, we with blank, which is just as well because blank out of. I am keeping well. The food is blank. Blank will blank at the blank. But my mate, blanker, says not to worry, It'll all be over by blank, and we shall all have medals. Chins up, Paul. It was in a careful hand, the excessively clear and well-shaped writing of someone who had to think about every letter. She folded it up again. Paul had wanted medals because they were shiny. That had been almost a year ago, when any recruiting party that came past went away with the best part of a battalion, and there had been people waving them off with flags and music. Sometimes, now, smaller parties of men came back. The lucky ones were missing only one arm or one leg. There were no flags. She unfolded the other piece of paper. It was a pamphlet. 
It was headed, From the Mothers of Borogravia. The mothers of Borogravia were very definite about wanting to send their sons off to war against the Slovenian aggressor, and used a great many exclamation points to say so. And this was odd, because the mothers in the town had not seemed keen on the idea of their sons going off to war, and positively tried to drag them back. Several copies of the pamphlet seemed to have reached every home even so. It was very patriotic. That is, it talked about killing foreigners. She'd learned to read and write after a fashion because the inn was big and it was a business and things had to be tallied and recorded. Her mother had taught her to read, which was acceptable to Nuggan, and her father made sure that she learned how to write, which was not. A woman who could write was an abomination unto Nuggan, according to Father Jupe. Anything she wrote would by definition be a lie. But Polly had learned anyway because Paul hadn't at least to the standard, needed to run an inn as busy as the Duchess. He could read, if he could run his finger slowly along the lines, and he could write letters painfully, with a lot of care and heavy breathing, like a man assembling a piece of jewellery. He was big and kind and slow, and could lift beer kegs as though they were toys, but he wasn't a man at home with paperwork. Their father had hinted to Polly, very gently but very often, that Polly would need to be right behind him when the time came for him to run the Duchess. Left to himself, with no one to tell him what to do next, her brother just stood and watched birds. At Paul's insistence, she'd read the whole of From the Mothers of Borogravia to him, including the bits about heroes and there being no greater good than to die for your country. She wished, now, she hadn't done that. Paul did what he was told. Unfortunately, he believed what he was told, too. She put the papers away and dozed again, until her bladder woke her up. Oh, well, at least at this time of morning she'd have a clear run. She reached out for her pack and stepped as softly as she could out into the rain. It was mostly just coming off the trees now, which were roaring in the wind that blew up the valley. The moon was hidden in the clouds, but there was just enough light to make out the inn's buildings. A certain greyness suggested that what passed for dawn in Plune was on the way. She located the men's privy, which indeed stank of inaccuracy. A lot of planning and practice had gone into this moment. She was helped by the design of her breeches, which were the old-fashioned kind with generous buttoned trap doors, and also by the experiment she'd made very early in the mornings when she was doing the cleaning. In short, with care and attention to detail, she'd found that a woman could pee standing up. It certainly worked back home in the inn's privy, which had been designed and built with the certain expectation of the aimlessness of the customers. The wind shook the dank building. In the dark she thought of Auntie Hattie, who'd gone a bit strange around her sixtieth birthday, and persistently accused passing young men of looking up her dress. She was even worse after a glass of wine, and she had one joke. What does a man stand up to do, a woman sit down to do, and a dog lift its leg to do? And then, when everyone was too embarrassed to answer, she'd triumphantly shriek, Shake hands! and fall over. Auntie Hattie was an abomination all by herself. Polly buttoned up the breeches with a sense of exhilaration. She felt she'd crossed a bridge, a sensation that was helped by the realisation that she'd kept her feet dry. Someone said, Psst! It was just as well she'd already taken a leak. Panic instantly squeezed every muscle. Where were they hiding? This was just a rotten old shed. Oh, there were a few cubicles, but the smell alone suggested very strongly that the woods outside would be a much better proposition. Even on a wild night. Even with extra wolves. Yes? She quavered, and then cleared her throat and demanded, with a little more gruffness, Yes? You'd need these, whispered the voice. In the fetid gloom, she made out something rising over the top of the cubicle. She reached up nervously and touched softness. It was a bundle of wool. Her fingers explored it. A pair of socks, she said. Right, wear em, said the mystery voice hoarsely. Thank you, but I've brought several pairs, Polly began. There was a faint sigh. No, not on your feet. Shove em down the front of your trousers. What do you mean? Look, said the whisperer patiently. You don't bulge where you shouldn't bulge. That's good. 
But you don't bulge where you should bulge, either. You know? Lower down. Oh, er, uh, I... but... I, I didn't think people noticed, said Polly, glowing with embarrassment. She had been spotted. But there was no hue and cry, no angry quotations from the Book of Nuggan. Someone was helping. Someone who had seen her. It's a funny thing, said the voice, but they notice what's missing more than they notice what's there. Just one pair, mark you. Don't get ambitious. Polly hesitated. Um, is it obvious? she said. No, that's why I gave it a socks. I meant that, that I'm not, that I'm not really, said the voice in the dark. You're pretty good. You come over as a frightened young lad trying to look big and brave. You might pick your nose a bit more often, just a tip. Few things interest a young man more than the contents of his nostrils. Now, I've got a favour to ask you in return. I didn't ask you for one, Polly thought, quite annoyed at being taken for being a frightened young lad, when she was sure she'd come over as quite a cool, non-ruffled young lad. But she said calmly, What is it? Got any paper? Wordlessly, Polly pulled from the mothers of Borogravia out of her shirt and handed it up. She heard the sound of a match striking and a sulphurous smell that only improved the general conditions. Why, is this the escutcheon of Her Grace the Duchess I see in front of me? said the Whisperer. Well, it won't be in front of me for long. Beat it, boy. Polly hurried out into the night, shocked, dazed, confused, and almost asphyxiated, and made it to the shed door but she'd barely shut it behind her and was blinking in the blackness when it was thrust open again and let in the wind, rain and Corporal Strappy. All right, all right, hands off! Well, you lot won't be able to find them, and on with socks! Hap, 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 hi-ho, hap, hap! Bodies were suddenly springing up or falling over all around Polly. Their muscles must have been obeying the voice directly, because no brain could have got into gear that quickly. Corporal Strappy, in obedience to the law of non-commissioned officers, responded by making the confusion more confusing. "'Good grief, you lot of old women can shift better than you!' he shouted with satisfaction as people flailed around looking for their coats and boots. "'Fall in! Get shaved! Every man in the regiment to be clean-shaven by order! Get dressed! Water, I've got my eye on you! Move, move! Breakfast in five minutes! Last one there doesn't get a sausage! Oh!' Deary me, what a bloody shower! The four lesser apocalyptical horsemen of panic, bewilderment, ignorance and shouting took control of the room to Corporal Strappy's obscene glee. Polly, though, ducked out the door, pulled a small tin mug out of her pack, dipped it into a water butt, balanced it on an old barrel behind the inn, and started to shave. She'd practised this, too. The secret was in the old cutthroat razor that she'd carefully blunted. After that, it was all in the shaving brush and soap. Get a lot of lather on, shave a lot of lather off. And you'd had a shave, hadn't you? Must have done, sir. Feel how smooth the skin is. She was halfway through when a voice by her ear screamed, What do you think you're doing, private parts? It was just as well the blade was blunt. Perks, sir, she said, rubbing her nose. I'm shaving, sir. It's perks, sir. Sir, sir, I'm not sir, Parts. I'm a bloody corporal, Parts. That means you call me corporal, Parts. And are you shaving in an official regimental mug, Parts, what you have not been issued with, right? You a deserter, Parts? No, sir, corporal. A thief, then? No, corporal. Then how come you got a bloody mug, Parts? Got it off a dead man, sir, uh, corporal. Strappy's voice pitched into a scream in any case, became a screech of rage. You're a looter! No, Corporal, the soldier... had died almost in her arms on the floor of the inn. There had been half a dozen men in that party of returning heroes. They must have been trekking with grey-faced patients for days, making their way back to little villages in the mountains. Polly counted nine arms and ten legs between them, and ten eyes but it was the apparently whole who were worse, in a way. 
They kept their stinking coats buttoned tight, in lieu of bandages over whatever unspeakable mess lay beneath, and they had the smell of death about them. The inn's regulars made space for them, and talked quietly, like people in a sacred place. Her father, and not usually a man given to sentiment, quietly put a generous tot of brandy into each mug of ale, and refused all payment. Then it turned out that they were carrying letters from soldiers still fighting, and one of them had brought the letter from Paul. He pushed it across the table to Polly as she served them stew, and then, with very little fuss, he died. The rest of the men moved unsteadily on later that day, taking with them to give to his parents the pot-metal medal that had been in the man's coat pocket, and the official commendation from the duchy that went with it. Polly had taken a look at it. It was printed, including the duchess's signature, and the man's name had been filled in, rather cramped, because it was longer than average. The last few letters were rammed up tight together. It's little details like that which get remembered, as undirected white-hot rage fills the mind. Apart from the letter and the medal, all the man left behind was a tin mug and, on the floor, a stain which wouldn't scrub out. Corporal Strappy listened impatiently to a slightly adjusted version. Polly could see his mind working. The mug had belonged to a soldier. Now it belongs to another soldier. Those were the facts of the matter, and there wasn't much he could do about it. He resorted instead to the safer ground of general abuse. So you think you're smart, parts? he said. No, Corporal. Oh, so you're stupid, are you? Well, I did enlist, Corporal, said Polly meekly. Somewhere behind Strappy, someone sniggered. I've got my eye on you, parts, growled Strappy, temporarily defeated. Just you put a foot wrong, that's all. He strode off. Um, said a voice beside Polly. She turned to see another youth, wearing second-hand clothes and an air of nervousness that didn't quite conceal some bubbling anger. He was big and red-haired, but his hair was cut so close that it was just head fuzz. You're a tonker, right? she said. Yeah, and... Could I have a borrow of your shaving gear, right? Polly looked at a chin as free of hair as a billiard ball. The boy blushed. Got to start some time, right? He said defiantly. The razor'll need sharpening, said Polly. That's all right, I know how to do that, said Tonka. Polly wordlessly handed over the mug and razor, and took the opportunity to duck into the privy while everyone else was occupied. It was the work of a moment to put the socks in place. Anchoring them was a problem, which she solved by unwinding part of one sock and tucking it up under her belt. They felt odd, and strangely heavy for a little package of wool. Walking a little awkwardly, Polly went in to see what horrors breakfast would bring. It brought stale horse bread and sausage, and very weak beer. She grabbed a sausage and a slab of bread and sat down. You had to concentrate to eat horse bread. There was a lot more about these days. A bread made from flour ground up with dried peas and beans and dried vegetable scrapings. It used to be made just for horses, to put them in fine condition. Now you hardly ever saw anything else on the table, and there tended to be less and less of it, too. You needed time and good teeth to work your way through a slice of horse bread, just like you needed a complete lack of imagination to eat a modern sausage. Polly sat and concentrated on chewing. The only other area of calm was around Private Maledict, who was drinking coffee like a young man relaxing in a sidewalk café, with an air of someone who has life thoroughly worked out. He nodded at Polly. Was that him in the privy, she wondered? I'd got back in just as Strappy started yelling and everyone started running around and rushing in and out. It could have been anyone. Do vampires use the privy? Well, do they? Has anyone ever dared ask? Sleep well, he asked. Yeah, did you? said Polly. I couldn't stand that shed, but Mr. Eyebrow kindly allowed me to use his cellar, said Maledict. Old habits die hard, you know. At least, he added, old, acceptable habits. I've never felt happy not hanging down. And you got coffee? I carry my own supply, said Maledict indicating an exquisite little silver-and-gilt coffee-making engine on the table by his cup. And Mr. Eyebrow kindly boiled some water for me. He grinned, 
showing two long canine teeth. It's amazing what you can achieve with a smile, Oliver. Polly nodded. Er, uh, um, is Igor a friend of yours? she said. At the next table, Igor had obtained a sausage, presumably raw, from the kitchen, and was watching it intently. A couple of wires ran from the sausage to a mug of the horrible vinegary beer, which was bubbling. Never seen him before in my life, said the vampire. Of course, if you've met one, you have, in a sense, met them all. We had an Igor at home, wonderful workers, very reliable, very trustworthy, and, of course, so good at stitching things together, if you know what I mean. Those stitches round his head don't look very professional, said Polly, who was beginning to object to Maledict's permanent expression of effortless superiority. Oh, that, it's an Igor thing, said Maledict. It's a look, like tribal scars, you know. They like them to show. Ha! We had a servant once who had stitches all the way round his neck, and he was extremely proud of them. Really? said Polly weakly. Yes, and the droll part of it all was, it wasn't even his head. Now Igor had a syringe in his hand, and was watching the sausage with an air of satisfaction. For a moment Polly thought that the sausage moved. All right, all right, time's up, you horrible lot, barked Corporal Strappy, strutting into the room. Fall in? That means line up, you shower. That means you two parts. And you, Mr. Vampire, sir, will you be joining us for a morning's light soldiering? On your feet. And where's that bloody Igor? Ah, far, said Igor from three inches behind Strappy's backbone. The corporal spun around. How do you get there? He bellowed. It's a gift, far, said Igor. Don't you ever get behind me again. Fall in with the rest of them. Now. Attention! Strappy sighed theatrically. That means stand up straight, got it? Once more with feeling, attain, shan! Oh, I see the problem. You've got trousers that are permanently at ease. I think I shall have to write to the Duchess and tell her she should ask for her money back. What are you smiling about, Mr. Vampire, sir? Strappy positioned himself in front of Maledict, who stood faultlessly to attention. Happy to be in the regiment, Corporal. Yeah, right, mumbled Strappy. Well, you won't be so. Everything all right, Corporal? asked Sergeant Jackram, appearing in the doorway. Best we could expect, Sergeant, sighed the Corporal. We ought to throw him back. Oh, dear me, yes, useless, useless, useless. Okay, lads, stand easy, said Jackram, glancing at Strappy in a less than friendly way. Today we're heading on down toward Plots where we'll meet up with the other recruiting parties, and you'll be issued with your uniforms and weapons, you lucky lads. Any of you ever used a weapon? You have perks? Polly lowered her hand. A bit, Sarge. My brother taught me a bit when he was home on leave, and some of the old men in the bar at home gave me some, er, uh, tips. They had, too. It was funny to watch a girl waving a sword around, and they'd been kind enough when they weren't laughing. She was a quick learner, but she'd made a point of staying clumsy long after she'd got the feel for the blade, because using a sword was also the work of a man, and a woman doing it was an abomination unto Nuggan. Old soldiers, on the whole, were on the easy-going side when it came to abominations. She'd be funny just as long as she was useless, and safe as long as she was funny. "'Expert, are you?' said Strappy, grinning nastily. "'A real fancy genius, are you?' "'No, Corporal?' said Polly meekly. All right, said Jackram. Anyone else? Hang on, Sarge. I reckon we'd all like a bit of instruction from Swordmeister Parts, said Strappy. Ain't that right, lads? There was a general murmuring and shrugging from the squad, who recognised a right little bullying bastard when they saw one, but treacherously were glad he hadn't picked on them. Strappy drew his own sword. Lend him one of yours, Sarge he said. Go on, just a little bit of fun, eh? Jackram hesitated and glanced at Polly. How about it, lad? You don't have to, he said. I'll have to sooner or later, Polly thought. The world was full of strappies. If you backed away from them, they only kept on coming. You had to stop them at the start. She sighed. OK, Sarge. Jackram pulled one of his cutlasses out of his sash and handed it to Polly. It looked amazingly sharp. He won't hurt you, Perks he said, while looking at the smirking Strappy. "'I'll try not to hurt him either, Sarge,' 
said Polly, and then cursed herself for the idiot bravado. It must have been the socks talking. Oh, good, said Strappy, stepping back. We'll just see what you're made of, parts. Flesh, thought Polly. Blood. Easily cut things. Oh, well. Strappy waved his sabre like the old boys had done, down low, in case she was one of those people who thought the whole idea was to hit the other man's sword. She ignored it, and watched his eyes, which was no great treat. He wouldn't stick her, not mortally, not with Jackram watching. He'd try for something that had hurt, and make everyone laugh at her. That was the strappy type through and through. Every inn counted one or two amongst its regulars. The corporal tested her more aggressively a couple of times, and twice, by luck, she managed to knock the blade out of the way. Luck would run out, though, and if she looked like putting up a decent show, Strappy would sort her out good and proper. Then she remembered the cackled advice of old Gummy Abbans, a retired sergeant who'd lost his left arm to a broadsword and all his teeth to cider. A good swordsman hates coming up against a newbie, girl. The reason being, he don't know what the bugger's gonna do. She swung the sabre wildly. Strappy had to block it, and for a moment the swords locked. That the best you can do, parts, the corporal jeered. Polly reached out and grabbed his shirt. No, corporal, she said, but this is. She pulled hard and lowered her head. The collision hurt more than she'd hoped, but she heard something crunch, and it didn't belong to her. She stepped back quickly, slightly dizzy, with the sabre at the ready. Strappy had sunk to his knees, blood gushing from his nose. When he got up, someone was going to die. Panting, Polly appealed wordlessly to Sergeant Jackram, who had folded his arms and was looking innocently at the ceiling. "'I bet you didn't learn that from your brother, Perks,' he said. "'No, Sarge. Got that from Gummy Abbans, Sarge.' Jackram suddenly looked down at her, grinning. "'What, old Sergeant Abbans?' "'Yes, Sarge.' "'There's a name from the past. He's still alive.' How is the evil old sot? Ah, uh, well preserved, Sarge, Polly said, still trying to get her breath. Jackram laughed. Yeah, I'll bet. Did his best fighting in bars, he did, and I'll bet that's not the only trick he told you about, eh? No, sir. And the other men had scolded the old boy for telling her, and Gummy had chuckled into his cider mug, and anyway, it had taken Polly a long time to find out what family jewels meant. Hear that, Strappy? said the sergeant to the cursing man dribbling blood onto the floor. Looks like you was lucky. But there's no prizes for fighting fair in a melee, lads, as you shall learn. All right, fun over. Go and put some cold water on that, corporal. It always looks worse than it is. And that's the end of it, the pair of you. That is an order. A word to the wise, understood? Yes, Sarge, said Polly meekly. Strappy grunted. Jackram looked at the rest of the recruits. Okay. Any of the rest of you boys ever held a stick? Right. I can see we're going to have to start slow and work up. There was another grunt from Strappy. You had to admire the man. On his knees, with blood bubbling through the hand cupping his injured nose, he could find time to make life difficult for someone in some small way. <coughs> Private <coughs> blood snack as a snored sergeant, he said accusingly. Any good with it? said the sergeant to Maledict. Not really, sir said Maledict. Never had training. I carry it for protection, sir. How can you protect yourself by carrying a sword if you don't know how to use it? Not me, sir. Other people. They see the sword and they don't attack me, said Maledict patiently. Yeah, but if they did, lad, you wouldn't be any good with it, said the sergeant. No, sir, I'd probably settle for just ripping their head off, sir. That's what I mean by protection, sir. Theirs, not mine. And I'd get hell from the League if I did that, sir. The sergeant stared at him for a while. Well thought out, he mumbled. There was a thud behind them, and a table overturned. Carborund and the troll sat upright, groaned, and crashed back down again. At the second attempt, he managed to stay upright, both hands clutching his head. Corporal Strappy, now on his feet, must have been made fearless by fury. He headed for the troll in a high-speed strut, and stood in front of him, vibrating with rage and still oozing blood in sticky strings. "'You horrible little man!' he screamed. "'You!' Carborundum reached down and, with care and no apparent effort, picked the corporal up by his head. He brought him to one crusted eye and turned him this way and that. 
Did I join Darby? He rumbled. Oh, Copperleaf. This is an affront on a f new superior officer, screamed the corporal in a muffled voice. Put Corporal Strappy down, please, said Sergeant Jackram. The troll grunted and lowered the man to the floor. Sorry about that, he said. Thought you was a dwarf. I demand this man is arrested for... Strappy began. No, you don't, Corporal, no, you don't, said the sergeant. This is not the time. On your feet, Carver and them, and get in line. Upon my oath, you try that little trick one more time, and there will be trouble, understand? Yes, sergeant, growled the troll, and knuckled himself to his feet. Right, then, said the sergeant, stepping back. Now, today, my lucky lads, we're going to learn about something we call marching. They left Plume to the wind and rain. About an hour after they'd vanished around a bend in the valley, the shed they'd slept in mysteriously burned down. There have been better attempts at marching, and they have been made by penguins. Sergeant Jackram brought up the rear in the cart, shouting instructions, but the recruits moved as if they'd never before had to get from place to place. The sergeant yelled the swagger out of their steps, stopped the cart, held an impromptu lesson in the concepts of right and left, for a few of them, and by degrees they left the mountains. Polly remembered those first few days with mixed feelings. All they did was march, but she was used to long walks, and her boots were good. The trousers ceased to chafe. A watery sun took the trouble to shine. It wasn't cold. It would have been fine, if it hadn't been for the corporal. She wondered how Strappy, whose nose was now about the same colour as a plum, was going to handle the situation between them. It turned out that he intended to deal with it by pretending it hadn't happened, and also by having as little as possible to do with Polly. He didn't spare the others, although he was selective. Maledict was left strictly alone, as was Carborundum. Whatever else Strappy was, he wasn't suicidal. And he was bewildered by Igor. The little man did whatever stupid chore Strappy found for him, and he did them quickly, competently, and with every impression of someone happy in his work. And that left the corporal completely mystified. He'd pick on the others for no reason at all, harangue them until they made some trivial mistake, and then bawl them out. His target of choice was Private Goom, better known as Wazza, who was stick-thin and round-eyed and nervous, and said grace loudly before meals. By the end of the first day, Strappy could make him throw up just by shouting. And then he'd laugh. Only, he never really laughed, Polly noted. What you got instead was a sort of harsh gargling of spit at the back of the throat, a noise like... <laughs> The presence of the man cast a damper on everything. Jackram seldom interfered. He often watched Strappy, though, and once, when Polly caught his eye, he winked. On the first night, a tent was shouted by Strappy off the cart and shouted up, and after a supper of stale bread and sausage had been shouted, they were shouted in front of a blackboard to be shouted at. Across the top of the board, Strappy had written, What we are fighting for, and down the side he had written, One, two, three. Right. Pay attention, he said, slapping the board with a stick. There's some who think that you boys ought to know why we are fighting this war, OK? Well, here it comes. Point one. Remember the town of Lips? It was viciously attacked by Slovenian troops a year ago. They... Sorry, but I thought we attacked Lips, didn't we, Corporal? Last year, they said... Shufty began. Are you trying to be smart, Private Manacle? Strappy demanded, naming the biggest sin in his personal list. Just what to know, Corporal, said Shufty. He was stocky, running to plump, and one of those people who bustled about being helpful in a mildly annoying way, taking over small jobs that you wouldn't have minded doing for yourself. There was something odd about him, although you had to bear in mind he was currently sitting next to Wazza, who had enough odd for everybody and was probably contagious. And had caught Strappy's eye. There was no fun in having a go at Shufty, but Wazza now, Wazza was always worth a shout. "'Are you listening, Private Goom?' he screamed. Wazza, who had been sitting and looking up with his eyes closed, jerked a wank. "'Corporal?' he quavered as Strappy advanced. "'I said, are you listening, Goom?' "'Yeah, Corporal,' moaned Wazza, shaking with fear. "'Really? And what did you hear, may I ask?' said Strappy in a voice of treacle and acid. "'Nothing, Corporal. She's not speaking.' "'Strappy!' 
took a deep, delighted breath of evil air. You are a useless, worthless pile of... There was a sound. It was a small, nondescript sound, one that you heard every day, a noise that did its job but never expected to be, for example, whistled or part of an interesting sonata. It was simply the sound of stone scraping on metal. On the other side of the fire, Jackram lowered his cutlass. He had a sharpening stone in his other hand. He returned their group stare. What? Oh, just maintaining the edge, he said innocently. Sorry if I interrupted your flow there, Corporal. Carry on. A basic animal survival instinct came to the corporal's aid. He left the trembling Wazza alone and turned back to Shufti. Uh, yes, yes, we attacked Lips too, said Strappy. Was that before the Slovenians did, said Maledict. Will you listen, Strappy demanded. We valiantly attacked Libs to reclaim what is Boragravian territory, and then the treacherous Swede has stole it back. Polly tuned out a little at this point, now that there was no immediate prospect of seeing Strappy decapitated. She knew about Lips. Half the old men who came and drank with her father had attacked the place. But no one had expected them to want to do it. Someone had just shouted, Attack! The trouble was the Knek River. It wandered across the wide, rich, silty plain like a piece of dropped string, but sometimes a flash flood or even a big fallen tree would cause it to crack like a whip, throwing coils of river around areas of land miles from its previous bed. And the river was the international border. She surfaced to hear, But this time everyone's on their side, the bastards! And you know why? It's cause of ank more pork. Because we stopped the mail coaches going over our country and tore down their clax towers, which are an abomination unto Nuggan, ank more pork is a godless city. I thought it had more than three hundred places of worship, said Maledict. Strappy stared at him in a rage that was incoherent until he managed to touch bottom again. Ank more pork is a god awful city, he said. Poisonous, just like its river. Barely fit for humans now, they let everything in. Zombies, werewolves, dwarfs, vampires, trolls. He remembered his audience, faltered and recovered. Which, in some cases, can be a good thing, of course. But it is a foul, lewd, lawless, overcrowded mess of a place, which is why Prince Heinrich loves it so much. He's been taken over by it. Bought by cheap toys, because that's the way Ank Morpork plays it, men. They buy you, they will you stop interrupting. What's the good of me trying to teach you stuff if you're going to keep on asking questions? I was just wondering why it's so crowded, Corp, said Tonka. If it's so bad, I mean. That's because they are a degraded people, Private, and they've sent a regiment up here to help Heinrich take over our beloved motherland. He has turned aside from the ways of Nuggan and embraced Ank Morpork's godless, god awfulness. Strappy looked pleased at having spotted that one and went on. Point two. In addition to its soldiers, Ank Morpork has sent Vimes the Butcher, the most evil man in that evil city. They are bent on nothing less than our destruction. I heard that Ank Morpork was just angry that we cut the Clax Towers down, said Polly. They were on our sovereign territory. Well, it was Lobinian until, Polly began. Strappy waved an angry finger at her. You listen to me, Parts. You can't get to be a great country like Boragravia without making enemies. Which leads me on to point three, Parts, who's sitting there thinking he's so smart. You all are. I can see it. Well, be smart about this. You might not like everything about your country, eh? It might not be the perfect place, but it's ours. You might think we don't have the best laws, but they are ours. The mountains might not be the prettiest ones or the tallest ones, but they are ours. We're fighting for what's ours, men. Strappy slammed his hand over his heart. Awake, ye sons of the motherland, taste no more the wine of the sour apples. They joined in with various levels of drone, and you had to. Even if you just opened and shut your mouth, you had to. Even if you just went, no, 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 you had to. Polly, who was exactly the kind of person who looks around surreptitiously at times like these, saw that Shufti was singing its word perfectly, and Strappy actually did have tears in his eyes. 
Wasser wasn't singing at all. He was praying. That was a good wheeze, said one of the more treacherous areas at the back of Polly's mind. To the bewilderment of all, Strappy continued alone all through the second verse, which nobody ever remembered, and then gave them a smug, I'm more patriotic than you smile. Afterwards, they tried to sleep on as much softness as two blankets could provide. They lay there in silence for some time. Jackram and Strappy had tents of their own, but instinctively they knew that Strappy at least would be a sneaker and a listener at tent flaps. After about an hour, when rain was drumming on the canvas, Carborundum said, OK, then, I think I've worked it out. If people are group par stupid, then we'll fight for group par stupidity, cause it's our stupidity. And that's good, yeah? Several of the squad sat up in the darkness, amazed at this. I realise I ought to know these things, but what does group par mean? said the voice of Maledict in the damp darkness. Oh, well, when, right, a daddy troll and a mummy troll... Good, right, yes, I think I've got it. Thank you, said Maledict. And what you've got there, my friend, is patriotism. My country, right or wrong? You should love your country, said Shifting. OK, what part? the voice of Tonka demanded from the far corner of the tent. The morning sunlight on the mountains, the horrible food, the damn mad abominations, all of my country except whatever bit Strappy is standing on. But we are at war. Yes, that's where they've got you, sighed Polly. Well, I'm not buying into it. It's all trickery. They keep you down, and when they piss off some other country, you have to fight for them. It's only your country when they want you to get killed, said Tonka. All the good bits in this country are in this tent, said the voice of Wazza. Embarrassed silence descended. The rain settled in. After a while, the tent began to leak. Eventually, someone said, What happens um, if you join up, but then you decide you don't want to? That was shifting. I think that's called deserting, and they cut your head off, said the voice of Maledict. In my case, that would be a drawback, but you, dear Shafti, would find it simply puts a big crimp in your social life. I never kissed a damn picture, said Tonka. I swivelled it round when Strappy wasn't looking and kissed it on the back. They'll still say you kissed the Duchess, though, said Maledict. You k k kissed the Duchess on, 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 on the bottom, said Wazza, horrified. It was the back of the picture, OK, said Tonka. It wasn't her real backside. Huh? Wouldn't have kissed it if it was. There was some unidentified sniggering from various corners and just a hint of giggle. That was wicked, hissed Wazza. Not and in heaven saw you to, to do that. It was just a picture, all right, muttered Tonka. Anyway, what's the difference? Front or back, we're all here together, and I don't see any steak and bacon. Something rumbled overhead. I join to see exciting foreign places and meet erotic people, said Carborundum. That caused a moment's thought. I think you mean exotic, said Igor. Yeah, that kind of stuff, agreed the troll. But they always lie, said someone, and then Polly realised it was her. They lie all the time about everything. They meant all that, said Tonka. We fight for liars. Ah, oh, they may be liars, snapped Polly, in a passable imitation of Strappy's yap, but they're our liars. Now, now, children, said Maledict, let's try to get some sleep, shall we? But here's a happy little dream from your Uncle Maledict. Dream that when we go into battle, Corporal Strappy is leading us. Wouldn't that be fun? After a while, Tonka said, In front of us, you mean? Oh, yes, I can see you're with me, Tonk, right in front of you on the noisy, frantic, confusing battlefield, where all so much can go wrong. And we'll have weapons, said Shufti wistfully. Of course you'll have weapons, your soldiers. And there's the enemy right in front of you. That's a good dream, Mal. Sleep on it, kid. Polly turned over and tried to make herself comfortable. It's all lies, she thought muzzily. Some of them are just prettier than others, that's all. People see what they think is there. Even I'm a lie, but I'm getting away with it. A warm autumnal wind was blowing leaves off the rowan trees as the recruits marched among the foothills. 
It was the morning of the next day, and the mountains were behind them. Polly passed the time identifying the birds in the hedgerows. It was a habit. She knew most of them. She hadn't set out to be an ornithologist, but birds brought Paul alive. All the slowness in the rest of his thinking became a flash of lightning in the presence of birds. Suddenly he knew their names, habits, and habitats, could whistle their songs, and, after Polly had saved up for a box of paints of a traveller at the inn, had painted a picture of a wren so real you could hear it. Their mother had been alive then. The row had gone on for days. Pictures of living creatures were an abomination in the eyes of Nuggan. Polly had asked why there were pictures of the Duchess everywhere, and had been thrashed for it. The picture had been burned, the paints thrown away. It was a terrible thing. Her mother had been a kind woman, or as kind as a devout woman could be, while trying to keep up with the whims of Nuggan, and she died slowly and painfully, amid pictures of the Duchess, and among the echoes of unanswered prayers. But that was the memory that crawled treacherously into Polly's mind every time, the fury and the scolding, while the little bird seemed to flutter in the flames. In the fields, women and old men were getting in the spoiled wheat after last night's rain, hoping to save what they could. There weren't any young men visible. Polly saw some of the other recruits steal a glance at the scavenging parties, and wondered if they were thinking the same thing. They saw no one else on the road until midday, when the party was marching through a landscape of low hills. The sun had boiled away some of the clouds, and, for a moment at least, summer was back, moist and sticky and mildly unpleasant, like a party guest who won't go home. A red blob in the distance became a rather larger blob, and resolved itself into a loose knot of men. Polly knew what to expect as soon as she saw it. By the reaction of some of the others, they did not. There was a moment of collision and confusion as people walked into one another, and then the party stopped and stared. It took the wounded men some time to draw level and some time to pass. Two able-bodied men, as far as Polly could tell, were trundling a handcart on which a third man lay. Others were limping on crutches or had arms in slings or wore red jackets with an empty sleeve. Perhaps worse were the ones like the man in the inn, grey-faced, staring straight ahead, jackets buttoned tight despite the heat. One or two of the injured glanced at the recruits as they lurched past, but there was no expression in their eyes beyond a terrible determination. Jackram reined in the horse. All right, twenty minutes breather, he muttered. Igor turned, nodded to the party of wounded heading grimly onward, and said, Permit them to see if I can do anything for them, Sarge. You'll get your chance soon enough, lad, said the sergeant. Sarge, said Igor, looking hurt. All right, if you must. Do you want someone to give you a hand? There was a nasty laugh from Corporal Strappy. Some assistance would be a help, yes, sergeant, said Igor with dignity. Sergeant looked at the squad and nodded. Private Halter, step forward. Know anything about doctoring? The red-headed Tonker stepped forward smartly. I butchered pigs for me, ma'am, Sarge, he said. Capital. Better than an army surgeon, upon my oath. Off you go, twenty minutes, remember. And don't let Igor bring back any souvenirs, said Strappy, and laughed his scraping laugh again. The rest of the boys sat down on the grass by the road, and one or two of them disappeared into the bushes. Polly went on the same errand, but pushed in a lot further, and took the opportunity to make a little sock adjustment. They had a tendency to creep if she wasn't careful. She froze at a rustling behind her, and then relaxed. She'd been careful. No one would have seen anything. So what if someone else was taking a leak? She'd just push her way back to the road and take no notice. Lofty sprang up as Polly parted the bushes, breeches around one ankle, face red as a beetroot. Polly couldn't help herself. Maybe it was the socks. Maybe it was the pleading expression on Lofty's face. When someone's broadcasting, don't look, the eyes have a mind of their own and go where they're not wanted. Lofty jumped up, dragging at her clothes. No, look, look, it's all right, Polly began, but it was too late. The girl had gone. Polly stared at the bushes and thought, blast. There's two of us. But what would I have said next? It's okay, I'm a girl too. You can trust me. We could be friends. Oh, and here's a good tip about socks. Igor and Tonka arrived back late, without saying anything. Nor did Sergeant Jackram. 
The squad moved off. Polly marched at the back with Carborundum. This meant she could keep a wary eye on Lofty, whoever she was. For the first time, Polly really looked at her. She was easy to miss because she was always, as it were, in Tonka's shadow. She was short, although now Polly knew she was female, the word petite could decently be used, and was dark and dark-haired and had a strange, self-absorbed look. And she was always marching with Tonka. Come to think of it, she always slept close to him too. Ah, so that was it. She's following her boy, Polly thought. It was kind of romantic and very, very dumb. Now she knew to look beyond the clothes and haircut, she could see all the little clues that Lofty was a girl, and a girl who hadn't planned enough. She saw Lofty whisper something to Tonka, who half turned and gave Polly a look of instant hatred and a hint of threat. I can't tell her, she thought. She would tell him. I can't afford to let them know. I've put too much into this. I didn't just cut my hair and wear trousers. I planned. Ah, oh, yes, the plans. It had begun as a sudden strange fancy, but it had continued as a plan. At first, Polly had started to watch boys closely. This had been reciprocated, hopefully, by a few of them to their subsequent disappointment. She watched how they moved. She listened to the rhythm of what passed, among boys, for conversation. She'd noted how they punched one another in greeting. It was a new world. She had good muscles for a girl, because running a large inn was all about moving heavy things, and she took over a number of the grittier chores which coarsened her hands nicely. She'd even worn a pair of her brother's old breeches under her long skirt to get the feel of them. A woman could be beaten for that sort of thing. Men dressed like men and women like women. Doing it the other way round was a blasphemous abomination unto Nuggan, according to Father Jupe. And that was probably the secret of her success so far, she thought, as she trudged through a puddle. People didn't look for a woman in trousers. To the casual observer, men's clothes and short hair and a bit of a swagger were what it took to be a man. Oh, and a second pair of socks. That had been gnawing at her, too. Someone knew about her, just like she knew about Lofty. And he hadn't given her away. She'd feared it was eyebrow, but doubted it. He'd have told the sergeant about her he was that sort. Right now she was guessing it was maledict, but perhaps that was just because he seemed so knowing all the time. Carbo no, he'd been out cold, and in any case, no, not the troll. And Igor lisped. Tonka? After all, he'd know about Lofty, so maybe... No, because why would he want to help Polly? No, there was nothing but danger in owning up to Lofty. The best she could do was try and see to it that the girl didn't give both of them away. She could hear Tonka whispering to his girl. I'd just died, so he cut off one of his legs and an arm and sewed them on men who needed them, just like I'd done a tear. You should have seen it. You couldn't see his fingers move. And he has all these ointments that just... Tonka's voice died away. Strappy was haranguing Wazzer again. Get Strappy really gets on my crags, muttered Carborundum. You want I should pull the head off of him? I could make it look like an accident. Better not, said Polly, but she did entertain the thought for a moment. They'd reached a road junction, where the road down from the mountains joined what passed for the main highway. It was crowded. There were carts and wheelbarrows, people driving herds of cows, grandmothers carrying all the household possessions on their backs, a general excitement of pigs and children, and it was all heading one way. It was the opposite way to the way the squad was going. The people and animals flowed around it like a stream around an inconvenient rock. The recruits bunched up. It was that or be separated by cows. Sergeant Jackram stood up in the cart. Private Carborundum. Yes, Sergeant, rumbled the troll. To the front. That helped. The stream still flowed, but at least the crowds parted some distance further along the road and gave the squad a wide berth. No one wants to barge up against even a slow-moving troll. But faces stared as the people hurried by. 
An old lady darted out for a moment, pressed a loaf of stale bread into Tonka's hands and said, You poor boys, before being swept away in the throng. What's this all about, Sarge? said Maledict. These look like refugees. Talk like that spreads alarm and despondency, shouted Corporal Strappy. Oh, you mean they're just people getting away early for the holidays to avoid the rush, said Maledict. Sorry I got confused. It must be that woman carrying a whole haystack we just passed. Do you know what can happen to you for cheeking a superior officer? screamed Strappy. No, tell me, is it worse than whatever it is these people are running away from? You signed up, Mr. Bloodsucker. You obey orders. Right, but I don't remember anyone ordering me not to think. Enough of that, snapped Jackram. They're shouting down there. Move on. Cover on them. You give people a push if they don't make way, you hear? They moved on. After a while, the press of people abased a little, so that what had been a torrent became a trickle. Occasionally, there would be a family group, or just one hurrying woman, burdened with bags. One old man was struggling with a wheelbarrow full of turnips. They are even taking the crops out of the fields, Polly noted. And everyone moved at a kind of half-run, as if things would be a little better when they'd caught up with the mass of people ahead, or merely overtook them, perhaps. The squad was passed by an old woman bent double under the weight of a black-and-white pig. And then there was just the road, rutted and muddy. An afternoon mist was rising from the fields on either side, quiet and clammy. After the noise of the refugees, the silence of the low countryside was suddenly oppressive. The only sound was the trudge and splash of the recruits' boots. Permission to speak, Sarge? said Polly. Yes, Private, said Jackram. How far is it to Plots? You don't have to tell him, Sarge, said Strappy. About five miles, said Sergeant Jackram. You'll get your uniforms and weapons at the depot there. That's a military secret, Sarge, Strappy whined. We could shut our eyes so as we don't see what we're wearing. How about that? said Maledict. Stop that, Private Maledict, said Jackram. Just keep moving and guard that tongue. They plodded on. The road grew muddier. A breeze sprang up, but instead of carrying the mist away, it merely streamed it across the damp fields in twisty, clammy, unpleasant shapes. The sun became an orange ball. Polly saw something large and white flutter across the field, blown by the wind. At first she thought it was a migratory lesser egret that had left things a little late, but it was clearly being blown by the wind. It flopped down once or twice, and then, as a gust caught it, blew across the road and wrapped itself across Corporal Strappy's face. He screamed. Lofty grabbed at the fluttering thing, which was damp. It tore in his, her, hands, and most of it dropped away from the struggling corporal. It's just a bit of paper, she said. Strappy flailed at it. I knew that, he said. I never asked you. Polly picked up one of the torn scraps. The paper was thin and muddy, although she recognised the words Ankh Morpork, the god-awful city. And the genius of Strappy was that anything he was against automatically sounded attractive. Ankh Morpork Times, she read aloud before the corporal snatched it out of her hand. You can't just read anything you say, parts, he shouted. You don't know who wrote it. He dropped the damp scrap onto the mud and stamped on it. Now let's move on, he said. They moved on. When the squad was more or less in rhythm, and staring at nothing more than its boots or the mist ahead of it, Polly raised her right hand to chest height, and carefully turned it palm up, so that she could see the fragment of paper that had soggily stayed behind when the rest had been pulled away. No surrender to Alliance, says Duchess, 97. From William de Word, Valley of the Kneck, Sectober 7. Borogravian troops, assisted by Lord v Light Infantry, took Kneck keep this mo... After fierce hand-to-hand -hand fight, I write its armaments, which are being turned on the rim Borogravian forces. His Grace Commander Sus told the Times that surrender had been rejected. View the enemy command. Load of stiff-necked fools don't in the paper. It is understood desperate situ spread famine. Across no alternate invasion. They were winning, weren't they? So where did the word surrender come from? And what was the alliance? 
And then there was the problem of Strappy, which had been growing on her. She could see he got on Jackram's nerves as well, and he had a struttiness about him, a certain um, sockiness, as if he was really the one in charge. Perhaps it was just general unpleasantness, but... Corporal, she said. Yes, Parts, said Strappy. His nose was still very red. We are winning this war, aren't we? said Polly. She'd given up correcting him. Suddenly every ear in the squad was listening. Don't you bother yourself about that, Parts, snapped the Corporal. Your job is to fight. Right, Corp, but so I'll be fighting on the winning side, will I? Oh, oh, we've got someone who asks too many questions here, Sarge, said Strappy. Yeah, don't ask questions, Perks, said Jackram absent-mindedly. So we are losing, then, said Tonka. Strappy turned on him. That's spreading alarm and despondency again, that is, he shrieked. That's aiding the enemy. Yeah, knock it off, Private Holter, said Jackram. OK, now get up. Oh, I'm placing you under arrest for... Strappy began. Corporal Strappy, a word in your shell-like ear, please. You men, you stop here, growled the sergeant, clambering down from the cart. Jackram walked back down the road about fifty feet. Glaring around at the squad, the corporal strutted after him. Are we in trouble? said Tonka. Are you guess? said Maledict. Bound to be, said Shifty. Strappy can always get you for something. They are having an argument said Benedict, which is odd, don't you think? A sergeant is supposed to give orders to a corporal. We are winning, aren't we? said Shifty. I mean, I know there's a war, but... I mean, we get weapons, don't we, and we'll... Well, they've got to train us, right? It'll probably be over by then, right? Everyone says we're winning. I will ask the Duchess in my prayers tonight, said Wazza. The rest of the squad looked at one another with a shared expression. Yeah, right, was said Tonka kindly. You do that. The sun was setting fast, half hidden in the mist. Here, on the muddy road between damp fields, it suddenly felt as cold as it could be. No one says we're winning except maybe Strappy, said Polly. They just say that everyone says we're winning. The men he got repaired didn't even say that, said Tonka. They said, you poor bastards, you'll leg it if you've got any sense. Thank you for sharing, said Maledict. It looks as though everyone's feeling sorry for us, said Polly. Yeah, well, thar am I, and I am us, said Igor. Thumb of those men. All right, all right, stop lollygagging, you lot, shouted Strappy, marching up. Corporal, said the sergeant, quietly, hauling himself back onto the cart. Strappy paused, and then, in a voice dripping with syrup and sarcasm, he went on, Excuse me! The sergeant and myself would be obliged if you brave heroes to be would join us in a little light marching. Jolly good. And there will be embroidery later on. Best foot forward, ladies. She heard Tonka gasp. Strappy turned, eyes glinting with sinister anticipation. Oh, someone doesn't like being called a lady, eh? He said. Dear me, Private Alter, you've got a lot to learn, haven't you? You're a sissy little lady until we make a man of you, right? And I dread to think how long that's going to take. Move! I know, thought Polly as they set off. It takes about ten seconds and a pair of socks. One sock, and you could make strappy. Plots turned out to be like plume, but it was worse because it was bigger. The rain started again as they marched into the cobbled square. It looked as though it always rained here. The buildings were grey and mud spattered near the ground. Roof gutters overflowed, pouring rain onto the cobbles and sending a spray over the recruits. There was no one about. Polly saw open doors banging in the wind and bits of debris in the streets and remembered the lines of hurrying people on the road. There was no one here. Sergeant Jackram climbed down from the cart as Strappy balled him into line. Then the sergeant took over, leaving the corporal to glower from the sidelines. This is wonderful plots, he said. Have a look round so that if you is killed and goes to hell, it won't come as a shock. You'll be bivying in that barracks over there what is military property. He waved a hand towards a crumbling stone building that looked about as military as a barn. You will be issued with your equipment, and tomorrow is a nice long march to Crotz, where you will arrive as boys and leave as men. Did I just say something funny, Perks? No, I thought so too. Tension. That means stand up straight. That's straight. 
yelled Strappy. A young man was riding across the square on a tired, skinny brown horse, which was quite suitable because he was a tired, skinny man. The skinniness was helped by the fact that he wore a tunic that had clearly been made for someone a couple of sizes larger. The same applied to his helmet. He must have padded it, Polly thought. One cough and it'll be over his eyes. Sergeant Jackram snapped off a salute as the officer approached. Jackram, sir. You'll be Lieutenant Blouse, sir. Well done, Sergeant. These are the recruits from upriver, sir. Fine body of men, sir. The rider peered at the squad. He actually leaned forward over the horse's neck, causing rain to pour off his helmet. This is all, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Most of them look very young, said the lieutenant, who didn't look very old. Yes, sir. And isn't that one a troll? Yes, sir. Well spotted, sir. And the one with stitches all round his head? He's an Igor, sir. Sort of like a special clan up in the mountains, sir. Do they fight? Can take a man apart very quickly, sir, as I understand it, said Jackram, his expression not changing. The young lieutenant sighed. Well, I'm sure they're all good fellows, he said. Now then, uh, men, I... Pay attention and listen to what the lieutenant has to say, bawled Strappy. The lieutenant shuddered. Thank you, corporal, he said. Men, I have good news, he added, but in the tone of one who hasn't. You were probably expecting a week or two in the training camp in Cross, yes? But I'm glad to be able to tell you that the the war is progressing so, uh, so, so, so well that you are to go directly to the front. Polly heard one or two gasps and a snigger from Corporal Strappy. All of you are to go to the lines, said the lieutenant. That includes you too, Corporal. Your time for action has come at last. The snigger stopped. Sorry, sir, said Strappy. The front? But you know that I'm, I'm, well, you know about the special duties. My orders said all able-bodied men, Corporal, said Blouse. I expect that you'll be itching for the fray after all these years, eh, a young man like you? Strappy said nothing. However, said the lieutenant, fumbling under his soaking cloak, I do have a package here for you, Sergeant Jackram, a very welcome one, I've no doubt. Jackram took the packet gingerly. Thank you, sir, I'll look at this later on, he began. On the contrary, Sergeant Jackram, said Blouse, your last recruits should see this, since you are a soldier and, as it were, a father of soldiers. And so it's only right that they see a fine soldier get his reward. An honourable discharge, Sergeant. Blouse spoke the words as if they had cream and a little cherry on top. Apart from the rain, the only sound now was Jackram's pudgy finger slowly ripping open the package. Oh, he said, like a man in shock. Good. A picture of the Duchess. That's eighteen I have now. Oh, and, and ooh, uh, a piece of paper saying it's a medal. So it looks like we've even run out of pot metal now. Oh, and my discharge with the printing of the Duchess's very own signature itself. He turned the packet over and shook it. Not my three months back pay, though. Three loud hurrahs for Sergeant Jackram, said the lieutenant to the rain and wind. Hip, hip! But I thought we needed every man, sir, said Jackram. Judging by all the notes pinned on that packet, it has been following you around for years, Sergeant, said Blouse. You know the military. That is your official discharge, I'm afraid. I cannot rescind it, I am sorry. But, Jackram began, it bears the Duchess's signature, Sergeant. Will you argue with that? I said I am sorry. In any case, what would you do? We will not be sending out any more recruiting parties. What? But we always need men, sir, Jackram protested. And I am fit and well again, got the stamina of a horse. You are the only man to return with recruits, Sergeant. That is how the matter is. The Sergeant hesitated for a moment and then saluted. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. We'll see the new lad settled in, sir. Pleasure to have served, sir. Can I ask something? said Maledict. You do not address an officer directly, Private, snapped Jackram. Now let the man speak, Sergeant, said the Lieutenant. These are unusual times, after all. Yes, my man. Did I hear you say we're going into battle without training, sir? Oh, well... Most of you will almost certainly be pikemen, <laughs> said the lieutenant nervously. Not a lot of training there, eh? You just need to know which end is which. <laughs> the lieutenant looked as though he wanted to die. Pikemen, 
said Maledict, looking puzzled. You heard the lieutenant, Private Maledict, snapped the sergeant. Yes, sir, thank you, sir, said Maledict, stepping back into the ranks. Are there any more questions? said Blouse, looking along the line. Jolly good, then. We leave by the last boat at midnight. Carry on, sergeant. For now. Uh, what was the other thing? Oh, yes, and I shall need a batman. Volunteers to be the lieutenant's batman step forward, not you, Private Maledict, snapped the sergeant. No one moved. Oh, come now, said the lieutenant. Polly slowly raised a hand. What's a batman, sir? The sergeant grinned mercilessly. Fair question, he said. A batman is like a personal servant who takes care of the officer, fetches his meals to him, sees he's smartly turned out, that style of thing. So he is free to perform his duties more adequately. Igor stepped forward. Igor, are you to serve his sergeant? he said. Using the amazing powers of deafness and restricted vision sometimes available even to the most nervous officers, the lieutenant appeared not to notice him. He looked fixedly at Polly. What about you, Private? he said. Private Perks used to work in a bar, sir, the sergeant volunteered. Capital. Report to my quarters in the inn at six, Private Perks. Carry on, sergeant. As the horse staggered away, Sergeant Jackram directed his glare at the squad, but there was no real fire to it. He appeared to be operating on automatic with his mind elsewhere. Don't just stand there trying to look pretty. There's uniforms and weapons inside. Get kitted up. If you want grub, cook it yourself. At the double D's, miss! The squad dashed for the barracks, propelled by sheer volume. But Polly hesitated. Corporal Strappy hadn't moved since the snigger had been cut short. He was staring blankly at the ground. You are right, Corporal, she said. You go away, Parts, said the Corporal, in a low voice that was much worse than his normal petulant shout. Just go away, all right. She shrugged and followed the others. But she had noticed the steaming dampness around the Corporal's feet. There was chaos inside. The barracks was really just one big room which did duty as mess, assembly room and kitchen, with big bunk rooms beyond it. It was empty and well on the way to decay. The roof leaked, the high windows were broken, dead leaves had blown in and lay around on the floor among the rat droppings. There were no pickets, no sentries, no people. There was a big pot boiling on the sooty hearth, though, and its hiss and seethe was the only liveliness in the place. At some point, Part of the room had been set up as a kind of quartermaster's store, but most of the shelves were empty. Polly had expected some sort of a queue, some kind of order, possibly someone handing out little piles of clothes. What there was instead was a rummage stall. Very much like a rummage stall, in fact, because nothing on it appeared to be new and little on it appeared to be worth having. The rest of the squad were already pouring through what might have been called merchandise if there was any possibility that anyone could be persuaded to buy it. What's this? One size doesn't fit anyone. Well, this tunic's got blood on it. Blood! Well, it is one of the stubborn stains. It's always very hard to get out without. There's the proper armour. Oh, no, there's a hole in this one. What this? Nothing fits a troll. A small, leathery old man was at bay behind the table, cowering under the ferocity of Maledict's stare. He wore a red uniform jacket, done up badly, with a corporal's stripes, stained and faded, on the sleeve. The left breast was covered in medals. One arm ended in a hook. One eye was covered in a patch. "'We are going to be pikemen,' the lieutenant said," said the vampire. Well, "'That means a sword and a pike per man, right? And a shield if there's an arrow storm, right? And a heavy helmet, right?' "'Wrong. You can't yell at me like that,' said the man. "'See these medals? I'm a—' A hand descended from above and lifted him over the table. Carborundum held the man close to his face and nodded. "'Yeah, can see him, mister,' he rumbled. "'And?' The recruits had fallen silent. "'Put him down, Carborundum,' said Polly, gently. "'Why?' "'He's got no legs.' The troll focused. Then, with exaggerated care, he lowered the old soldier to the ground. There were a couple of little tapping sounds as the two wooden peg-legs touched the planking. "'Sorry about that,' he said. The little man steadied himself against the table and shuffled his arms around a couple of crutches. "'All right,' he said gruffly. "'No harm done, but watch it another time.' "'But this is ridiculous,' said Maledict, turning to Polly and waving a hand at the heap of rags and bent metal. "'You couldn't equip three men out of this mess. There are not even any decent boots.' Polly looked along the length of the table. 
We're supposed to be well equipped, she said to the one-eyed man. We're supposed to be the finest army in the world. That's what we're told, and aren't we winning? The man looked at her. Inside, she stared at herself. She hadn't meant to speak out like that. So they say, he said in a blank kind of way. And wh 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 what do you say? said Wazza. He picked up one of the few swords. It was stained and notched. The corporal glanced up at Carborundum and then at Maledict. Well, I'm not stupid, you know, Wazza went on, red in the face and trembling. All this stuff is off the dead men. Well, it's a shame to waste good boots, the man began. We're the last ones, aren't we? said Wazza. The last re recruits. The peg-legged corporal eyed the distant doorway and saw no relief heading in his direction. We've got to stay here all night, said Maledict. Night, he went on, causing the old corporal to wobble on his crutches, where who knows what evil flits through the shadows, dealing death on silent wings, seeking a hapless victim who... Yeah, all right, all right, I did see your ribbon, said the corporal. Look, I'm closing up after you, gone. I just run the stores, that's all. That's all I do, honest. I'm on one-tenth pay me on account of the leg situation, and I don't want trouble. And is this all you've got? said Maledict. Don't you have a little something put by? Are you saying I'm dishonest? said the corporal hotly. Let's say I'm open to the idea that you might not be, said the vampire. Come on, corporal, you said we were the last to go. What are you saving up? What have you got? The corporal sighed and swung with surprising speed over to a door which he unlocked. "'You'd better come and look,' he said. "'But it's not good.' It was worse. They found a few more breastplates, but one was sliced in half and the other was one big dent. A shield was in two pieces too. There were bent swords and crushed helmets, battered hats and torn shirts. "'I done what I can,' sighed the corporal. "'I hammered stuff out and washed out the clothes, but it's been weeks since I had any coal for the forage.' "'And you can't do nothing about swords without a forage. "'It's been months since I got any new weapons, "'and let me tell you, since the dwarfs buggered off, "'the steel we've been getting is crap anyway.' "'He rubbed his nose. "'I know you think quartermasters are a thieving bunch, "'and I won't say we might not skim a bit off the top "'when things are going well with this stuff. "'A beetle couldn't make a living off this.' "'He sniffed again. "'I ain't been paid in three months, neither. "'I guess one-tenth of nothing is not as bad as nothing, "'but I was never that good at philosophy.' Then he brightened up. Got plenty to eat, at least, he said. If you like horse, that is. Personally, I prefer rat, but there's no accounting for taste. You can't eat a horse, said Shufty. Or you be a rat man, said the corporal, leading the way out into the big room. No. You'll learn to be one. You'll all learn, said the little one-tenth corporal with an evil grin. Ever eaten scubbo? No. Nothing like a bowl of scubbo when you're hungry. You can put anything in scubbo. Pork, beef, mutton, rabbit, chicken, duck, anything. Even rats, if you got them. It's food for the marching man, Scabo. Got some on the boil out there right now. You can have some of that if you like. The squad brightened up. Sounds good, said Eagle. What's in it? Boiling water, said the corporal. It's what we call blind Scabo. But there's going to be old horse in a minute unless you've got something better. Could do with some seasonings at least. "'Who's looking after the Rupert?' "'They looked at one another. "'The corporal sighed. "'The officer,' he explained. "'They're all called Rupert or Rodney or Tristram or something. "'They get better grub than you do. "'You could try scrounging something at the inn.' "'Scrounge?' said Polly. "'The old man rolled his one eye. "'Yes, yeah, scrounge. "'Scrounge, nick, avalendo, borrow, thieve, "'lift, acquire, purloin. "'That's what you'll learn if you're going to survive this war.' "'which they say we're winning, of course. "'Always remember that.' "'He spat vaguely in the direction of the fire, "'possibly missing the cooking pot only by accident. "'Yeah, and all the lads I see coming back down the road "'walking hand in hand with death, "'they probably overdid the celebrating, eh? "'So easy to take your hand right off "'if you open a bottle of champagne the wrong way, eh? "'I see you've got an eagle with you, you lucky devils. "'Wish we'd had one when I went off to battle. "'I wouldn't be kept awake by woodworm if we had.' "'We have to steal our food?' said Maledict. "'No, you can starve if that takes your fancy,' said the corporal. 
I've starved a few times. There's no future in it. I ate a man's leg when we were snowed up in the Ibelstarn campaign, but fair is fair, he ate mine. He looked at their faces. Well, it's not on, is it? Eating your own leg. You'd probably go blind. You swap legs? said Polly, horrified. Yep, me and Sergeant Ausgarda. It was his idea, sensible man, the sergeant. That kept us alive for the week, and by then the relief got through. We were certainly relieved about that. Oh, dear. Where's my manners? How do you do, lads? My name's Corporal Scallop. They call me three parts. He held out his hook. But that's cannibalism, said Tonka, backing away. No, it's not. Not officially. Not unless you eat a whole person, said three parts Scallop levelly. Military rules. All eyes turned to the big pot bubbling on the fire. Horse, said Scallop. I ain't got nothing but horse. I told you. I wouldn't lie to you, boys. Now kick yourselves up with the best you can find. What's your name, stone man? Carborundum, said the troll. Got a wee bit of decent snacking anthracite saved about the back, then. And some official red paint for you, because I never met a troll yet that wanted to wear a jacket. The rest of you mark what I'm telling you. Fill up with grub. Fill your pack with grub. Fill your hat with grub. Fill your boots with soup. If any of you run across a pot of mustard, you hang on to it. It's amazing what mustard will help down. And look after your mates. And keep out of the way of officers, because they ain't healthy. That's what you learn in the army. The enemy don't really want to fight you, because the enemy is mostly blokes like you who want to go home with all their bits still on. But officers will get you killed. Scallop looked around at them. There, I said it. And if there's a political amongst you, mister, you can go and tell tales and to hell with you. After a few moments of embarrassed silence, Polly said, What's a political? Like a spy on the on your own side, said Maledict. That's right, said Scallop. There is one in every battalion these days snitching on their mates. Get promotion that way, see. Don't want dissent in the ranks, eh? Don't want loose talk about losing battles, right? Which is a load of bloody cludges, cause the infantry grumbles all the time. Moaning is part of being a soldier, he sighed. Anyway, there's a bunkhouse out the back. I beats the palliarses regular, so there's probably not too many fleas. Once again he looked at blank faces. That's straw mattresses to you. Go on, help yourselves. Take what you like. I'm closing up after you've gone anyway. We must be winning now you rattling lads are joining, right? The clouds had broken when Polly stepped out into the night, and a half-moon filled the world with cold silver and black. The inn opposite was another rubbishy alehouse for selling bad beer to soldiers. It stank of ancient slops even before she opened the door. The sign was flaked and unrecognisable, but she could read the name. The world turned upside down. She pushed open the door. The smell got worse. There were no customers and no sign of Strappy or Jackram, but Polly did see a servant methodically spreading the inn's dirt evenly across the floor with a mop. Excuse me, she began, and then remembered the socks, raised her voice and tried to sound angry. Hey, where's the lieutenant? The servant looked at her and gestured up the stairs with a thumb. There was only one candle alight up there, and she knocked on the nearest door. Enter! She entered. Lieutenant Blouse was standing in the middle of the floor in his breeches and shirt sleeves holding a sabre. Polly was no expert in these matters, but she thought she recognised the stylish, flamboyant pose as the one beginners tend to use just before they're stabbed through the heart by a more experienced fighter. Ah, perks, isn't it? he said, lowering the blade. Just, uh, limbering up. Yes, sir. There's some laundry in the bag over there. I expect someone in the inn will do it. What's for supper? I'll check, sir. What are the men having? Scubbo, sir, said Polly. Possibly with hor... Then bring me some, will you? We are at war, after all, and I must show an example to my men, said Blouse, sheathing the sword at the third attempt. That would be good for morale. Polly glanced at the table. A book lay open on top of a pile of others. It looked like a manual of swordsmanship, and the page it was open at was page five. Beside it was a thick lensed pair of spectacles. Are you a reading man, Perks? said Blouse, closing the book. Polly hesitated, but then what did Oz care? A bit, sir, she admitted. I suspect I shall have to leave most of these behind, he said. Do take one if you want it. He waved a hand at the books. Polly read the titles. 
the craft of war, principles of engagement, battle studies, tactical defence. All a bit heavy for me, sir, she said. Thanks all the same. Tell me, Perks, said Blaz, are the recruits in uh, good spirits? He gave her a look of apparently genuine concern. He really did have no chin, she noticed. His face just eased its way into his neck without much to disturb it on the way. But his Adam's apple now, that was a champion. It went up and down his neck like a ball on a spring. Polly had been soldiering for only a couple of days, but already an instinct had developed. In summary, it was this. Lie to officers. Yes, sir, she said. Getting everything they need. The aforesaid instinct weighed the chances of them getting anything more than they'd already got as a result of a complaint, and Polly said, Yes, sir. Of course, it is not up to us to question our orders, said Blouse. Wasn't doing so, sir, said Polly, momentarily perplexed. Even though at times we might feel... The lieutenant began and started again. Obviously, warfare is a very volatile thing, and the tide of battle can change in a moment. Yes, sir, said Polly, still staring. The man had a small spot where his spectacles had rubbed on his nose. The lieutenant seemed to have something on his mind, too. Why did you join up, Perks? he said, groping on the table and finding his spectacles at the third attempt. He had woollen gloves on with the fingers cut out. Patriotic duty, sir, said Polly promptly. You lied about your age? No, sir. Just patriotic duty, Perks? There were lies, and then there were lies. Polly shifted awkwardly. Would quite like to find out what's happened to my brother Paul, sir, she said. Ah, yes. Lieutenant Blouse's face, not a picture of happiness to begin with, suddenly bore a hunted look. Paul Perks, sir, Polly prompted. I'm, uh, not really in a position to know, Perks, said Blouse. I was working as a, um, I was, uh, in charge of, uh, I was engaged in special work back at headquarters, uh, Obviously, I don't know all the soldiers, Perks. Older brother, what, a, is he? Yes, sir. Joined the ins and outs last year, sir. And, uh, have you any younger brothers? said the lieutenant. No, sir. Ah, well, that's something to be thankful for at any rate, said Blouse. It was a strange thing to say. Polly's brow wrinkled in puzzlement. Sir? she said. And then she felt an unpleasant sensation of movement. Something was slipping slowly down the inside of her thigh. "'Anything the matter, Perks?' said the lieutenant, catching her expression. "'No, sir. Just a, a bit of cramp, sir. All the marching, sir.' She clamped both hands around one knee and edged backwards toward the door. "'I'll just go and, just go and see to your supper, sir.' "'Yes, yes,' said Blouse, staring at her leg. "'Yes, please.' Polly paused outside the door to pull her socks up, retucked the end of one under her belt as an anchor, and hurried down to the inn's kitchens. A look told her all she wanted to know. Food hygiene here consisted of making a half-hearted effort not to gob in the stew. "'I want onions, salt, pepper,' she began. The maid, who was stirring the soot-black pot on the soot-black stove, glanced up, realised she had been addressed by a man, and hastily pushed her damp hair out of her eyes. "'It's stew, sir,' she announced. "'I don't want any, I just want the stuff,' said Polly. "'For the officer,' she added. The kitchenmaid pointed a soot-blackened thumb to a nearby door and gave Polly what she probably thought was a saucy grin. "'I'm sure you can have anything that takes your fancy, sir,' she said. Polly glanced at the couple of shelves that had been dignified by the name of Pantry and grabbed a couple of large onions, one in each hand. "'May I?' she said. "'Oh, sir,' giggled the maid, "'I do hope you're not one of them coarse soldiers "'who take advantage of a helpless maiden, sir.' "'No, er, uh, no, I I'm not one of them,' said Polly. "'Oh, this didn't seem to be the right answer. "'The maid put her head on one side. "'Have you had much to do with young women, sir?' she asked. "'Er, uh, yes, quite a lot,' said Polly. "'Er, uh, lots, really.' "'Really?' the maid drew closer. She smelled mostly of sweat, tinged with soot. Polly raised the onions as a kind of barrier. "'I'm sure there are things you'd like to learn,' the maid purred. "'I'm sure there's something you wouldn't,' said Polly, and turned and ran. As she made it out into the cold night air, a plaintive voice behind her called out, "'I'm off at eight o'clock!' Ten minutes later, Corporal Scallet was impressed. 
Polly got the feeling this did not happen often. Shufti had wedged an old breastplate beside the fire, had hammered some slabs of horse meat until they were tender, dipped them in some flour and was frying them. The sliced onions sizzled next to them. I always just boil them, said Scallet, watching him with interest. You just lose all the flavour if you do that, said Shufti. Eh, hey, lad, the stuff I've ate, you wouldn't want to taste it. Saute things first, especially the onions, Shufti went on. Improves the flavour. Anyway, when you boil, you ought to boil slow. That's what me mam always says. Roast fast, boil slow, OK. This isn't bad meat for horse. Shame to boil it anyway. Amazing, said Scallop. We could have done with you in Ibblestarn. The Sarge was a good man, but a bit, you know, tough in the leg. A marinade would probably have helped, said Shufti absently, flipping a slice of meat with a broken sword. He turned to Polly. Was there any more stuff in the larder, Oz? I can make up some stock for tomorrow if we can. I'm not going in that kitchen again, said Polly. Ah, that'll be Round Heels Molly, said Corporal Scallet, looking up and grinning. She sent many a lad on his way rejoicing. He dipped a ladle in the boiling scabbo pot next to the pan. Disintegrated grey meat seized in a few inches of water. That'll do for the Rupert, he said, and picked up a stained bowl. Well, he did say he wanted to eat what the men eat, said Polly. Oh, that kind of officer, said Scallet uncharitably. Yes, yeah, some young ones try that stuff if they've been reading the wrong books. Some of them try to be friends, the bastards. He spat expertly between the two pans. Wait till he tries what the men eat. But if we're having steak and onions... No thanks to the likes of him, said the corporal, ladling the slurry into the bowl. The Slovenian troops get one pound of beef and a pound of flour a day minimum, plus fat pork or butter and half a pound of peas. A pint of molasses sometimes, too. We get stale or spread and what we scrounge. He'll have scubble and like it. No fresh vegetables, no fruit, said Shufty. That's a very binding diet, Corp. Yeah, well, once battle commences, I reckon you'll find constipation's the last thing in your mind, said Scallet. He reached up, pushed some rags aside, and pulled down a dusty bottle from a shelf. Rupert's not having none of this, neither, he said. Got it off of the baggage the last officer that went through, but I'll share it with you, because you's good lads. He casually knocked the top of the bottle off against the edge of the chimney. It's only sherry, but it'll make you drunk. Thanks, Corp, said Shifty, and took the bottle. He sloshed a lot of it over the sizzling meat. Hey, that's good drink you're wasting, said Scallet, making a grab for it. No, it'll spice up the meat a fair treat, said Shifty, trying to hang on to the bottle. It'll sugar. Half the liquid had gone on the fire as the two hands fought for it. But that wasn't what had felt like a small steel rod shooting through Polly's head. She looked around at the rest of the squad, who didn't appear to have... Maledict winked at her and made a tiny gesture with his head toward the other end of the room, and strolled in that direction. Polly followed. Maledict always found something to lounge against. He relaxed in the shadows, looked up at the rafters, and said, Now, I say a man who knows how to cook is no less of a man for that. But a man who says sugar when he swears? Have you ever heard a man say that? You haven't, I can tell. So, it was you who gave me the socks, thought Polly. You know about me, I can tell you do, but do you know about Lofty? Maybe Shufty was very politely brought up, but one look at Maledict's knowing smile made her decide not to try that road. Besides, the moment you looked at Shufty with the idea that maybe he was a girl, you saw that he was. No man would say sugar. Three girls now, and I'm pretty sure about Lofty too said Maledict. What are you going to do about them? she said. Do? Why should I do anything about anyone? said Maledict. I'm a vampire officially pretending not to be one, right? I'm the last person who'll say anyone has to play the hand they were dealt. So good luck to him, say I. But you might like to take him aside later on and have a word with him. You know, a man to man. Polly nodded. Was there a knowingness to that comment? I'd better go and take the Lieutenant Iscobo, she said. And blast it, I forgot about his laundry. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that, old chap, said Maledict, and flashed a little smile. The way things are going around here, Igor's probably a washerwoman in disguise. Polly did the laundry in the end, 
She wasn't sure that she'd be able to dodge Molly a second time, and there wasn't that much of it. Afterwards, she hung it in front of the fire, which was roaring. The horse had been surprisingly good, but not as surprising as Blouse's reaction to the scubbo. He had sat there in his evening dress uniform, wearing special clothes just to sit down and eat all by yourself as a new one on Polly, and had yummed it up and sent her back with the bowl for more. The meat had been boiled white, and there was scum on the top. The squad wondered what kind of a life an officer could have led that inclined him to like Scubbo. "'Don't know much about him,' said Scallet upon questioning. "'He's been here two weeks, fretting to get to the war. Bought a whole cartload of books with him, I heard. Looks like a typical Rupert to me.' They were all behind the door when their chins were ended out. A sergeant who went through said he's not really a soldier at all, just some wonk from headquarters that's good at sums. Oh, great, said Maledict, who was brewing his coffee by the fire. The little engine gurgled and hissed. I don't think he can see very well without his glasses, said Polly, but he's very, um, polite. Not been a Rupert for long, then, said Scallet. They're more, hey there, you, damn your eyes, fa fa fa. I've seen your sergeant before with old Jackram. Been everywhere he has. Everyone knows old Jackram. He was with us in the snow up at Ibblestarn. How many people did he eat? said Maledict to General Laughter. The dinner had been good, and there had still been enough sherry for a glass each. Let's just say I heard he didn't come down much sooner than he went up, said Scallet. And Corporal Strappy, said Polly. Never seen him before either, said Scallet. Cross-grained little bugger political, I'd say. Why's he gone and left you here? Got a nice cushy bed in here, has he? I, I, I hope he's not going to be our sergeant, said Wazza. Him? Why? said Scallet. Polly volunteered the events earlier in the evening. To her surprise, Scallet laughed. They're trying to get rid of the old bugger again, are they? he said. That's a laugh. Bless you, it'll take more than a bunch of Gawains and Rodneys to leave a jackram out of his own army. Why, he's been court-martialed twice. He got off both times. And you know he once saved General Frock's life? He's been everywhere, got the goods on everyone, knows more strings than me, and I know a good few, mark my words. If he wants to march for you tomorrow, he will, and no skinny little Rupert will get in his way. So, what was a man like that doing as a recruiting officer? said Maledict sharply. Cause he got his leg cut open in Slovenia and bit the sawbones who tried to look at it when the wound went bad, clever dick retorted Scallop, cleaned it out himself with maggots and honey, and then drank a pint of brandy and sewed himself up and lay on his bed with a fever for a week. But the general got him, I heard, came and visited him while he was too weak, and told him he was going on the drumming for a year and no argument. Not even Frock himself would hand him his papers, not after Jackram had carried him on his back for fourteen miles through enemy lines. The door swung open, and Sergeant Jackram walked in, tucking his hands into his belt. "'Don't bother to salute, lads,' he said as they turned guiltily. "'Evening three parts. Nice to see nearly all of you again, you awful old god-dodger. Where's Corporal Strappy?' "'Haven't seen him all evening, Sarge,' said Maledict. "'Didn't he come in here with you?' "'No, Sarge. We thought he was with you.' Not a muscle moved on Jackram's face. "'I see,' he said. "'Well, you heard the lieutenant. The boat leaves at midnight.' We shall be well down the connect by Wednesday's dawn. Get a few hours' sleep if you can. Tomorrow's going to be a long day if you're lucky. And with that, he turned and went out again. Wind howled outside and was cut off when the door shut. We'll be well down the connect, Polly noted. Well done, three parts. Missing a corporal, said Scallet. Now there's a thing. Usually it's a recruit that goes a wall. Well, you heard the sergeant, boys. Time to wash up and turn in. There was a washroom and latrine in a rough and ready fashion. Polly found a moment when she and Shufty were in it alone. She'd racked her brains about how best to raise the subject, but as it turned out, just a look was all it took. There was when I volunteered to do the supper, wasn't it? Shufty mumbled, staring into the stone sink which had moss growing in it. That was a clue, yes, said Polly. A lot of men cook, you know, said Shufty hotly. "'Yes, but not soldiers, and, and not enthusiastically,' said Polly. "'They don't do marinades.' "'Have you told anybody?' mumbled Shufty, red in the face. "'No,' said Polly, which was, after all, strictly true. "'Look, you were good. You had me fooled right up until sugar.' "'Yes, yes, I know,' Shufty whispered. "'I can do the 
the belching and the walking stupidly and even the nose picking but I wasn't brought up to swear like you men us men thought Polly oh boy we're at the coarse and licentious soldiery I'm afraid it's shit or bust she said um, why are you doing this Shifty stared into the dank stone sink as if strange green slime was really interesting and mumbled something sorry what was that said Polly go into find me husband said Shufty, only a little bit louder oh dear how long have you been married said Polly without thinking not married yet said Shufty in a voice as tall as an ant Polly glanced down at the plumpness of Shufty oh dear oh dear she tried to sound reasonable don't you think that you should don't you tell me to go home said Shufty rounding on her there's nothing for me back home except disgrace I'm not going home I'm going to the war and I'm going to find him no one's going to tell me not to Ozza no one this has happened before anyway and it ended right there's a song about it and everything oh that said Polly yes I know folk singers should be shot what I was going to say was that you might find this helps the disguise she produced a soft cylinder of woolly socks from her pack and wordlessly handed it over it was a dangerous thing to do she knew but now she was feeling a kind of responsibility to those whose sudden strange fancy hadn't been followed by a plan on the way back to her palace she caught sight of Wazza hanging his little picture of the Duchess on a handy hook in the crumbling wall above his mattress he looked around furtively failed to spot Polly in the shadows of the doorway and bobbed a very quick curtsy to the picture a curtsy not a bow Polly frowned four she was barely surprised now and she had one pair of clean socks left this was soon going to be a barefoot army Polly could tell time by the fire you got a feel for how long a fire burned and the logs on this one were grey with ash over the glow beneath it was gone eleven she decided by the sound of it no one was getting any sleep she'd got up after an hour or two of lying on the crackling straw mattress staring at darkness and listening to things move about underneath her she'd have stayed on it for longer but something in the straw seemed to want to push her leg out of the way besides she didn't have any dry blankets there were blankets in the barracks but three parts had advised against them on account of them carrying as he put it the itch the corporal had left a candle alight Polly had read Paul's letter again and took another look at the piece of printed paper rescued from the muddy road the words were fractured and she wasn't sure about any of them but she didn't like the sound of any of them invage had a particularly unpleasant ring to it and then there was the third piece of paper she couldn't help that it had been a complete accident she'd done Blouse's laundry and of course you went through the pockets before you washed things because anyone who'd ever tried to unroll a soggy bleached sausage that had once been a banknote never wanted to do it twice and there had been this folded piece of paper admittedly she needn't have unfolded it and having unfolded it needn't have read it but there are some things that you just do it was a letter presumably Blouse had shoved it in a pocket and forgot about it when he changed his shirt she didn't need to read it again but by candlelight she did my dearest Emmeline fame and fortune await after only eight years as a second lieutenant I have now been promoted and am to have a command of course this will mean that there'll be no officer left in the adjutant general's blankets bedding and horse fodder department but I've explained my new filing system to Corporal Dreb and I believe he is sound you know I cannot go into matters of detail but I believe this will be a very exciting prospect and I'm anxious to be at the foe I am bold enough to hope that the name of Blouse will go down in military history in the meantime I'm brushing up my sword drill and it is definitely all coming back to me of course the promotion brings with it no less than one shilling extra per DM plus three pence fodder allowance to this end I have purchased a charger from Mr. Honest Jack Slacker a most entertaining gentleman although I fear that his description of my steeds prowess may have been prone to some exaggeration nevertheless I am moving up at last and if fate smiles on me this will hurry for the day when I can 
And that was it, fortunately. After some thought, Polly went and carefully damped the letter, then dried it quickly over the remains of the fire and slipped it into the pocket of the washed shirt. Blouse might scold her for not removing it before washing, but she doubted it. A blanket counter with a new filing system. An ensign for eight years in a war where promotion could be rather fast. A man who put quotes around any word or phrase he thought of as even slightly racy. Brushing up on his sword drill. And so near-sighted he'd bought a horse from Jack Slacker who went around all the horse fair's bargain bins and sold winded old screws that dropped a leg before you got home. Our leader. They were losing the war. Everyone knew that, but nobody would say it. It was as if they felt that if the words weren't said out loud, then it wasn't really happening. They were losing the war, and this squad, untrained and untried, fighting in dead men's boots, could only help them lose it faster. Half of them were girls. And because of some bloody stupid song, Shufti was wandering off into a war to look for the father of her child, and that was a desperate errand for a girl, even in peacetime. And Lofty was trailing after her boy, which would probably be romantic right up until five minutes into a battle, and she... well, yes. She'd heard the song too. So what? Paul was her brother. She'd always kept an eye on him, even when he was small. Mother was always busy. Everyone was always busy at the Duchess, so Polly had become a big sister to a brother fifteen months older than she. She'd taught him to blow his nose taught him how to form letters, went and found him when crueler boys had got him lost in the woods. Running after Paul was a duty that had become a habit. And then, well, it wasn't the only reason. When her father died, the Duchess would be lost to her side of the family if there was no male to inherit. That was the law, plain and simple. Nogonatic law said that men could inherit the things of men, such as land, buildings, money, and all domestic animals except cats. Women could inherit the things of women, which were mostly small items of personal jewellery and spinning wheels and cats passed from mothers to daughters. They certainly couldn't inherit a large, famous tavern. So the Duchess would go to Paul if he was alive, or, if he was dead, it was allowable for it to go to Polly's husband if she was married. And since Polly saw no prospect of that, she needed a brother. Paul could happily carry barrels around for the rest of his life. She would run the Duchess. But if she was left alone, a woman with no man, then at best all she'd get would be maybe the chance to go on living there while the deeds went to cousin Vloppo, who was a drunkard. Of course, all that wasn't THE reason. Certainly not. But it was a reason all the same. THE reason was simply Paul. She'd always found him and brought him home. She looked at the shako in her hands. There had been helmets, but since they all had arrow holes or gaping rips in them, the squad had wordlessly gone for the softer hats. You'd die anyway, and at least you wouldn't have a headache. The shako's badge showed the regimental symbol of a flaming cheese. Maybe one day she'd find out why. Polly put it on, picked up her pack and a small bag of laundry, and stepped out into the night. The moon was gone. The clouds had come back. She was drenched by the time she'd crossed the square. The rain was coming horizontally. She shoved open the inn door and saw, by the light of one guttering candle, chaos. Clothing was strewn across the flagstones. Cupboards were hanging open. Jackram was coming down the stairs, cutlass in one hand, lantern in the other. Oh, it's you perks, he said. They've cleaned out the place and buggered off, even Molly. I heard him go. Pushing a cart by the sound of it. What are you doing here? Batman, Sarge, said Polly, shaking water off her hat. Oh, yeah, right. Go and wake him up, then. He's snoring like a sawmill. I hope to elder boat's still there. Why'd they bug Scarpa, Sarge? said Polly, and thought, Sugar, if it comes to it, I don't swear either. But the sergeant didn't appear to notice. He gave her what is known as an old-fashioned look. This one had dinosaurs in it. "'Got wind of something, I don't doubt,' he said. "'Of course, we're winning the war, you know,' he said. "'Ah. Oh, and we're not going to be invaded at all, I expect,' said Polly, with equally exaggerated care. "'Quite right. 
I detest those treacherous devils who'd have us believe that a vast army is about to sweep right across the country any day now, said Jackram. Er, uh, no sign of Corporal Strappy, Sarge? No, but I haven't turned over every stone yet. Shh! Polly froze and strained to listen. There were hoofbeats getting louder as they approached, and changing from thuds into the ringing sound of horseshoes on cobbles. Cavalry patrol, Jackram whispered, putting the lantern down on the bar. Six or seven horses. Ours? I bleed in doubt it. The clattering slowed and came to a stop outside. Keep on talking, said Jackram, reaching down and sliding the door's bolt across. He turned and headed toward the rear of the inn. What? What about? whispered Polly. Sarge? Jackram had vanished. Polly heard murmuring outside the door, followed by a couple of sharp knocks. She threw off her jacket. She wrenched the shako off her head and tossed it behind the bar. Now she wasn't a soldier, at least. And as the door was shaken against the bolt, she saw something white lying in the debris. It was a terrible temptation. The door burst open at the second blow, but the soldiers didn't immediately enter. Lying under the bar, struggling to put the petticoat on over rolled-up trousers, Polly tried to make sense of the sounds. As far as she could tell from the rustles and thuds, anyone waiting inside the doorway with ambush in mind would have been briefly and terminally sorry. She tried to count the invaders. It sounded as though there were at least three. In the tense silence, the sound of a voice speaking in normal tones came as a shock. We heard the bolt slide across. That means you're in here somewhere. Make it easy on yourself. We don't want to have to come and find you. I don't want you to either, Polly thought. I'm not a soldier. Go away. Then the next thought was, What do you mean you're not a soldier? You took the shilling and kissed the picture, didn't you? And suddenly an arm had reached over the bar and grabbed her. At least she didn't have to act. Oh, no, please, sir, don't hurt me. I just got frightened. Please. But inside there was a certain sockness that felt ashamed and wanted to kick out. Ye gods, what are you? said the cavalryman, pulling her upright and looking at her as if she was some kind of exhibit. Polly, sir, barmaid, sir, only they cleared out and left me. Keep the noise down, girl. Polly nodded. The last thing she needed now was Blouse to run down the stairs with his sabre and fencing for beginners. Yes, sir, she squeaked. Barmaid, eh? Three pints of what you'd probably call your finest ale, then. That, at least, could happen on automatic. She'd seen the mugs under the bar, and the barrels were behind her. The beer was thin and sharp, but probably wouldn't dissolve a penny. The cavalryman watched her closely as she filled the mugs. "'What happened to your hair?' he said. Polly had been ready for this. "'Oh, sir, they cut it off, sir, cos I smiled at a Slovenian trooper, sir.' "'Here?' "'In Drock, sir.' It was a town much nearer the border. "'And me ma'am said it was shaming to the family, and I got sent here, sir.' Her hands shook as she put the mugs on the bar, and she was hardly exaggerating. Hardly, but a bit, nevertheless. You're acting like a girl, she thought. Keep it up. Now she could take stock of the invaders. They wore dark blue uniforms and big boots and heavy cavalry helmets. One of them was standing by the shuttered windows. The other two were watching her. One had a sergeant's stripes and an expression of deep suspicion. The one who'd grabbed her was a captain. "'This is terrible beer, girl,' he said, sniffing the mug. "'Yes, sir, I know, sir,' Polly gabbled. "'They wouldn't listen to me, sir, and said you have to put a damp sheet over the barrels in this thundery weather, sir, and Molly never cleans the spigot, and this town's empty, you know, that. "'They all scarped, sir,' said Polly earnestly. "'Gonna be an invasion, sir, everyone says. They're frightened of you, sir.' "'Except you, eh?' said the sergeant. "'What's your name, girl who smiles at Slovenian troopers?' said the captain, smiling. Polly, sir, said Polly. Her questing hand found what it was seeking under the bar. It was the barman's friend. There was always one. And are you a frightened of me, Polly? said the captain. There was a snigger from the soldier by the window. The captain had a well-trimmed moustache that had been waxed to points, and was over six feet tall, Polly reckoned. He had a pretty smile, too, which was somehow improved by the scar on his face. A circle of glass covered one eye. Her hand gripped the hidden cudgel. No, sir, she said, looking back into one eye and one glass. Er, what's that glass for, sir? It's a monocle, said the captain. 
It helps me to see you, for which I am eternally grateful. I always say, as if I had two, I'd make a spectacle of myself. That got a dutiful laugh from the sergeant. Polly looks blank. And are you going to tell me where the recruits are? said the captain. She forced her expression not to change. No? The captain smiled. He had good teeth, but there was now no warmth in his eyes. You are in no position to be ignorant, he said. We won't hurt them, I assure you. There was a scream in the distance. Much, said the sergeant, with more satisfaction than necessary. There was another yell. The captain nodded to the man by the door, who slipped out. Polly pulled the shako out from under the bar and put it on. One of them gave her his cap, did he? said the sergeant, and his teeth were nowhere near as good as the officer's. Well, I'd like a girl who'll smile at a soldier. The cudgel hit him alongside the head. It was old Blackthorn, and he went down like a tree. The captain backed away as Polly came out from behind the bar, with the club readied again. But he hadn't drawn his sword, and he was laughing. Now, girl, if you want... He caught her arm as she swung, dragged her toward him in a tight grip, still laughing, and folded up with a gasp as her knee connected with his sock drawer. Thank you, Gummy. As he sagged, she stepped back and brought the cudgel down on his helmet, making it ring. She was shaking. She felt sick. Her stomach was a small, red-hot lump. What else could she have done? Was she supposed to think, we have met the enemy and he is nice? Anyway, he wasn't. He was smug. She tugged a sabre from a scabbard and crept out into the night. It was still raining and waist-deep mist was drifting up from the river. Half a dozen or so horses were outside, but not tied up. A trooper was waiting with them. Faintly, against the rustle of the rain, she heard him making soothing noises to comfort one of them. She wished she hadn't heard that. Well, she'd taken the shilling. Polly gripped the cudgel. She'd gone a step when the mist between her and the man fountained up slowly as something rose out of it. The horses shifted uneasily. The man turned, a shadow moved, the man fell. Oi! whispered Polly. The shadow turned. Oh, sir, it's me, Maledict, it said. Sarge sent me to see if you needed help. Bloody Jackman left me surrounded by armed men, Polly hissed. And? Well, I knocked two of them out, she said, feeling as she said it that this rather spoiled her case as a victim. Another one went over the road, though. I think we got that one, said Maledict. Well, I said got. Tonka nearly got it. There's a girl with what I call unresolved issues. He turned around. Let's see. Seven horses, seven men. Yep. Tonker, said Polly. Oh, yes. Hadn't you spotted her? She went mad when the man charged at Lofty. Now let's have a look at your gentleman, shall we? said Maledict, heading for the door. But Lofty and Tonker, Polly began, running to keep up. I mean, the way they act, they... I thought she was his girl. I thought Tonker... I mean... I know Lofty is a girl. Even in the dark, Maledict's teeth gleamed as he smiled. The world's certainly unfolding itself for you, eh? Ozer? Every day something new. Cross dressing now, I see. What? You are wearing a petticoat, Ozer, said Maledict, stepping into the bar. Polly looked down guiltily and started to tug it off, and then thought, hang on a moment. The sergeant had managed to pull himself up against the bar where he was being sick. The captain was groaning on the floor. "'Good evening, gentlemen,' said the vampire. "'Please pay attention. I am a reformed vampire, which is to say, I am a bundle of suppressed instincts held together with spit and coffee. It would be wrong to say that violent, tearing carnage does not come easily to me. It's not tearing your throats out that doesn't come easily to me. Please don't make it any harder. The sergeant pushed himself away from the bar top and took a muzzy swing at Maledict. Almost absent-mindedly, Maledict leaned away from it and then returned a roundhouse blow that knocked him over. The captain looks bad, he said. What did he try to do to poor little you? Patronize me, said Polly, glaring at Maledict. 
Ah, said the vampire. Maledict knocked softly on the barracks door. It opened a fraction, and then all the way. Carborundum lowered his club. Wordlessly, Polly and Maledict dragged the two cavalrymen inside. Sergeant Jackram was sitting on a stool by the fire, drinking a mug of beer. Well done, lads, he said. Put them with the others. He waved the mug vaguely toward the far wall, where four of the soldiers cowered under the gaze of Tonka. They had been manacled together. The last soldier was lying on a table, with Igor at work on him with a needle and thread. How's he coming along, Private? said Jackram. You'll be fine, Farge, said Igor. It looked worse than it was, really. Just as well, because until we get to the battlefield, I won't get any spares. Got a couple of legs for all three parts, said Jackram. No, then, Sarge, none of that, said Scarlet evenly. He was sitting on the other side of the fireplace. You just leave me their horses and saddles. Your lads could do with their sabres, I've no doubt. They were looking for us, Sarge, said Polly. We're just a bunch of untrained recruits, and they were looking for us. I could have been killed, Sarge. No, I know talent when I seize it, said Jackram. Well done, lad. Had to piss off myself on account of a big man in full enemy uniform isn't easy to miss. Besides, you lads needed to be woke up. That's military thinking, that is. But if I hadn't... Polly hesitated. If I hadn't tricked them, they might have killed the lieutenant. See, there is always a positive side any way you look at it, said Scallet. The sergeant stood up, wiped his mouth on the back of his hand, and hitched up his belt. He ambled over to the captain, reached down, and lifted him up by his jacket. "'Why were you looking for these boys, sir?' he inquired. The captain opened his eye and focused on the fat man. "'I am an officer and a gentleman, sergeant,' he muttered. "'There are rules.' "'Not many gentlemen around here at this moment, sir,' said the sergeant. "'Damned right,' whispered Maledict. Polly, feeling drunk with relief and released tension, had to put her hand over her mouth to stop giggling. Oh, yeah, the rules. Prisoners of war and that, Jackram went on. That means you even have to eat the same things as us, you poor devils. So you're not going to talk to me? I am. Captain Horence of the First Heavy Dragoons. I'll say nothing more. And something about the way he said it elbowed Polly in the brain. He's lying. Jackram stared at him blankly for a moment, and then said, "'Well, now, it looks like what we have here is an embuggerance, which, my lads of the cheesemongers, is defined as an obstruction in the way of progress. I propose to deal with it in this wise.' He let go of the man's jacket, and the captain fell back. Sergeant Jackram removed his hat. Then he removed his jacket, too, revealing a stained shirt and bright red suspenders. He was still almost spherical. From his neck, folds of skin lapped their way down to the tropical regions. The belt must have been there just to conform to regulations, Polly thought. He reached up and undid a piece of string from around his neck. It was looped through a hole in a tarnished coin. Corporal Scallot, he said. Yes, Sarge, said Scallot, saluting. You will note I am divesting myself of my insignia, and am handing you my official shilling, which means, since last time I signed up it was for twelve years, and that was sixteen years ago, I am now fully and legally a damn civilian. Yes, Mr. Jackram, said Scallop cheerfully. Among the prisoners, heads jerked up at the sound of the name. And that being the case, and since you, Captain, are invading our country by night— under cover of darkness, and I am a humble civilian, I think there's no rule to stop me beating seven kinds of crap out of you until you tell me why you came here and when the rest of your mates are going to arrive. And that may take me some time, sir, because up until now I've only ever discovered five types of crap. He rolled up his sleeves, hauled up the captain again, and drew back a fist. "'We just had to take the recruits into custody,' said a voice. "'We weren't going to hurt them. "'Now put him down, Jack from Daniel. "'He's still seeing stars.' "'It was the sergeant from the inn. "'Polly looked at the other prisoners. "'Even with Carborundum and Maledict watching them, "'and Tonka glaring at them, "'there was a definite sense that the first blow landed on the captain "'was going to start a riot. "'And Polly thought, "'They are very protective, aren't they?' "'Jackram must have picked it up, too.' 
Ah, now we are talking, he said, lowering the captain gently, but still holding his coat. Your men speak up for you well, captain. That's because we're not slaves, you bloody beet-eater, growled one of the troopers. Slaves? All my lads joined up of their own free will, turnip head. Maybe they thought they did, said the sergeant. You just lied to them. Lied to them for years. They're all going to die because of your stupid lies. Lies and your rattled, rotting, lying old whore of a duchess. Private Goom, as you were, that is an order. As you were, I said. Private Maledict, take that sword off of Private Goom. That is another order. Sergeant, order your men to ease back slowly. Slowly. Do it now. Upon my oath, I am not a violent man, but any man, any man who disobeys me, by God, that man is looking at a broken rib. Jackram screamed all that in one long explosion of sound without taking his eyes off the captain. Reaction, order, and breathless stillness had taken just a few seconds. Polly stared at the sudden tableau as her muscles untensed. The Slovenian troopers were settling back. Carborundum's raised club began to lower itself gently. Little Wazza was held off the ground by Maledict, who'd wrenched a sword from her hand. Possibly only a vampire could have moved faster than Wazza as she'd charged the prisoners. Custody, said Jackram in a quiet voice. That's a funny word. Look at my little lads, will you? Not a whisker between them yet, save for the troll, and lichen don't count. Still wet behind the ears they are. What's dangerous about a harmless bunch of farm boys that are concern a fine bunch of horse wallopers like yourselves? Can someone please come and put their finger on this knot? said Igor from his makeshift operating table. I've just about done. Harmless? said the sergeant, staring at the struggling wazza. They're a bunch of bloody madmen. I want to speak to your officer, damn you, said the captain, who looked a little less unfocused now. You do have an officer, don't you? Yeah, we've got one somewhere, as I recall, said Jackram. Perks, go and fetch the Rupert, will you? Best if you take that dress off first, too. You never know with Rupert's. He carefully lowered the captain onto a bench and straightened up. Carborundum, maledict, chop something off any prisoner who moves and any man who tries to attack a prisoner, he said. Now then, oh yes, three parts, Scarlet. I wish to enlist in your wonderful army, with its many opportunities for a young man willing to apply himself. Any previous soldier in? said Scallet, grinning. Forty years fighting every bleeder within a hundred miles of Borogravia, Corporal. Special scales? Stay in alive, Corporal, come what may. Allow me to present you with one shilling and a major acceleration to the rank of sergeant, said Scallet, handing back the coat and the shilling. Want to osculate the dark scene? Not at my time of life, said Jackram, putting on his jacket again. There, he said. All smart, all neat, all legal. Go on, Perks, I gave you an order. Blouse was snoring. His candle had burned down. A book was open on his blanket. Polly gently pulled it out from under his fingers. The title, almost invisible on the stained cover, was Tacticus, The Campaigns. Sir? she whispered. Blouse opened his eyes, saw her, and then turned and frantically scrabbled by the bed. Here they are, sir, said Polly, handing him his spectacles. Ah, <clears throat> Perks, thank you, said the lieutenant, sitting up. Midnight, is it? A bit after, sir. Oh dear, then we must hurry. Quick, pass me my breeches. Have the men had a good night? We were attacked by Slovenian troops, sir. First, heavy dragoons. We took them prisoners, sir. No casualties, sir. Because they didn't expect us to fight. They wanted to take us alive, and they walked in on Carborundum and Maledict and me. It had been hard, very hard, to force herself to swing that cudgel, but once she had done it, it had felt easy, and then she'd felt embarrassed about being caught in a petticoat, even though she had her breeches on underneath. She'd gone from boy to girl just by thinking it, and it had been so easy. She needed some time to consider this. She needed time to think about a lot of things. She suspected that time was going to be in short supply. Blouse was still sitting there with his breeches half on, staring at her. Run that past me again one more time, will you, Perks? 
he said, you have captured some of the enemy. Not just me, sir. I only got two of them, said Polly. We all are piled in, sir. Heavy dragoons? Yes, sir. That's the prince's personal regiment. They've invaded. I think it was more of a patrol, sir. Seven men. And none of you are hurt? No, sir. Pass me my shirt. Oh, blast. It was then that Polly noticed the bandage around his right hand. It was red with blood. He saw her expression. A bit of a self-inflicted wound, Perks, he said nervously. Brushing up on my sword drill after supper. Nothing serious. Just a bit rusty, you know. Can't quite manage buttons. Uh, if you would be so good. Polly helped the lieutenant struggle into the rest of his clothes and threw his other possessions in a bag. It took a special kind of man, she reflected, to cut his sword hand with his own sword. "'I should pay my bill,' the lieutenant muttered as they hurried down the darkened stairs. "'Can't, sir. Everyone's fed, sir. Uh, perhaps I should leave them a note, do you think? I wouldn't like them to think that I'd done a runner without—' "'They've all gone, sir,' said Polly, pushing him toward the front door. She stopped outside the barracks, straightened his coat, and stared at his face. "'Did you wash last night, sir?' Uh, there was no... Blanche began. The response was automatic. Even though she was fifteen months younger, she'd mothered Paul for too long. Handkerchief? she demanded. And since some things get programmed into the brain at an early age, one was obediently produced. Spit? Polly commanded. Then she used the damp hanky to wipe a mark off Blouse's face, and realised, as she was doing it, that she was doing it. There was no going back. The only way out was ahead. "'All right,' she said brusquely. "'Have you got everything?' Uh, "'Yes, Perks.' "'Have you been to the privy this morning?' Her mouth went on while her brain cowered in fear of a court-martial. "'I'm in shock,' she thought, and so's he. "'So you cling to what you know, and you can't stop.' Uh, "'No, Perks,' said the lieutenant. "'Then you must go properly before we get in the boat, all right?' "'Yes, Perks.' "'In you go, then. There's a good lieutenant.' She leaned against the wall and got her breath back in a few hurried gulps as Blouse stepped into the building, then slipped in after him. "'Officer present!' Jackram barked. The squad, already lined up, stood to varying degrees of attention. The sergeant crashed to attention in front of Blouse, causing the young man to sway backward. "'Apprehended enemy scouting party, sir. Dangerous business all round, sir.' In view of the emergency nature of the emergency, sir, and seeing as how you have no NCO, what with Corporal Strappy having scarpered, and seeing as how I'm an old soldier in good standing, you are allowed to conscript me as an auxiliary under Duchess's regulations, Rule 796, Section 3A, Paragraph 2, sir. Thank you, sir. What? said Blouse, staring around blearily, and becoming aware that in a world of sudden turmoil there was a big red coat that seemed to know what it was doing. "'Oh, yes, fine. Rule 796, you say? Absolutely. W well done. Uh, carry on, Sergeant.' "'Are you in command here?' barked Horence, standing. "'Indeed I am, Captain,' said Blaz. Horence looked him up and down. "'You?' he said, disdain oozing from the word. "'Indeed, sir,' said Blaz, his eyes narrowing. "'Oh, well, we shall have to do what we can. I am Captain Horence, and that fat bastard—' said Horence, pointing a threatening finger at Jackram, "'That bastard offered me violence, as a prisoner, in chains, and that boy,' the captain added, spitting the word toward Polly, "'kicked me in the privates and almost clubbed me to death. I demand that you let us go.' Blouse turned to Polly. "'Did you kick Captain Horence in the privates parts?' Uh, "'Yes, sir. Uh, need, actually.' And it's Perks, actually, sir, although I can see why you made the mistake. What was he doing at the time? Um, embracing me, sir. Polly saw Blouse's eyebrows rise and plunged on. I was temporarily disguised as a girl, sir, in order to allay suspicion. And then you clubbed him? Yes, sir. Once, sir. What in the world possessed you to stop at once? said Blouse. Sir? said Polly, as Horence gasped. Blouse turned with an almost seraphic look of pleasure on his face. "'And you, Sergeant,' he went on, "'did you in fact lay a hand on the captain?' 
Jackram took a step forward and saluted smartly. Not as in fact per se and such, sir, no, he said, keeping his eyes fixed on a point some twelve feet high on the far wall. I just considered, since he had invaded our country to capture our lad, sir, that it wouldn't hurt if he experienced temporary feelings of shock and awe, sir. On my oath, sir, I am not a violent man. Of course not, Sergeant, said Blouse. And now, while he still smiled, the smile was edged with a kind of malevolent glee. For heaven's sake, you fool! You can't believe these ignorant yokels! They're the dregs of— Horence began. I do believe them, indeed I do, said Blouse, shaking with nervous defiance. I would believe their testimony against yours, sir, if they told me the sky was green, and it would appear that, untrained as they are, they have bested some of Slovenia's finest soldiers by wit and daring. I have every confidence that they have further surprises in store for us. Dropping your drawers would do it, whispered Maledict. Shut up, hissed Polly, and then had to cram a fist into her mouth again. I know you, Captain Horence, said Blouse, and just for a moment the captain looked worried. I mean, I know your sort. I have had to put up with you all my life. Big, jovial bullies with your brains in your breeches. You dare to come riding into our country and think we're going to be frightened of you? You think you can appeal to me over the heads of my men? You demand, on the soil of my country? Captain, murmured the cavalry sergeant as Horence stared open-mouthed at the lieutenant. They'll be here soon. Ah, said Horence uncertainly. Then he seemed with some effort to regain his composure. "'Reinforcements are coming,' he snapped. "'Free us now, you idiot, and I might just put this down to native stupidity. Otherwise I shall see to it that things go very, very badly for you and your <laughs> men.' Seven cavalrymen were considered not enough to deal with farm boys,' said Blas. "'You're sweating, Captain. You are worried, and yet you have reinforcements coming.' "'Permission to speak, sir.' barked Jackram, and went straight on to, "'Cheesemongers, get bleeding armed again right now. Maledict, you give Private Goom his sword back and wish him luck. Carborundum, you grab a handful of them twelve-foot pikes. The rest of—' "'There is these as well, Sarge,' said Maledict. "'Lots of them. I got them off our friend's saddles.' He held up what looked to Polly like a couple of large pistol crossbows, steely and sleek. "'Horse bows,' said Jackram like a child opening a wonderful hogswatch present. That's what you get for leading a honest and sober life, my lads. Dreadful little engines they are. Let's have two each. I don't want unnecessary violence, sergeant, said Blouse. Right you are, sir, said the sergeant. Carborundum, first man comes through that door running. I want him nailed to the pub wall. He caught the lieutenant's eye and added, but not too hard. And someone did knock at the door. Maledict levelled two bows at it. Carborundum lifted a couple of pikes in either hand. Polly raised her cudgel, a weapon she at least knew how to use. The other boys, and girls, raised whatever weapon three-part Scallet had been able to procure. There was silence. Polly looked around. "'Come in?' she suggested. "'Yeah, right, that should do it,' said Jackram, rolling his eyes. The door was pushed open, and a small, dapper man stepped through carefully. In build, colouring, and hairstyle, he looked rather like Mala— A vampire, said Polly softly. A oh, damn, said Maledict. The newcomer's clothing, however, was unusual. It was an old-fashioned evening dress coat, with the sleeves removed, and many, many pockets sewn all over it. In front of him, slung around his neck, was a large black box. Against all common sense, he beamed at the sight of a dozen weapons poised to deliver perforated death. Wonderful, he said, lifting up the box and unfolding three legs to form a tripod for it. But could the troll move a little to his left, please? Huh? said Carborundum. The squad looked at one another. Yes, and if the sergeant would be so kind as to move into the centre more and raise those swords a little bit higher, the vampire went on. Great! And you, sir, if you could give me a grr. Grr? said Blaz. Very good, really fierce now. There was a blinding flash and a brief cry of, Oh, shit! 
followed by the tinkle of breaking glass. Where the vampire had been standing was a little cone of dust. Blinking, Polly watched it fountain up into a human shape that coalesced once more into the vampire. Oh dear, I really thought the new filter would do it, he said. Oh well, we live and learn. He gave them a bright smile and added, Now, which one of you is Captain Horentz, please? Half an hour had passed. Polly was still bewildered. The trouble was not that she didn't understand what was going on. The trouble was that before she could understand that, she had to understand a lot of other things. One of them was the concept of a newspaper. Blouse was looking proud and worried by turns, but nervous all the time. Polly watched him carefully, not least because he was talking to the man who had come in with the iconographer. He wore a big leather coat and jodhpurs, and spent most of his time writing things down in a notebook, with occasional puzzled glances at the squad. Finally, Maledict, who had good hearing, sauntered over to the recruits from his lounging spot by the wall. Okay, he said, lowering his voice. It's all a bit complicated, but do any of you know about newspapers? Yes, my second cousin Igor in Ankh Morpork told me about them, said Igor. They're like a kind of government announcement. Um, sort of. Except they are not written by the government. They are written by ordinary people who write things down, said Maledict. Like a diary, said Tonka. Um, no. Maledict tried to explain. The squad tried to understand. It still made no sense. It sounded to Polly like some kind of Punch and Judy show. Anyway, why would you trust anything written down? She certainly didn't trust Mothers of Borogravia, and that was from the government. And if you couldn't trust the government, who could you trust? Very nearly everyone, come to think of it. Mr. Derward works for a newspaper in Ankh Morpork, said Maledict. He says we're losing. He says casualties are mounting and troops are deserting, and all the civilians are heading for the mountains. But what, what, why should we believe him? Wasser demanded. Well, we've seen a lot of casualties and refugees, and Corporal Strappy hasn't been around since he heard he was going to the front, said Maledict. Sorry, but it's true. We've all seen it. Yeah, but he's just some man from a foreign country. Well, well, why would the Duchess lie to us? I mean, why would she send us out just to die, said Wazza. She w w watches over us. Everyone says we're winning, said Tonka doubtfully, after that moment of embarrassment. Tears were running down Wazza's face. No, they don't, said Polly. I don't think we are either. Does anyone think we are, said Maledict. Polly looked from face to face. But... Saying so, it's like treachery against the Duchess, isn't it? said Wazza. It's spreading alarm and despondency, isn't it? Maybe we ought to be alarmed, said Maledict. Do you know how he came to be here? He travels around writing things down about the war for his paper of news. He met those cavalry just up the road, in our country. And they told him they'd just heard that the very last recruits from Borogravia were here, and they were nothing but uh, a wet little bunch of squeaking boys. They said they'd capture us for our own good, and he could get a picture of us for his paper. He could show everybody how dreadful things were, they said, because we were scraping the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, but we beat him, so that's foxed him, said Tonka, grinning nastily. Nothing for him to write down now, eh? Um, not really. He says that this is even better. Better? Whose side is he on? Bit of a puzzler, really. He comes from Ankh Morpork, but he's not exactly on their side. Uh, Otto Hreek, who makes the pictures for him. The vampire? He crumbled to dust when the light flashed, said Polly, and then he came back. Well, I was standing behind Carborundum at the time, said Maledict, but I know the technique. He probably carries a thin glass vial of bl... 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 No, wait, I can say this. Blood, he sighed. There, no problem. A thin vial of what I said, which smashed on the ground and brought the dust back to life again. It's a great idea. Maledict gave them a wan smile. I think he really cares a lot about what he does, you know. 
Anyway, he told me Mr. De Word just tries to find out the truth, and then he writes it down and sells it to anyone who wants it. And people let him do that, said Polly. Apparently. Otto says he makes Commander Vimes livid with rage about once a week, but nothing ever happens. Vimes? The butcher? said Polly. He's a duke, Otto says, but not like ours. Otto says he's never seen him butcher anybody. Otto's a black ribboner like me. He wouldn't lie to a fellow ribboner. And he says that picture he took is going on the clacks from the nearest tower tonight. It will be in the paper of news tomorrow, and they print a copy here. How can you send a picture on the clacks? said Polly. I know people who've seen them. It's just a lot of boxes on a tower that go clack, clack. Ah, Otto explained that to me too, said Maledict. It's very ingenious. How does it work, then? Oh, I didn't understand what he said. It was all about numbers. But it certainly sounded very clever. Anyway, the word just told the loo, the Rupert, that news about a bunch of boys beating up experienced soldiers would certainly make people sit up and take notice. The squad looked at one another sheepishly. It was a bit of a fluke, and anyway we had carborundum, said Tonka. And I used trickery, said Polly. I mean, I couldn't do it twice. So what? said Maledict. We did it. The squad did it. The next time we'll do it differently. Yeah, said Tonka and there was a shared moment of exhilaration in which they were capable of anything. It lasted all of... a moment. "'But it won't work,' said Shifty. "'We've just been lucky. You know it won't work, Maledict. You all know it won't work, right?' "'Well, I'm not saying we could, you know, take on a regiment all at once,' said Maledict. "'And the Lou Rupert might be a bit wet, but we could help make a difference. Old Jackram knows what he's doing.' "'Upon my oath, I am not a violent man. "'Whack!' sniggered Tonka. "'And there were a few... "'Yes, giggles. "'They were giggles, Polly knew, from the squad. "'No, you're not,' said Shifty flatly. "'None of us are, right? "'Because we're girls.' "'There was a dead silence. "'Well, not Carborundum and Ozza, okay,' Shifty went on, "'as if the silence was sucking unwilling words out of her. "'And I'm not sure about Maledict and Ego.' "'But I know the rest of us are, right? "'I've got eyes, I've got ears, I've got a brain, right?' "'In the silence there was a slow rumble "'that preceded a pronouncement from Carborundum. "'If it any help,' she said, "'in a voice suddenly more sandy than gravelly, "'my real name's Jade.' "'Polly felt questing eyes boring into her. "'She was embarrassed, of course, "'but not for the obvious reason.' It was for the other one, the little lesson that life sometimes rams home with a stick. You are not the only one watching the world. Other people are also people. While you watch them, they watch you. And they think about you while you think about them. The world isn't just about you. There was going to be no possibility of getting out of this. And, in a way, it was a relief. Polly, she said almost in a whisper. She looked questioningly at Maledict, who smiled in a distinctly non-committal way. "'Is this the time?' he said. "'All right, you lot, what are you standing about for?' bawled Jackram, six inches from the back of Maledict's head. No one saw him arrive there. He moved with an NCO's stealth, which sometimes mystifies even Igor's. Maledict's smile didn't change. "'Why, we're awaiting your orders, Sergeant,' he said, turning around. Do you think you're clever, Maledict? Um, yes, Sarge, quite clever, the vampire conceded. There wasn't a lot of humour in Jackram's smile. Good, glad to hear it. Don't want another stupid corporal. Yeah, I know you ain't even a proper private yet, but glory be you're a corporal now, because I need one and you're the snappiest dresser. Get some stripes from three parts. The rest of you, this isn't a bleeding mother's meeting. We're leaving in five minutes. Move. "'But the prisoners, Sarge,' Polly began, still trying to digest the revelation. "'We're going to drag him over to the inn and leave him tied up in the nude and shackled together,' said Jackram. "'Vicious little devil when he's roused our Rupert, eh?' 
and three parties having their boots and horses. They won't be going too far for a while, not in the nude. Won't the writing man let them out? said Tonka. Don't care, said Jackram. He could probably cut the ropes, but I'm dropping the shackle key in the privy, and that'll take a bit of fishing out. Whose side is he on, Sarge? said Polly. Dunno. I don't trust him. Ignore him. Don't talk to him. Never talk to people who write things down. Military rule. Now, I know I just gave you lot an order, because I heard the bleeding echo. Get on with it. We are leaving. Road to perdition, lad, promotion, said Scallop to Maledict, swinging up with two stripes hanging from his hook. He grinned. That's three pence extra a day you're due now, only you won't get it because they ain't paying us. But, to look on the bright side, you won't get any stoppages, and they're a devil for stoppages. The way I see it, march backwards and your pockets will overflow. The rain had stopped. Most of the squad were parading outside the barracks, where there was now a small covered wagon belonging to the writer of the paper of news. A large flag hung from a pole attached to it, but Polly couldn't make out the design by moonlight. Beside the wagon, Maledict was deep in conversation with Otto. The centre of attention, though, was the line of cavalry horses. One had been offered to blouse, but he'd waved it away with a look of alarm, and muttering something about being loyal to his steed, which to Polly's eye looked like a self-propelled toast rack with a bad attitude. But he'd probably made the right decision at that, because they were big beasts, broad, battle-hardened and bright-eyed. Sitting astride one of them would have strained the crotch in Blouse's trousers, and an attempt at reining one of them in would have pulled his arms off at the shoulder. Now each horse had a pair of boots hanging from its saddle, except for the leading horse, a truly magnificent beast, upon which Corporal Scallet sat like an afterthought. "'I'm no donkey-walloper, as you know, three parts,' said Jackram, as he finished lashing the crutches behind the saddle. "'But this is a hell of a good horse you've got here.' "'Damn right, Sarge. You could feed a platoon for a week off of it,' said the corporal. "'Sure you won't come with us?' Jackram added, standing back. "'I reckon you still must have one or two things left for the bastards to cut off, eh?' "'Thank you, Sarge. It's a kind offer,' said three parts. "'But fast horses are going to be at a real premium soon.' and I'll be in on the ground floor, as you might say. This lot will be worth three years' pay. He turned in the saddle and nodded at the squad. Best of luck, lads, he added cheerfully. You'll walk with death every day, but I've seen him, and he's been known to wink. And remember, fill your boots with soup. He urged the horses into a walk, and disappeared with his trophies into the gloom. Jackram watched him go, shook his head, and turned to the recruits. All right, ladies. What's funny, Private Holter? And nothing, Sarge. I just thought of something, said Tonka, almost choking. You ain't paid to think of things. You're paid to march. Do it. The squad marched away. The rain slackened to nothing, but the wind rose a little, rattling windows, blowing through the deserted houses, opening and shutting doors, like someone looking for something they could have sworn they put down here only a moment ago. That was all that moved in plots, except for one candle flame down near the floor in the back room of the deserted barracks. The candle had been tilted so that it leaned against a cotton thread fastened between the legs of a stool. This meant that when the candle burned low enough, it would burn through the thread and fall all the way to the floor and into a ragged trail of straw that led to a pile of palliasses on which had been stood two ancient cans of lamp oil. It took about an hour, in the wet, dejected night, for this to happen, and then all the windows blew out. Tomorrow dawned on Borogravia like a great big fish. A pigeon rose over the forests, banked slightly, and headed straight for the valley of the Kneck. Even from here, the black stone bulk of the keep was visible, rising above the sea of trees. The pigeon sped on, one spark of purpose in the fresh new morning and squawked as darkness dropped from the sky, gripping it in talons of steel. Buzzard and pigeon tumbled for a moment, and then the buzzard gained a little height and flapped onwards. The pigeon thought, but had it been more capable of coherent thought, and knew something about how birds of prey catch pigeons, and allowing for the fact that all pigeons who know how birds of prey catch are dead, and therefore capable of slightly less thought than a living pigeon, it might have wondered why it was being gripped so kindly. 
It was being held, not squeezed. As it was, all it could think was, <coughs> The buzzard reached the valley and began to circle low over the keep. As it gyred, a tiny figure detached itself from the leather harness on its back, and with great care inched itself around the body and down to the talons. It reached the imprisoned pigeon, knelt on it, and put its arms around the bird's neck. The buzzard skimmed low over a stone balcony, reared in the air, and let the pigeon go. Bird and tiny man rolled and bounced across the flagstone in a trail of feathers and lay still. Eventually, a voice from somewhere under the pigeon said, Bugger! Urgent footsteps ran across the stones, and the pigeon was lifted off Corporal Buggy Swires. He was a gnome and barely six inches tall. On the other hand, as the head and only member of Ankh Morpork City Watch's airborne section, he spent most of his time so high that everyone looked small. Are you all right, Buggy? said Commander Vimes. Not too bad, sir, said Buggy, spitting out a feather. But it wasn't elegant, was it? I'll do better next time. Trouble is, pigeons are too stupid to be steered. What have you got me? The time sent this up from the cart, sir. I tracked it all the way. Well done, Buggy. There was a flurry of wings, and the buzzard landed on the battlements. And, er, uh, what is his name? Vimes added. The buzzard gave him the mad, distant look of all birds. She's Morak, sir. Trained by the Pixies. Wonderful bird. Was she the one we paid a crate of whiskey for? Yes, sir, and worth every dram. The pigeon struggled in Vimes's hand. You wait there, then, Buggy, and I'll get Reg to come out with some raw rabbit, he said, and walked into his tower. Sergeant Angua was waiting by his desk, reading the Living Testament of Nuggan. Is that a carrier pigeon, sir? she said as Vimes sat down. No, said Vimes. Hold it a minute, will you? I want to have a look inside the message capsule. It does look like a carrier pigeon, said Angua, putting down the book. Ah, but messages flying through the air are an abomination unto Nuggan, said Vimes. The prayers of the faithful bounce off them, apparently. No, I think I've found someone's lost pet, and I'm looking in this little tube here to see if I can find the owner's name and address, because I'm a kind man. So... You are not actually waylaying field reports from the Times, then, sir, said Angua, grinning. Not as such, no. I'm just such a keen reader that I want to see tomorrow's news today. And Mr. De Word seems to have a knack for finding things out. Angua, I want to stop these stupid people fighting so that we can all go home. And if that means allowing the occasional pigeon to have a crap on my desk, so be it. Oh, sorry, sir, I didn't notice. I expect it'll wipe off. Go and get Reg to find some rabbit for the buzzard, will you? When she'd gone, Vimes carefully unscrewed the end of the tube and pulled out a roll of very thin paper. He unfolded it, smoothed it out, and read the tiny writing, smiling as he did so. Then he turned the paper over and looked at the picture. He was still staring at it when Angua returned with Reg and half a bucket of crunchy rabbit bits. Anything interesting, sir, said Angua, ingenuously. Well... Yes, you could say that. All plans are changed, all bets are off. <laughs> oh, Mr. De Word, you poor fool. He handed her the paper. She read the story carefully. Good for them, sir, she said. Most of them look fifteen years old, and when you see the size of those dragoons, well, you've got to be impressed. Yes, yes, you could say that, you could say that, said Vimes, his face gleaming like a man with a joke to share. Tell me, did De Word interview any Boragravian high-ups when he arrived? No, sir. I understand he was turned away. They don't really know what a reporter is, so I gathered the adjutant threw him out and said he was a nuisance. Dear me, the poor man, said Vimes, still grinning. You met Prince Heinrich the other day. Describe him to me. Angua cleared her throat. Well, sir, he was largely green, shading to blue, with overtones of gross and a trail of... I meant describe him to me on the assumption that I'm not a werewolf who sees with his nose said Vimes. Oh, yes, said Angua. Sorry, sir. Six foot two, hundred and eighty pounds, fair hair, green-blue eyes, sabre scar on his left cheek, wears a monocle in his right eye, waxed moustache. Good. Well observed. And now look at Captain Horrence in the picture, will you? She looked again and said, very quietly, Oh, dear. 
They didn't know. He wasn't going to tell them, was he? Would they have seen a picture? Angua shrugged. I doubt it, sir. I mean, where would they see it? There's never been a newspaper here until the Times cart turned up last week. Some woodcut, maybe? No, they're an abomination, unless they're of the Duchess. So they really didn't know. And de Word has never seen him, said Vimes. But you saw him when we arrived the other day. What did you think of him, just between ourselves? An arrogant son of a bitch, sir, and I know what I'm talking about. The kind of man who thinks he knows what a woman likes, and it's himself. All very friendly right up until they say no. Stupid? I don't think so, but not as clever as he thinks he is. Right, because he didn't tell our writer friend his real name. Did you read the bit at the end? Angua read at the end of the text. Perry, the captain threatened and harangued me after the recruits had gone. Alas, I had no time to fish for the manacle key in the privy. Please let the prince know where they are soonest. W.D.W. Looks like William didn't take to him either, she said. I wonder why the prince was out with a scouting party. You said he was an arrogant son of a bitch, said Vimes. Maybe he just wanted to pop across and see if his arm was still breathing. His voice trailed off. Angua looked at Vimes's face, which was staring through her. She knew her boss. He thought war was simply another crime like murder. He didn't much like people with titles, and regarded being a duke as a job description rather than a lever to greatness. He had an odd sense of humour, and he had a sense for what she thought of as harbingers, those little straws in the wind that said there was a storm coming. In the nuddy, he chuckled. Could have slit their throats. Didn't. They took their boots away and left them to hop home in the nude. The squad, it seemed, had found a friend. She waited. I feel sorry for the Borogravians, he said. Me too, sir, said Angua. Oh, why? Their religion's gone bad on them. Have you seen the latest abominations? They abominate the smell of beets and people with red hair. In rather shaky writing, sir. And root vegetables are a staple here. Three years ago, it was abominable to grow root crops on ground which had grown grain or peas. Vimes looked blank, and she remembered that he was a city boy. It means no real crop rotation, sir, she explained. The ground sours, diseases build up. You were right when you said they were going mad. These commandments are dumb, and any farmer can see that. I imagine people go along with them as best they can, but sooner or later you either have to break them and feel guilty, or keep them and suffer. For no reason, sir. I've had a look around. They're very religious here, but their gods let them down. No wonder they mostly pray to their royal family. She watched him stare at the piece of pigeon post for a while, then he said, How far is it to plots? About fifty miles, said Angua, adding, as the wolf runs, maybe six hours. I can leave right away. Good. Buggy will keep an eye on you. Little Henry is going to hop home, or meet one of his patrols, or an enemy patrol, whatever. But the midden is going to hit the windmill when everyone sees that picture. I bet De Word would have let him out if he'd been nice and polite. That'll teach him to meddle with the awesome power of a fair and free press. <laughs> he sat upright and rubbed his hands together like a man who meant business. Now... Let's get that pigeon on its way again before it gets missed, eh? Get Reg to lurch along to where the Times people are staying and tell them their pigeon flew in the wrong window. Again. That was a good time, Polly remembered. They didn't go down to the river docks. They could see there was no boat there. They hadn't turned up, and the boatman had left without them. Instead, they crossed the bridge and headed up into the forests, with Blouse leading the way on his ancient horse. Maledict went on ahead, and... Jade brought up the rear. You didn't need a light at night when a vampire led the way, and a troll at the rear would certainly discourage hangers-on. No one mentioned the boat. No one spoke at all. The thing was... The thing was, Polly realised, that they were no longer marching alone. They shared the secret. That was a huge relief, and right now they didn't need to talk about it. Nevertheless, it was probably a good idea to keep up a regular output of farts, belches, nose-pickings and groin-scratchings just in case. Polly didn't know whether to be proud that they'd taken her for a boy. I mean, she thought, I'd worked hard to get it right. I mastered the walk. Except 
I suppose what I really did was mistress the walk. <laughs> I invented the fake shaving routine, and the others didn't even think of that. I haven't cleaned my fingernails for days, and I pride myself on being able to belch with the best of them. So, I mean, I was trying. It was just slightly annoying to find that she'd succeeded so well. After a few hours of this, when true dawn was breaking, they smelled smoke. There was a faint pall of it among the trees. Lieutenant Blouse raised a hand for them to halt, and Jackram joined him in whispered conversation. Polly stepped forward. Permission to whisper too, Sarge. I think I know what this is. Jackram and Blouse stared at her. Then the sergeant said, All right, Perks, go and find out if you're right then. That was an aspect that hadn't occurred to Polly, but she'd left herself open. Jackram relented when he saw her expression, nodded to Maledict and said, Go with him, Corporal. They left the squad behind and walked forward carefully over the beds of new fallen leaves. The smoke was heavy and fragrant, and above all, reminiscent. Polly headed to where thicker undergrowth was taking advantage of the extra light of a clearing, and pushed through into an airy thicket of hazel trees. The smoke was denser here, and barely moving. The thicket ended. A few yards away, in a wide patch of cleared ground, a mound, like a small volcano, was spewing flame and smoke into the air. "'Charcoal oven,' whispered Polly. "'Just clay, plastered on a stack of hazel. Should sit there smouldering for days. The wind probably caught it last night, and the fire's broken out. Won't make good charcoal now. It's burning too fast.' They edged around it, keeping to the bushes. Other clay domes were dotted around the clearing, with faint wisps of steam and smoke coming from their tops. There were a couple of ovens in the process of being built, the fresh clay stacked alongside some bundles of hazel sticks. There was a hut, and the domes, and nothing else but silence, apart from the crackle of the runaway fire. "'The charcoal burner's dead, or nearly dead,' said Polly. "'He's dead,' said Maledict. "'There is a smell of death here.' "'You can smell it about the smoke.' "'Sure,' said Maledict. "'Some things were really good at smelling.' "'But how did you know?' "'They watched the burns like hawks,' said Polly, staring at the hut. "'He wouldn't let it go out of control like that if he was alive. "'Is he in the hut?' "'They are in the hut,' said Maledict flatly. "'He set off across the smoky ground. "'Polly ran after him. "'Man and woman,' she said, "'their wives often live out with—' "'Can't tell, not if they're old,' said Maledict shortly. "'The hut was only a temporary thing.' made of woven hazel and roofed with tarpaulin. The charcoal burners moved around a lot, from coppice to coppice. It didn't have windows, but it did have a doorway, with a rag for a door. The rag had been pulled away. The doorway was dark. I've got to be a man about this, she thought. There was a woman on the bed, and a man lying on the floor. There were other details which the eyes saw, but the brain did not focus on. There was a great deal of blood. The couple had been old they would not grow older. Back outside, Polly took frantic mouthfuls of air. "'Do you think those cavalry men did it?' she said at last, and then realised that Maledict was shaking. "'Oh, the blood!' she said. "'I can deal with it. It's OK. I just have to get my mind right. It's OK.' He leaned against the hut, breathing heavily. "'OK, I'm fine,' he said. "'And I can't smell horses.' Why don't you use your eyes? Nice, soft mud everywhere after the rain, but no hoof prints. Plenty of footprints, though. We did it. Don't be silly. We were... The vampire had reached down and pulled something out of the fallen leaves. He rubbed the mud off it with a thumb. In thin, pressed brass, it was the flaming cheese badge of the ins and outs. But I thought we were the good guys, said Polly weakly. If we were guys, I mean... "'I think I need a coffee,' said the vampire. "'Deserters,' said Sergeant Jackram, ten minutes later. "'It happens.' He tossed the badge into the fire. "'But they were on our side,' said Shufty. "'So? Not everyone's a nice gentleman like you, Private Manacle,' said Jackram. "'Not after a few years of getting shot at and eating rat scubble. "'On the retreat from Krusk, I had no water for three days, "'and then fell on my face in a puddle of horse-piss.' A circumstance which did nothing for my feelings of goodwill toward my fellow man or horse. Something the matter, Corporal? Maledict was on his knees going through his pack with a distracted air. My cough is gone, Sarge. 
should have packed it properly then, said Jackram, unsympathetically. I did, Sarge. I washed out the engine and packed it up with the beanbag after supper last night. I know I did. I don't take coffee lightly. If someone else did, they're going to wish I'd never been born, growled Jackram, looking around at the rest of the squad. Anyone else lost anything? Eh, uh, I wasn't going to say anything, because I wasn't sure, Shafty volunteered. But my stuff looked as if it had been pulled about when I opened my pack just now. Oh, ho, said Jackram. Well, well, well. I'll say this once, lads. Pinching from your mates is a hanging offence, understood? Nothing breaks down morale faster than some sneaky little sod dipping into people's packs. And if I find out someone's been at it, I'll swing on their heels. He glared at the squad. I ain't going to demand that you all empty out your packs as if you was criminals, he said. But you'd better check that nothing's missing. Of course, one of you might have packed something that wasn't theirs by accident, okay? Packing in a rush, poor light, easy to do. In which case, you sort it out amongst yourselves, understand? Now I'm off to have a shave. Lieutenant Blouse is having a throw-up behind the shelter after a viewing of the corpses, poor chap. Polly rummaged desperately in her pack. She'd thrown things in any old how last night, but what she was frantically searching for was... not there. Despite the heat from the charcoal mounds, she shivered. The ringlets had gone. Feverishly, she tried to remember the events of yesterday evening. They'd just dumped their packs as soon as they were in the barracks, right? And Maledict had made himself some coffee at supper time. He'd washed and dried the little machine. There was a thin little wail. Wazza, the meagre contents of her pack spread around her, held up the coffee engine. It had been stamped almost flat. Boop, 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 she began. Polly's mind worked faster, like a mill wheel in a flood. Then everyone took their packs into the back room with all the mattresses, didn't they? And so they'd still be there when the squad fought the troopers. Oh, was said Shufti. Oh, dear. So who might have sneaked in through the back door? There was no one around except the squad and the cavalrymen. Perhaps someone wanted to watch and cause a little trouble on the way. Strappy, she said aloud. It must have been him. The little weasel ran into the cavalry and then snuck back to watch. He was dar damn well going through our packs out the back. Oh, come on, she added as they stared at her. Can you see was her stealing from anyone? Anyway, when did she have the chance? Wouldn't they have taken him prisoner? said Tonka, staring at the crushed machine in Wazza's shaking hands. If he'd whipped off his shako and jacket, he'd be just another stupid civilian, wouldn't he? Or he could say he was a deserter. He could make up some story, said Polly. You know how he was with Wazza. He went through my pack too, stole something of mine. What was it? said Shufty. Just something, okay? He just wanted to make trouble. She watched them, thinking. Sounds convincing, said Maledict, nodding abruptly. A little weasel. Okay, was. Just fish out the beans, and I'll do the best I can. There's no, no... B -b 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 Maledict put a hand over his eyes. No beans? He said. Please, has anyone got the beans? There was a general rummaging and a general lack of a result. No beans, moaned Maledict. He threw away the beans. Come on, lads, we've got to get the sentries posted, said Jackram, approaching. Sorted it all out, have you? Yes, Sarge. Oz thinks, Shifty began. It was all a bit of a mispacking, Sarge, said Polly quickly, anxious to keep away from anything connected with missing ringlets. Nothing to worry about. All sorted, Sarge. No problem. Nothing to worry anyone. Not a thing, Sarge. Jackram looked from the startled squad to Polly, and back, and back again. She felt his gaze bore into her, daring her to change her expression of mad, tense honesty. Yes, he said slowly. Right. Sort it out, eh? Well done, Perks. Attention! Officer present. Yes, yes, Sergeant, thank you. Oh, and I don't think we need to be too formal, said Blouse, who looked rather pale. Uh, a word with you when you have finished, if you please. And I think we should bury the, um, bodies. Jackram saluted. Right you are, sir. Two volunteers to dig a grave for those poor souls. Goom and Tute. 
What's he doing? Lofty was over by the blazing charcoal oven. She was holding a burning branch a foot or two from her face and turning it this way and that, watching the flames. I'll do it, Sarge, said Tonka, stepping beside Wazza. What are you, married? said Jackram. You are on guard, Halter. I doubt whoever did it will come back, but if they do, you sing out, right? You and Igor come with me and I'll show you your stations. No coffee, moaned Maledict. Foul muck anyway, said Jackram, walking away. A cup of hot sweet tea is a soldier's friend. Polly grabbed the kettle for blousy shaving water and hurried away. That was another thing you learned in the military. Look busy. Look busy, and no one worried too much about what you were busy at. Bloody, bloody Strappy. He'd got her hair. He'd try and use it against her if he could, that was certain. That'd be his style. What would he do now? Well, he'd want to keep away from Jackram, that'd be another certainty. He'd wait, somewhere. She'd have to, too. The squad had made camp upwind of the smoke. It was supposed to be a rest stop, since no one had got much sleep last night. But as Jackram handed out tasks, he reminded them, There is an old military saying which is, Hard luck for you. There was no question of using the woven hut, but there were a few tarpaulin-covered frames built to keep the coppiced wood dry. Those not given jobs to do lay down on the stacked piles of twigs, which were yielding and didn't smell, and were, in any case, better than the inhabited palaces back at the barracks. Blouse, as an officer, had a shelter to himself. Polly had stacked bundles of twigs to make a chair that was at least springy. Now she laid out his shaving things and turned to go. "'Could you shave me, Perks?' said the lieutenant. Fortunately, Polly's back was turned and he didn't see her expression. "'This damn hand is quite swollen, I'm afraid,' Blouse went on. "'I would not normally ask, but—' "'Yes, of course, sir,' said Polly, because there was no alternative. Well, now, let's see. She'd got quite good at scraping a blunt razor across a face bare of hair, yes. Oh, and she'd shaved a few dead pigs in the kitchens of the Duchess, but that was only because nobody likes hairy bacon. They didn't really count, did they? Panic rose, and rose faster at the sight of Jackram approaching. She was going to cut an officer's throat in the presence of a sergeant. Well, when in doubt, bustle, military rule bustle and hope there's a surprise attack. Are you not being a little strict with the men, Sergeant? said Blouse as Polly flapped a towel around his neck. Not, sir. Keep them occupied, that's the bunny. Otherwise they'll mope, said Jackram confidently. Yes, but they have just seen a couple of badly mutilated bodies, said Blouse and shuddered. Good practice for them, sir. They'll see plenty more. Polly turned to the shaving gear she'd laid out on a towel. Let's see. Cutthroat razor, oh dear. The grey stone for coarse sharpening, the red stone for fine sharpening, the soap, the brush, the bowl. Well, at least she knew how to make foam. Deserters, Sergeant. Bad business, Blouse went on. You always get them, sir. That's why the pay is always late. Walking away from three months' back pay makes a man think twice. Mess at a word, the newspaper man said there had been a great many desertions, Sergeant. It is very strange that so many men would desert from a winning side. Polly whirled the brush vigorously. Jackram, for the first time since Maledict had joined, looked uncomfortable. But whose side's he on, sir? he said. Sergeant, I am sure you are not a stupid man, said Blouse, as behind him foam poured over the edge of the bowl and flopped onto the floor. There are desperate deserters abroad. Our borders appear to be sufficiently unguarded that enemy cavalry operate forty miles inside our fair country. And High Command appears to be so desperate, yes, desperate, Sergeant, that even half a dozen untrained and frankly very young men must go to the front. The foam had a life of its own now. Polly hesitated. Hot towel first, please, Parks, said Blouse. Yes, sir, sorry, sir, I forgot, sir, said Polly, panic rising. She had a vague recollection of walking past the barber shop in months. Hot towel on face, right. She grabbed a small towel, tipped boiling water onto it, wrung it out, and dropped it on the lieutenant's face. He did not actually scream as such. Ah, ah, something else worries me, Sergeant. Yes, sir. The cavalry must have apprehended Corporal Strappy. I cannot see how else they found out about our men. Good thinking, sir said the sergeant, 
watching Polly apply the lava across Blouse's mouth and nose. "'I do hope they didn't torture the poor man,' said the lieutenant. Jackram was silent on that issue, but meaningfully so. Polly wished he wouldn't keep glancing at her. "'But why would a deserter f head straight for the front?' said Blouse. "'Makes sense, sir, for an old soldier, especially a political.' "'Really?' "'Trust me on that, sir,' said Jackram. Behind Blouse, Polly brushed the razor up and down the red stone. It was already as slick as ice. "'But our boys, Sergeant, are not old soldiers. It takes <coughs> two weeks to turn a recruit into a fighting man,' said the lieutenant. "'They're promising material, sir. I could do it in a couple of days, sir,' said Jackram. "'Perks!' Polly nearly sliced her thumb off. "'Yes, Sarge?' she quavered. "'Do you think you could kill a man today?' Polly glanced at the razor. The edge glowed. "'I'm sorry to say I think I could, sir.' "'There you have it, sir,' said Jackram, with a lopsided grin. "'There's something about these lads, sir. They are quick.' He walked behind Blouse, took the razor from Polly's grateful hand without a word, and said, "'There's a few matters we ought to discuss, sir, private-like. I think Perks here ought to get some rest.' "'Of course, Sergeant. Part of all they sold at Jean, eh?' "'And them too, sir,' said Jackram. "'You're dismissed, Perks.' Polly walked away, her right hand still trembling. Behind her she heard Blouse sigh and say, "'These are tricky times, Sergeant. Command has never been so burdensome. "'The great General Tacticus says that in dangerous times "'the commander must be like the eagle and see the whole, "'yet still be like the hawk and see every detail.' "'Yes, sir,' said Jackram, gliding the razor down a cheek. "'And if he acts like a common tit, sir, "'he can hang upside down all day and eat fat bacon.' "'Er, uh, well said, Sergeant.' "'The charcoal burner and his wife were buried "'to the accompaniment of, to Polly's lack of surprise, "'a small prayer from Wazza. "'It asked the Duchess to intercede with the god Nuggan "'to give eternal rest and similar items to the departed. "'Polly had heard it many times before,' She'd wondered how the process worked. She'd never prayed since the day the bird burned, not even when her mother was dying. A god that burned painted birds would not save a mother. A god like that was not worth a prayer. But Wazza prayed for everyone. Wazza prayed like a child, eyes screwed up and hands clenched until they were white. The reedy little voice trembled with such belief that Polly felt embarrassed, and then ashamed, and finally, after the ringing Amen, amazed that the world appeared no different than before. For a minute or two, it had been a better place. There was a cat in the hut. It cowered under the crude bed and spat at anyone who came close. All the food's been taken, but there's carrots and parsnips in a little garden down the hill a bit, Shufty said as they walked away. It'd be stealing for the dead, said Wazza. Well, if they object, they can hold on, can't they? said Shufty. They're underground already. For some reason that was, at this time, funny. They'd have laughed at anything. Now there was Jade, Lofty, Shufty, and Polly. Everyone else was on guard duty. They sat by a fire on which a small pot seethed. Lofty tended the fire. She always seemed more animated near a fire, Polly noticed. I'm doing horse scubble for the Rupert, said Shufty, easily dropping into a slang learned all of twenty hours ago. He specifically asked for it. Got lots of dry horse jerky from three parts, but Tonka says she can knock over some pheasants while she's on duty. I hope she spends some time watching for enemies too, said Polly. She'll be careful, said Lofty, prodding the fire with a stick. You know, if we're found out, we'll be beaten and sent back, said Shifty. Oh, boy, said Polly. So suddenly she surprised herself. By whom? Who's going to try out here? Who cares out here? Well, er, uh, wearing men's clothes is an abomination unto Nuggan. Why? It just is, said Shufty firmly. But you're wearing them, said Polly. Well, it was the only way, said Shufty, and I tried them on and they didn't seem all that abominable to me. Have you noticed the men talk to you differently, said Lofty, shyly. Talk, said Polly. They listen to you differently too. They don't keep looking at you all the time, said Shufty. You know what I mean? You're just another person. If a girl walked down the street wearing a sword, a man would try to take it off her. Which holes? 
We ain't allowed to carry clubs, said Jade. Only large rocks. And it ain't right for a girl to wear lichen, cos the boys say bald is modest. Had to rub bird doings into my head to grow this lot. That was quite a long speech for a troll. Uh, we didn't know that, said Polly. Um, trolls all look the same to us, more or less. I'm naturally craggy, said Jade. I don't see why I should polish. There is a difference, said Shufty. I think it's the socks. It's like they pull you forward all the time. It's like the whole world spins around your socks. She sighed and looked at the horse meat, which had been boiled almost white. It's done, she said. You'd better go and give it to the Rupert, Polly. I mean, Ozza. I told the Sarge I could do something better, but he said the lieutenant said how good it was last night. A small wild turkey, a brace of pheasants, and a couple of rabbits, all tied together, landed in front of Shufty. "'Good job we were guarding you, eh?' said Tonka, grinning and whirring an empty sling around in one hand. "'One rock, one lunch. Maledict's staying on guard. He said he'll smell anyone before they see him, and he's too edgy to eat. What can you do with that lot?' "'Casserole of game,' said Shufty firmly. "'We've got the veg, and have still got half an onion.' "'A woman?' always has half an onion left over, no matter what the size of the onion, the dish, or the woman. I'm sure I can make an oven out of one of those... On your feet, attention! snapped the silently moving Jackram behind them. He stood back with a faint smile on his face as they scrambled to their feet. Private Halter, I must have bleeding amazing eyesight, he said when they were approximately upright. Yes, Sarge, said Tonka, staring straight ahead. Can you guess why, Private Halter? No, Sarge. It's because I knows you are on perimeter guard, Holter, but I can see you as clear as if you were standing right here in front of me, Holter. Can't I, Holter? Yes, Sarge. It's just as well you are still on perimeter duty, Holter, because the penalty for absenting yourself from your post in time of war is death, Holter. Are you only... No onlys. I don't want to hear no onlys. I don't want you to think that I am a shouty man, Holter. Corporal Strappy was a shouty man, but he was a damn political. Upon my oath, I am not a shouty man, but if you ain't back at your post inside of thirty seconds, I'll rip your tongue out. Tonka fled. Sergeant Jackram cleared his throat and continued in a level voice. This, my lads, is what we call a real orientation lecture, not one of the fancy political ones like Strappy gave you. He cleared his throat again. The purpose of this lecture is to let you know where we are. We are in the deep cack. It couldn't be worse if it was raining arseholes. Any questions? Since there were none from the bemused recruits, he continued, while beginning a slow stroll around the squad. We know enemy forces are in the area. Currently they have no boots. But there will be others with boots aplenty. Also there may be deserters in the area. They will not be nice people. They will be impolite. Therefore, Lieutenant Blouse has decreed that we will travel off the roads and by night. Yes, we have met the enemy, and we have prevailed. That was a fluke. They weren't expecting you to be rough, tough soldiers. Nor were you, so I don't want you to feel cocky about it. He leaned forward until his face was inches from Polly's. Are you feeling cocky, Private Perks? No, Sarge. Good. Good. Jackram stepped back. We are heading for the front, lads. The war. And in a nasty war, where's the best place to be? Apart from on the moon, of course. No one? Slowly, Jade raised a hand. Go on, then, said the sergeant. In the army, Sarge, said the troll. Cause? She began to count on her fingers. One... You got weapons and armour and debt. Two. You are surrounded by other armed men. Uh, many. You's getting paid and getting better grub than the people in civilian street. Uh, lots. If and you gives up, you getting taken prisoner and there's rules about that, like not kicking prisoners in her head and stuff, cause if you kick their prisoners in her head, they'll kick your prisoners in her head. So that's 
like you're kicking your own head, but there's no rule says you can't kick enemy civilians in a head. There's other stuff too, but I ran out of numbers. She gave them a diamond grin. We may be slow, but we ain't stupid, she added. I am impressed, Private, said Jackram, and you are right. The only wasp in the jam is that you ain't soldiers. But I can help you there. Being a soldier is not hard. If it was, soldiers would not be able to do it. There is only three things you need to remember, which are viz. One, obey orders. Two, give it to the enemy good and hard. Three, don't die. Got that? Right. You're nearly there. Well done. I propose to assist you in the execution of all three. You are my little lads, and I will look after you. In the meantime, you've got duties. Shufti, get cooking. Private Perks, see to the Rupert. And after that, practice your shaving. I will now visit those on guard, and deliver unto them the holy word. Dis missed. They remained at something like attention, until he was probably out of earshot, and then sagged. Why does he always shout? said Shufti. I mean, he only has to ask. Polly appended the horrible scubbo into a tin bowl and almost ran to the lieutenant's shelter. He looked up from a map and smiled at her as if she was delivering a feast. Ah, scubbo, he said. We are actually having other stuff, sir, Polly volunteered. I'm sure there's enough to go round. Good heavens, no. No, it's been years since I've had food like this, said Blouse, picking up the spoon. Of course, at school we didn't appreciate it so much. You had food like this at school, sir? said Polly. Yes, most days, said Blouse happily. Polly couldn't quite fit this in her head. Blouse was a knob. Knobs ate knobby food, didn't they? Had you done something bad, sir? I can't imagine what you mean, Perks, said Blouse, slurping at the horrible thin gruel. Are the men rested? Yes, sir. The dead people were a bit of a shock. Yes, bad business, sighed the lieutenant. Such is war, alas. I'm only sorry you had to learn so fast. Such a terrible waste all the time. I'm sure things can be sorted out when we reach Connect, though. No general can expect young men like yourselves to be instant soldiers. I shall have something to say about that. His rabbity features looked unusually determined, as if a hamster had spotted a gap in its treadmill. Do you require me for anything else, sir? said Polly. Ah, uh, do the men talk about me, Perks? Not really, sir, no. The lieutenant looked disappointed. No. Oh. Oh, well. Thank you, Perks. Polly wondered if Jackram ever slept. She did a spell of guard duty, and he stepped out from behind her with, Guess who, Perks? You're on lookout. You should see the dreadful enemy before they see you. What are the four S's? Shape, shadow, silhouette, and shine, Sarge, said Polly, snapping to attention. She'd been expecting this. That caused a moment's pause from the sergeant before he said, Just knew that, did you? No, sir. A little bird told me when we changed guards, sir. Said you'd asked him, sir. Oh, so. Jackram's little lads are ganging up on their kindly old sergeant, are they? Said Jackram. No, sir. Sharing information important to the squad in a vital survival situation, Sarge. You've got a quick mouth on you, Perks. I'll grant you that. Thank you, Sarge. But I see you're not standing in a bleeding shadow, Perks. Nor have you done anything to change your bleeding shape. You're silhouetted against a bleeding light and your sabres shining like a diamond in a chimney sweeps bleeding air all. Explain! It's because of the one sea, Sarge, said Polly, still staring straight ahead. And that is? Colour, Sarge. I'm wearing bleeding red and white in a bleeding grey forest, Sarge. She risked a sideways glance. In Jackram's little piggy eyes there gleamed a gleam. It was the one they had when he was secretly pleased. "'Ashamed of your lovely, lovely uniform, Perks,' he said. "'Don't want to be seen dead in it, Sarge,' said Polly. "'Ha! As you were, Perks!' Polly smiled straight ahead. When she came off guard for a bowl of game casserole, Jackram was teaching basic swordcraft to Lofty and Tonka, using hazel sticks as swords. By the time Polly had finished, he was teaching Wazza some of the finer points of using a high-performance pistol crossbow especially the one about not turning around with it cocked and saying, Well, 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 what's this bit for, Sarge? 
Wasser handled weapons like a house-proud woman disposing of a dead mouse, at arm's length and trying not to look. But even she was better with them than Igor, who just didn't seem at home with the idea of what was, to him, randomised surgery. Jade was dozing. Maledict was hanging by his knees under the roof of one of the sheds, with his arms folded across his chest. He must have been telling the truth when he said that there were some aspects of being a vampire that were hard to give up. Igor and Maledict. She still wasn't sure about Maledict, but Igor had to be a boy with those stitches around the head, and that face that could only be called homely. And even then it was the kind of home that has a burned-out vehicle on the lawn. He was quiet and neat, but maybe that's how Igor's behaved. She woke up with Shufti shaking her. We're moving! Better go and see to the Rupert! What? Oh, oh, right! There was a bustle all around her. Polly staggered to her feet and hurried over to Lieutenant Blouse's shed, where he was standing in front of his wretched horse and holding the bridle with a lost expression. Ah, Perks, he said. I'm not at all sure I'm doing this right. No, sir. You've got the waffles twisted and the snuffles are upside down, said Polly, who'd often helped in the inn's yard. Ah, that would be why he was so difficult last night, said Blouse. I suppose I ought to know this sort of thing, but at home we had a man to do it. Let me, sir, said Polly. She untwisted the bridle with a few careful movements. What's his name, sir? Thalocephalos, said Blouse sheepishly. That was the legendary stallion of General Tacticus, you know. I didn't know that, sir, said Polly. She leaned back and glanced between the horse's rear legs. Wow! Blouse really was short-sighted, wasn't he? The mare looked at her partly with its eyes, which were small and evil, but mostly with its yellowing teeth, of which it had an enormous amount. She had the impression that it was thinking about sniggering. I'll hold him for you while you mount, sir, she said. Thank you. He certainly moves about a bit when I try. I expect he does, sir, said Polly. She knew about difficult horses. This one had all the hallmarks of a right bastard, one of those not cowed at all by the obvious superiority of the human race. The mare eyeballed and yellow-toothed her as Blouse mounted, but Polly had positioned herself carefully away from the uprights of the shelter. Phalocephalos wasn't the sort to buck and kick. She was the sneaky kind, Polly could see, the sort that stepped on your foot. She moved her foot just as the hoof came down, but Thalocephalos, angry at being thwarted, turned, twisted, lowered her head, and bit Polly sharply on the rolled-up socks. "'Bad horse!' said Blouse severely. "'Sorry about that, Perks. I think he's anxious to get to the fray. Oh, my word!' he added, looking down. "'Are you all right, Perks?' "'Well, he's pulling a bit, sir,' said Polly, being dragged sideways. Blouse had gone white again. "'But he's bitten. Uh, he, he's caught you by the, uh, right on the—' The penny dropped. Polly looked down and hastily remembered what she'd heard during numerous rule-free bar fights. "'Oh! Ah! Oh! Ah! Blimey! Right in a fruit! Ah! Oh!' she lamented, and then, since it seemed a good idea at the time, brought both fists down heavily on the mare's nose. The lieutenant fainted. It took some time to bring Blouse round, but at least it gave Polly time to think. He opened his eyes and focused on her. Er, uh, you fell off your horse, sir, Polly volunteered. Parks, are you all right? Dear boy, he had you by the... Only needs a few stitches, sir, said Polly cheerfully. What? From Igor? No, sir, just the cloth, sir, said Polly. The trousers are a bit big for me, sir. Ah, right, too big, eh? Phew, eh? Ha, near miss there, eh? Well, I mustn't lie around here all day. The squad helped him on to Thalocephalos, who was still sniggering unrepentantly. On the subject of too big, Polly made a mental note to see about his jacket next time they stopped. She wasn't much good with a needle, but if Igor couldn't do something to make it look better, then he wasn't the man she thought he was. And that was a sentence that begged a question. Jackram bellowed them into order. They were better at that now. Neater, too. All right, sins and outs. Tonight we... A set of huge yellow teeth removed his cap. Oh, I do apologise, Sergeant, said Blouse behind him, trying to rein back the mare. No bother, sir, these things happen, said Jackram, furiously tugging his hat back. I should like to address my men, Sergeant. Oh? Er, uh, yes, sir. 
said Jackram, looking worried. Of course, sir. Ins and outs. A ten, wait for it. Shun. Blyers coughed. Er, uh, <clears throat> men, he said. As you know, we must make all speed to the Connect Valley, where, apparently, we are needed. Travelling by night will prevent entanglements. Er, uh, I... He stared at them, his face contorted by some inner struggle. Ah, uh, I have to say, I don't think we are... That is, all the evidence is... Uh, it doesn't seem to me that... Um, I think I should tell you... Um, permission to speak, sir, said Polly. Are you feeling all right? We just have to hope that those put in power over us are making right decisions, mumbled Blouse. But I have every confidence in you, and I'm sure you will do your best. Long live the Duchess. Carry on, Sergeant Jackram. Ins and outs. Form up. March. And they headed into the dusk and off to war. About half an hour after the squad had left, the charcoal burner's cat ventured very cautiously back into the hut. It liked the hut. It got fed there. It watched, with suspicion, a stub of candle that had been lit and put very carefully on a pile of straw and dried bracken between the makeshift beds. Its ears flattened as the shrinking candle flared and the waxy straw around it began to crackle. By the time the hut was a mass of flame, the cat was on the other side of the clearing, moving fast. The order of march was ours last night, with maledict going on ahead. The clouds were holding in some heat and were thin enough to hint at moonlight here and there. Forests by night held no problems for Polly anyway, and this wasn't true wild forest in any case. Nor was it, in truth, a march that they were doing. It was more like a high-speed creep in ones and twos. She'd acquired two of the horse bows, now stuck awkwardly between the straps of her pack. They were horrible things, rather like a cross between a small crossbow and a clock. There were mechanisms in the thick shaft, and the bow itself was barely six inches across. Somehow, if you leaned your weight on it, you could cock it with enough stored energy to fire a nasty little metal arrow through an inch-thick plank. They were blued metal, sleek and evil. But there is an old military saying, Better me firing it at you than you firing it at me, you bastard. Polly eased her way along the line until she was walking alongside Igor. He nodded to her in the gloom and then turned his attention to walking. He needed to because his pack was twice the size of the rest of them. No one felt inclined to ask him what was in it. Sometimes you thought you could hear liquid sloshing. Igor's sometimes passed through Munns, although technically they were an abomination in the eyes of Nuggan. It had seemed to Polly that using bits of someone who was dead to help three or four other people stay alive was a sensible idea. But in the pulpit, Father Jupe had argued that Nuggan didn't want people to live. He wanted them to live properly. There had been general murmurs of agreement from the congregation, but Polly knew for a fact that there were a couple of people sitting there with a hand or arm or leg that was a little less tanned or a little more hairy than the other one. There were lumberjacks everywhere in the mountains. Accidents happened. Fast, sudden accidents. And, since there were not many jobs for a one-armed lumberjack, men went off and found an Igor to do what no amount of prayer could manage. The Igors had a motto. What goes around comes around. You didn't have to pay them back. You had to pay them forward. And that, frankly, was the bit where people got worried. When you were dying, an Igor would mysteriously arrive on the doorstep and request that he be allowed to take away any bits urgently needed by others on his little list. He'd be quite happy to wait until the priest had gone, and it was said, when the time came, he'd do very neat work. However, it happened quite often that when an Igor turned up, the prospective donor took fright and turned to Nuggan who liked whole people, in which case the Igor would quietly and politely leave and never come back. He'd never come back to the whole village, or the whole lumber camp, nor would other Igors. What goes around, comes around, or stops. As far as Polly could tell, Igors believed that the body was nothing more than a more complicated kind of clothing. Oddly enough, that's what Nuggenites thought too. "'Glad you joined, Igor,' said Polly as they jogged along. "'Yes, of. "'Could you take a look at the Rupert's hand next time we stop, please? "'He cut it badly. "'Yes, of. "'Can I ask you something, Igor?' "'Yes, Oz?' 
What are female Igors called, Igor? Igor stumbled and kept moving. He was silent for a while and then said, All right, what did I do wrong? Sometimes you forget to lisp, said Polly, but mostly it's just a feeling. Little things about the way you move, maybe. The word you're looking for is Igorina, said Igorina. We don't lisp as much as the boys. It's a style thing. They continued in more silence until Polly said, I thought it was bad enough cutting my hair. The stitches, said Igorina. I can have them out in five minutes. They're just for show. Polly hesitated, but after all, Igor's had to be trustworthy, didn't they? You didn't cut your hair? Actually, I just removed it, said Igorina. I put mine in my pack, Polly went on, trying not to look at the stitches around Igorina's head. So did I, said Igorina, in a jar. It's still growing. Polly swallowed. You needed a lack of graphic imagination to talk about personal issues with an Igor. Mine was stolen back at the barracks. I'm sure it was strappy, she said. Oh, dear. I hate to think of him with it. Why did you bring it? And that was the question. She'd planned. And she'd been good at planning. She'd fooled the rest of them even. She'd been cool and sensible, and she hadn't felt more than a faint pang at cutting off her hair. And she'd brought it with her. Why? She could have thrown it away. It wasn't magic. It was just hair. She could have thrown it away, just like that, easily. But... but... Ah, right. The maids could have found it. That was it. She had to get it out of the house quickly. Right. And then she could bury it somewhere when she was a long way away. Right. But she hadn't, had she? She'd been very busy. Right, said the little voice in inner treachery. She had been very busy fooling everyone but herself, right? What could Strappy do? said Igorina. Dracrim would knock him over a moment he saw him. He's a deserter and a thief. Yes, but he could tell someone, said Polly. OK, then say it's a lock of hair from the sweetheart you left behind you. Lots of soldiers carry a locket or something like that. You know, her golden hair in Linglet's fair, like the song says. It was all my hair. A locket? You couldn't hold it all in your hat. Ah, said Igorina. Then you could say you loved her very much. Despite everything, Polly started to laugh and couldn't stop herself. She bit her sleeve and tried to keep going with her shoulders shaking. Something that felt like a small tree prodded her in the back. You two ought to keep the noise down, rumbled Jade. Sorry, sorry, hissed Polly. Igorina started to hum. Polly knew the song. I'm lonesome since I crossed the hill and o'er the moor and valley. And she vowed, not that one too. One song is enough, and I want to leave the girl behind me. But it seems I brought her with me instead. At which point they emerged from the trees and saw the red glow. The rest of the squad were already gathered around watching it. It covered quite a lot of the horizon and brightened and faded in places as they watched. Is that owl? said Wazza. No, but men have made it so, I fear, said the lieutenant. That is the Connect Valley. It's on fire, sir, said Polly. Bless you, that's just the light of cooking fires reflected off the clouds, said Sergeant Jackram. Always looks bad by night, Sir Battlefield. Not to worry, lads. What are they cooking, elephants? said Maledict. And what's that? said Polly, pointing to a nearby hill, darker still against the night. On it, a little light was flickering on and off very fast. There was a whoosh and a metallic pop as Blouse pulled out a small telescope and opened it up. It's a light, Clax, the devils, he said. There's another one over there, rumbled Jade, pointing to a hill a lot further away. Twinkle, twinkle. Polly stared at the redness in the sky, and then at the cold little light winking on and off. Quiet, soft light. Harmless light. And behind it, a burning sky. It'll be in code, said Blouse. Spies, I'll be bound. A light clacks, 
said Tonka. What's that? An abomination in the eyes of Nuggan, said Blaz. Unfortunately, because they'd be damn useful if we could have them too, eh, Sergeant? Yes, sir, said Jackram automatically. The only messages passing through the air should be the prayers of the faithful. Praise Nuggan, praise the Duchess, and so on and so forth, said Blouse, squinting. He sighed. Such a shame. How far to that hill would you say, Sergeant? Two miles, sir, said Jackram. Worth trying to sneak up? They must know people will see them and come looking, so I expect they won't hang around for long, mused Blouse. In any case, uh, those things will be highly directional. You'd lose it once you got down in the valley. Permission to speak, sir? said Polly. Of course, said Blouse. How do they get the light so bright, sir? It's pure white. Some kind of firework thingy, I believe. Why? And they send messages with light? Yes, Perks, and your point is? And the people who get those messages send messages back the same way, Polly persevered. Yes, Perks, that is the whole idea. Then, maybe we don't have to go all the way to that hill, sir. The light is being aimed towards us, sir. They all turned. The hill they were skirting loomed above them. Well done, Perks, Blaz whispered. Let's go, Sergeant. He swung himself off the horse, which automatically stepped sideways to make sure that he fell over when he landed. Right you are, sir, said Jackram, helping him up. Maledict, you take Goom and Halter and circle around to the left. The rest go round to the right. Not you, Carborundum, no offence, but this has got to be quiet, OK? You stay here. Perks, you come with me. I shall come too, Sergeant, said Blouse, and only Polly saw Jackram grimace. Good idea, sir, said the Sergeant. I suggest you... I suggest Perks and I come with you. Everyone got that? Get to the top, neat and quiet, and no one, no one moves until you hear my signal. My signal, said Blouse firmly. That's what I meant, sir. Quick and quiet. Hit them hard, but I want at least one left alive. Go. The two teams fanned out to right and left and disappeared. The sergeants gave them a minute or two's start, and then set off with unusual speed for a man of his girth, so that for a moment Polly and the lieutenant were left standing. Behind them, a dejected jade watched them go. The trees thinned out on the steep slope, but not enough for much underbrush to get a hold. Polly found it easier to go on all fours, grabbing at tufts and saplings to steady herself. After a while, she caught a whiff of smoke, chemical and acrid. She was sure, too, that she could hear a faint clicking noise. A tree extended a hand and pulled her into its shadow. "'Don't you say a bleeding word,' hissed Jackram. "'Where's the Rupert?' "'Don't know, Sarge.' "'Damn! You can't let a Rupert run around loose.' There's no telling what he might take it into his little head to do, now that he's got the idea he's in charge. You're his minder. Find him. Polly slithered back down the slope and found Blouse steadying himself against a tree, wheezing gently. Ah, Perks, he panted. My asthma seems to be uh, coming back. I'll help you up, sir, said Polly, grabbing his hand and tugging him forward. Could you wheeze a little quieter, sir? By degrees, dragging and pushing, she bundled the man up to Jackram's tree. "'Glad you could join us, sir,' hissed the sergeant, face contorted into an expression of maddened affability. "'If you'd care to wait here, Perks and me will crawl up the—' "'I'm coming too, sergeant,' Blouse insisted. Jackram hesitated. "'Yes, sir,' he said. "'But with respect, sir, I know about skirmishing.' "'Let's go, sergeant,' said Blouse, dropping flat and beginning to drag himself forward. Yes, sir, muttered Jackram darkly. Polly eased her way forward, too. The grass here was shorter, rabbit nibbled, with small bushes here and there. She concentrated on keeping the noise down and aimed for the clicking. The smell of chemical smoke grew stronger. It hung in the air around her, and as she moved forward, she saw light, little specks of it. She raised her head. There were three men a few feet away, silhouetted against the night. One of them was holding a large pipe about five feet long, balanced on his shoulder at one end and on a tripod at the other. That end was aimed at the distant hill. On the other end, a foot or so behind the man's head, was a big square box. Light was leaking from joints in this. From a little stovepipe chimney on the top of it, heavy smoke poured out. Perks, on the count of three, said Jackram on Polly's right, 
One, as you were, Sergeant, said Blouse quietly on her left. Polly saw Jackram's big florid face turn with an expression of astonishment. Sir? Hold position, said Blouse. Above them the clicking continued. Military secrets, thought Polly. Spies. Enemies. And we're just watching. It was like seeing blood drain from an artery. Sir? hissed Jackram, rage smoking off him. Hold position, Sergeant. That is an order, said Blouse calmly. Jackram subsided, but only into the deceptive calm of a volcano waiting to explode. The relentless chatter of the clacks went on. It seemed to go on for ever. Beside Polly, Sergeant Jackram seized and fretted like a dog on a leash. The clicking stopped. Polly heard a distant murmur of conversation. "'Sergeant Jackram,' whispered Blouse, "'you may get them with all speed.' Jackram exploded out of the grass like a partridge. "'All right, my lads. Up, boys, and at them. Polly's first thought, as she leapt up and ran, was that the distance was suddenly a lot wider than it had appeared. All three men had turned at the sound of Jackram's cry. The one with the clax tube was already dropping it and reaching for a sword, but Jackram was bearing down on him like a landslide. The man made the mistake of standing his ground. There was a brief clash of swords, and then a melee, and Sergeant Jackram was a sufficiently deadly melee all by himself. The second man flew past Polly, but she was running for the third one. He backed away from her, reaching up to his mouth, then turned to run, and found himself face to face with Maledict. "'Don't let him swallow!' Polly yelled. Maledict's arm shot up and lifted the struggling man aloft by his throat. It would have been a perfect operation had not the rest of the squad arrived, having put all their effort into running and leaving none of it to spare for slowing down. There were collisions. Maledict went down as his captive kicked him in the chest, and the man tried to scramble away, cannoning into Tonka. Polly leapt over Igorina, was almost tripped by a fallen wazzer, and threw herself desperately toward the quarry, now on his knees. He had a dagger out and waved it wildly in front of her, while he grasped his throat with his other hand and made choking noises. She knocked the knife away, ran behind him, and slapped him on the back as hard as she could. He fell forward. Before she could grab him, a hand lifted him bodily, and Jackram's voice roared, "'Can't have the poor man choking to death, Perks!' His other hand punched the man in the stomach with a noise like meat hitting a slab. The man's eyes crossed, and something large and white flew out of his mouth and shot over Jackram's shoulder. Jackram dropped him and turned on Blouse. "'Sir, I protest, sir!' he said, quivering with anger. "'We lay there and watched these devils sending who knows what messages, sir. Spies, sir. We could have got them right there and then, sir.' "'And then, Sergeant,' said Blouse. "'What?' Don't you think the people they were talking to would wonder what had happened if the messages had stopped in mid-flow? said the lieutenant. Even so, sir. Whereas now we have their device, sergeant, and their masters don't know we have it, said Blouse. Yeah, well, but you said they were sending messages in code, sir, and er, I think we have their cipher book as well, Sarge, said Maledict, stepping forward with the white object in his hand. That man tried to eat it, Sarge. Rice paper. But he rushed his food, you might say. And you dislodged it, Sergeant, and probably saved his life. Well done, said Blaz. But one of them got away, sir, said Jackram. He'll soon get to... Sergeant. Jade was rising over the grass. As she plodded nearer, they saw she was dragging a man by one foot. When she got closer, it became obvious that the man was dead. Living people have more head. I heard the shouting, and he came running, and I jumped up, and he came straight into me at first, Jade complained. I didn't even get a chance to hit him. Well, Private, at least we can definitely say he was stopped, said Blouse. Far, this man is dying, said Igorina, who was kneeling by the man Sergeant Jackram had so positively saved from choking. He hath been poisoned. Hath he? By whom? said Blouse. Are you sure? The green foam coming out of his mouth is a definite clue, sir. What's funny, Private Maledict? said Blouse. The vampire chuckled. Oh, sorry, sir. They say to spies, 
if you're caught, eat the documents, don't they? A good way of making sure they don't give away any secrets. But you've got the soggy book in your hands, Private. Vampires can't be poisoned that easily, sir, said Maledict calmly. It was probably only fatal by mouth in any case, sir, said Igorina. Terrible stuff. Stuff. He's dead, sir. Nothing I can do. Poor fellow. Well, we have the codes anyway, said Blouse. This is a great discovery, men. And a prisoner, sir. And a prisoner, said Jackram. The one surviving man who had been operating the clacks groaned and tried to move. A bit bruised, I expect, Jackram added with some satisfaction. When I land on someone, sir, they stay landed on. Two of you, bring him with us, said Blouse. Sergeant, there's a few hours to dawn, and I want to be well away from here. I want the other two buried somewhere down in the woods, and... You just have to say, carry on, Sergeant, sir, said Jackram, and it was almost a wail. That's how it works, sir. You tell me what you want, I give them the orders. Times are changing, Sergeant, said Blouse. Messages flying across the sky. They were an abomination unto Nuggan. The logic sounded impeccable to Polly as she helped Wazza to dig two graves. Prayers from the faithful ascended unto Nuggan, going upwards. A variety of unseen things, such as sanctity and grace, and a list of this week's abominations, descended from Nuggan to the faithful, going downwards. What was forbidden was messages from one human to another going, as it were, sideways. There could be collisions, if you believe in Nuggan, that is, if you believed in prayer. Wazza's real name was Alice, she confided as she dug, but it was hard to apply the name to a small, stick-thin lad with a bad haircut and not much skill with a shovel, who had a habit of standing just slightly too close to you and stared just slightly to the left of your face when she talked to you. Wazza believed in prayer. She believed in everything. That made her kind of awkward to talk to if you didn't. But Polly felt she should make the effort. "'How old are you, Was? she said, shoveling dirt. But nineteen, Polly,' said Wazza. "'Why'd you join?' "'The Duchess told me to,' said Wazza. That was why people didn't talk to Wazza much. "'Was, you do know that wearing men's clothes is an abomination, don't you?' "'Thank you for reminding me, Polly,' said Wazza, without a trace of irony. "'But the Duchess told me that nothing I do will be held abominable in pursuit of my quest.' "'A quest, eh?' said Polly, trying to sound jovial. "'And what kind of quest is that?' "'I'm to take command of the army,' said Wazza. Hairs rose on the back of Polly's neck. "'Yes,' she said. "'Yeah, the Duchess stepped out of her picture when I was asleep, "'and she told me to go at once to Connect," said Wazza. "'The little mother spoke to me, Oz. "'She commanded me. "'She guides my steps. "'She led me out of vile slavery.' How can that be an abomination? She's got a sword, thought Polly, and a shovel. This needs careful handling. That's nice, she said. And, and I must tell you that I never in my life have I felt such love and camaraderie, Wazza went on earnestly. These few days have been the happiest of my life. You have all shown me such kindness, such gentleness. The little mother guides me. She guides us all, Oz. You do believe that too, don't you? The moonlight revealed the tracks of tears and the grime on Wazza's cheeks. Um, said Polly, and sought wildly for a way to avoid lying. She found it. Er, uh, you know I want to find Paul, she said. Yes, and that does you credit. The Duchess knows, said Wazza quickly. Yes, well, yes, I'm... "'Also doing it for the Duchess,' said Polly, feeling wretched. "'I think about the Duchess all the time, I must admit. "'Well, that was true. It just wasn't honest. "'I'm so very glad to hear that, Oz, because I had thought you were a backslider,' said Wazza. "'But you said that with such conviction. "'Perhaps this would be the time for us to get down on our knees and—' "'Was you're standing in another man's grave,' said Polly. "'There is a time and place, you know.' Let's get back to the others, eh? 
The happiest days of her life had been spent tramping through forests, digging graves, and trying to dodge soldiers on both sides. And the trouble with Polly was that she had a mind that asked questions even when she really, really didn't want to know the answers. So the Duchess is still talking to you, is she? she said as they made their way among the dark trees. Oh, yes. When we were in plots, sleeping in the barracks, said Wazza, she said it was all working. Don't, don't ask another question, said part of Polly's mind, but she ignored it out of sheer horrible curiosity. Wazza was nice, well, sort of nice in a slightly scary way, but talking to her was like picking at a scab. You knew what was likely to be under the crust, but you picked anyway. So, what did you used to do back in the world, she said. Wazza gave her a haunting smile. I used to be beaten. Tea was brewing in a small hollow near the track. Several of the squad were standing guard. No one liked the idea of men in dark clothes sneaking around. Mug of Saloop, said Shufty, holding one up. A few days ago they'd have called it sweet milky tea, but even if they couldn't walk the walk, yet they were determined to talk the talk as soon as possible. What's happening? said Polly. Dunno, said Shufty. Sergeant and Rupert went off over that way with the prisoner, but no one tells us groans anything. It's grunts, I think, said Water, taking the tea. I've done them a couple of mugs anyway. See what you can find out, eh? Polly gulped her tea down, grabbed the mugs and hurried away. On the edge of the hollow, Maledict was lounging against a tree. There was this about vampires. They could never look scruffy. Instead, they were... what was the word? Deshabillé. It meant untidy, but with bags and bags of style. In this case, Maledict's jacket was open, and he'd stuck his packet of cigarettes in the band of his shako. He saluted her with his crossbow as she went past. Oz, he said. Yes, Corp? Any coffee in their packs? Sorry, Corp, only tea. Damn. Maledict thumped the tree behind him. Hey, you went straight for the man who was swallowing the cipher. Straight for him. How come? Just luck, said Polly. You're right. Try again. I have very good night vision. Oh, all right. Well, the one on the left started to run, and the one in the middle was dropping the clax tube and reaching for his sword. But the one on the right thought that putting something into his mouth was more important even than fighting or running away. Satisfied? You worked all that out in a couple of seconds. That was smart. Yeah, right. Now, please forget it, OK? I don't want to be noticed. I don't particularly want to be here. I just want to find my brother, OK? Oh, fine. I just thought that you'd like to know someone saw you. And you'd better get that tea to them before they try to kill one another. At least I was someone watching the enemy, Polly thought furiously as she walked away. I wasn't someone watching another soldier. Who does he think he is? Or she is? She heard the raised voices as she pushed through a thicket. You can't torture an unarmed man! That was Blouse's voice. Well, I'm not waiting for him to arm himself, sir. He knows stuff, and he's a spy. Don't you dare kick him in the ribs again. That is an order, Sergeant. Asking nicely didn't work, did it, sir? Pretty please with sprinkles on top is not a recognized method of interrogation. You shouldn't be here, sir. You should say, Sergeant, find out what you can from the prisoner, and then go somewhere and wait until I tell you what I got out of him, sir. You did it again. What? What? You kicked him again. No, I didn't. Sergeant, I gave you an order. And? Tease up, said Polly cheerfully. Both men turned. Their expression changed. If they had been birds, their feathers would have gently settled back. Ah, perks, said Blouse. Well done. Yeah, good lad, said Sergeant Jackram. Polly's presence seemed to lower the temperature. The two men drank their tea and eyed one another warily. You'll have noticed, Sergeant, that the men were wearing the dark green uniform of the 1st Battalion of the Slovenian 59th Bowman, a skirmishing battalion, said Blouse, with cold politeness. That is not the uniform of a spy, Sergeant. Yes, sir, but they'd let their uniforms get very dirty then. No shine on the buttons, sir. Patrolling behind enemy lines is not spying, Sergeant. You must have done it in your time. More times than you could count, sir, said Jackram. 
and I knew full well that if I got caught I was due a good kicking in the nudges. But skirmishers is the worst, sir. You think you're safe in the lines. Next moment it turns out that some bastard sitting in the bushes on a hill has been working out windage and yardage and has dropped an arrow right through your mate's head. He picked up a strange-looking longbow. See these things they've got. Burly and strong in the arm, number five recurved, made in bloody ank more pork. A real killing weapon. I say we give him a choice, sir. He can tell us what he knows and go out easy, or keep mum and go out hard. No, Sergeant, he is an enemy officer taken in battle and entitled to fair treatment. No, sir, he's a sergeant, and they don't deserve no respect at all, sir, I should know. They're cunning and artful, if they're any good. And I wouldn't mind if he was an officer, sir, but sergeants are clever. There was a grunt from the bound prisoner. Loosen his gag, Perks, said Blouse. Instinctively, even if the instinct was only a couple of days old, Polly glanced at Jackram. The sergeant shrugged. She pulled the rag down. I'll talk, said the prisoner, spitting out cotton fluff, but not to that tub of lard. I'll talk to the officer. You keep that man away from me. You're in no position to negotiate, soldier boy, snarled Jackram. Sergeant, said the lieutenant, I'm sure you have things to see to. Please do, sir. Send a couple of men back here. He can't do anything against the four of us. But that was another order, sergeant, said Blouse. He turned to the prisoner as Jackram stumped off. What is your name, man? Sergeant's towering, lieutenant. And if you are a sensible man, you will release me and surrender. Surrender, said Blouse, as Igorina and Walter ran into the clearing, armed and bewildered. Yep. I'll put in a good word for you when the boys catch up with us. You don't want to know how many men are looking for you. Could I have a drink, please? What? Oh, yes, of course, said Blouse, as if caught out in a display of bad manners. Perks, fetch some tea for the sergeant. Why are people looking for us, pray? Towering gave him a cock-eyed grin. You don't know? No, said Blouse, coldly. You really don't know? Now Towering was laughing. He was far too relaxed for a bound man, and Blouse sounded far too much like a nice but worried man trying to appear firm and determined. To Polly, it was like watching a child bluffing in poker against a man called Doc. "'I don't wish to play games, man. Out with it,' he said. "'Everyone knows about you, Lieutenant. Yours a monstrous regiment, you are,' he said. "'No offence meant, of course. They say you've got a troll and a vampire and an ego and a werewolf.' They say you, he began to chuckle, they say you overpowered Prince Heinrich on his guard and stole his boots and made him hop away and so altogether. In a thicket some way off a nightingale sang, for quite a while uninterrupted. Then Blouse said, ha, No, you are in fact wrong. The man was Captain Horence. Yeah, right, like he tells you who he was, with you pointing swords at him, said Towering. I heard from one of my mates that one of you kicked him in the meat and two veg, but I haven't seen the picture yet. Someone took a picture of him getting kicked, squeaked Polly, drenched in a sudden horror. Not of that, no. But there's copies all over the place of him in chains, and I hear it's been sent by the cracks to Ank Moorpork. Is... is he annoyed? Polly quavered, cursing Otto Creek and his picture-making. Well, now, let me see said Towering sarcastically. Annoyed? No, I shouldn't think he's annoyed. Livid is the word, I think. Or raging? Yeah, I think raging is the word. There's a lot of people looking for you lads now. Well done. Even Blouse could see Polly's distress. Uh, Perks, he said, it was you, wasn't it, who, um, over and over in Polly's head the words, Oh, God, I kicked the prince in the fruit and veg, were going around and around like a hamster in a runaway treadmill, until suddenly it ran up against something solid. Yes, sir, she snapped. He was forcing himself upon a young woman, sir, if you recall. Blouse's frown faded and became a grin of childlike duplicity. Ah, yes, indeed. He was pressing his suit in no small way, was he not? "'He didn't have ironing in mind, sir,' said Polly fervently. "'Towering looked up at Wazza, grimly clutching a crossbow "'that Polly knew for a fact she was scared of, "'and Igorina, who'd much rather be holding a surgeon's knife "'than the sabre in her hand. "'Polly saw his brief smile. 
And there you have it, Sergeant Towering, said the lieutenant, turning to the prisoner. Of course, we all know there is some atrocious behaviour in times of war, but it is not the sort of thing we would expect of a royal prince. Lieutenant Blouse read only the more technical history books. If we are to be pursued because a gallant young soldier prevented matters from becoming even more disgusting, then so be it. Now I am impressed, said Towering. A real knight errant, eh? He's a credit to you, lieutenant. Any chance of that tea? Blouse's skinny chest visibly swelled at the compliment. Yes, Perks, the tea, if you would be so good. Leaving the three of you with this man who's positively radiating an intention to escape, Polly thought. Could perhaps Private Goom go and fetch, she began. A word in Private Perks, snapped Blouse. He drew her closer, but Polly kept her eye on Sergeant Towering. He might be bound hand and foot, but she wouldn't have trusted a man who grinned like that if he'd been nailed to the ceiling. Perks, you are making a great contribution, but I really will not have my orders continually questioned said Blouse. You are my batman, after all. I think I run a happy ship here, but I will be obeyed. Please? It was like being savaged by a goldfish, but she had to admit he had a point. Er, uh, sorry, sir, said Polly, backing away as long as possible so as not to miss the end of the tragedy. Then she turned and ran. Jackram was sitting by the fire with the prisoner's bow across his huge knees and slicing some sort of black sausage with a big clasp knife. He was chewing. "'Where's the rest of us, sir?' said Polly, scrabbling for a mug. "'I sent them to scout a wide perimeter, Perks. Can't be too careful if meaty boys got pals out there.' "'Which was perfectly sensible. It just happened to mean that half the squad had been sent away.' "'Sarge, you know that captain back at the barracks? "'That was—' "'I've got good hearing, Perks. "'Kicked him in the royal prerogative, eh? "'Ha! Ah, make it all more interesting, eh?' "'It's going to go wrong, Sarge. "'I just know it,' said Polly, "'dragging the kettle off the hob "'and spilling half the water as she topped up the teapot. "'Do you chew at all, Perks?' said Jackram. "'What, Sarge?' said Polly distractedly. "'The sergeant held out a small piece of sticky, black stuff.' "'Tobacco. Chewing tobacco,' said Jackram. "'I favour black heart to Jolly Sailor, "'cause it's rum-dipped. "'But others say, "'Sarge, that man's going to escape, Sarge. "'I know he is. "'The lieutenant isn't in charge. "'He is. "'He's all friendly and everything, "'but I can tell by his eyes, Sarge.' "'I'm sure Lieutenant Blouse knows what he's doing, Perks,' "'he said primly. "'You're not telling me a bound man can overcome four of you, are you?' "'Oh, sugar,' said Polly. "'Just down there in the old black tin,' said Jackram. "'Polly tipped some into the worst cup of tea ever made by a serving soldier "'and ran back to the clearing. "'Amazingly, the man was still in a sitting position, "'and still bound hand and foot. "'Her fellow cheesemongers were watching him warily. "'Polly relaxed, but only a little. "'And there you have it, Lieutenant,' he was saying. "'No disgrace in calling it quits, eh? "'He'll hunt you down soon enough, cause it's personal now.' But if you were to come along with me, I'd do my best to see it goes easy with you. You don't want to get caught by the heavy dragoons right now. They ain't got much of a sense of humour. Tease up, said Polly. Oh, thank you, Perks, said Blouse dejectedly. I think we can at least cut Sergeant Towering's hands free, don't you? Yes, sir, said Polly, meaning no, sir. The man offered his bound wrists, and Polly reached out gingerly with her knife while holding the mug like a weapon. "'Artful lad you've got there, Lieutenant,' said Towering. "'He reckons I'm going to grab his knife off of him. Good lad.' Polly sliced the rope, brought her knife hand back quickly, and then carefully proffered the mug. "'And he's made the tea lukewarm, so it won't hurt when I splashes it in his face,' Towering went on. He gave Polly the steady, honest gaze of the born bastard. Polly held it, lie for lie. "'Oh, yeah!' The Ankh Morpork people have got a little printing press on a cart over on the other side of the river, said Towering, still watching Polly. For morale, they say. And they sent the picture back to the city, too, on the clacks. Don't ask me how. Oh, yeah, a good picture. Plucky rookies, Trans-Slovenia's finest, they wrote. Funny thing, 
but it looks like the writer man didn't spot it was the prince. But we all did. His voice became even more friendly. Now look, mates, as a foot soldier like yourselves, I'm all for seeing the bloody donkey boys made to look fools. So you come along with me, and I'll see to it that at least you don't sleep in chains tomorrow. That's my best offer. He took a sip of tea and added, It's a better one than most of the tents got, I'll tell you. I heard your regiment got wiped out. Polly's expression didn't change, but she felt herself curl up into a tiny ball behind it. Look at the eyes. Look at the eyes. Liar. Liar. Wiped out, said Blouse. Towering dropped his mug of tea. He smacked the crossbow out of Waz's grip with his left hand, grabbed the sabre from Igorino with his right hand, and brought the curved blade down on the rope between his legs. It happened fast before any of them could quite focus on the change in the situation. And then the sergeant was on his feet, slapping Blouse across the face and grabbing him in an arm lock. And you are right, kiddo, he said to Polly over Blouse's shoulder. Crying shame you ain't an officer, eh? The last of the fallen tea dribbled into the soil. Polly reached slowly for her crossbow. Don't! One step, one move from any of you, and I'll cut him, said the sergeant. Won't be the first officer I've killed, believe me. The difference between them and me is, I don't care. Five heads turned. There was Jackram, outlined against the distant firelight. He had the man's own bow drawn taut, and aimed directly at the sergeant, in complete disregard of the fact that the lieutenant's head was in the way. Blouse closed his eyes. "'You'd shoot your own officer,' said Towering. "'Yup. Won't be the first officer I've killed neither,' said Jackram. "'You ain't going nowhere, friend, except down. Easy or hard, I don't care.' The bow creaked. "'You're just bluffing, mister.' "'Upon my oath, I am not a bluffing man. I don't think we was ever introduced, by the way. Jackram's the name.' The change in the man was a whole body event. He seemed to get smaller, as if every cell had said, Oh dear, very quietly to itself. He sagged, and Blouse slumped a little. Can I... Too late, said Jackram. Polly never forgot the sound the arrow made. Jackram laid the bow aside carefully. Found out who he was messing with, he said, as if nothing much had happened. Shame, really. Seemed like a decent sort. Any salute left, Perks? There was silence, and then a thump as Towering's body finally overbalanced and hit the ground. Very slowly, Lieutenant Blouse raised his hand to his ear, which the arrow had perforated en route to its target, and then looked with strange detachment at the blood on his fingers. Oh, sorry about that, sir, said Jackram jovially. Just saw the one chance, and I thought, well, it's the fleshy part. Get yourself a gold earring, sir, and you'll be the height of fashion. Quite a large gold earring, maybe. Don't you all believe that stuff about the ins and outs, Jackram went on. That was just lies. So what we do now is... Can anyone tell me what we do now? Er, uh, bury the body? hazarded eagerly now. Yeah, but check his boots. He's got small feet, and these Lavinians have much better boots than us. Steal the boots of a dead man, Sarge, said Wazza, still in shock. Easier than getting him off a live one. Jackram softened his voice a little when he saw their expressions. Lads, this is war, understand. He was a soldier, they were soldiers, you were soldiers, more or less. No soldier will see grub or good boots go to waste. Bury em decent and say what prayers you can remember, and hope they've gone where there's no fighting. He raised his voice back to the normal bellow. Perks! Round up the others. Igor, cover the fire. Try to make it look like we were never here. We are moving out in number ten minutes. Can make a few miles before full daylight. That's right. Eh, Lieutenant? Blouse was still transfixed, but seemed to wake up now. What? Oh, yes, right. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes. Carry on, Sergeant. The fire gleamed off Jackram's triumphal face. In the red glow, his little dark eyes were like holes in space his grinning mouth the gateway to a hell, his bulk some monster from the abyss. He let it happen, Polly knew. He obeyed orders. He didn't do anything wrong. But he could have sent Maledict and Jade to help us, instead of Wazza and Igorina, who aren't quick with weapons. He sent the others away. He had the bow ready. 
he played a game with us as pieces and won. Poor old soldier, her father and his friends had sung while frost formed on the window panes. Poor old soldier, if ever I list for a soldier again, the devil shall be my sergeant. In the firelights, the grin of Sergeant Jackram was a crescent of blood, his coat the colour of a battlefield sky. You are my little lads, he roared, and I will look after you. They made more than six miles before Jackram called a halt, and already the land was changing. There were more rocks, fewer trees. The Connect Valley was rich and fertile, and it was from here that the fertility had been washed. It was a landscape of ravines and thick scrub woodland, with a few small communities scratching a living from the poverty-stricken soil. It was a good place to hide, and in here someone had already hidden. It was a stream-carved gully, but at the end of summer the stream here was just a trickle between the rocks. Jackram must have found it by smell, because you couldn't see it from the track. The ashes of the fire in the small gully were still warm. The sergeant got up awkwardly after inspecting them. "'Some lads like our pals from last night,' he said. "'Couldn't it just be a hunter, Sarge?' said Maledict. "'It could, Corporal, but it ain't,' said Jackram. "'I brought you in here because it looks like a blind gully, "'and there's water and there's good vantage points up there and over there,' he pointed. "'And there's a decent overhang to keep the weather off, "'and it's hard for anyone to creep up on us. "'Military, in other words. "'And someone else thought the same as me last night. "'So while they're out there looking for us, "'we'll sit snug here where they've already looked. "'Get a couple of lads up on guard right now.' "'Polly drew first watch, atop the small cliff at the edge of the gully. "'It was a good sight, no doubt about it. "'A regiment could hide here. "'No one could get near without being seen, too.' And she was pulling her weight like a proper member of the squad, so, with any luck, Blouse would find someone else to shave him before she was off duty. Through a gap in the treetops below, she could see a road of sorts running through the woodland. She kept an eye on it. Eventually, Tonka relieved her with a cup of soup. On the far side of the gully, Wazza was being replaced by Lofty. "'Where are you from, Oz?' said Tonka, while Polly savoured the soup. "'There couldn't be any harm in telling. "'Muns,' said Polly. "'Really?' "'Someone said you worked in a bar. What was the inn called?' "'Ah, there was the harm right there. But she could hardly lie now. "'The Duchess,' she said. "'That big place, very knobby. Did they treat you okay?' "'What? Oh, yes, yes, pretty fair. Hit you at all?' "'Eh? No, never,' said Polly, nervous of where this was going. "'Work you too hard?' Polly had to consider this. In truth, she worked harder than both maids, and they at least had an afternoon off every week. I was usually the first one up and the last one to go to bed, if that's what you mean, she said. And, to change the subject quickly, she went on, What about you? You know Munns? We both lived there, me and Tilda. I mean, Lofty, said Tonka. Oh, whereabouts? The girls' working school, said Tonka, and looked away. And that's the kind of trap small talk can get you in, Polly thought. "'Not a nice place, I think,' she said, feeling stupid. "'It was not a nice place, yes, a very nasty place,' said Tonka. "'Wasa was there, we think. We think it was her. "'Used to be sent out a lot on work hire,' Polly nodded. "'Once a girl from the school came and worked as a maid at the Duchess. "'She'd arrive every morning, scrubbed raw in a clean pinafore, "'peeling off from a line of very similar girls, led by a teacher, "'and flanked by a couple of large men with long sticks. "'She was skinny, polite in a dull, trained sort of way, worked very hard and never talked to anybody. She was gone in three months, and Polly never found out why. Tonka stared into Polly's eyes, almost mocking her innocence. We think she was the one they used to lock up sometimes in the special room. That's the thing about the school. If you don't toughen up, you go funny in the head. I expect you were glad to leave, was all Polly could say. The basement window was unlocked, said Tonka. "'But I promised Tilda we'd go back one day next summer.' "'Oh, so it wasn't that bad then,' said Polly, grateful for some relief. "'No, it'll burn better,' said Tonka. "'Ever run across someone called Father Jupe?' "'Oh, yes,' said Polly. "'And, feeling that something more was expected of her, added, "'He used to come to dinner when my mother... "'He used to come to dinner. "'A bit pompous, but he seemed okay. "'Yes,' said Tonka. He was good at seeming. 
Once again there was a dark chasm in the conversation that not even a troll could bridge, and all you could do was draw back from the edge. I'd better go and see to the loop to the Rupert, Polly said, standing up. Thank you very much for the soup. She worked her way down through the scree and birch thickets until she emerged by the little stream that ran through the gully. And there, like some awful river god, was Sergeant Jackram. His red coat, a tent for lesser men, was draped carefully over a bush. He himself was sitting on a rock with his shirt off and his huge suspenders dangling, so that only a yellowing woollen undershirt saved the world from a sight of the man's bare chest. For some reason, though, he'd kept his shako on. His shaving kit, with a razor like a small machete and a shaving brush you could use to hang wallpaper, was on the rock beside him. Jackram was bathing his feet in the stream. He glanced up when Polly approached and nodded amiably. "'Morning, Perks,' he said. "'Don't rush. Never rush for Rupert's. Sit down for a spell, get your boots off. Let your feet feel the fresh air. Look after your feet, and your feet will look after you.' He pulled out his big clasp knife and the rope of chewing tobacco. "'Sure you won't join me?' "'No, thanks, Sarge.' Polly sat down on a rock on the opposite side of the stream, which was only a few feet wide, and started to tug at her boots. She felt as though she'd been given an order. Besides, right now she felt she needed the shock of clean, cold water. "'Good lad. Filthy habit. Worse than the smokes,' said Jackram, coughing off a lump. "'Got started on it when I was but a lad. Better than striking a light at night, see? Don't want to give away your position. Of course, you've got to gob a bundle every so often, but gobbing in the dark don't show up.' Polly dabbled her feet. The icy water did indeed feel refreshing. It seemed to jolt her alive and the trees around the gully birds sang. "'Say it, Perks,' said Jackram after a while. "'Say what, Sarge?' "'Oh, bleeding old Perks, it's a nice day, don't muck me around. I seen the way you've been looking at me.' "'All right, Sarge. You murdered that man last night.' "'Really? Prove it,' said Jackram calmly. "'Well, I can't, can I? But you set it up. You even sent Igor and Wazza to guard him. They're not good with weapons.' "'How good would they have to be, do you think, four of you against a man tied up?' said Jackram. "'Nah. That sergeant was dead the moment we got him, and he knew it. It took a bloody genius, like your Rupert, to make him think he's got a chance. We're out in the woods, lad. What was Blouse going to do with him? Who'd we hand him over to? Would the lieutenant cart him around with us, or tie him to a tree and leave him to kick wolves away until he gets too tired? Much more gentlemanly than giving him a quiet cigarette and a swift chop where you go quick.' which is what he was expecting and what I'd have given him. Jackram popped the tobacco into his mouth. You know what most of the military training is, Perks, he went on. All that yelling from little spitbubs like Strappy. It's to turn you into a man who will, on the word of command, stick his blade into some poor sod just like him who happens to be wearing the wrong uniform. He's like you, you're like him. He doesn't really want to kill you, you don't really want to kill him. But if you don't kill him first, he'll kill you. That's the start and finish of it. It don't come easy without training. Ruperts don't get that training because they are gentlemen. Well, upon my oath, I am no gentleman, and I'll kill when I have to. And I said I'd keep you safe, and no damn Rupert's going to stop me. He gave me my discharge papers, Jackram added, radiating indignance. Me, and expected me to thank him. Every other Rupert I've served under has had the sense to write, Not posted here, or on extended patrol or something, and shove it back in the mail, but not him. "'What was it you said to Corporal Strappy that made him run away?' said Polly, before she could stop herself. Jackram looked at her for a while, with no expression in his eyes. Then he gave a strange little chuckle. "'Now, why would a little lad like you say a little thing like that?' he said. "'Because he just vanished, and suddenly some old rule means you're back on the strength, Sarge,' said Polly. "'That's why he said that little thing.' "'Ha! And there's no such rule either, not like that one,' said Jackram, splashing his feet. "'But Rupert's never read the Book of Rules, unless they're trying to find a reason to hang you, so I was safe there. Strappy was scared shitless, you know that.' "'Yes, but he could have slipped away later on,' said Polly. "'He wasn't stupid. Rushing off into the night. He must have had something real close to run from, right?' "'Oh, that's an evil brain you have there, Perks,' said Jackram happily. Once again, Polly had the definite feeling that Jackram was enjoying this, just as he'd seemed pleased when she'd argued about the uniform. He wasn't a bully like Strappy. 
He treated Igorina and Wazza with something approaching fatherly concern, but with Polly and Maledict and Tonka, he pushed all the time, wanting you to push back. It does the job, Sarge, she said. I just had a little tate ah tate with him, as it were, quiet-like, explained all the nasty things that can happen vis-a-vis -vis the confusion of war. Like being found with his throat cut, said Polly. Has been known to happen, said Jack reminiscently. You know, lad, you're going to make a damn good sergeant one day. Any fool can use his eyes and ears, but you uses that brain to connect them up. I'm not going to be a sergeant. I'm going to get the job done and go home, said Polly vehemently. Yes, I said that once, too, grinned Jackram. Perks, I don't need no clacky thing. I don't need newsy paper. Sergeant Jackram knows what's going on. He talks to them men coming back, the ones that won't talk to anyone else. I know more than the Rupert, for all that he gets his little letters from HQ that worry him so much. Everyone talks to Sergeant Jackram. And in his big, fat head, Sergeant Jackram puts it all together. Sergeant Jackram knows what's going on. And what's that, Sarge? said Polly innocently. Jackram didn't reply immediately. Instead, he reached down with a grunt and rubbed one of his feet. The corroded shilling on a string which had lain innocently on a woollen undershirt swung forward, but there was something else. For a moment, something golden slipped out of the undershirt's open neck, something oval and golden, on a golden chain flashed in the sunlight. Then he straightened up, and it was dragged back out of sight. "'This is a bloody odd war, lad,' he said. "'It's true there's not just Slovenian soldiers out there. Lads say there is uniforms they'd never seen before. We've kicked a lot of backsides over the years, so maybe they really have ganged up, and it's going to be our turn. But what I reckon is they're stuck. They took the keep. Oh, yes, I know. But they've got to hold on to it.' And winter's coming home, and all those lads from Ankh, Moorpork, and everywhere are a long way from home. We might have a chance yet. Ha! Huh. Especially now the prince is dead set on finding the young soldier that need him in the wedding tackle. That means he's angry. He'll make mistakes. Well, Sarge, I think— I'm glad you do, Private Perks, said Jackram, suddenly becoming a sergeant again. And I think that after you've seen to the Rupert and had a nap, you and me is going to show the lads some swordsmanship. Whatever bleeding war this is, sooner or later young Wazzer is going to have to use that blade he waggles about. Get going. Polly found Lieutenant Blau sitting with his back to the cliff, eating scubber out of a bowl. Igorina was packing away her medical kit, and Blau's ear was bandaged. Everything all right, sir, she said. Sorry I wasn't. I quite understand, Perks. You must stand your turn like the other lads, said Blau's, and Polly heard the quotes clank into place. I had a refreshing nap and the bleeding, and indeed the shaking, has quite stopped. However, I do still need a shave. You uh, want me to shave you? said Polly, her heart sinking. I must set an example, Perks, but I have to say, you lads make such an effort it puts me to shame. You all seem to have faces as smooth as a baby's bottom, I must say. Yes, sir. Polly pulled out the shaving gear and walked over to the fire, where the kettle was permanently boiling. Most of the squad was dozing, but Maledict was sitting cross-legged by the fire, doing something to his hat. "'Heard about the prisoner last night,' he said, without looking up. "'I don't think the L.T. is going to last very long. What do you think?' "'The who? The lieutenant. From what I hear, Blouse is probably going to have a nasty accident. Jackram thinks he's dangerous.' "'He's learning, just like us?' "'Yes, but the L.T. is supposed to know what to do. What do you think he does?' Jackram stuck too said Polly, topping up the kettle with cold water. I think we just keep going. If there's anything there to get to, said Maledict. He held up the shako. What do you think? The words, born to die, had been chalked on the side of the hat, next to the packet of cigarettes. Very individual, said Polly. Why do you smoke? It's not very vampire, really. Well, I'm not supposed to be very vampire, said Maledict lighting up with the shaking hands. It's the sucking. I need it. I'm on edge. I'm getting the no coffee jitters. I'm not good with woods in any case. But you're a vamp... Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, this, this was crypts, no problem. But I keep thinking I'm surrounded by lots of pointy stakes. Truth is, I'm beginning to hurt. It's like a going cold bat all over again. I'm getting the voices and the sweats. Shh! 
said Polly, as Shifty grunted in her sleep. You can't be, she hissed. You said you've been going straight for two years. No oh, bl 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 blood, said Maledix. Who said anything about blood? I'm talking about coffee, damn it. We've got plenty of tea, Polly began. You don't understand. This is about craving. You never stop craving. You just switch it to something that doesn't cause people to turn you into a short kebab. I need coffee. Why me, Polly thought. Do I have this little sign on me saying, tell me your troubles? I'll see what I can do, she said, and hastily filled the shaving mug. Polly hurried back with the water, ushered Blouse to a rock, and stirred up some foam. She sharpened the razor, taking as long as she dared. When he coughed impatiently, she took a position, raised the razor, and prayed. But not to Nuggan, never to Nuggan since her mother died. And then Lofty was running across the ground trying to shout a whisper. Movement! Blouse nearly lost another earlobe. Out from nowhere came Jackram, boots on but suspenders dangling. He grabbed Lofty by the shoulder and swung her around. Where? he demanded. There's a track down there. Troopers! Carts! What do we do, Sarge? We keep the noise down, muttered Jackram. Are they heading up here? No, they went right past, Sarge. Jackram turned and gave the rest of the squad a satisfied look. OK. Corporal, take Carbrandum and Perks and go and take a look. The rest of you... Tool up and try to be brave, eh, Lieutenant? Blouse bemusedly dabbed foam off his face. What? Oh, yes. Uh, see to it, Sergeant. Twenty seconds later, Polly was running after Maledict, down the slope. Here and there the bottom of a valley could be seen through the trees, and as she glanced down, she saw sunlight flash off something metal. At least the trees had coated the woodland floor with a thick layer of needles, and, contrary to popular opinion, most woods aren't littered with branches that snap loudly. They reached the edge of the woods, where bushes fought one another for their place in the sun, and found a spot with a view. There were only four troopers, in an unfamiliar uniform, riding in pairs ahead and behind a cart. It was small, and had a canvas cover. "'What's in a little cart that four men have to protect?' said Maledict. "'It must be valuable.' Polly pointed to the huge flag that hung limply from a pole on the wagon. "'I think it's a newspaper man,' she said. "'It's the same cart, same flag, too.' "'Then it's a good thing they've gone right past,' hissed Maledict. "'Let's just see them out of sight and creep away like a good little mice, okay?' The party was travelling at the speed of the cart, and at this point the two riders in the lead stopped and turned in their saddles, waiting for it to catch up. Then one of them pointed back, past the hidden watchers. There was a shout, too far away to be understood. The troopers in the rear trotted up to the cart, met with their comrades, and all four turned to look up. There was some discussion, and two riders trotted back along the road. Oh, darn, said Polly. What have they spotted? The horsemen went past their hiding place. A few moments later, they heard the horses enter the woods. Do we run and get them? said Jade. Let Jackram do that, said Maledict. But if he does, and the men don't come back, Polly began. When they don't come back? Maledict corrected her. Then those other two will get suspicious, won't they? One will probably stay here, the other will go to get help. Then we'll sneak up and wait, said Maledict. Look, they've dismounted. The cart's pulled in, too. If they look as though they're worried, we'll move in. And do what, exactly? said Polly. Threaten to shoot them, said Maledict firmly. And if they don't believe us? Then we'll threaten to shoot them in a much louder voice, said Maledict. Happy? And I hope to hell they've got some coffee. There are three things a soldier wants to do when there's a respite on the road. One involves lighting a cigarette, one involves lighting a fire, and the other one involves no flames at all, but does generally require a tree. Actually, a tree is not technically required, but seems to be insisted upon for reasons of style. The two troopers had a fire going and a billy can steaming when a young man jumped down from the cart, stretched his arms, looked around, yawned, and sauntered a little way into the forest. He found a convenient tree and, a moment later, was apparently examining the bark at eye height with studied enthusiasm. The tip of a steel crossbow bolt pressed against the back of his neck, and a voice said, Raise your hands and turn around slowly. What? Right now? Um... All right, no. You can finish what you're doing. Actually, I think that's going to be quite impossible. Let me just, uh, 
Right, OK. The man raised his hands again. You realise I just have to shout. So, said Polly, I just have to pull this trigger. Shall we have a race? The man turned around. See, said Polly, stepping back. It's him again, the word, the writer man. You're them, he said. Them who? said Jade. Oh, dear, said Maledict. Look, I'd give anything to talk to you, said the word. Please? You're with the enemy, hissed Polly. What? Them? No. They're from Lord Rust's regiment, from Ank Morpork. They've been sent to protect us. Troops to protect you in Borogravia, said Maledict. Who from? You mean from whom? Uh, well, you, in theory. Jade leaned down. Efficient, aren't they? Look, I must talk to you, said the man urgently. This is astounding. Everyone's looking for you. Did you kill that old couple in the woods? Birds sang. Far off there was the call of the female blue-capped woodpecker. A patrol found the fresh graves, said the word. High above, an ice heron, a winter migrant from the hub, gave an ugly honk as it searched for lakes. I take it you didn't then, said the word. We buried them, said Maledict coldly. We don't know who killed them. We did take some vegetables, said Polly. She remembered laughing about it. Admittedly, it was only because it was that or start crying, but even so. You've been living off the land. He tugged a notebook out of his pocket and was scribbling in it with a pencil. We don't have to talk to you, said Maledict. No, no, you must. There's so much you need to know. You're in the ups and downs, right? Ins and outs, said Polly. And you, the man began. I've had enough of this, said Maledict, and marched away from the tree and into the clearing. The two cavalrymen looked up from their fire, and there was a moment of immobility before one reached for his sword. Maledict swung the bow quickly from one to the other, its point hypnotising them like a swinging watch. I've only got one shot, but there's two of you, he said. Who shall I shoot? You choose. Now, listen very carefully. Where's your coffee? You've got coffee, haven't you? Come on, everyone's got coffee. Spill the beans. They stared at the crossbow and slowly shook their heads. What about you, writer man? snarled Maledict. Where are you hiding the coffee? We only have cocoa, said the writer, raising his hands quickly as Maledict turned on him. You're welcome to... Maledict dropped his crossbow, which fired straight up into the air, and failed to hit anything, especially a duck. This is so unusual in situations like this that it should be reported under new humour regulations. If it had hit a duck, which quacked, and then landed on somebody's head, this would of course been very droll, and would certainly have been reported. Instead, it drifted in the breeze a little, and landed in an oak tree some thirty feet away, where it missed a squirrel. Maledict sat down with his head in his hands. "'We're all gonna die,' he said. The troopers shifted as though to stand up, and Jade raised her sapling. "'Don't even think about it,' she said. Polly turned to the writer man. "'You want us to talk to you, sir? Then you talk to us. Is this about Prince Heinrich's socks?' Maledict stood up in one mad movement. "'I say we grease the lot of them and go home.' he said to no one in particular. One, two, three, what are we fighting for? Socks, said the writer, looking nervously at the vampire. What have socks got to do with it? I just gave you an order, Polly, said Maledict. What is it you think we don't know? Polly insisted, glaring at the word. Well, to start with, you're just about all that's left of the ins and outs. That's not true. Oh, there's prisoners and wounded, I think. But why should I lie to you? Why did he call you Polly? "'Because I know a lot about birds,' said Polly, mentally cursing. "'How do you know what's been happening to the regiment?' "'Because it's my job to know things,' said the man. "'What's that bird up there?' Polly glanced up. "'I don't have time for stupid games,' she said. "'And that's a—' "'She stopped. "'Something was wheeling high above in the forbidden blue. "'You don't know?' said the word. "'Yes, of course I know,' said Polly irritably. "'It's a white-necked buzzard.' "'But I thought they never came this far into the mountains. "'I only ever saw one in a book.' "'She raised her bow again and tried to take control. "'Am I right, Mr. It's my job to know things?' "'De Word raised his hands again and gave her a sickly smile. "'Probably,' he said. "'I live in a city. 
I know sparrows from starlings. After that, everything's a duck as far as I'm concerned. Polly glared at him. Look, please, said the man. You need to listen to me. You need to know things before it's too late. Polly lowered the bow. If you want to talk to us, wait here, she said. Corporal, we are leaving. Carborundum, pick up those troopers. Hold it, said Maledict. Who's the corporal in his squad? You are, said Polly, and you're drooling and swaying and your eyes look weird. So what was your point, please? Maledict considered this. Polly was tired and frightened and somewhere inside this was all being transmuted into anger. Hers was not an expression you wanted to see at the far end of a crossbow. An arrow couldn't kill a vampire, but that didn't mean it didn't hurt. Uh, you're right, he said. Carborundum, pick up those troopers, we are leaving. There was a bird whistle as Polly neared the hiding place. She identified this one as the sound of a very bad bird impersonator, and made a note to teach the girls some bird calls that at least sounded real. They were harder to do than most people thought. The squad were in the gully, armed and at least looking dangerous. There was a certain amount of relaxation when they saw Jade carrying the two bound troopers. Two more were sitting disconsolately against the cliff, hands tied behind them. Maledict walked smartly up to Blouse and saluted. Two prisoners, L.T., and Parrox thinks there's someone down there you ought to talk to. He leaned forward. The newspaper a man, sir. Then we'll jolly well keep well away from him, then, said Blouse. Eh, hey, Sergeant? Right, sir, said Jackram. Nothing but trouble, sir. Polly saluted madly. Please, sir, permission to speak, sir? Yes, Perks, said Blouse. Polly saw there was one chance and one only. She had to find out about Paul. Now her mind worked as fast as it had on the hill last night, when she'd gone for the man with the code book. Sir, I don't know if he's worth talking to, sir, but he may be worth listening to, even if you think he'll only tell us lies, because sometimes, sir, the way people tell you lies, if they tell you enough lies, well, they sort of show you what shape the truth is, sir, and we don't have to tell him the truth, sir, we could lie to him too. I'm not, by nature, an untruthful man, Perks, said Blouse coldly. Glad to hear it, sir. Are we winning the war, sir? You stop that right now, Perks, Jackram roared. It was only a question, Sarge, said Polly reproachfully. Around the clearing the squad waited, ears sucking up every sound. Everyone knew the answer. They waited for it to be said aloud. Perks, this kind of talk spreads despondency, Blouse began, but he said it as if he didn't believe it and didn't care who knew. No, sir, it doesn't really. It's better than being lied to, said Polly. She changed her voice, gave it that edge her mother used to use on her when she was being scolded. It's evil to lie. No one likes a liar. Tell me the truth, please. Some harmonic of that must have had a home in an old part of Blouse's brain. As Jackram opened his mouth to roar, the lieutenant held up a hand. We are not winning perks, but we have not lost yet. I think we all know that, sir, but it's good to hear you say it, said Polly, giving him an encouraging smile. That seemed to work, too. I suppose there's no harm in at least being civil to wretched fellow, said Blouse, as if thinking aloud. He may give away valuable information under cunning questioning. Polly looked at Sergeant Jackram, who was staring upwards like a man in prayer. Permission to be the man to interrogate the gentleman, sir, said the sergeant. Permission denied, sergeant, said Blouse. I'd like him to live, and I don't want to lose another lobe. However, you may take Perks back to the cart and drive it up here. Jackram gave him the smart salute. Polly had already learned to recognise it. It meant that Jackram had already made plans. Very good, sir, he said. Come on, Perks. Jackram was quiet as they walked back down over the needle-carpeted slope. Then, after a while, he said, Do you know why them troopers found our little nook, Perks? No, Sarge? The lieutenant ordered Shufti to put out the fire immediately. It wasn't as if there was even any smoke. So Shufti goes and pours the kettle on it. Polly gave this a few seconds' thought. Steam, Sarge. Right, in a bloody great rising cloud. Not Shufti's fault. The gallopers weren't any trouble, though. Bright enough not to try to outrun half a dozen crossbows, at least. That's clever for a cavalryman. Well done, Sarge. Don't talk to me as if I was a Rupert lad, said Jackram easily. Sorry, Sarge. I see you're learning how to steer an officer, though. You want to make sure they gives you the right orders, see? You'll make a good sergeant, Perks. Don't want to, Sarge. Yeah, right, said Jackram. It could have meant anything. 
After watching the track for a minute or two, they stepped out and headed toward the cart. De Word was sitting on a stool beside it, writing in a notebook, but he stood up hurriedly when he saw them. It'll be a good idea to get off the track, he said, as soon as they approached. There are a lot of patrols, I understand. Slovenian patrols, sir, said Jackram. Yes. In theory, this, he pointed to the flag that hung limply from the cart, should keep us safe. But everyone's a bit jumpy at the moment. Aren't you Sergeant Jack Ram? Jackram, sir, and I'll thank you for not writing my name down in your little book, sir. Sorry, Sergeant, but that's my job, said De Word breezily. I have to write things down. Well, sir, soldiering's my job, said Jackram, climbing onto the cart and gathering up the reins. But you'll note how at this moment in time I'm not killing you. Let's go, eh? Polly climbed into the back of the cart as it lumbered off. It was full of boxes and equipment, and while it may once have been neatly organised, that organisation was now but a distant memory, a clear indication that this cart was the property of a man. Next to her, half a dozen of the largest pigeons she'd ever seen dozed on a perch in their wire cage, and she wondered if they were a living larder. One of them opened one eye and lazily went, which is pigeon for do. Most of the rest of the boxes had labels like, she leaned closer, Captain Horace Calumny's Patent Field Biscuits and Dried Stew. As she was musing that Shufty would have very much liked to get her hands on one or two of these boxes, a bundle of clothes hanging from the ceiling of the rocking cart moved slightly and a face appeared. Good morning, it said upside down. William DeWord turned around on the seat in front. It's only Otto, Private, he said. Don't be afraid. Yes, I will not bite, said the face cheerfully. It smiled. A vampire's face does not look any better upside down, and a smile in these circumstances does nothing to improve matters. That is guaranteed. Polly lowered the crossbow. Jackram would have been impressed at how quickly she had raised it. So was she, and embarrassed too. The socks were doing the thinking again. Otto very elegantly lowered himself to the bed of the cart. Where are we going? he said, steadying himself as they bounced over a rut. A little place I know, sir, said Jackram. Nice and quiet. Good. I need to exercise the imps, said the vampire. They get fretful if they are cooped up for too long. Otto pushed aside a stack of paper and revealed his large picture-making box. He lifted a small hatch. Rise on shine, lads, he said. There was a chorus of high-pitched voices from inside. I'd better just give you the heads up, re tiger, Mr. De Word, said Jackram as the cart rolled up an old logging track. Tiger? Who's Tiger? Oops, said Jackram. Sorry, that's what we call the lieutenant, sir, on account of him being so brave. Forget I said that, will you? Brave, is he? said De Word. And clever, sir. Don't let him fool you, sir. He is one of the great military minds of his generation, sir. Polly's mouth dropped open. She'd suggested they liked the man, but this... Really? Then why is he just a lieutenant? said the writer. Ah, I can see there's no fooling you, sir, said Jack Cremusing knowingness. Yes, it's a puzzler, sir, why he calls himself a lieutenant. Still, I dare say he has his reasons, eh? Just like Heinrich calling himself a captain, writes. He tapped the side of his nose. I see everything, sir, and I don't say a word. All I could find out was that he did some kind of desk job at your HQ, sergeant, said De Word. Polly saw him taking his notebook out slowly and carefully. "'Yes, I expect that what you would find out, sir,' said Jackram, with a huge conspiratorial wink. "'And then, when things are at their worst, they let him out, sir. They unleash him, sir. Me? I don't know a thing, sir.' "'What does he do? Explode?' said De Word. "'Ha, <laughs> Nice one, sir,' said Jackram. "'No, sir, what he does, sir, is assess situation, sir.' I don't understand it myself, sir, not being a big thinker, but the proof of the pudding, sir, is in the eating of same, and last night we were jumped by eight, twenty Slovenian troopers, sir, and the lieutenant just assessed the situation in a flash, and skewered five of the buggers, sir, like a kebab, sir, mild as milk to look at, but rouse him and he's a whirlwind of death. Of course you did not hear it from me, sir. And he's in charge of a bunch of recruits, sergeant, said the word. That doesn't sound very likely to me. Recruits who captured some crack cavalrymen, sir, said Jackram, looking pained. That's leadership for you. Comes the hour, comes the man, sir. 
I'm just a simple old soldier, sir. Seen em come, seen em go. Upon my oath, I am not a lying man, sir, but I look at Lieutenant Blouse in wonderment. He just seemed confused to me, said the word, but there was a hint of uncertainty in his voice. That was a bit of concussion, sir. He took a wallop that would have felled a lesser man, and still got back onto his feet. Amazing, sir. Hmm, said the word, making a note. The cart splashed across the shallow little stream and dropped into the gully. Lieutenant Blouse was sitting on a rock. He'd made an effort, but his tunic was grubby, his boots were muddy, his hand was swollen, and one ear, despite Igorina's attentions, was still inflamed. He had his sword on his knees. Jackram carefully brought the cart to a halt by a thicket of birch trees. All four of the enemy troopers were tied up against the cliff. Apart from them, the camp appeared to be deserted. "'Where are the rest of the men, Sergeant?' whispered De Word as he slid down off the cart. "'Oh, they're around, sir.' said Jackram, watching you. Probably not a good idea to make any sudden moves, sir. No one else was visible, and then Maledict faded into view. People never really looked at things Polly knew. They glanced, and what had been a patch of scrub was now Corporal Maledict. Polly stared. He'd cut a hole in the centre of his old blanket, and the mud and grass stains on the mildewed greyness had turned him into part of the landscape until he saluted. He'd also stuck leafy twigs all over his hat. Sergeant Jackram goggled. Polly had never really seen proper goggling before, but the sergeant had the face to do it at a championship level. She could feel him drawing breath while at the same time assembling cuss words for a right royal thundering and then he remembered he was playing Sergeant Big Jolly Fat Man, and this was not the time to segue into Sergeant Incandescent. Lads, eh? he chuckled to De Word. What will they think of next? De Word nodded nervously, pulled a wad of newspapers from under his seat, and advanced on the lieutenant. Mr. De Word, isn't it? said Blau, standing up. Pucks, can we manage a cup of, ah, uh, saloup for Mr. De Word? There's a good chap. Do take a rock, sir. Good of you to see me, lieutenant said the word. It looks as though you've been in the wars, he added, with an attempt at joviality. No, only this one, said Blouse, looking puzzled. I meant that you have been wounded, sir, said the word. These? Are, oh, they're nothing, sir. I'm afraid the one on my hand was self-inflicted. Sword drill, you know. You're left-handed, then, sir? Oh, no. Polly, washing out a mug, heard Jackram say out of the corner of his mouth, Should have seen the other two fellows, sir. "'Are you aware of the progress of the war, Lieutenant?' said De Word. "'You tell me, sir,' said Blaz. "'All your army is bottled up in the Connect Valley, "'dug in, mostly, just beyond the reach of the Keep's weaponry. "'Your forts elsewhere along the border have been captured. "'The garrisons at Drurp and Galitz and Arblat have been overwhelmed. "'As far as I can tell, Lieutenant, "'your squad are the only soldiers still at large. "'At least,' he added, "'the only ones still fighting.' "'And my regiment?' said Blouse quietly. "'The remnant of the Tenth took part in a brave, but frankly, suicidal attempt to retake Kneck Keep a few days ago, sir. Most of the survivors are prisoners of war, and I have to tell you that almost all your high command have been captured. They were in the Keep when it was taken. There are big dungeons in that fort, sir, and they're pretty full. "'Why should I believe you?' "'I do,' thought Polly. "'So, Paul is either dead wounded or captured, and it doesn't help much to think of it as two chances in three that he is alive. De Word threw his newspapers at the lieutenant's feet. It's all there, sir. I didn't make it up. It's the truth. It will remain true whether you believe it or not. There are more than six countries ranged against you, including Genua and Moldavia and Ankh Morpork. There is no one on your side. You are alone. The only reason you're not beaten yet is because you won't admit it. I've seen your generals, sir, great leaders, and your men fight like demons, but they won't surrender. Borogravia doesn't know the meaning of the word surrender, Mr. De Word, said the lieutenant. May I loan you a dictionary, sir, snapped De Word, going red in the face. It's very similar to the meaning of the word making some kind of peace while you've still got a chance, sir. It's rather like the word quitting while you've still got a head, sir. Good heavens, sir, don't you understand? The reason that there still is an army in Knek Valley is that the Allies haven't yet decided what to do with it. They're fed up with the slaughter. Ah, so we still fight back, said Blouse. 
De Word sighed. You don't understand, sir. They are fed up with slaughtering you. They've got the keep now. There's some big war engines up there. They... Frankly, sir, some of the Alliance would just as soon wipe out the remains of your army. It'd be like shooting rats in a barrel. They have you at their mercy, and yet you keep on attacking. You attack the keep. It's on sheer rock, and it's got walls a hundred feet high. You make salience across the river. You're bottled up, and you've got nowhere to go, and the Allies could simply massacre you any time they want and you act as if you're just facing some kind of temporary setback. That's what's really happening, Lieutenant. You are just a last little detail. Have a care, please, Blouse warned. Excuse me, sir, but do you know anything about recent history? In the past thirty years, you have declared war on every single one of your neighbours at least once. All countries fight, but you brawl. And then last year, you invaded Slovenia again. They invaded us, Mr. De Word. You have been misinformed, Lieutenant. You invaded the Konek province. That was confirmed as Borogravian by the Treaty of Lint more than a hundred years ago. Signed at Sword Point, sir. And no one cares now, in any case. It's all got beyond your stupid little royal scuffles because your men tore down the Grand Trunk, you see, the Klax Towers, and tore up the coach road. Ankh Morpork regards that as bandit activity. Have a care, I said, said Blouse. I note you are displaying the Ankh Morpork flag with evident pride on your wagon. Kivis Morporkias Sum, sir. I am an Ankh Morpork citizen. You could say that Ankh Morpork shelters me under her wide and rather greasy wing, although I agree the metaphor could use some work. Your Ankh Morpork soldiers aren't in a position to protect you, however. Sir, you are right. You could have me killed right now, said De Word simply. You know that. I know that. But you won't for three reasons. The officers of Borogravia tend towards honour. Everyone says that. That's why they don't surrender. And I bleed most distressingly. And you don't need to, because everyone's interested in you. Suddenly it's all changed. Interested in us? Sir, in a sense, you could help a lot right now. Apparently, people back in Ankh Morpork were amazed when... Look, have you heard about what we call human interest, sir? No. De Word tried to explain. Blouse listened with his mouth open, and at the end said, "'Have I got this right? Although many people have been killed and wounded in this wretched war, it's not been of much interest to your readers. But it is now just because of us, because of a little skirmish in a town they never heard of. And because of that, we're suddenly a plucky little country, and people are telling your newspaper that your great city should be on our side. Yes, Lieutenant. We put out a second edition last night, you see, after I'd found out that Captain Horenz was really Prince Heinrich. Did you know this at the time, sir? Of course not, snapped Blouse. And you, Private, uh, Perks, would you have kicked him in the, um, would you have kicked him had you known? Polly dropped a mug in her nervousness and looked at Blouse. You may answer, of course, Perks, said the Lieutenant. "'Well, yes, sir. I would have kicked him. Harder, probably. I was defending myself, sir,' Polly said, carefully avoiding further details. You couldn't be sure what someone like De Word would do with them. "'Right. Good. Yes,' said De Word. "'Then you might be pleased with this. Our cartoonist, Fizz, drew this for the special edition. It was on the front page. We've sold a record number of copies.' He handed her a flimsy piece of paper, which by the look of the creases had been folded many times. It was a line drawing with lots of shading. It showed a huge figure with a large sword, a monstrous monocle, and a moustache as wide as a coat hanger, menacing a much smaller figure armed with nothing more than an instrument for lifting beats. In fact, there was a beat stuck on the end of it. At least, that was clearly what had been happening, right up to the point when the smaller figure, wearing a not-a-bad attempt at an ins and outs shako, and a face that slightly looked like Polly's, had kicked the other one squarely in the groinal regions. 
A sort of balloon was coming out of Polly's mouth, containing the words, That's for your royal prerogative, you blackguard. The balloon issuing from the mouth of the ogre, who could only be Prince Heinrich, said, Oh, my succession, that such a small thing could hurt so much. And in the background, a fat woman in a rumpled ball gown and a huge old-fashioned helmet was clasping her hands to an unbelievably large bosom, staring at the fight with a mixture of concern and admiration, and ballooning, Oh, my swain, I fear our liaison is cut short. Since no one else was saying much, but was simply staring, the words said rather nervously, Fizz is rather uh, direct in these matters, but amazingly popular. <coughs> You see, the curious thing is that although Ankh Morpork is probably the biggest bully around, in a subtle kind of way, we nevertheless have a soft spot for people who stand up to bullies, especially royal ones. We tend to be on their side, provided it doesn't cost us too much. Blouse cleared his throat. It's quite a good likeness of you, Perks, he said hoarsely. I only use my knee, sir, Polly protested, and that fat lady certainly wasn't there. "'That's more pork here,' said De Word. "'She's a sort of representation of the city, "'except that, in her case, she's not covered in mud and soot. "'And I have to add, for my part,' said Blouse, "'in his talking-to-a-meeting voice, "'that Boragravia is, in fact, larger than Slovenia, "'although most of the country is little more than barren mountainside.' "'That doesn't actually matter,' said De Word. "'It doesn't?' said Blouse. "'No, sir, it's just a fact.' It's not politics. In politics, sir, pictures like this are powerful. Sir, even the Alliance commanders are talking about you, and the Slovenians are angry and bewildered. If you, the heroes of the hour, could make a plea for a little common sense... The lieutenant took a long, deep breath. This is a foolish war, Mr. De Word, but I am a soldier. I have kissed the Duchess, as we say. It's an oath of loyalty. Don't tempt me to break it. I must fight for my country. We will repel all invaders. If there are deserters, we will find them and rally them again. We know the country. While we are free, Boragravia will be free. You have had your say. Thank you. Where is that tea, Perks? What? Oh, nearly done, sir, said Polly, turning back to the fire. It had been a sudden strange fancy, but a stupid plan. Now, out here... All the drawbacks were visible. How would she have got Paul home? Would he have wanted to come? Could she have managed it? Even if he was still alive, how could she hope to get him out of a prison? So you'll be guerrilla fighters, eh? said Mr. De Word behind her. Madmen, all of you. No, we are not irregulars, said Blouse. We kissed the Duchess. We are soldiers. Oh, well, said De Word. Then I admire your spirit at least. Ah, Otto. The vampire iconographer ambled up and gave them a shy smile. Do not be afraid, I am a black ribboner just like your corporal, he said. Light is my passion now. Oh, uh, well done, said Blouse. Take the pictures, Otto, said De Word. These gentlemen have a war to fight. Out of interest, Mr. De Word, Blouse interrupted. How did you get the pictures back to your city so quickly? Magic, I assume? What? De Word looked momentarily off balance. Oh, no, sir. Wizards are expensive, and Commander Vimes has said that there is going to be no first use of magic in this war. We send things by pigeon to our office in the keep, and then by clacks from the nearest trunk tower. Oh, really? said Blouse, showing rather more animation than Polly had seen up to now. Using numbers to indicate a scale of grey shades, perhaps? Mind God, said Otto. Well... Yes, as a matter of fact, we do, said De Word. I'm very impressed at you. I have seen the Clax Towers on the far bank of the Connect, said Blouse, his eyes lighting up. Very clever idea, using big shuttered boxes rather than the old-fashioned semaphore arms. And would I be right in my surmise that the box on the top, which opens its shutters once a second, is a, a kind of system, a uh, clock, that makes certain the whole Clax line keeps in step? Oh, good, thought so. One beat a second is probably the limit of the mechanisms, so no doubt all your efforts now are concentrated on maximising the information content per shutter operation? Yes, I imagine that would be the case. 
As for sending pictures, well, sooner or later all things are numbers, yes? Now, of course, you would use each of the two columns of four boxes to send a grey code, but it must be very slow. Have you considered a squeezing algorithm? De Word and Creek exchanged a glance. Are you sure you haven't been talking to anyone about this, sir? said the writer. Oh, it's all very elementary, said Blau, smiling happily. I had thought about it in the context of military maps, which are, of course, mostly white space. So I wondered if it would be possible to indicate a required shade on one column, and on the other side indicate how far along that rank that shade would persist. And a delightful bonus here is that if your map was simply in black and white, then you have even more. You haven't seen inside a Clax Tower, have you? said De Word. Alas, no, said Blouse. This is simply thinking aloud based on the de facto existence of your picture. I believe I can see a number of other little mathematical <coughs> tricks to make the passage of information even swifter, but I am sure these have already occurred to you. And, of course, a fairly minor modification could potentially double the information burden of the whole system at a stroke. And, of course, that is without using coloured filters at night, which I am certain, even with the overhead of extra mechanical effort, would surely increase throughput by... I'm sorry, did I say something wrong? The two men wore a glazed expression. De Word shook himself. Oh, uh, no, nothing, he said. And you seem to have got the grasp of things very quickly. No, it was quite straightforward once I started thinking about it, said Blouse. It was exactly the same when I had to redesign the department's filing system, you see. People build themselves something that works. Then circumstances change, and they have to tinker with it to make it continue to work and they are so busy tinkering that they cannot see that a much better idea would be to build a whole new system to deal with the new circumstances. But to an outsider, the idea is obvious. In politics as well as uh, filing systems and claxes, do you think? said De Word. Blouse's brow wrinkled. I'm sorry, I don't think I follow, he said. Would you agree that sometimes... A country's system is so out of date that it's only the outsiders that can see the need for wholesale change, said De Word. He smiled. Lieutenant Blouse did not. Just a point to ponder, maybe, said De Word. Uh, since you wish to tell the world of your defiance, would you object if my colleague takes your picture? Blouse shrugged. If it gives you any satisfaction, he said. It's an abomination, of course, but these days it's hard to find something that isn't. You must tell the world, Mr. De Word, that Borogravia won't lie down. We will not give in. We will fight on. Write that down in your little notebook, please. While we can stand, we will kick. Yes, but once again, may I implore you to... Mr. De Word, you have, I am sure, heard the saying that the pen is mightier than the sword. De Word preened a little. <laughs> of course, and I... Do you want to test it? Take your picture, sir, and then my men will escort you back to your road. Otto Shriek stood up and bowed to Blouse. He unslung his picture box. Oh, this will only take one minute, he said. It never does. But Polly watched in horrified fascination as Otto took picture after picture of Lieutenant Blouse in a variety of what the lieutenant thought were heroic poses. It is a terrible thing to see a man trying to jut out a chin he does not, in fact, have... Very impressive, said De Word. I just hope you live to see it in my paper, sir. I shall look forward to it with the keenest anticipation, said Blas. And now, Perks, please go along with the sergeant and put these two gentlemen back on their way. Otto sidled up to Polly as they walked back to the cart. I need to tell you something about your vampire, he said. Oh, yes? You are a friend of his, said Otto. Yes, said Polly. Is something wrong? Sir, is a problem... He's got twitchy because he's run out of coffee. Alas, if only it was that simple, Otto looked awkward. You have to understand that when a vampire forgoes the B word, there is a process that we call transference. They force themselves to desire something else. For me, this was not painful. I crave the perfection of light and shade. Pictures are my life, but your friend chose coffee. And now he has none. Oh, I see. I wonder if you do. It probably seemed so sensible to him. 
It is a human craving, and no one minds if you say, as it might be, I'm dying for a cup of coffee, or I'd kill for a cup of coffee. But without coffee, he will, I'm afraid, revert. Do you understand, this is very difficult for me to talk about. Otto trailed off. By revert, you mean? First, will come mild delusions, I think. A psychic susceptibility to all kinds of influences from who knows where, and vampires can hallucinate so strongly that they can be contagious. I think that is happening already. He will become erratic. This may last for several days, and then his conditioning will break and he will be once again a true vampire. No more Mr. Nice Coffee Drinker guy. Can't I do anything to help him? Otto reverentially laid his picture box in the back of the cart and turned to her. You can find him some coffee, or you can keep a wooden stake and a big knife ready. You would be doing him a favour, believe me. I can't do that. Otto shrugged. Find someone who will. He is amazing, said De Word as the cart rocked back down through the trees. I know the clax is against your religion, but he seems to understand all about it. Like I said, sir, he assesses stuff, said Jackram, beaming. Mind like a razor. He was talking about clax algorithms that the companies are only just now investigating, said De Word. That department he was talking about. Ah, I can see nothing gets past you, sir, said Jackram. Very hush, hush. Can't talk about it. To be frank, Sergeant, I'd always assumed that Borogravia was, well, backward. Jackram's smile was waxy and bright. If we seem to be a long way back, sir, it's only so as we can get a good run up. You know, Sergeant, it's a great shame to see a mind like that wasted, said De Word as the cart lurched in a rut. This is not an age of heroes and famous last stands and death or glory charges. Do your men a favour and try to tell him that, will you? Wouldn't dream of it, sir said Jackram. Here is your road, sir. Where will you be heading now? To Knek Valley, Sergeant. This is a good story, Sergeant. Thank you. Allow me to shake you by the hand. Glad to hear you think that, sir, said Jackram, extending his hand. Polly heard the faint clink of coins in their passage from palm to palm. De Word took the reins. But I must tell you, Sergeant, that we'll probably send off our stuff by pigeon within the hour, he said. We will have to say you have prisoners. "'Don't worry about that, sir,' said Jackram. "'By the time their mates come out here to rescue these gallopers, "'we'll be halfway back to the mountains. "'Our mountains.' "'They parted. "'Jackram watched them out of sight and turned to Polly. "'Him with his airs and graces,' he said. "'Did you see that? "'He insulted me by giving me a tip.' "'He glanced at his palm. "'Hm! Five ank more pork dollars. "'Well, at least he's a man who knows how to insult you handsomely,' he added and the coins disappeared into his jacket with remarkable speed. "'I think he wants to help us, Sarge,' said Polly. Jackram ignored that. "'I hate bloody Ankmore pork,' he said. "'Who are they to tell us what to do? Who cares what they think?' "'Do you think we can really join up with deserters, Sarge?' "'Nope. They deserted once, what's to stop them a second time? They spat on the Duchess when they deserted. They can't kiss and make up now. You get one kiss, that's all.' But Lieutenant Blows... The Rupert should stick to his sums. He thinks he's a soldier. Never walked on a battlefield in his life. All that rubbish he gave your man was death or glory stuff. And I'll tell you, Perks, I've seen death more often than I care to remember, but I've never clapped eyes on glory. I'm all for sending the fools to look for us where we ain't, though. He's not my man, Sarge, said Polly. Yeah, well, you're at home with the writing and reading, grumbled Jackram. You can't trust the people who do that stuff. They mess around with the world, and it turns out everything you know is wrong. They reached the gully again. The squad had come back from their various hiding places, and most were clustered around one of the newspapers. For the first time, Polly saw the picture. It was actually quite good, especially of Shufti and Wazza. She was mostly hidden by the bulk of Jackram, but you could see the sullen cavalrymen behind them, and their expressions were a picture in themselves. It's a good one of Tonka, said Igorina who didn't lisp so much when there were no officers to hear. "'Do you think having a picture like this is an abomination unto Nuggan?' said Shufti nervously. "'Probably,' said Polly absent-mindedly. "'Most things are.' She ran her eye down the text next to the picture. 
It was full of phrases like plucky farm boys and humiliation of some of Slovenia's best troops and sting in the tail. She could see why it had caused trouble. She rustled through the other pages. They were crammed with strange stories about places she'd never heard of and pictures of people she didn't recognise. But one page was a mass of grey text under a line of much bigger printing which read, Why this mad state must be stopped. Bewildered, her eye picked up phrases from the sea of letters. Disgraceful invasions of neighbouring states. Deluded worshippers of a mad god. A strutting bully. Outrage after outrage. Flying in the face of international opinion. Don't you lads read that rubbish. You don't know where it's been said Sergeant Jackram jovially, arriving behind them. It'll all be lies. We are leaving right... Corporal Maledict. Maledict, emerging from the trees, gave a lazy salute. He was still wearing his blanket. What are you doing out of uniform? I'm in uniform underneath, Sarge. We don't want to be seen, right? Like this, we become part of the jungle. It's a forest, Corporal, and without bloody uniforms, how the hell will we know our friends from our enemies? Maledict lit a cigarette before he replied. The way I see it, Sarge, he said, the enemy is everyone but us. Just one moment, Sergeant, said Blouse, who had looked up from a newspaper and had been watching the apparition with considerable interest. There are precedents in antiquity, you know. General Song Sung Lo moved his army disguised as a field of sunflowers, and General Tacticus once commanded his battalion to dress as spruces. Sunflowers, said Jackram, his voice oozing with disdain. Both actions were successful, Sergeant. No uniforms, no badges, no stripes, sir. Possibly you could be an extra large bloom, said Blouse, and his face betrayed no hint of amusement. And you have surely carried out actions at night when all markings are invisible? Yes, sir, but night is night, sir. Well, sunflowers is... is sunflowers, sir. I've worn this uniform for more than fifty... all my life, sir. And sneaking around without a uniform is downright dishonourable. It's for spies, sir. Jackram's face had gone beyond red into crimson, and Polly was amazed to see tears in the corners of his eyes. "'How can we be spies, Sergeant, in our own country?' said Blouse, calmly. Well, "'The L.T.'s got a point, Sarge,' said Maledict. Jackram turned like a bull at bay, and then, to Polly's amazement, he sagged. But she wasn't amazed for long. She knew the man. She didn't know why, but there was something about Jackram that she could read. It was in the eyes. He could lie with eyes as honest and tranquil as those of an angel. And if he appeared to be backing away... It was indeed only to get a run-up later on. "'All right, all right,' the sergeant said. "'Upon my oath, I am not a man to disobey orders,' and his eyes twinkled. "'Well done, sergeant,' said Blouse. Jackram pulled himself together. "'I don't want to be a sunflower, though,' he said. "'Happily, there are only fir trees in this area, sergeant.' "'Point well made, sir,' Jackram turned to the awed squad. "'All right,' Last detail, he bellowed. You heard the man spruce up. It was an hour later. As far as Polly could tell, they'd started out for the mountains, but had travelled in a wide semicircle, so that they ended up facing back the way they had come, but a few miles away. Was Blouse leading, or had he left it to Jackram? Neither man was complaining. The lieutenant called a halt in a thicket of birch, thus doubling the size of the thicket. You could say that the camouflage effects were effective because bright red and white show up against greens and greys. Beyond that, though, language tended to run out. Jade had scraped off her paint and was green and grey anyway. Igor looked like a walking brush. Wazza quivered like an aspen all the time, so her needles rustled permanently. The others had made more or less reasonable attempts, and Polly was pretty proud of her own efforts. Jackram was about as tree-like as a big red rubber ball. Polly suspected that he'd surreptitiously shined up his brasswork too. Every tree held a mug of tea in limb or hand. After all, they'd stopped for five minutes. Men, said Blouse, as if he'd only just reached that conclusion, you may have gathered that we are heading back toward the mountains to raise a deserter's army there. This story is, in fact, a ruse for the benefit of Mr. De Word. 
He paused, as if expecting some reaction. They stared at him. He went on. We are, in fact, continuing our journey to the Connect Valley. This is the last thing the enemy will be expecting. Polly glanced at the sergeant. He was grinning. It is an established fact that a small, light force can get into places that a battalion cannot penetrate, Blouse went on. Men, we will be that force. Is that not right, Sergeant Jackram? Yes, sir. We will come down like a hammer on those forces smaller than us, said Blouse happily. Yes, sir. And from those that outnumber us, we will merge silently into the forest. Yes, sir. We will slip past their sentries. That's right, sir, said Jackram. And take Connect Keep from under their noses. Jackram's tea sprayed across the clearing. I dare say our enemy feels impregnable just because he commands a heavily armed fort on a rocky crag with walls a hundred feet high and twenty feet thick, Blouse continued, as if half the trees weren't now dripping tea. But he is in for a surprise. You are right, Sarge, whispered Polly. Jackram was making strange little noises in his throat. Does anyone have any questions? said Blouse. Igorina raised a branch. How will we get in, far? she said. Ah, good question, said Blouse. All will become apparent in due time. Aerial cavalry, said Maledict. Pardon, Corporal? Flying machines, sir, said Maledict. They won't know where to expect us. We touch down in a handy LZ, take them out, and then dust off. Blouse's clear brow wrinkled a little. Flying machine? he said. I saw a picture of one by someone called Leonard of Quarum. A sort of a flying windmill. It's just like a big screw up in the sky. I don't think we need one of those, although the advice is welcome, said Blouse. Not when we've got a big screw up down here, sir, Jackram managed. Sir, this is just a bunch of recruits, sir. All that stuff about honour and freedom and that, that was just for the writer man, right? Good idea, sir, yeah. Let's get to Connect Valley. Let's sneak in and join the rest of the lads. That's where we ought to be, sir. You can't be serious about taking the keep, sir. I wouldn't try that with a thousand men. I might try it with half a dozen, Sergeant. Jackram's eyes bulged. Really, sir? What'll Private Goon do? Tremble at them? Young Igor will stitch him up, will he? Private Halter will give him a nasty look? They're promising lads, sir, but they're not men. General Tacticus said the fate of a battle may depend upon the actions of one man in the right place, Sergeant said Blouse, calmly. And having a lot more soldiers than the other bugger, sir, Jackram insisted. Sir, we should get to the rest of the army. Maybe it's trapped, maybe it isn't. All that stuff about them not wanting to slaughter us, sir, that makes no sense. The idea is to win, sir. If the rest of them have stopped attacking, it's because they're frightened of us. We should be down there. That's the place for young recruits, sir, where they can learn. The enemy is looking for them, sir. If General Frock is among those captured, the keep will be where he is held, said Blouse. I believe he was the first officer you served under as a sergeant, am I right? Jackram hesitated. That's right, sir, he said eventually. And he was the dumbest lieutenant I've ever met, bar one. I am positive there is a secret entrance into the keep, sergeant. Polly's memory nudged her. If Paul was alive, he was in the keep. She caught Shufti's eye. The girl nodded. She'd been thinking along the same lines. She didn't talk much about her fiancé, and Polly wondered how official the arrangement was. Permission to speak, Sarge, she said. Okay, Perks. I'd like to find a way into the keep, Sarge. Perks, are you volunteering to attack the biggest, strongest castle within five hundred miles, single-handed? I'll go too, said Shufti. Oh, two of you, said Jackram. Oh, well, that's all right, then. I'll go, said Wasser. The Duchess has told me that I should. Jackram looked down at Wasser's thin little face and watery eyes and sighed. He turned back to Blouse. Let's get a move on, sir, shall we? We can talk about this later. At least we're headed to Knek, first stop on the road to hell. Perks and Igor, you take point. Maledict, yo! Uh, you scout on ahead. I hear ya. Good. As the vampire walked past Polly, the world just for a moment changed. The forest became greener, the sky greyer, 
and she heard a noise overhead like whop, 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 and then it was gone. Vampire hallucinations are contagious, she thought. What's going on in his head? She hurried forward with Igorina, and they set off again through the forest. Birds sang. The effect was peaceful, if you didn't know about birdsong, but Polly could recognise the alarm calls close by and the territorial threats far off, and everywhere the preoccupation with sex. That took the edge off the pleasure. It's hard to be an ornithologist and walk through a wood when all around you the world is shouting, Bugger off, this is my bush. Ah, the best thief. Have sex with me. I can make my chest big and red. Polly, said Igorina. Hmm? Could you kill someone if you had to? Polly came right back to the here and now. What sort of question is that to ask anyone? I think it's the sort you'd ask a soldier, said Igorina. I don't know. If they were attacking me, I suppose, hurt them hard enough to keep them lying down anyway. And you? We have a great respect for life, Polly, said Igorina solemnly. It's easy to kill someone, and almost impossible to bring them back again. Almost. Well, if you don't have a really good lightning rod, and even if you have, they're never quite the same, cutlery tends to stick to them. Igorina, why are you here? The clan isn't very keen on girls getting too involved in the great work, said Igorina, looking downcast. Stick to your needlework, my mother keeps saying. Well, that's all very fine, but I know I'm good at the actual incisions as well, especially the fiddly bits. And I think a woman on the slab would feel a lot better about things if she knew there was a female hand on the wee belong dead switch. Though... I thought some battlefield experience would convince my father. Soldiers aren't choosy about who saves their lives. I suppose men are the same the world over, said Polly. On the inside, certainly. And, er, uh, you really can put your hair back. Polly had seen it in its jar when they'd been breaking camp. It had spun gently in its bottle of green liquid like some fine, rare seaweed. Oh, yes. Scalp transplants are easy. It stings a bit for a couple of minutes, that's all. There was a movement between the trees, and then the blur resolved itself into maledict. He held a finger to his lips as he drew closer, and then whispered urgently, Jarl is dragging us. Polly and Igorina looked at one another. Who's Charlie? Maledict stared at them, and then rubbed his face distractedly. I'm sorry, uh, sorry, it's... Oh, look, we're being followed. I, I know it. The sun was setting. Polly peered over the rocky ledge, back the way they had come. She could make out the track, golden and red in the late afternoon light. Nothing was moving. The outcrop was near the top of another rounded hill. The rear of it became the floor of a little enclosed space, surrounded by bushes. It made a good lookout for people who wanted to see without being seen and it had done so in the recent past by the look of the old fires. Maledict was sitting with his head in his hands, with jackram and blouse on either side of him. They were trying to understand, and not making much progress. So you can't hear anything, said blouse. No. And you didn't see anything and can't smell anything, said jackram. No, I told you, but there is something after us, watching us. But if you can't, blouse began. Oh, look, I'm a vampire, panted Maledict. Just trust me, OK? I thought, Sarge, said Igorina from behind Jackram. We Igors often serve vampires. In times of stress, their personal space can extend as much as ten miles from their body. There was the usual pause that followed an extended lisp. People need time to think. Stress, said Blaise. You know how you can feel that someone's looking at you, mumbled Maledict. Well, it's like that times a thousand. And it's not a, a feeling, it's something I know. Lots of people are looking for us, Corporal, said Blouse, patting him kindly on the shoulder. It doesn't mean that they'll find us. Polly, looking down on the gold-lit woodland, opened her mouth to speak. It was dry. Nothing came out. Maledict shook the lieutenant's hand away. This 
person isn't looking for us. They know where we are. Polly forced saliva into her mouth and tried again. Movement! And then it wasn't there any more. She'd have sworn there had been something on the path, something that merged with the light, revealing itself only by the changing, wavering pattern of shadows as it moved. Er, perhaps not, she muttered. Look, we've all lost sleep and we're all a little strung out, said Blouse. Let's just keep things down, shall we? I need coffee, moaned Maledict, rocking back and forth. Polly squinted at the distant pathway. The breeze was shaking the trees and red-gold leaves were drifting down. For a moment there was just a suggestion. She got to her feet. Stare at shadows and waving branches for long enough and you could see anything. It was like looking at pictures in the fire. OK, said Shufty, who'd been working over the fire. This might do it. It smells like coffee anyway. Well, quite like coffee. Well, quite like coffee if coffee was made from acorns anyway. She'd roasted some acorns. At least the woods had plenty of them at this time of year, and everyone knew that roasted, ground acorns could be substituted for coffee, didn't they? Polly had agreed that it was worth a try, but as far as she could recall, no one had ever, given the choice, said, No, I will not touch horrible coffee any more. It's a long, black, ground acorn substitute for me, with extra floating gritty bits. She took the mug from Shufty and carried it over to the vampire. As she bent down, the world changed. Wop, 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 wop. The sky was a haze of dust, turning the sun into a blood-red disk. For a moment, Polly saw them in the sky. Giant, fat screws spinning in the air, hovering in the air, but drifting slowly toward her. "'He's having flash sides,' whispered Igorina at her elbow. "'Flash sides?' "'Like someone else's flashbacks. "'We don't know anything about them. "'They could come from anywhere. "'A vampire at this stage is open to all sorts of influences. "'Give him the coffee, please.' Maledict grabbed the mug and tried to down the contents so quickly that they spilled down his chin. They watched him swallow. "'A taste's like mud,' he said, putting down the mug. "'Yes, but is it working?' Maledict looked up and blinked. "'Ye gods, but this stuff is gruesome!' "'Are we in a forest or a jungle? Any flying screws?' Igorina demanded. "'How many fingers am I holding up?' "'You know, that's something an Igor should never say,' said Maledict, grimacing. "'But the feelings aren't so strong. I can suck it down. I can gut it out.' Polly looked at Igorina, who shrugged and said, "'That's nice.' and motioned to Polly to join her a little way off. "'He, or possibly she, is right on the edge,' she said. "'Well, we all are,' said Polly. "'We're hardly getting any sleep.' "'You know what I mean. "'I've uh, taken the liberty of um, being prepared.' Wordlessly, Igorino let her jacket fall open just for a moment. Polly saw a knife, a wooden stake, and a hammer in neatly stitched little pockets. "'It's not going to come to that, is it?' "'I hope not,' said Igorina. "'But if it does, I'm the only one who can reliably find the heart. "'People always think it's more to the left than—' "'It's not going to come to that,' said Polly firmly. "'The sky was red. "'The war was a day away. "'Polly crept along just below the ridge with the tea can. "'It was tea that kept the army on its feet.' Remember what's real. Well, that took some doing. Tonka and Lofty, for example. It didn't matter which of them was on guard, the other one would be there as well. And they were, sitting side by side on a fallen tree, staring down the slope. They were holding hands. They always held hands when they thought they were alone. But it seemed to Polly that they didn't hold hands like people who were, well, friends. They held hands tightly, like someone who has slipped over a cliff would hold hands with a rescuer, fearing that to let go would be to fall away. Uh, tea up, she quavered. The girls turned, and she dipped a couple of mugs into the scalding tea. You know, she said quietly, no one would hate you if you ran away tonight. What do you mean, Oz? said Lofty. 
Well, what's there in Connect for a you? You got away from the school. You could go anywhere. I bet the two of you could sneak. We're staying, said Tonka severely. We talked about it. Where else would we go? Anyway, supposing something is following us. Probably just an animal, said Polly, who didn't believe it herself. Animals don't do that, said Tonka. And I don't think Maledict would get so excited. It's probably more spies. Well, we'll get them. Nobody is going to take us back, said Lofty. Oh, er, uh, good, said Polly, backing away. Well, must get on. No one likes cold tea, eh? She hurried around the hill. Whenever Lofty and Tonka were together, she felt like a trespasser. Wazza was on guard in a small dell, watching the land below with her usual expression of slightly worrying intensity. She turned as Polly approached. Oh, Polly, said Wazza, good news. Oh, good, said Polly weakly. I like good news. She says it'll be all right for us not to wear our dimity scarves, said Wazza. What? Oh, good, said Polly. But only because we are serving a higher purpose, said Wazza. And just as blouse could invert commas, Wazza could drop capital letters into a spoken sentence. That's good, then, said Polly. You know, Polly, said Wazza, I think the world would be a lot better if it was run by women. There wouldn't be any wars. Of course, the book would consider such an idea a dire abomination unto Nuggan. It may be in error. I shall consult the Duchess. Bless this cup that I may drink of it, she added. Er, uh, yes, said Polly, and wondered what she should dread more. Maledict suddenly turning into a ravening monster, or was her reaching the end of whatever mental journey she was taking? She'd been a kitchen maid, and now she was subjecting the book to critical analysis and talking to a religious icon. That sort of thing led to friction. The presence of those seeking the truth is infinitely to be preferred to the presence of those who think they've found it. Besides, she thought as she watched was a drink, you only thought the world would be better if it was run by women if you didn't actually know many women, or old women at least. Take the whole thing about the dimity scarves. Women had to cover their hair on Fridays, but there was nothing about this in the book, which was pretty dark pretty damn rigorous about most things. It was just a custom. It was done because it had always been done. And if you forgot or didn't want to, the old women got you. They had eyes like hawks. They could practically see through walls. And the men took notice because no man wanted to cross the crones in case they started watching him. So half-hearted punishment would be dealt out. Whenever there was an execution, and especially when there was a whipping, you always found the grannies in the front row sucking on peppermints. Polly had forgotten her dimity scarf. She did wear it at home on Fridays, for no other reason than that it was easier than not doing so. She vowed that if she ever got back, she'd never do it again. Er, uh, was, she said. Yes, Polly. You've got a direct line to the Duchess, have you? We talk about things, said Wazza dreamily. You, er, uh, couldn't raise the subject of coffee, could you? said Polly wretchedly. The Duchess can only move very, very small things, said Wazza. A few beans, perhaps. Was we really need some coffee, I don't think the acorns are that much of a substitute. I will pray, said Wazza. Good, you do that, said Polly. And strangely enough, she felt a little more hopeful. Maledict had hallucinations, but Wazza had a certainty you could bend steel around. It was the opposite of a hallucination somehow. It was as if she could see what was real and you couldn't. Polly, said Wazza, yes. You don't believe in the Duchess, do you? I mean, the real Duchess, not your inn. Polly looked into the small, pinched, intense face. Well, I mean, they say she's dead. And I prayed to her when I was small, but since you ask, I don't exactly, um, believe, as, uh, she gabbled. She is standing just behind you, just behind your right shoulder. In the silence of the woods, Polly turned. I can't see her, she said. I am happy for you, said Wazza, handing her the empty mug. But I didn't see anything, said Polly. No, said Wazza, 
But you turned round. Polly had never asked too many questions about the girls' working school. She was, by definition, a good girl. Her father was an influential man in the community, and she worked hard. She didn't have much to do with men, and, most important, she was, well, smart. She was bright enough to do what a lot of other people did in the chronic, reason-free insanity that was everyday life in Munns. She knew what to see and what to ignore, when to obey and when to merely present the face of obedience, when to speak and when to keep her thoughts to herself. She learned the ways of the survivor. Most people did. But if you rebelled, or were merely dangerously honest, or had the wrong kind of illness, or were not wanted, or were a girl who liked the boys more than the old women thought you should, and worse, were not good at counting, then the school was your destination. She didn't know much about what went on in there, but imagination rushed to fill the gap. And she wondered what happened to you in that hellish pressure cooker. If you were tough like Tonka, it boiled you hard and gave you a shell. Lofty, it was hard to know. She was quiet and shy until you saw firelight reflected in her eyes, and sometimes the flames were there in the absence of any fire to reflect. But if you were Wazza, dealt a poor hand to start with, and locked up, and starved, and beaten, and mistreated Nuggan knew how, and yes, Polly thought, Nuggan probably did know how, and pushed deeper and deeper into yourself, what would you find down there? And then you'd look up from those depths into the only smile you ever saw. The last man on guard duty was Jackram, because Shufty was busy cooking. He was sitting on a mossy rock, crossbow in one hand, staring at something in his hand. He spun around as she approached, and Polly caught the gleam of gold as something was shoved back in his jacket. The sergeant lowered the bow. "'You make enough noise for an elephant, Perks,' he said. "'Sorry, Sarge,' said Polly, who knew she hadn't. He took the tea mug and turned to point downhill. "'See that bush down there, Perks,' he said. "'Just to the right of that fallen log.' Polly squinted. "'Yes, Sarge,' she said. "'Notice anything about it?' Polly stared again. "'There must be something wrong about it,' she decided, "'otherwise he wouldn't have asked her.' She concentrated. "'The shadow's wrong,' she decided at last. "'Good lad. "'The reason being, our chum is behind the bush. "'He's been a-watching of me, and I've been a-watching of him. "'Nothing else for it. "'He'll have it away on his toes as soon as he sees anyone move, "'and he's too far away to drop an arrow on him.' "'An enemy?' "'I don't think so. "'A friend?' "'Cocky devil, at any rate. "'He doesn't care that I know he's there.' You go on back up the hill, lad, and bring down that big bow we got off the... There he goes. The shadow had vanished. Polly stared into the woods, but the long light was getting crimson, and dusk was unfolding between the trees. It's a wolf, said Jackram. A werewolf, said Polly. Now, what makes you think that? Because Sergeant Towering said we'd got a werewolf in the squad. I'm sure we haven't. I mean, we'd have found out by now, wouldn't we? But I wondered if they'd seen one. "'Can't do anything about it, anyway,' said Jackram. "'A silver arrow would do the job, but we've got none. "'What about our shilling, Sarge? "'Oh, you think you can kill a werewolf with an I.O.U.?' "'Oh, yeah.' "'Then Polly added, "'You've got a real shilling, Sarge, around your neck with that gold medallion. "'If you could have bent steel around Wazza's certainty, "'you could have heated it with Jackram's glare. "'What's round my neck is no business of yours, Perks, "'and the only thing worse than a werewolf "'is me if anyone tries to take my shilling off me, understand?' "'He softened as he saw Polly's terrified expression. "'We'll move on after we've eaten,' he said. "'Find a better place for a rest, "'somewhere easier to defend. "'We're all pretty tired, Sarge, "'so I want us all to be upright and armed "'if our friend comes back with his chums,' said Jackram. He followed her gaze. The gold locket had slipped out of his jacket and dangled guiltily on its chain. He deftly tucked it away. "'She was just a girl I knew,' said Jackram. "'That's all, right? It was a long time ago.' "'I didn't ask you, Sarge,' said Polly, backing away. Jackram's shoulders settled. "'That's right, lad, you didn't. 
and I ain't asking you about anything neither. But I reckon we'd better find the corporal some coffee, eh? I meant that, Sarge. And our Rupert's dreaming of laurel wreaths all round his head, Perks. We've got ourselves a goddamn hero here. Can't think, can't fight, no bloody use at all except for a famous last stand and a medal sent to his old mum. And I've been in a few famous last stands, lad, and they are butcher shops. That's what Blouse is leading you into, mark my words. What will you lot do then, eh? We've had a few scuffles, but that's not war. Think you'll be man enough to stand when the metal meets the meat? You did, Sarge, said Polly. You said you were in a few last stands. Yeah, lad, but I was holding the metal. Polly walked back up the slope. All this, she thought, and we haven't even got there. Sarge is thinking about the girl he left behind. Well, that's normal. And Tonka and Lofty only think about one another. But I suppose after you've been in that school... And as for Wazza... Polly wondered how she would have survived the school. Would she have grown hard like Tonka? Would she have just folded up inside, like the maids who came and went and worked hard and never had a name? Or perhaps she would have become like Wazza and found some door in her own head. I may be lowly, but I talk to gods. Wazza had said, Not your inn. Had she ever told Wazza about the Duchess? Surely not. Surely she... But no, she had told Tonka, hadn't she? That was it, then, all explained. Tonka must have mentioned it to Wazza at some point. Nothing weird about it at all, even if practically no one ever had a conversation with Woz. It was so hard. She was so intense, so coiled up. But that had to be the only explanation. Yes. She wasn't going to let there be any other. Polly shivered, and was aware that someone was walking beside her. She looked up and groaned. It was a tall, robed figure with a scythe. You're a hallucination, right? Oh, yes. You are all in a state of heightened sensibility caused by mental contagion and lack of sleep. If you're a hallucination, how do you know that? I know it because you know it. I am simply better at articulating it, said Death. I'm not going to die, am I? I mean, right now. No, but you were told that you would walk with Death every day. Oh, yes. Corporal Scallet said that. He is an old friend. You might say he is on the installment plan. Do you mind walking a bit more invisibly? Of course. How's this? And quietly, too? There was silence, which was presumably the answer. And polish yourself up a bit, said Polly to the empty air, and that robe needs a wash. There was no reply, but she felt better for saying it. Shofty had cooked beef stew with dumplings and herbs. It was magnificent. It was also a mystery. "'I don't recall us passing a cow, Private,' said Blouse, as he handed his tin plate along for a second helping. "'Eh, uh, no, sir. And yet you have acquired beef.' "'Eh, uh, yes, sir. Eh, uh, when that writer man came up in his cart, well, when you were talking, eh, uh, I crept around and I took a look inside.' "'There's a name for someone who does that sort of thing, Private,' said Blouse, severely. "'Yeah, it's Quartermaster, Shufti. Well done,' said Jackram. "'If that writer man gets hungry, he can always eat his words, eh, Lieutenant?' "'And... yes,' said Blouse, carefully. "'Yes, of course. Good initiative, Private.' "'Oh, I didn't think it up, sir,' said Shufti brightly. "'Sarge told me to.' Polly stopped, spoon halfway to her mouth, and swivelled her eyes from sergeant to lieutenant. "'You teach looting, sergeant,' said Blouse. There was a joint gasp from the squad. If this was a bar back at the Duchess, the regulars would have been hurrying out of the doors, and Polly would have been helping her father get the bottles off the shelf. "'Not looting, sir, not looting,' said Jackram calmly, licking his spoon. Under Duchess's regulations, Rule 611, Section 1C, Paragraph I, sir, it would be plundering. 
said cart being the property of bloody ank Morpork, sir, which is aiding and abetting the enemy. Plundering is allowed, sir. The two men held eye contact for a moment, and then Blouse reached behind him and into his pack. Polly saw him draw out a small yet thick book. Rule 611, he murmured. Blouse glanced up at the sergeant and thumbed through the thin, shiny pages. 611, pillaging, plundering and looting, ah yes. And let me see... You are with us, Sergeant Jackram, owing to Rule 796, I think you reminded me at the time. There was another silence, broken only by the riffle of the pages. 796, 796, said Blouse softly. Ah! He stared at the page, and Jackram stared at him. And Polly watched Jackram and knew, knew that there was no Rule 796. Blouse closed the book with a leathery thwap. "'Absolutely correct, Sergeant,' he said brightly. "'I commend you on your encyclopedic knowledge of the regulations.' Jackram looked astounded. "'What?' "'You were practically word-perfect, Sergeant,' said Blouse, and there was a gleam in his eye. Polly remembered Blouse looking at the captured cavalry captain. This was that same look, the look which said, "'Now I have the upper hand.' Jackram's chins wobbled. "'You had something to add, Sergeant?' said Blouse. "'Er, uh, no, sir,' said Jackram, his face an open declaration of war. "'We'll leave at moonrise,' said Blouse. "'I suggest we all get some rest until then, and then may we prevail.' He nodded to the group and walked over to where Polly had spread his blanket in the lee of the bushes. After a few moments there were some snores which Polly refused to believe. Jackram certainly didn't. He got up and strode out of the firelight. Polly hurried after him. "'Did you hear that?' snarled the sergeant, staring out at the darkening hills. "'The little yo-yo! What right has he got, checking up in the book of words?' "'Well, you did quote chapter and verse, Sarge,' said Polly. "'So officers are supposed to believe what they're told.' And then he smiled. "'Did you see? Caught me out and smiled at me. Thinks he's got one over on me just because he caught me out.' You did lie, Sarge. I did not, Perks. It's not lying when you do it to officers. It's presenting them with the world the way they think it ought to be. You can't let them start checking up for themselves. They get the wrong ideas. I told you, it'll be the death of all of us, invading the bloody keep the man's wrong in the head. Sarge, said Polly urgently. Yes, what? We're being signalled, Sarge. On a distant hilltop, twinkling like an early evening star, a white light was flashing. Blouse lowered his telescope. "'They're repeating CQ,' he said, "'and I believe those longer pauses are when they're aiming their tube in different directions. They're looking for their spies. CQ, see? Private Igor. Far? You know how that tube works, don't you?' "'Oh, yes, sir. You just light a flare in the box, and then it's just point and click.' "'You're not going to answer it, are you, sir?' said Jackram, horrified. "'I am indeed, Sergeant,' said Blouse briskly. "'Private Carborundum, please assemble the tube. Manacle, please bring the lantern. I shall need to read the codebook.' "'But that'll give away our position,' said Jackram. "'No, Sergeant, because although this term may be unfamiliar to you, I intend to what we call lie,' said Blouse. "'Igor, I'm sure you have some scissors, although I'd rather you didn't attempt to repeat the word.' "'I have some of the appliances you mentioned, sir,' said Igorina stiffly. "'Good,' Blouse looked around. "'It's almost pitch dark now. Ideal. "'Take my blanket and cut, oh, a three-inch circle out of it, "'and then tie the blanket over the front of the tube. "'That will cut off most of the light, sir.' "'Indeed it will. My plan depends upon it,' said Blouse proudly. "'Sir, they will see the light. They'll know we're here.' said Jackram, as though repeating things to a child. "'I explained, Sergeant. I will lie,' said Blouse. "'You can't lie when—' "'Thank you for your input, Sergeant. That will be all for now,' said Blouse. "'Are we ready, Igor?' "'Just about, sir,' said Igorina, tying the blanket across the end of the tube. "'Okay, sir. I'll light the flare when you say.' Blouse unfolded the little book. "'Ready, Private?' he said. "'Yep,' 
said Jade. On the word long, you will hold the trigger for the count of two and then let go. On the word short, you will hold it down for the count of one and likewise let it go. Got that? Yep, LT. Could hold it down for lots if you like, said Jade. One, two, many, lots. I'm good at counting. I as you like. Just say the word. Two will suffice, said Blouse. And you, Private Goom, I want you to take my telescope and look for long and short flashes from that light over there. Understand? Polly saw Woz's face and said quickly, I'll do that, sir. A small white hand was laid on her arm. In the miserly glimmer of the dark lantern, Woz's eyes glowed with the light of certainty. The Duchess guides our footsteps now, she said, and took the telescope from the lieutenant. What we are doing is her work, sir. Is it? Oh, well, <clears throat> that's good, said Blaz. She will bless this instrument of far-seeing that I may use it, said Wazza. Indeed, <clears throat> said Blows nervously. Well done. Now, are we ready? Send as follows. Long, long, short. The shutter in the tube clicked and rattled as the message flashed out across the sky. When the troll lowered the tube, there was half a minute of darkness, and then... Short, long, Wazza began. Blouse held the code book up to his face, his lips moving as he read by the pinpoints of light escaping from the joints of the box. W R U, he said, and M S G P R. That's not a message, said Jackram. On the contrary, they want to know where we are because they're having trouble seeing our light, said Blouse. Send as follows. Short, I protest, sir. Blouse lowered the book. Sergeant, I am about to tell our spy that we are seven miles further away than we really are. Do you understand? And I am certain they will believe us because I have artificially reduced the light output from our device. Do you understand? And I will tell them that their spies have encountered a very large party of recruits and deserters heading for the mountains and are in pursuit. Do you understand? I am making us invisible. Do you understand? Do you understand, Sergeant Jackram? The squad held their breath. Jackram drew himself stiffly to attention. Fully understood, sir, he said. Very well. Jackram stood to attention as the messages were exchanged, like a naughty pupil forced to stand by the teacher's desk. Messages flashed across the sky from hilltop to hilltop. Lights flickered. The clack's tube rattled. Wazza called out the longs and shorts. Blouse scribbled in the book. S. P. P. 2, he said aloud. Ha! That's an order to remain where we are. More flashes, sir, said Wazza. T. Y. E. 3, said Blouse, still making notes. That. Be ready to give aid. N. V. A. S. N. That's... That's not the code, sir, said Polly. Private. Send as follows right now, Blaz croaked. Long, long. The message went. They watched while the dew fell, and overhead the stars came out and twinkled messages no one ever tried to read. The clacks went silent. Now we leave as soon as possible, said Blaz. He gave a little cough. I believe the phrase is, let us get the heck out of here. Close, sir, said Polly. Quite close. There was an old, very old, Borogravian song with more Z's and V's in it than any lowlander could pronounce. It was called Blogvieji, and it meant, The sun has risen, let's make war. You needed a special kind of history to get all that in one word. Sam Vimes sighed. The little countries here fought because of the river, because of idiot treaties, because of royal rows, but mostly they fought because they had always fought. They made war, in fact, because the sun came up. This war had tied itself in a knot. Downriver, the valley narrowed to a canyon before the Kneck plunged over a waterfall a quarter of a mile high. Anyone trying to get up through the jagged mountains there would find themselves in a world of gorges, knife-edged ridges, permanent ice, and even more permanent death. Anyone trying to cross the Kneck into Slovenia now would be butchered on the shore. 
The only way out of the valley was back along the Kinec, which would put an army under the shadow of the keep. That had been fine when the keep was in Borogravian hands. Now that it had been captured, they'd be passing in range of their own weapons. And such weapons! Vimes had seen catapults that would throw a stone ball three miles. When it landed, it would crack into needle-sharp shards. Or there was the other machine, which sent six-foot steel discs skimming through the air. Once they'd hit the ground and leapt up again, they were unreliable as hell, but that only made them more terrifying. Vimes had been told that the edged disc would probably keep going for several hundred yards, no matter how many men or horses it encountered on the way. And they were only the latest ideas. There were plenty of conventional weapons, if by that you meant giant bows, catapults, and mangonels that hurled balls of a Phoebean fire which clung while it burned. From up here, in his drafty tower, he could see the fires of the dug-in army all across the plain. They couldn't retreat, and the Alliance, if that's what you could call the petulant hubbub, didn't dare head up the valley into the heart of the country with that army at their back, yet didn't have enough men to hold the keep and corral the enemy. And in a few weeks it would start to snow. The passes would fill up. Nothing would be able to get through. And every day, thousands of men and horses would need feeding. Of course, the men could, eventually, eat the horses, thus settling two feeding problems at a stroke. After that, there would have to be the good old leg rotor, which, Vimes understood from one of the friendlier Slovenians, was a common feature of winter warfare up here. Since he was Captain Hopalong Splatzer, Vimes believed him. And then it would rain and then the rain and the snow melt together would turn the damn river into a flood. But before that, the Alliance would have bickered itself apart and gone home. All the Borogravians had to do, in fact, was hold their ground to score a draw. He swore under his breath. Prince Heinrich had inherited the throne in a country where the chief export was a kind of hand-painted wooden clog, but in ten years, he vowed, his capital city of Rigor would be the ankh Morpork of the mountains. For some reason, he thought ankh Morpork would be pleased about this. He was anxious, he said, to learn the ankh Morpork way of doing things, the kind of innocent ambition that could well lead to an aspiring ruler, well, finding out the ankh Morpork way of doing things. Heinrich had a reputation locally for cunning, but Ankh Morpork had overtaken cunning a thousand years ago, had sped past Devious, had left Artful far behind, and had now, by a roundabout route, arrived at Straightforward. Vimes leafed through the papers on his desk, and looked up when he heard a shrill, harsh cry outside. A buzzard came in a long, shallow swoop through the open window, and alighted on a makeshift perch at the far end of the room. Vimes strolled over as the little figure on the bird's back raised his flying goggles. "'How's it going, Buggy?' he said. "'They're getting suspicious, Mr. Vimes, and Sergeant Angler says it's getting a bit risky now if they're so close. Tell her to come on in, then. "'Right, sir. And they still need coffee.' "'Oh, damn, haven't they found any?' "'No, sir. And it's getting tricky with the vampire.' "'Well, if they're suspicious now, then they'll be certain if we drop a flask of coffee on them. "'Sergeant Angua says we'll probably get away with it, sir. She didn't see why.' "'The gnome looked expectantly at Vimes. So did his buzzard. "'They've come a long way, sir, for a bunch of girls. Well, mostly girls.' "'Vimes reached out absent-mindedly to pet the bird. "'Don't, sir, she'll have your thumb off!' Buggy yelled. "'There was a knock on the door, and Reg came in with a tray of raw meat.' saw Buggy over, Red, so I thought I'd nipped out the kitchen, sir. Well done, Reg. Don't they ask why you want raw meat? Yes, sir. I tell them you eat it, sir. Vimes paused before answering. Reg meant well, after all. Well, it probably can't do my reputation any harm, he said. By the way, what was going down in the crypt? Oh, they're not what I'd call proper zombies, sir, said Reg, selecting a piece of meat and dangling it in front of Morag. More like dead men walking. Er, uh, yes, said Vimes. I mean, 
There's no real thinking going on, the zombie went on, picking up another lump of raw rabbit. No embracing the opportunities of a life beyond the grave, sir. They're just a lot of old memories on legs. The sort of thing that gives zombies a bad name, Mr. Vimes. It makes me so angry. Morag tried to snap at another lump of bloody rabbit fur that Reg, oblivious for the moment, was waving aimlessly. Eh, uh, Reg, said Buggy. How hard can it be, sir, to move with the times? Now take me, for example. One day I woke up dead. Did I? Reg, Vimes warned as Morag's head bobbed back and forth. Take it lying down, no. And I didn't. Reg, be careful. She's just had two of your fingers off. What? No. Oh. Reg held up a denuded hand and stared at it. Oh, now, will you look at that? He peered down at the floor with a hope that was quickly dashed. Blast! Any chance we can make her throw up? Only by sticking your remaining fingers down her throat, Reg. Sorry, Buggy, do the best you can, please. And you, Reg, go back downstairs and see if they've got any coffee, will you? Oh, dear, murmured Shifty. It's big, said Tonka. Blouse said nothing. Not seen it before, sir, said Jackram cheerfully as they stared at the distant keep. If there is a fairy tale scale for castles, where the top end is occupied by those white, spire encrusted castles with the blue pointy roofs, then Connect Keep was low, black, and clung to its outcrop like a storm cloud. A bed of the Connect ran around it. Along the peninsula on which it was built, the approach road was wide and bereft of cover, and an ideal stroll for those who were tired of life. Blouse took all this in. Ah, uh, no, Sergeant, said Blouse. I've seen pictures, of course, but they don't do it justice. Any of them books you read tell you what to do, sir, said Jackram. They were lying in some bushes half a mile away from the keep. Possibly, Sergeant. In the craft of war... Song Sung Lo said, To win without fighting is the greatest victory. The enemy wishes us to attack where he is strongest, therefore we will disappoint him. A way will present itself, Sergeant. Well, it's never presented itself to me, and I've been here dozens of times, said Jackram, still grinning. Ha! Even the rats should have to disguise themselves as washerwomen to get in that place. Even if you get up that road, you've got narrow entrances, holes in the ceiling to pour hot oil through, gates everywhere that a troll couldn't smash through, a couple of mazes, a hundred little ways you can be shot at. Oh, it's a wonderful place to attack. I wonder how the Alliance got in, said Blouse. Treachery, probably, sir. The world's full of traitors. Or perhaps they discovered the secret entrance, sir. You know, sir, the one you're sure is there. Or perhaps you've forgotten. It's the sort of thing that can slip your mind when you're busy, I expect. We shall reconnoitre, Sergeant, said Blouse coldly, as they crawled out of the bushes. He brushed leaves off his uniform. Thalacephalos, or as Blouse referred to her, the faithful steed, had been turned loose miles back. You couldn't sneak around on horseback, and as Jackram had pointed out, the creature was too skinny for anyone to want to eat, and too vicious for anyone to want to ride. Right, sir, yes, we might as well do that, sir, said Jackram now, all gloating helpfulness. Where would you like us to reconnoitre, sir? There must be a secret entrance, Sergeant. No one would build a place like that with only one entrance. Agreed? Yes, sir. Only perhaps they kept it a secret, sir. Only trying to help, sir. They turned at the sound of urgent praying. Wazza had fallen to her knees, hands clasped together. The rest of the squad edged away slowly. Piety is a wonderful thing. What is he doing, Sergeant? said Blouse. Praying, sir, said Jackram. I've noticed he does that a lot. Is that, er, uh, within regulations, Sergeant? the lieutenant whispered. Always a difficult one, sir, that one, said Jackram. I have, myself, prayed many times on the field of battle. Many times have I said the soldier's prayer, sir, and I don't mind admitting it. Er, uh, I don't think I know that one, said Blouse. Oh, I reckon the words will come to you soon enough, sir, once you're up against the foe. Generally, though, they're on the lines of, Oh, God, let me kill this bastard before he kills me. Jackram grinned at Blouse's expression. That's what I call the authorised version, sir. Yes, Sergeant, but where would we be if we all prayed all the time, said the lieutenant. In heaven, sir, sitting at Nuggan's right hand, 
said Jackram promptly. That's what I was taught as a little nipper, sir. Of course, it'll be a bit crowded, so it's just as well we don't. At which point, Wazza stopped praying and stood up, brushing dust off her knees. She gave the squad her bright, worrying smile. The Duchess will guide our steps, she said. Oh, good, said Blouse weakly. She will show us the way. Wonderful. Ah, uh, did she mention a map reference at all? said the lieutenant. She will give us eyes that we might see. Ah, good. Well, jolly good, said Blouse. I definitely feel a lot better for knowing that. Don't you, Sergeant? Yes, sir, said Jackram. Because before this, sir, we didn't have a prayer. They scouted in threes, while the rest of the squad lay up in a deep hollow among the bushes. They were enemy patrols, but it's not hard to avoid half a dozen men who stick to the tracks and aren't being careful not to make a noise. The troops were the Slovenian, and acted as though they owned the place. For some reason, Polly ended up patrolling with Maledict and Wazza, or, to put it another way, a vampire on the edge, and a girl who was possibly so far over it that she'd found a new edge out beyond the horizon. She was changing every day, that was a fact. On the day they'd all joined up, a lifetime ago, she'd been this shivering little waif who flinched at shadows. Now, sometimes, she seemed taller, full of some ethereal certainty, and shadows fled before her. Well, not in actual fact, Polly would admit, but she walked as if they should. And then there had been the miracle of the turkey. That was hard to explain. The three of them had been moving along the cliffs. They'd circled a couple of Slovenian lookout posts, forewarned by the smell of cooking fires, but alas not by the smell of any coffee. Maledict seemed to be mostly in control, except for a tendency to mutter to himself in letters and numbers, but Polly had stopped that by threatening to hit him with a stick the very next time he did it. They'd reached a cliff edge that gave yet another view of the keep, and once again Polly raised a telescope and scanned the sheer walls and jumbled rocks for any sign of another entrance. "'Look down at the river,' said Wazza. The circle of view blurred upwards as Polly shifted the scope. When it stopped moving, she saw whiteness. She had to lower the instrument to see what she'd been looking at. "'Oh, my!' she said. "'There's Blouse's secret entrance, right where anyone can see it.' "'It'll make sense, though,' said Maledict. "'And there is a path all along the river, see. There's a couple more women on it.' "'Tiny gateway, though,' said Polly. "'And it'd be so easy to search people for weapons.' "'Soldiers couldn't get through, though,' said the vampire. "'We could,' said Polly. "'And we're soldiers, aren't we?' There was a pause before Maledict said, "'The soldiers need weapons. Swords and crossbows get noticed.' "'There will be weapons inside,' said Wazza. "'The Duchess has told me. The castle is full of weapons.' "'Did she tell you how to make the enemy let go of them?' said Maledict. "'All right, all right,' said Polly quickly. "'We ought to tell the Rupert as soon as possible, OK? Let's get back.' "'Hold on, I'm the corporal,' said Maledict. "'Well?' said Polly. And? Let's get back, said Maledict. Good idea. She should have listened to the bird song. she realised later. The shrill calls in the distance would have told her the news, if only she'd been calm enough to listen. They hadn't gone more than thirty yards before they saw the soldiers. Someone in the Slovenian army was dangerously clever. He'd realised that the way to spot interlopers was not to march noisily along the beaten paths, but to sneak quietly between the trees. The soldier had a crossbow. It was sheer luck, probably sheer luck, that he was looking the other way when Polly came around a holly bush. She flung herself behind a tree and gestured madly at Maledict further down the path, who had the sense to take cover. Polly drew her sword and held it, clutched to her chest in both hands. She could hear the man. He was some way away, but he was moving toward her. Probably the little lookout they had just found was a regular point on the patrol route. After all, she thought bitterly, it was just the sort of thing some untrained idiots might come across. Maybe a quiet patrol could even surprise them there. She shut her eyes and tried to breathe normally. This was it. This was it. This was it. This was where she found out. What to remember. What to remember. What to remember. When the metal meets the meat, be holding the metal. She could taste metal in her mouth. The man would walk right past her. He'd be alert but not that alert. A slash would be better than a stab. Yes, a good swipe at head height would kill. 
some mother's son, some sister's brother, some lad who'd followed the drum for a shilling in his first new suit. If only she'd been trained, if only she'd had a couple of weeks stabbing straw men until she could believe that all men were made of straw. She froze. Down the angle of the path, still as a tree, head bowed, stood Wazza. As soon as the scout reached Polly's tree, she'd be seen. She'd have to do it now. Perhaps that's why men did it. You didn't do it to save duchesses or countries. You killed the enemy to stop him killing your mates, that they, in turn, might save you. She could hear the cautious tread close to the tree. She raised the sabre, saw the light flash along its edge. A wild turkey rose from the scrub on the other side of the path in one rocketing tower of wings and feathers and echoing noise. Half flying, half running, it bounded off into the woods. There was the thud of a bow and a last squawk. "'Oh, good shot, Rudy,' said a voice nearby. "'Looks like a big one.' "'Did you see that?' said another voice. "'Another step, and I'd have tripped over it.' Behind her tree, Polly breathed out. A third voice, some way off, called out, "'Let's head back, eh, Corp? The way that went off, the tiger's probably run a mile.' "'Yeah, and I'm so scared,' said the closest voice. "'The tiger's behind every tree, right?' "'Okay, let's call it a day. My wife will cook him a treat.' Gradually, the voices of the soldiers got lost among the trees. Polly lowered the sword. She saw Maledict peer out of his bush and stare at her. She raised a finger to her lips. He nodded. She waited until the bird song had settled down a little before stepping out. Wazza seemed to be lost in thought. Polly took her very carefully by the hand. Quietly, dodging from tree to tree, they headed back to the hollow. Most particularly, Polly and Maledict didn't talk but they looked one another in the eye once or twice. Of course, a turkey would lie low until a hunter almost trod on it. Of course, that one must have been there all the time, and only lost its bird nerve when the scout crept up. It had been an unusually large bird, one that no hungry soldier could resist, but... Well... Since the brain treacherously does not stop thinking just because you want it to, Polly's added... She said the Duchess could move small things. How small is a thought in the mind of a bird? Only Jade and Igorina were waiting for them in the hollow. The others had found a better base a mile away, they said. We found the secret entrance, said Polly quietly as they headed away. Can we get in? said Igorina. It's the washerwoman's entrance, said Maledict. It's right down by the river, but there's a path. Wash our women, said Igor, but this is a war. Clothes still get dirty, I suppose, said Polly. Dirtier, I should think, said Maledict. But our countrywomen washing clothes for the enemy, said Igorina, looking shocked. If it's that or starve, yes, said Polly. I saw a woman come out carrying a basket of loaves. They say the keep is full of granaries. Anyway, you sewed up an enemy officer, didn't you? That's different, said Igorina. We are duty-bound to save our fellow ma person. Nothing has ever been said about his, uh, their underwear. We could get in, said Polly, if we disguised ourselves as women. Silence greeted this, then disguised, said Igorina. You know what I mean, said Polly. As washerwomen, said Igorina, these are virgin's hands. Really? Where did you get them? said Maledict. Igorina stuck out her tongue at him. Anyway, I don't intend that we should do any washing, said Polly. Then what do you intend? said Igorina. Polly hesitated. You know I want to get my brother out if he's in there, she said. And if we could stop the invasion, that would be a good idea. Well, that might take extra starch, said Maledict. I don't want to, you know, spoil the spirit of the moment. But that is a really awful idea. The L.T. won't agree to something as wild as that. No, he won't, said Polly. But he'll suggest it. Hmm, said Blouse a little later. Washerwomen, is that usual, Sergeant Jackram? Oh, yes, sir. I expect the women in the villages round here do it, just like they did when we held the keep, said Jackram. You mean, they provide aid and comfort to the enemy? Why? Better than starving, sir. Fact of life. It doesn't always stop at washing, neither. Sergeant, there are young men here, snapped Blouse, blushing. They'll have to find out about ironing and darning sooner or later, sir, said Jackram innocently. 
Blouse opened his mouth. Blouse shut his mouth. Tea's up, sir, said Polly. Tea was an amazingly useful thing. It gave you an excuse to talk to anyone. They settled in what remained of a half-ruined farmhouse. By the look of it, not even patrols bothered to come here. There were no signs of lit fires or even the most temporary occupation. It stank of decay, and half the roof was gone. Do the women just come and go, Perks? said the lieutenant. Yes, sir, said Polly. And I had an idea, sir. Permission to tell you my idea, sir? She saw Jackram raise an eyebrow. She was laying it on thick, she had to admit, but time was pressing. Please do, Perks, said Bows. Else I fear you may explode. They could be spies for us, sir. We could even get them to open the gates for us. Well done, Private, said Blouse. I do like a soldier to think. Yeah, right, growled Jackram. And he's sharper and he'll cut himself, sir. They're washerwomen, sir, basically. No offence to young Perks, keen lad that he is, but your average guard pays attention when old Mother Riley tries to open the gates. There's not just a pair of gates, neither. There's six pairs, and nice little courtyards between them for the guards to have a squint at you and see if you's a wrong un. And drawbridges, and spiky ceilings that drop down if someone doesn't like the look of you. Try opening that lot with soapy hands. I'm afraid the sergeant has a point, Perks, said Blouse, sadly. Well, supposing a couple of women managed to knock out a few guards, sir, they could let us in through their little door, said Polly. We might even be able to capture the commander of the fort, sir. I bet there's plenty of women in the keep, sir, in the kitchens and so on. They could open doors for us. Oh, come on, Perks, Jackram began. No, Sergeant, wait, said Blaz. Astonishingly enough, Perks, in your boyish enthusiasm you have, although you haven't realised it, given me a very interesting idea. Have I, sir? said Polly who, in her boyish enthusiasm, had considered trying to tattoo the idea on Blouse's head. For someone so clever, he really was slow. "'Indeed you have, Perks,' said Blouse, "'because, of course, we only need one washerwoman to get us inside, do we not?' The quotes sounded promising. "'Well, yes, sir,' said Polly. "'And if one, as it were, thinks outside of the box, the woman does not in fact need to be a woman.' Blouse beamed. Polly allowed her brow to wrinkle in honest puzzlement. "'Doesn't she, sir?' she said. "'I don't think I quite understand, sir. I am perplexed, sir.' "'She could be a man, Perks,' said Blouse, almost exploding with delight. "'One of us, in disguise!' Polly breathed a sigh of relief. Sergeant Jackram laughed. "'Bless you, sir, dressing up as a washerwoman is for getting out of places. Military rules!' If a man gets inside, he could disable any guards near the door, spy out the situation from a military perspective, and let the rest of the troops in, said Blouse. If this was done at night, men, we could be holding key positions by the morning. But these aren't men, sir, said Jackram. Polly turned. The sergeant was looking right at her, right through her. Oh, darn, I mean damn, he knows. I beg your pardon? They are... "'My little lads, sir,' Jackram went on, winking at Polly. "'Keen lads, full of mustard, but they ain't ones for cutting throats and stabbing hearts. "'They signed out to be pikemen in the press, sir, in a proper army. "'You're my little lads,' I says to them, when I signed them up, and I will look after you. "'I can't stand by and let you take them to certain death.' "'It's my decision to make, Sergeant,' said Blouse. "'We are at the hinge of destiny. "'Who in the pinch is not ready to lay down his life for his country. In a proper stand-up fight, sir, not getting beaten over the head by a bunch of nasty men for creeping around their fort. You know I've never been one for spies and hiding your colours, sir, never. Sergeant, we have no choice. We must take advantage of the tide of fortune. I know about tide, sir. They leave little fish gasping. The sergeant stood up, fists clenching. Your concern for your men does you credit, sergeant, but it falls to us... "'A famous last stand, sir,' said Jackram. "'He spat expertly into the fire of the tumble-down hearth. "'To well with him, sir. "'That's just a way of dying famous. "'Sergeant, your insubordination is getting—' "'I'll go,' said Polly quietly. "'Both men stopped, turned, and stared. "'I'll go,' Polly repeated louder. "'Someone ought to.' "'Don't be daft, Perks,' snaps Jackram. 
You don't know what's in there. You don't know what guards are waiting just inside the door. You don't know. I'll find out then, Sarge, won't I? said Polly, smiling desperately. Maybe I can get to somewhere where you can see and send signals, or... On this issue, at least, the sergeant and I are of one mind, Perks, said Blouse. Really, Private, it would simply not work. Oh, you're brave, certainly, but what makes you think you stand a chance of passing yourself off as a woman? Well, sir... What? Your keenness will not go unrecorded, Perks, said Blouse, smiling. But, you know... A good officer keeps an eye on his men, and I have to say that I have noticed in you, in all of you, little habits. Perfectly normal, nothing to worry about, like the occasional deep exploration of a nostril, maybe, and a tendency to grin after passing wind, a natural boyish inclination to <coughs> scratch your, yourselves in public, that sort of thing. These are the kind of little details that would give you away in a trice, and tell any observer that you were a man in women's clothing, believe me. I'm sure I could pull it off, sir, said Polly, weakly. She could sense Jackram's eyes on her. You, blimey, you bloody well know, don't you? How long have you known? Blouse shook his head. No, they would see through you in a flash. You are a fine bunch of lads, but there is only one man here who'd stand a chance of getting away with it. Manacle? Yes, sir, said Shufty, rigid with instant panic. Can you all find me a dress, do you think? Maledict was the first to break the silence. Sir, are you telling us you're going to try to get in dressed as a woman? Well, I'm clearly the only one who's had any practice, said Blouse, rubbing his hands together. At my old school, we were in and out of skirts all the time. He looked around at the circle of absolutely expressionless faces. Theatricals, you see? he said brightly. No girls at our boarding school, of course, but we didn't let that stop us. Why, my Lady Sprightly, in a comedy of cuckolds, is still talked about, I understand, and as for my yum-yum, is... is... Sergeant Jackham all right? The sergeant had folded up, but, with his face still level with his knees, he managed to croak, Old war wounds, sir, come upon me sudden like... Please help him, Private Eagle. Where was I? I can see you all look puzzled, but there's nothing strange about this. Fine old tradition, men dressing up as girls. In the sixth form, the chaps used to do it for their jape all the time. He paused for a moment and added thoughtfully, Especially Rigglesworth, for some reason. He shook his head as if dislodging a thought and went on, Anyway, I have some experience in this field, you see. And what would you do if... I mean, when you got in, sir, said Polly. You won't just have to fool the guards. There'll be other women in there. "'That will not present a problem, Perks,' said Blouse. "'I shall act in a feminine way, and I have this stage trick, do you see, "'where I make my voice sound quite high-pitched like this.' "'The falsetto could have scratched glass. "'See?' he said. "'No. If we need a woman, I'm your man.' "'Amazing, sir,' said Maledict. "'For a moment I could have sworn there was a woman in the room. "'And I could certainly find out if there are any other badly guarded entrances.' Blouse went on. Who knows? I might even be able to procure a key off one of the guards by means of feminine wiles. In any case, if things are all clear, I shall send a signal. A towel hanging from a window, perhaps. Something clearly unusual, anyway. There was some more silence. Several of the squad were staring at the ceiling. Yes, said Polly. I can see you've thought this out carefully, sir. Blouse sighed. "'If only Rigglesworth were here,' he said. "'Why, sir?' "'Amazingly clever chap at laying his hands on a dress, young Rigglesworth,' said the lieutenant. Polly caught Maledict's eye. The vampire made a face and shrugged. "Um," said Shifty. "'Yes, manacle. "'I do have a petticoat in my back, sir. "'Good heavens, why?' Shifty went red. She hadn't worked out an answer. "'Bandicoot, Thar,' Igorina cut in smoothly. "'Yes, yes, that's right,' said Shifty. I, "'I found it in the inn, back in Bloon. "'I asked the lads to acquire any suitable linen they might find, sir, just in case.' "'Very sound thinking, that man,' said Blouse. "'Anyone else got anything?' "'I wouldn't be at all surprised, sir,' said Igor, staring around the room. "'Glances were exchanged. Packs were unslung. "'Everyone except Polly and Maledict had something.' produced with downcast eyes. A shift, a petticoat, 
and in most cases a dimity scarf carried out of some sort of residual unexplainable need. You obviously must have thought we'd take serious damage, said Blouse. Can't be too careful, Thar, said Igorina. She grinned at Polly. Of course, I have rather short hair at present, Blouse mused. Polly thought of her ringlets, now lost and probably stroked by Strappy, but desperation spooled through her memory. They looked like older women, mostly, she said quickly. They wore headscarves and wimples. I'm sure Igor, e sure Igor can make up something, sir. We Igors are very resourceful, sir, Igorina agreed. She pulled a black leather wallet out of her jacket. Ten minutes with a needle, sir, that's all I'll need. Oh, I can do old women wonderfully well, said Blouse. With a speed that made Lofty jump, he suddenly thrust out both hands, twisted like claws, contorted his face into an expression of mad imbecility, and screeched, Oh, dearie me, my poor old feet! Things today aren't like they used to be! Lorks! Behind him, Sergeant Jackram put his head in his hands. Amazing, sir, said Maledict. I've never seen a transformation like it. Perhaps just a wee bit less old, sir, Polly suggested, although in truth Blouse had reminded her of her Aunt Hattie two-thirds of the way through a glass of sherry. You think so? said Blouse. Oh, well, if you're really sure. And er, if you do meet a guard, um, old women don't usually try to... Uh, try to... Canoodle, cut in Maledict, whose mind had clearly been hurtling down the same horrible slope. Canoodle with them, Polly added, blushing, and then, after a second's thought, added, unless she's had a glass of sherry anyway. And I do suggest you go and have a save, sir. Save? said Blouse. Shave, sir, said Polly. I'll lay out the kit, sir. Oh, yes, of course. Don't see many old women with beards, eh? <laughs> except my auntie Parthenope, as I recall. And uh, no one's got a couple of balloons, have they? asked the lieutenant. Eh, why, sir? said Tonka. A big bosom always gets a laugh, said Blouse. He looked around the row of faces. Not a good idea, perhaps? I got a huge round of applause as the widow trembler in Tish Pity She's a Tree. No? I think Igor could sew something a bit more realistic, sir, said Polly. Really? Oh, well, if you really think so, said Blouse dejectedly, I'll just go and get myself into character. He disappeared into the building's only other room. After a few seconds, the rest of them heard him reciting, Lorks, my poor feet, in varying tones of fingernail screech. The squad went into a huddle. What was all that about? said Tonka. He was talking about the theatre, said Maledict. What's that? An abomination unto Nuggan, of course, said the vampire. It'd take too long to explain, dear child. People pretending to be other people to tell a story in a huge room where the world is a different place. Other people sitting and watching them and eating chocolate. Very, very abominable. I would like to eat chocolates in a great big room where the world is a different place, mumbled Lofty, sadly. I saw a Punch and Judy show in the town once, said Shifty. Then they dragged the men away, and it became an abomination. I remember that, said Polly. Crocodiles should not be seen to eat figures of authority, apparently. Although until the puppet show, no one in the town knew what a crocodile was. The bit where the clown had beaten his wife has also contravened abomination, because he'd used a stick thicker than the regulation one inch. The lieutenant won't last a minute, you know, she said. Yes, but he won't listen, will he, said Igorina. I'll do the best with my scissors and needle to make a woman of him, but... Igorina, when it's you talking about this sort of thing, some very strange pictures turn up in my head, said Maledict. Sorry, said Igorina. Can you pray for him, Wazza? said Polly. I think we're going to need a miracle here. Wazza obediently closed her eyes and folded her hands for a moment, and then said shyly, I'm afraid she says it will take more than a turkey. Was, said Polly, do you really... Then she stopped, with the bright little face watching her. Yes, I do, said Wazza. I really talk to the Duchess. Yeah, well, I used to too, snapped Tonka. I used to beg her once upon a time. 
That stupid face just stared and did nothing. She never stopped anything. All that stuff, all that stupid... The girl stopped, too many words blocking her brain. Anyway, why should she talk to you? Because I listen, said Wazza quietly. And what does she say? Sometimes she just cries. She cries! Because there are so many things that people want, and she can't give them anything. Wazza gave them all one of her smiles that lit up the room. But everything will be fine when I'm in the right place, she said. Well, that's all right then, Polly began, in that cloud of deep embarrassment that Wazza called up within her. You're right, said Tonka, but I'm not praying to anyone, OK, ever again. I don't like this, Was. You're a decent kid, but I don't like the way you smile, she stopped. Oh, no. Polly stared at Wazza. Her face was thin and all angles, and the Duchess in the painting had looked, well, like an overfed turbot. But now the smile, the actual smile... I'm not putting up with that, Tonka snarled. You stop that right now, I mean it. You're giving me the creeps. Oz, you stop her, him, him smiling like that. Just calm down, all of you, Polly began. Bleeding well, shut up, said Jackram. A man can't hear himself chew. Look, you're all edgy, that happens. And Wazza here's just got a bit of religion before the fight. That happens too. And what you do is, you save it all up for the enemy. Quiet and down. That is what we in the military call an order, okay? Perks, it was Blouse. You'd better hurry, said Maledict. His cough sits probably once lacing. In fact, Blouse was sitting on what remained of a chair. Ah, Perks, a uh, shave, please, he said. Oh, I thought your hand was better, sir. Ah, uh, yes. Blouse looked awkward. The problem, Perks, is... I have never actually shaved myself at all, to be honest. I had a man to do it for me at school, and then, of course, in the army, I shared a Batman with Blitherskite, and uh, those attempts I made on my own behalf have been somewhat bloody. I never really thought about it until I got to plots, and uh, suddenly it was embarrassing. Sorry about that, sir, said Polly. It was a strange old world. Later on, perhaps you could give me a few tips, Blouse went on. You keep yourself beautifully shaven, I can't help noticing. General Frock would be pleased. He's very anti-whiskers, they say. If you like, sir, said Polly. There was no getting out of it. She made a show of sharpening the razor. Perhaps she could manage it with only a few small cuts. Do you think I should have a reddened nose, said Blouse. Probably, sir, said Polly. Sarge knows about me, I'm sure, she thought. I know he does. Why is he keeping quiet? Probably, Perks. What? Oh, no. Uh, why a red nose, sir? said Polly, applying the lather with vigour. It would look more <laughs> amusing, perhaps. Not sure that's the purpose of the exercise, sir. Now, if you just uh, lie back, sir. There's something you should know about young Perks, sir. Polly actually yelped. Walking as silently as only a sergeant can, Jackram had stolen into the room. <laughs> it's sergeant, said Blouse. Perks, doesn't know how to shave a man, sir, said Jackram. Give me the razor, Perks. Doesn't know how to shave, said Blouse. No, sir. Perks lied to us, right, Perks? All right, Sarge, no need to drag it out, sighed Polly. Lieutenant, I'm... Underage, said Jackram. Right, Perks? Only fourteen, aren't you? Jackram looked at Polly over the top of the lieutenant's head and winked. Er... Uh, I told a lie to get enlisted, sir, yes, said Polly. I don't think a lad like that ought to be dragged into the keep, however game he is, said Jackram, and I don't think he's the only one, right, Perks? Oh, so that's the game. Blackmail, Polly thought. Yes, Sarge, she said wearily. Can't have a massacre of little lads, sir, now can we, said Jackram. I see your p point, Sergeant, said the lieutenant, as Jackram gently drove the blade down his cheek. That is a tricky one. Best to call it a day, then, said Jackram. On the other hand, Sergeant, I do know that you yourself joined up as a child, said Blouse. The blade stopped moving. Well, it was all different in those, Jackram began. You were five years old, apparently, the lieutenant went on. 
You see, when I heard that I'd be meeting you, a legend in the army, of course I had to look at our files so that I could, perhaps, make a few timely jokes in presenting you with your honourable discharge. You know, humorous little reminiscences about times gone by. Imagine how puzzled I was, therefore, to find that you appear to have been drawing actual wages for... Well, it was a little hard to be certain, but possibly as much as sixty years. Polly had put a keen edge on the razor. It rested against the lieutenant's cheek. Polly thought about the murder. They will write the killing of an escaping prisoner in the woods. It won't be the first officer I've killed. Probably one of them clerical errors, sir, said Jackram coldly. In the gloomy room, with moss now colonising the walls, the sergeant loomed large. An owl, perched on the chimney, gave a screech. It echoed down into the room. "'In fact, no, sergeant,' said Blouse, apparently oblivious to the razor. "'Your package, sergeant, had been tampered with, on numerous occasions, once even by General Frock. He deducted ten years from your age and signed the change. And he wasn't the only one. Frankly, sergeant, I'm forced to only one conclusion.' "'And what's that, sir?' the razor halted again, still pressed against Blouse's neck. The silence seemed to last for some time, sharp and drawn out. "'That there was some other man called Jackram,' said Blouse slowly, "'whose records have got mixed up with yours, and every attempt to sort it out by officers who were not, uh, not entirely at home with figures only made it more confusing.' The razor started to move again with silky smoothness. "'I think you put your finger right on it, sir,' said Jackram. "'I am going to write an explanatory note and add it to the packet,' Blouse went on. "'It seems to me the sensible thing to do would be to ask you here and now how old you are. "'How old are you, Sergeant?' Forty-three, sir,' said Jackram instantly. Polly looked up, expecting the generic thunderclap that ought to accompany such a universe-sized untruth. "'Are you sure?' said Blouse. Forty-five, sir? The hardships of a soldier's life shows up on her face, sir. Even so. Ah, I'd recall a couple of extra birthdays what had slipped my memory, sir. I'm forty-seven, sir. Still no rumble of celestial disapproval, Polly noticed. Er, uh, yes, very well. After all, you should know, eh, Sergeant? I shall amend it. Thank you, sir. Just like General Frock did. And Major Galosh. "'And Colonel Leggin, Sergeant.' "'Yes, sir. Clerical error has followed me around all the days of my life, sir. "'I've been a martyr to it.' Jackram stood back. "'There we are, sir. Face as smooth as a baby's bum. "'Smooth is how things should be, eh, sir? I've always liked things smooth.' "'They watched Lieutenant Blouse walk down through the trees to the path. "'They watched him join the erratic, straggling line of women on their way to the door.' They listened for screams and heard none. "'Does any woman sway that much?' said Wazza, peering through the bushes. "'Not legally, I think,' said Polly, scanning the keep with the lieutenant's telescope. "'Well, we'll just have to wait for some kind of signal that he's okay.' Somewhere overhead a buzzard screamed. Oh, "'No, they'll have got him the moment he walked through the door,' said Maledict. "'Bet on it.' They left Jade on watch. With her paint scraped off, a troll could settle into rocky scenery so well that no one was likely to notice her before they walked into her, and by the time they walked into her, it was too late. They made their way back through the woods, and had almost reached the ruined farmhouse when it happened. "'You are holding up well, Mal,' said Polly. "'Maybe those acorns did the trick. You haven't mentioned coffee at all.' Maledict stopped and turned slowly to Polly's horror. His face was suddenly shiny with sweat. "'You had to bring it up, didn't you?' he said hoarsely. "'Oh, please, no, I was holding on so tight. I was doing so well.' He fell forward, but managed to get onto his hands and knees. Then he raised his head, and his eyes were glowing red. "'Fetch Igorina, he muttered, gasping. "'I know she's ready for this.' Wazza was praying furiously. Maledict tried to stand up again, fell back onto his knees, and raised his arms imploringly to the sky. "'Get out of here while you can,' he mumbled as his teeth visibly lengthened. "'I'll—' There was a shadow, a sense of movement, and the vampire slumped forward. 
stunned by an eight-ounce sack of coffee beans that had dropped out of a clear sky. Polly arrived at the farmhouse carrying Maledict on her shoulder. She made him as comfortable as possible on some ancient straw, and the squad consulted. "'Do you think we ought to try and take the sack out of his mouth?' said Shifty nervously. "'I tried, but he fights,' said Polly. "'But he's unconscious. He still won't let go of it. He's sucking it. I'd swear he was out cold, but he just sort of reached out and grabbed it and bit. It dropped out of a clear sky.' Tonka stared at water. "'The Duchess does a room service,' she said. "'Now she says she d didn't. "'You get freak rains of fish,' said Igorina, kneeling down by Maledict. "'I suppose it's possible that a whirlwind tore through a coffee plantation, "'and then possibly a lightning discharge in the upper ether. "'At what point did it blow through a factory making small coffee sacks?' said Tonka. "'Ones with jolly turbaned men printed on them, apparently saying, "'Clatchy and rare roasted, when a pickaxe is not enough.' "'Well, if you're going to put it like that, it does seem a little far-fetched,' Igorina admitted. She stood up, adding, "'I think he'll be fine when he wakes up. Possibly a little talkative, though.' "'Okay, lads, get some rest,' said Jackram, stamping in. "'Let's give the Rupert a couple of hours to muck things up, and then we can nip around the valley and slip down through and join the rest of the army. Good grub and proper blankets to sleep on, hey? That's the ticket.' "'We don't know he's going to mess up, Sarge,' said Polly. "'Oh, yeah, right.' Maybe he'll have married the command of the garrison by now, eh? Stranger things have happened, although I can't remember when. Perks and Manacle, you're on watch. The rest of you, get some shut-eye. A Slovenian patrol went past in the distance. Polly watched it out of sight. It was turning into a fine day, warm with a bit of wind. Good drying weather. A good day to be a washerwoman. And maybe Blouse would succeed. Maybe all the guards were blind. Paul, Shifty whispered. Yes, Shifty. Look, what was your name back in the world? Betty, it's Betty. Uh, most of the ins and outs are in the keep, right? Apparently. So, that's where I'm most likely to find my fiancé, yes? We've talked about that, Polly thought. Could be. Might be quite hard, as there's a lot of men, said Betty, a woman with something on her mind. Well, if we get as far as the prisoners and ask around, they'll be bound to know his name. What is it? Johnny, whispered Betty. "'Just Johnny,' said Polly. "'Eh, uh, yes.' "'Ah,' Polly thought, "'I think I know how this goes. "'He's got fair hair and blue eyes, "'and I think he had one gold earring "'and a funny-shaped... "'What do you call it? "'Oh, yes, sort of carbuncle on his... "'his bottom,' Betty went on. "'Right, right. "'Um, now I've come to tell someone "'it doesn't sound very helpful, I suppose.' Not unless we're in a position to have a very unusual identification parade, Polly thought, and I can't imagine what position that would be. Not as such, she said. He said everyone in the regiment knows him, Betty went on. Right? Oh, good, said Polly. All we need to do is ask. And uh, we were going to break a sixpence in half, you know, like they do, so that if he had to be away for years, we'd be sure we'd got the right person, because the two halves would match. "'Oh, that would be a bit of a help, I expect,' said Polly. "'Well, yes, except, well, I gave him the sixpence, "'and he said he'd get the blacksmith to break it in his vice, "'and he went off, and uh, I think he got called away.' "'Betty's voice trailed off. "'Well, that was about what I expected,' Polly thought. "'I expect you think I'm a silly girl,' mumbled Betty after a while. "'A foolish woman, perhaps,' said Polly. "'turning to watch the landscape intently. "'It was, you know, a, a whirlwind romance.' "'Sounds more like a hurricane to me,' said Polly, and Betty grinned. "'Yes, it was a bit like that,' she said. "'Polly matched smile for smile. "'Betty, it's daft to talk about silly and foolish at a time like this,' she said. "'Where are we going to look for wisdom? "'To a god who hates jigsaws in the colour blue? "'A fossil government led by a picture?' An army that thinks stubbornness is the same as courage? Compared to all that, all you've got wrong is timing. I don't want to end up in the school, though, said Betty, a.k.a. Shufty. They took away a girl from our village, and she was kicking and screaming. Then fight them, said Polly. You've got a sword now, haven't you? Fight back. She saw the look of horror on Betty's face, and remembered that this wasn't Tonka she was talking to. Look, 
If we get out of this alive, we'll talk to the Colonel. He might be able to help. After all, perhaps your boy really was called Johnny, she thought. Perhaps he really was called away suddenly. Hope is a wonderful thing, she went on. If we get out of this, there's going to be no school and no beatings, not for you or any of us, not if we've got brains, not if we're smart. Betty was almost in tears, but she managed another smile. And Was is talking to the Duchess, too. She'll fix things. Polly stared out at the bright, unchanging landscape, empty except for a buzzard making wide circles in the forbidden blue. I'm not sure about that, she said, but someone up there likes us. Twilight was brief at this time of year. There had been no sign from Blouse. I watched until I couldn't see, said Jade as they sat and watched Shifty make stew. Some of the women that came out was ones I saw going in this morning too. Are you sure? said Jackram. We might be fixed, Sarge, said Jade, looking hurt. But trolls have great, er, uh, viz you all ac you it tea. More women was going in this evening too. Night shift, said Tonka. Oh, well, he tried, said Jackram. With any luck, he's in a nice warm cell, and they found him a pair of long pants. Get your kit together, lads. We'll creep around and into our lines, and you'll be snug in bed by midnight. Polly remembered what she'd said hours ago about fighting. You had to start somewhere. I want to try the keep again, she said. You do perks, do you? said Jackram, with mock interest. My brother's in there. Nice safe place for him, then. He might be injured. I vote for the keep. Vote, said Jackram. My word, that's a new one. Voting in the army. Who wants to get killed, lads? Let's have a show of hands. Knock it off, perks. I'm going to try it, Sarge. You are not. Try and stop me. The words came out before she could stop them. And that's it, she thought. The shout heard round the world. No going back after this. I've run off the edge of the cliff, and it's all downhill from here. Jackram's expression stayed blank for a second or two, and then he said, Anyone else voting for the keep? Polly looked at Shufty, who blushed, but, We are, said Tonka. Beside her, Lofty struck a match and held it so as it flared. That was pretty much a speech from Lofty. Why, pray, said Jackram. We don't want to sit around in a swamp, said Tonka, and we don't like being ordered about. Should have thought of that before you joined the army, lad. We aren't lads, Sarge. You are if I says you are. Well, it's not as though I wasn't expecting it, Polly thought. I've played this out enough times in my head. Here goes. All right, Sarge, she said. It's time to have it out, here and now. Were, said Jackram, theatrically, fishing his screwed-up paper of tobacco out of his pocket. What? Jackram sat down on the remains of a wall. Just injecting a little sauciness into the conversation, he said. Carry on, Perks. Have your say. I thought it had come to this. You know I'm a woman, Sarge, said Polly. Yep, I wouldn't trust you to shave cheese. The squad stared. Jackram opened his big knife and examined the chewing tobacco, as though it was the most interesting thing present. So, er, uh, what are you going to do about it? said Polly, feeling derailed. Dunno. Can't do anything, can I? You were born like it. You didn't tell Blouse, said Polly. Nope. Polly wanted to knock the wretched tobacco out of the sergeant's hand. Now that she had got over the surprise, there was something offensive about this lack of reaction. It was like someone opening a door just before your battering ram hit it. Suddenly you were running through the building and not certain how to stop. Well, we're all women, Sarge, said Tonka. How about that? Jackram soared at the tobacco. So, he said, still paying attention to the job in hand. What? said Polly. Think no one else ever tried it? Think you're the only ones? Think your old Sarge is deaf, blind and stupid? You could fool one another, and anyone can fool a Rupert, but you can't fool Jackram. Weren't sure about Maledict and still ain't, because with a vampire, who knows? And not sure about you, Carborundum, because with a troll, who cares? No offence. None taken, rumbled Jade. She caught Polly's eye and shrugged. Not so good at reading the signs, not knowing many trolls, said the sergeant. I had you down pat in the first minute, Oz. Something in the eyes, I reckon. 
Like you were watching to see how good you were. Oh, hell, Polly thought. Eh, uh, do I have a pair of socks belonging to you? Yep, well washed, I might add. You'll have them back right now, said Polly, grabbing for her belt. In your own time, Perks, in your own time, no rush, said Jackram, raising a hand. Well washed, please. Why, Sarge, said Tonka, why didn't you give us away? You could have given us away any time. Jackram slewed his wad from cheek to cheek and sat chewing for a while, staring at nothing. No, you ain't the first, he said. I've seen a few, mostly by themselves, always frightened, and mostly they didn't last long. But one or two of them were bonny soldiers, very bonny soldiers indeed. So I looked at you lot and I thought to myself, well now, I thought, I wonder how they'll do when they find out they're not alone. You know about lions? They nodded. Well, the lion is a big old coward mostly. If you want trouble, you want to tangle with the lioness. They're killers and they hunt together. It's the same everywhere. If you want big grief, look to the ladies. Even with insects, right? There's a kind of beetle where she bites his head off right while he's exercising his conjugals. And that's what I call serious grief. On the other hand, from what I heard, he carries on regardless. So maybe it's not the same for beetles. He looked around at their blank expressions. No, he said. Well, maybe I thought a whole bunch of girls all at once. That's strange. Maybe there's a reason. Polly saw him glance briefly at Wazza. Anyway, I wasn't going to shame you all in front of a little toad like Strappy, and then there was all that business in plots, and then, well, we was galloping, as it were, caught up in things with no time to get off. You did well, lads, very well, shaped up like good uns. I'm going into the keep, said Polly. Oh, don't worry about the Rupert, said Jackram. Probably he's enjoying a nice bowl of scubbo right now. He went to a school for young gentlemen, so prison will be just like old times. We're still going, Sarge. Sorry, said Polly. Oh, don't say sorry, Perks. You were doing well up until then, said Jackram bitterly. Shufty stood up. I'm going too, she said. I think my fiancé is in there. I have to go, said Wazza. The Duchess guides my steps. I'll go then, said Egorina. I'm probably going to be needed. I shouldn't think I could get by as a washerwoman, rumbled Jade. I'll stay here and watch over Mal. Ha! If he's still after blood when he wakes up, he's going to have blunt teeth. They looked at one another in silence, embarrassed but defiant. Then there was the sound of someone clapping slowly. Oh, very nice, said Jackram. A band of brothers, eh? Oh, sorry, sisters. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Look, Blouse was a fool. It was probably all them books. He read all that stuff about it being a noble thing to die for your country, I expect. I was never that keen on reading, but I know the job is making some other poor devil die for his. He slewed his black tobacco from side to side. I wanted you to be safe, lads. Down in the press of men, I reckoned I could get you through this, no matter how many friends the prince has sent after you. I look at you, lads, and I think, you poor boys, you don't know nothing about war. What are you going to do? Tonka, you are a crack shot, but after one shot, who's backing you up while you reload? Perks, you know a trick or two, but the blokes in the castle will maybe know a trick or five. You're a good cook, Shifty. Too bad it's going to be too hot in there. Will the Duchess turn aside arrows, was her? Yes, she will. I hope you're right, my lad, said Jackram, giving the girl a long, slow look. Personally, i found religion in battle is as much use as a chocolate helmet. You'll need more than a prayer if Prince Heinrich catches you, I might add. We're going to try it, Sarge, said Polly. There's nothing for us in the army. Will you come with us, Sarge? said Shifty. No, lad. Me as a washerwoman, I doubt it. Don't seem to have a skirt anywhere about me for a start. Uh, just one thing, lads. How are you going to get in? In the morning, when we see the women going in again, said Polly. Got it all planned, General, and you'll be dressed as women. Er, uh, we are women, Sarge, said Polly. Yes, lad, technical detail, but you kitted out the Rupert with all your little knick-knacks, didn't you? What are you going to do? Tell the guards you opened the wrong cupboard in the dark? Another embarrassed silence descended. Jackram sighed. 
This ain't proper war, he said. Still, I said I'd look after you. You are my little lads, I said. His eyes gleamed. And you still are, even if the world's turned upside down. I'll just have to hope, Miss Perks, that you picked up a few tricks from old Sarge, although I reckon you can think of a few of your own. And now I'd better get you kitted up, right? Perhaps we could sneak in and steal something from the villages where the servants come from, said Tonka. From a bunch of poor women, said Polly, her heart sinking. Anyway, there'll be soldiers everywhere. Well, how do we get women's clothes on the battlefield? said Lofty. Jackram laughed, stood up, stuck his thumbs in his belt, and grinned. I told you, lads, you don't know nothing about war, he said. And one of the things they didn't know was that it had edges. Polly wasn't certain what she'd expected. Men and horses, obviously. In her mind's eye they were engaged in mortal combat, but obviously you couldn't go on doing that all day. So there would be tents, and that was about as far as the mind's eye had seen. It hadn't seen that an army on campaign is a sort of large, portable city. It has only one employer, and it manufactures dead people, but like all cities, it attracts citizens. What was unnerving was the sound of babies crying off in the rows of tents. She hadn't expected that. Or the mud. Or the crowds. Everywhere there were fires and the smell of cooking. This was a siege, after all. People had settled in. Getting down onto the plain in the dark had been easy. There was only Polly and Shufti trailing after the sergeant, who'd said that more would be too many, and in any case would attract too much attention. There were patrols, but their edge had been dulled by sheer repetitiveness. Besides, the Allies weren't expecting anyone to make much effort to get into the valley, at least in small groups. And men in the dark make noise, far more noise than a woman. They'd located a Borogravian sentry in the gloom by the noise of him trying to suck a morsel of dinner out of his teeth. But another one had located them when they were a stone's throw from the tents. He was young, so he was still keen. Halt! Uh, who goes there, friend or foe? The light from a cooking fire glinted off a crossbow. See? whispered Jackram. This is where your uniform is your friend. Aren't you glad you kept it? He swaggered forwards and spat tobacco between the young sentry's boots. My name's Jackram, he said. That's Sergeant Jackram. As for the other bit, you choose. Sergeant Jackram, said the boy, his mouth staying open. Yes, lad. What, the one who killed sixteen men at the Battle of Zop? There was only ten of them, but good lad for knowing it. The Jackram who carried General Frock through fourteen miles of enemy territory? That's right. Polly saw teeth in the gloom as the sentry grinned. My dad told me he fought with you at Blunderburg. Ah, that was a hot battle, that was, said Jackram. No, he meant in the pub afterwards. He pinched your drink, and you smacked him in the gob, and he kicked you in the nadgers, and you hit him in the guts, and he blacked your eye, and then you hit him with a table, and when he came round his mate stood him beer for the evening for managing to lay nearly three punches on Sergeant Jackram. He tells the story every year, when it's the anniversary, and he's pit, uh, reminiscing. Jackram thought for a moment, and then jabbed a finger at the young man. Joe Haberkirk, right? he said. The smile broadened to the point where the top of the young man's head was in danger of falling off. "'He'll be smirking all day when I tell him you remember him, Sarge,' said the sentry. "'He says that where you piss, grass don't grow.' "'Well, what can a modest man say to that, eh?' said Jackram. Then the young man frowned. "'Funny, though. He thought you were dead, Sarge,' he said. "'Tell him I bet him a shilling I'm not,' said Jackram. "'And your name, lad?' "'Lart, Sarge. Lart Habakirk.' "'Glad you joined, are you?' "'Yes, Sarge,' said Lart, loyally. "'We're just having a stroll, lad. Tell your dad I asked after him.' "'I will, Sarge.' The boy stood to attention like a one-man guard of honour. "'This is a proud moment for me, Sarge.' "'Does everyone know you, Sarge?' whispered Polly as they walked away. "'I pretty much, on our side anyway. I'll make so bold as to declare that most of the enemy that meets me don't know anything much afterwards.' "'I never thought it was going to be like this,' hissed Shufty. "'Like what?' said Jackram. "'There's women and children, shops. I can smell bread-baking. It's like a... a city.' "'Yeah, but what we're after isn't going to be in the main streets. Follow me, lads.' 
Sergeant Jackram, suddenly furtive, ducked between two big heaps of boxes and emerged beside a smithy, its forge glowing in the dusk. Here the tents were open-sided. Armourers and saddlers worked by lantern light, shadows flickering across the mud. Polly and Shufty had to step out of the way of a mule train, each animal carrying two casks on its back. The mules moved aside for Jackram. Maybe he's met them before too, thought Polly. Maybe he really does know everyone. The sergeants walked like a man with the deeds to the world. He acknowledged other sergeants with a nod, lazily saluted the few officers they were around here, and ignored everybody else. "'You been here before, Sarge?' said Shufty. "'No, lad.' "'But you know where you're going?' "'Correct. I ain't been here, but I know battlefields, especially when everyone's had a chance to dig in.' Jackram sniffed the air. "'Ah, right, that's the stuff. Just you two wait here.' He disappeared between two stacks of lumber. They heard a distant muttering, and, after a moment or two, Jackram reappeared holding a small bottle. Polly grinned. "'Is that rum, Sarge?' "'Well done, my little bar steward. And it would be nice if it was rum upon my word, or whisky, or gin, or brandy. But this don't have none of those fancy names. This is the genuine Stingo, this is. Pure hangman.' "'Hangman?' said Shifty. "'One drop and you're dead,' said Polly. Jackram beamed as a master to a keen pupil. "'That's right, Shufty. It's rot-scut. Wheresoever men are gathered together, someone will find something to ferment in a rubber boot, distill in an old kettle, and flog to his mates. Made from rats, by the smell of it. Ferments well, does your average rat. Fancy a taste?' Shufty shied away from the proffered bottle. The sergeant laughed. "'Good lad. Stick to beer,' he said. "'Don't the officers stop it?' said Polly. "'Officers? What do they know about anything?' said Jackram. "'And I bought this off a sergeant, too. Anyone watching us?' Polly peered into the gloom. "'No, Sarge?' Jackram poured some of the liquid into one pudgy hand and splashed it onto his face. "'Youch!' he hissed. "'Stings like the blazes. And now to kill the toothworms. Got to do the job properly.' He took a quick sip from the bottle, spat it out, and shoved the cork back in. "'Muck,' he said. "'Okay, let's go.' "'Where are we going, Sarge?' said Shufty. "'You can tell us now, can't you?' "'A quiet little place where our needs will be met,' said Jackram. "'It's around here somewhere.' "'You don't half smell a drink, Sarge,' said Shufty. "'Will they let you in if you smell drunk?' "'Yes, Shufty lad, they will,' said Jackram, setting off again. "'The reason being, my pockets jingle and I smell of booze. "'Everyone likes a rich drunk.' Ah, down this little valley here, that'll be our... Yeah, I was right, this is the place. Tucked away, delicate-like. See any clothes hanging out to dry, boys? There were a few washing lines strung behind the half-dozen or so drab tents in this side valley, which was little more than a wash gouged out by winter rains. If there had been anything on them, it had been taken in against the heavy dew. Shame, said Jackram. "'Okay, so we'll have to do it the hard way. "'Remember, just act natural and listen to what I say.' "'I'm sh shaking, Sarge,' Shifty muttered. "'Good, good, very natural,' said Jackram. "'This is our place, I think. "'Nice and quiet, no one watching us. "'Nice little path up there to the top of the wash.' "'He stopped outside a very large tent "'and tapped on the board outside with his swagger stick. "'The so-lid doves,' Polly read. "'Yeah, well, these ladies weren't hired for their spelling,' said Jackram, pushing open the flap of the tent of ill repute. Inside was a stuffy little area, a sort of canvas antechamber. A lady, lumpy and crow-like in a black bombazine dress, rose from a chair and gave the trio the most calculating look Polly had ever met. It finished off by putting a price on her boots. The sergeant doffed his cap and, in a jovial, rotund voice that peed brandy and cracked plum pudding, said, "'Good evening, madame. Sergeant Smith's the name, yes, indeed. And me and my bold lads here have been so fortunate as to acquire the spoils of war, if you catch my drift. And nothing would do for it but they were clamouring, clamouring to go to the nearest house of good repute, for to have a man made of them.' Little beady eyes skewered Polly again. Shufty, ears glowing like signal beacons, was staring fixedly at the ground. "'Looks like that'll be a job and a half,' said the woman shortly. "'You never spoke a truer word, madame,' beamed Jackram. Two of your fair flowers apiece should do it, I reckon.' 
There was a clink as, staggering slightly, Jackram put several gold coins on the rickety little table. Something about the gleam of it thawed things no end. The woman's face cracked into a smile as glutinous as slug gravy. Well, now, we're always honoured to entertain the ins and outs, Sergeant, she said. And if you gentlemen would like to step through to the uh, inner sanctum? Polly heard a very faint sound behind her and turned. She hadn't noticed the man sitting on a chair just inside the door. He had to be a man because trolls weren't pink. He made eyebrow back in plume look like some kind of weed. He wore leather, which was what she'd heard creaking, and he had his eyes just slightly open. When he saw her looking at him, he winked. It wasn't a friendly wink. There are times when a plan suddenly isn't going to work. When you're in the middle of it is not the time to find this out. Eh, uh, Sarge, she said. The sergeant turned, saw her frantic grimace, and appeared to spot the guard for the first time. Oh dear, where's my manners, he said, lurching back and fumbling in his pocket. He came up with a gold coin which he folded in the astonished man's hand. Then he turned around, tapping the side of his nose with an expression of idiot knowingness. A word of advice, lads, he said. Always give the guard a tip. He keeps the riff-raff out very important. Very important man. He stumbled back to the lady in black and belched hugely. And now, madame, if we can meet these visions of loveliness you are hiding under this here bushel, he said. It depended, Polly thought a few seconds later, on how and when, and after drinking how much of what, that you had those visions. She knew about these places. Serving behind a bar can really broaden your education. There were a number of ladies back home who were, as her mother put it, no better than they should be. And at twelve years old, Polly had got a smack for asking how good they should have been then. They were an abomination unto Nuggan, but men have always found space in their religion for a little sinning here and there. The word to describe the four ladies seated in the room beyond, if you wanted to be kind, was tired. If you didn't want to be kind, a whole range of words were just hanging in the air. They looked up without much interest. This is faith, prudence, grace and comfort, said the lady of the house. The night shift has not yet come on, I'm afraid. I'm sure these beauties will be a great education for my roaring boys, said the sergeant. But... May I be so bold as to inquire about your name, madame? I'm Mrs. Smother, Sergeant. And do you have a first name, may I ask? Dolores, said Mrs. Smother. To my special friends? Well now, Dolores, said Jackram, and there was another jingle of coins in his pocket. I will come right out with it and be frank, because I can see you are a woman of the world. These frail blossoms are all very well in their way for I know the fashion these days is for ladies with less meat on them than a butcher's pencil. But a gentleman such as me, who has been around the world and seen a thing or two, well, he learns the value of maturity, he sighed. Not to mention hope and patience. The coins jingled again. Perhaps you and I might retire to some suitable boudoir, madame, and discuss the matter over a cordial or two. Mrs. Smother looked from the sergeant to the lads, glanced back in the anteroom, and looked back at Jackram, with her head on one side and a thin, calculating smile on her lips. Yes, she said. You're a fine figure of a man, Sergeant Smith. Let us take a load off your pocket, shall we? She joined arm in arm with the sergeant, who winked roguishly at Polly and Shakti. We're well set then, lads, he chuckled. Now, just so as you don't get carried away, when it's time to go, I'll blow my whistle, and you'd better have finished what you're doing. Ha, 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 and meet me sharpish. Duty calls. Remember the fine traditions of the ins and outs. Giggling and almost tripping up, he left the room on the arm of the proprietress. Shufti sidled hurriedly up to Polly and whispered, Is Sarge all right, Elsa? He's just had a bit too much to drink, said Polly loudly, as all four of the girls stood up. But he... Shufti got a nudge in the ribs before she could say any more. One of the girls carefully laid down her knitting, took Polly's arm, flashed her well-crafted expression of interest, and said, You're a well-set-up young man, aren't you? What's your name, dear? I'm Gracie. Oliver, said Polly. And what the hell is the fine tradition of the ins and outs? 
Ever seen a woman with no clothes on before, Oliver? The girls giggled. Polly's brow wrinkled as, just for a moment, she was caught unawares. Yes, she said, of course. Oh, it looks like we've got ourselves a regular Don, Jew and girls, said Gracie, stepping back. We may have to send out for reinforcements. Why don't you and me and Prudence go off to a little nook I know, and your little friend will be the guest of faith and comfort. Comfort's very good with young men, ain't your comfort? Sergeant Jackram had been wrong in his description of the girls. Three of them were indeed several meals short of a healthy weight, but when Comfort got up out of her large armchair, you realised that it had in fact been quite a small armchair, and had mostly been Comfort. For a large woman she had a small face, locked in a piggy-eyed scowl. There was a death's head tattoo on one arm. "'He's young,' said Gracie. "'He'll heal. Come along, Don Juan.' In a way, Polly was relieved. She didn't take to the girls. Oh, the profession could bring anyone down, but she'd got to know some of the town's ladies of uneasy virtue, and they had an edge she couldn't find here. "'Why do you work here?' she said as they entered a smaller, canvas-walled room. There was a rickety bed, taking up most of the space. "'You know, you look a bit too young to be that sort of customer,' said Gracie. "'What sort?' said Polly. "'Oh, uh, holy Joe,' said Gracie. "'What's a girl like you doing in a place like this and all that stuff? "'Feel sorry for us, do you? "'At least if someone cuts up rough, we've got Gary outside, "'and after he's finished with the bloke, the colonel gets told "'and a bastard gets bunged in clink.' "'Yeah,' said Prudence. "'From what we hear, we're the safest leaders within twenty-five miles. "'All the spellers not too bad. "'We get money to keep, and we get fed, and she don't beat us, "'which is more than can be said for husbands. "'And you can't wander around loose now, can you?' Jackram put up with blouse because you've got to have an officer, Polly thought. If you don't have an officer, some other officer will take you over. And a woman by herself is missing a man, while a man by himself is his own master. Trousers, that's the secret. Trousers and a pair of socks. I never dreamed it was like this. Put on trousers and the world changes. We walk different. We act different. I see these girls and I think, Idiots, get yourself some trousers. "'Can you please get your clothes off?' she said. "'I think we'd better hurry.' "'One of the ins and outs, this one,' said Gracie, slipping her dress off her shoulders. "'Keep an eye on your cheeses, Prue.' Er, "'Why does that mean we're in the ins and outs?' said Polly. She made a show of unbuttoning her jacket, wishing that she believed in anyone there to pray so that she could pray for the whistle. "'That's cos you lads always have your eye on business,' said Gracie. And maybe there was someone listening at that. The whistle blew. Polly grabbed the dresses and ran out, oblivious to the yells behind her. She collided with Shufty outside, tripped over the groaning form of Gary, saw Sergeant Jackram holding the tent flap open, and bulleted into the night. "'This way!' the sergeant hissed, grabbing her by the collar before she'd gone a few feet and swinging her round. "'You too, Shufty, move!' He ran up the side of the wash like a child's balloon being blown by the wind, leaving them to scramble after him. His arms were full of clothing, which snagged and danced behind him. Up above was knee-deep scrub, treacherous in the gloom. They tripped and staggered across it until they reached heavier growth, whereupon the sergeant got hold of both of them and pushed them into the bushes. The shouts and screams were fainter now. "'Now we'll just keep quiet like,' he whispered. "'There's patrols about.' "'They'll be bound to find us,' Polly hissed, while Shifty wheezed. "'No, they won't,' said Jackram. First, they'll all be running towards the shouting, because that's neat. "'There they go,' Polly heard more shouts in the distance. "'And bloody fools they are, too. "'They're supposed to be guarding the perimeter, "'and they're running towards trouble in the camp. "'And they're running straight towards lamplight, "'so there goes their night eyes. "'If I was there, Sergeant, they'd be due a fizzer. "'Come on.' "'He stood up and pulled Shufty to her feet. "'Feeling all right, Dad?' It was horrible, Sarge. One of them put her hand on... on my socks. Something that doesn't often happen, I'll bet any man, said Jackram. But you did a good job. Now we'll walk nice and quiet, and no more talking till I say, OK? They plodded on for ten minutes, skirting the camp. They heard several patrols, and saw a couple of others on the hilltops as the moon rose. But it dawned on Polly that, loud though the shouting had been, it was only part of the huge patchwork of sound that rose out of the camp. The patrols this far away probably hadn't heard it, or at least were commanded by the kind of soldiers who didn't want to get put on a fizzer. In the dark she heard Jackram take a deep breath. 
Okay, that's far enough. Not a bad job of work, lads. You're real ins and outs now. That guard was out cold, said Polly. Did you eat him? You see, I'm fat, said Jackram. People don't think fat men can fight. They think fat men are funny. They think wrong. Gave him a chop to the windpipe. Sarge, said Shufty, horrified. What? What? He was coming at me with his club, said Jackram. Why was he doing that, Sarge? Oh, you cunning soldier, you, said Jackram. All right, I grant you that I'd just given Madame the old quietus. But, to be fair, I know when someone's just handed me a bleeding drink full of sleepy drops. You hit a woman, Sarge, said Polly. Yeah, and maybe when she wakes up in her corsets, she'll decide that next time a poor old drunk fat man wanders in, it mightn't be such a good idea to try to roll him for his wad, growled Chakram. I'd be in a ditch without my drawers on, and a damn great headache if she'd had her way. And if you two was daft enough to complain to an officer, she'd swear black was blue that I didn't have a penny on me when I came in, and was drunk and disorderly. And the colonel wouldn't care a fig, because he'd reckon a sergeant's daft enough to get caught like that at it coming to him. I know, you see. I look after my lads. There was a clink in the dark. Plus, a few extra dollars won't go amiss. Sarge, you didn't steal the cash box, did you? said Polly. Yep. Got a good armful of her wardrobe, too. Good, said Shifty fervently. It wasn't a nice place. It was mostly my money in any case, said Jackram. Business has been a bit slow today by the feel of it. But it's immoral earnings, said Polly and then felt a complete fool for saying it. No, said Jackram. It was immoral earnings. Now it's the proceeds of common theft. Life's a lot easier when you learn to think straight. Polly was glad there was no mirror. The best that could be said for the squad's new clothing was that it covered them up. But this was a war. You seldom saw new clothes on anybody. Yet they felt awkward, and there was no sense in that at all but they looked at one another in the chilly light of dawn and giggled in embarrassment. Wow, Polly thought, look at us, dressed as women. Oddly enough, it was Igorina who really looked the part. She'd disappeared into the other tumble-down room carrying her pack. For ten minutes the squad had heard the occasional grunt or ouch, and then she'd returned with a full head of hair, shoulder-length hair. Her face was the right shape, missing the lumps and bumps they'd come to know and the stitches on her forehead shrank and disappeared as Polly watched in astonishment. "'Doesn't that hurt?' she said. "'It smarts a bit for a few minutes,' said Igorina. "'You just have to have the nag, and a special ointment, of course.' "'But why is there a curved scar on your cheek now?' said Tonka. "'And those stitches are staying.' Igorina looked down demurely. She'd even restyled one of the dresses into a dirndl, and looked like a fresh young maid from the beer cellar. Just to look at her was to mentally order a large pretzel. "'You've got to have something to show,' she said. "'Otherwise you're letting down the clan. And actually I think the stitches are rather fetching.' "'Well, okay,' Tonka conceded. "'But lisp a bit, will you? I know this is completely wrong, but now you look, oh, I don't know, weird, I suppose.' "'Okay, line up,' said Jackram. He stood back and gave them a look of theatrical disdain. "'Well, I've never seen such a lot of scrub washerwomen in all my life,' he said. "'I wish you all the luck you're bleeding well going to need. There'll be someone watching the door for you to come out, and that's all I can promise. Private Perks, you're acting unpaid corporal on this one. I hope you picked up one or two little lessons on our stroll. In and out, that's what you should do. No famous last stands, please. When in doubt, kick him in the nadges and scarper. Mind you, if you frighten them like you frighten me, you should have no trouble. Are you sure you won't join us, Sarge? said Tonka, still trying not to laugh. No, lad, you won't get me in skirts. Everyone has their place right. The place where they draw the line, well, that's mine. I'm pretty steeped in sin one way and another, but Jackram always shows his colours. I'm an old soldier. I'll fight like a soldier does, in the ranks, on the battlefield. Besides... If I went in there simpering in petticoats, I'd never hear the end of it. The Duchess says there is a d d different path for Sergeant Jackram, said Wazza. And I don't know if you don't frighten me worst of all, Private Goom, said Jackram. He hitched up his equatorial belt. You're right, though. When you're inside, I shall nip down nice and quiet and slip into our lines. If I can't raise a little diversionary attack, 
my name's not Sergeant Jackram. And, since it is Sergeant Jackram, that proves it. Ah, there's plenty of men in this man's army that owe me a favour. He gave a little sniff and added, or wouldn't say no to my face, and plenty of likely lads who'll want to tell their grandchildren they fought alongside Jackram too. Well, I'll give them their chance at real soldier in. Sarge, it'll be suicide to attack the main gates, said Polly. Jackram slapped his belly. See this lot, he said. It's like having your own armour. Bloke once stuck a blade in this up to the hilt and was surprised as hell when I nutted him. Anyway, you lads will be making so much fuss the guards will be distracted, right? You're relying on me, I'm relying on you. That's military, that is. You give me a signal, any signal. That's all I'll need. The Duchess says your path takes you further, said Wazza. Oh, yeah, said Jackram jovially. And where's that, then? Somewhere with a good pub, I hope. The Duchess says, um, it should lead to the town of Scritz, said Wazza. She said it quietly while the rest of the squad were laughing, not so much at Jackram's comment as a way of losing some of the tension. But Polly heard it. Jackram was really, really good, she thought. The fleeting expression of terror was gone in an instant. Scritz? Nothing there, said Jackram. Dull town. There was a sword, said Wazza. Jackram was ready this time. There was not a flicker of expression, just a blank face that he was so good at. And that was odd, Polly thought, because there should have been something, even if it was only puzzlement. Handled lots of swords in my time, he said dismissively. Yes, Private Halter. There's one thing you didn't tell us, Sarge, said Tonka, lowering her hand. Why is the regiment called the ins and outs? First into battle, last out of the fray, said Jackram automatically. So why are we nicknamed the Cheesemongers? Yes, said Shifty. Why, Sarge? Because the way those girls were talking, it sounded like it's something we ought to know. Jackram made a clicking noise of exasperation. Oh, Tonka, why the hell did you wait till you got your trousers off before asking me that? I'll feel embarrassed telling you now. And Polly thought, that's dangling bait, right? You want to tell us. You want to get any conversation away from Scritz. Ah, said Tonka, it's about sex then, is it? Not as such, no. Well, tell me then, said Tonka. I'd like to know before I die. If it makes you feel any better, I'll nudge people and go, knuh, knuh, knuh. Jackram sighed. There's a song, he said. It starts, "'Twas on a Monday morning, all in the month of May." Then it is all about sex, said Polly flatly. It's a folk song. It starts with "'twas." It takes place in May. Q.E.D. It's about sex. It's a milkmaid involved. I bet she is. There could be, Jackram conceded. Going for to market, for to sell her wares, said Polly. Very likely. Okay, that gives us the cheese. And she meets, let's see, a soldier, a sailor, a jolly ploughboy, or just possibly a man clothed all in leather, I expect. No, since it's about us, it's a soldier, right? And since it's one of the ins and outs, oh dear, I feel a humorous double entendre coming on. Just one question. What item of her clothing fell down or came untied? Her garter, said Jackram. You've heard it before, Perks. No. But I just know how folk songs go. We had folk singers in the lower bar for six months back ho uh, where I worked. In the end, we had to get a man in with a ferret. But you remember stuff. Uh, oh, no. Was there canoodling, Sarge? said Tonka, grinning. Kayaking, I expect, said Igorina to General Sniggering. No, he stole the cheese, didn't he? sighed Polly. As the poor girl was lying there, waiting for a garter to be tied, him, him, he damn well made off with her cheese, right? Eh, not damn, not with the skirt on Oz, Tonka warned. Then it's not Oz either, said Polly. Fill your hat with bread, fill your boots with soup, and steal the cheese, eh, Sarge? That's right. We've always been a very practical regiment, said Jackram. An army marches on its stomach, lads. On mine, of course, it could hold a parade. It were her own fault. She should have been able to tie up her own garters said Lofty. Yeah, probably wanted her cheese stolen, said Tonka. Wise words, said Jackram. Off you go then, cheesemongers. The mist was still thick as they made their way down through the woods to the path by the river. Polly's skirt kept catching in brambles. 
It must have done so before she joined up, but she'd never noticed it so much. Now it was seriously hindering her. She reached up and absent-mindedly adjusted the socks, which she'd separated to use as padding elsewhere. She was too skinny, that was the trouble. The ringlets would have been useful there. They would have said, girl. In their absence, she had to rely on a scarf and a socks change. All right, she whispered as the ground levelled out. Remember, no swearing. Giggle, don't snigger. No belching. No weapons either. They can't be that stupid in there. Anyone bought a weapon? There was a shaking of heads. Did you bring a weapon, Tonk? Magda? No, Polly. No item of any sort with a certain weapon-like quality? Polly insisted. No, Polly, said Tonka demurely. Anything perhaps with an edge? Oh, you mean this? Yes, Magda. Well, a woman can carry a knife, can't she? It's a sabre, Magda. You're trying to hide it, but it's a sabre. But I'm only using it like a knife, Polly. It's three feet long, Magda. Size isn't important, Polly. No one believes that. Leave it behind a tree, please. That is an order. All right. After a while, Shafty, who had appeared to be thinking deeply, said, I can't understand why she didn't just tie up her own garter. Shafty, what the hell? Tonka began. Heck, Polly corrected her, and you're talking to Betty, remember? What the heck are you talking about, Betty? said Tonka, rolling her eyes. Well, the song, of course. And you don't have to lie down to tie a garter in any case. It'd be more difficult, said Shifty. It's all a bit silly. No one said anything for a while. It was perhaps easy to see why Shifty was on her quest. You're right, said Polly eventually. It's a silly song. A very silly song, Tonker agreed. They all agreed. It was a silly song. They stepped out onto the river path. Ahead of them, a small group of women were hurrying around a bend in the cliff. Automatically, the squad looked up. The keep grew out of the sheer cliff. It was hard to see where the unhewn rock ended and the ancient masonry began. They could see no windows. From here, it was just a wall extending to the sky. No way in, it said. No way out. In this wall are few doors and they close with finality. This close to the deep, slow river, the air was bone-chilling cold, and grew colder the higher they looked. Around the curve, they could see the little rock shelf where the back door was, and the women ahead of them talking to a guard. This is not going to work, said Shifty under her breath. They're showing him some papers. Anyone brought theirs? No? The soldier had looked up and was watching the girls with that blank, official expression of someone who was not looking for excitement or adventure in his life. Keep moving, murmured Polly. If it all gets really bad, burst into tears. That's disgusting, said Tonka. Their treacherous feet were taking them closer all the time. Polly kept her eyes downwards, as was proper in an unmarried woman. There would be others watching, she knew it. They'd probably be bored. They might not be expecting any trouble. But up on those walls, there were eyes fixed on her. They reached the guard. Just inside the narrow stone doorway, there was another one, lounging in the shadow. Papers, said the guard. Oh, sir, I have none, said Polly. She'd been working out the speech on the way down through the wood. War, fears of invasion, people fleeing, no food. You didn't have to make things up. You just had to reassemble reality. I had to leave. All right, the guard interrupted. No papers, no problem. If you just step in and see my colleague, nice of you to join us. He stood aside and waved a hand toward the dark entrance. Mystified, Polly stepped inside with the others following. Behind them, the door swung shut. Inside, she saw that they were in a long passage with many slits in the wall to rooms on either side. Lamplight shone from the slits. She could see shadows beyond them. Bowman could turn anyone trapped in here into mints. At the end of the corridor, another door swung open. It led into a small room in which there sat, at a desk, a young man in a uniform Polly didn't recognise, although it had a captain's insignia. Standing to one side was a much, much larger man in the same uniform, or possibly two uniforms stitched together. He had a sword. There was that about him. When this man held a sword, it was clearly held, and held by him. The eye was drawn to it. Even Jade would have been impressed. 
Good morning, ladies, said the captain. No papers, eh? Take off your scarves, please. And that's it, thought Polly, as the bottom of her stomach dropped away, and we thought we were being clever. There was nothing for it but to obey. Ah, you'll tell me your hair got shaved off as a punishment for fraternising with the enemy, eh? said the man, barely looking up. Except for you, he added to Igorina. Didn't feel like fraternising with any enemies? Something wrong with decent Lubinian boys? Uh, no, said Igorina. Now the captain gave them a bright little smile. Gentlemen, let's not mess about, shall we? You walk wrong. We do watch, you know. You walk wrong and you stand wrong. You, he pointed to Tonka, have got a bit of shaving soap under on the ear. And you, lad, are either deformed, or you've tried the old trick of sticking a pair of socks down your undershirt. Crimson with humiliation, Polly hung her head. Getting in or out disguised as washerwomen, said the captain, shaking his head. Everyone outside this stupid country knows that one, lads, and most of them make more effort than you boys. Well, for you, the war is over. This place has got big, big dungeons, and I don't mind telling you, you're probably going to be better off in here than outside. Yeah, what do you want? Shofti had raised a hand. Can I show you something? she said. Polly didn't turn, but watched the captain's face as, beside Polly, cloth rustled. She couldn't believe it. Shufti was raising her skirt. Oh, said the captain. There was an explosion from Tonka, but it was an explosion of tears. They came out accompanied by a long, mournful wail as she threw herself onto the floor. We walked so far. We lay in ditches to hide from soldiers. There's no food. We want to work. You called us boys. Why are you so cruel? Polly knelt down and half picked her up, patting her on the back as Tonka's shoulders heaved with the force of her sobs. It's been very hard for all of us, she said to the red-faced captain. Have you seen everything you wish to see? If you can take him down, I can garrote the other one with my apron string, whispered Tonka in her ear between howls. No, please, said the captain, giving the guard the agonised glance of a man who knows that he is going to be the laughing stock of the whole fort inside the hour. Once was quite... I, I mean, I've seen... Look, I'm completely satisfied. Private, go and fetch one of the women from the laundry. I am so sorry, ladies. I, I, I have a job to do. Do you enjoy it? said Polly every syllable tinkling with ice. Yes, said the captain hurriedly. I, I mean, no, no, yes. We have to be careful. Uh, ah, the soldier had returned, trailing a woman. Polly stared. Ah, Daphne, some new uh, volunteers for Mrs. Enid, said the captain, waving vaguely toward the squad. I'm sure she will have some use for them. Um, oh, certainly, captain, said the woman, curtsying demurely. Polly still stared. "'Off you go with Daphne, uh, ladies,' said the captain. "'And if you're hard workers, Mrs. Enid will, I am sure, give you a pass "'so as we don't have this trouble again.' Uh, um. "'Shofty put both hands on his desk, leaned towards him, and said, "'Boo!' "'His chair hit the wall. "'I may not be clever,' she said to Polly, "'but I'm not stupid.' "'But Polly was still staring at Lieutenant Blouse. "'He'd curtsied surprisingly well.' The soldier escorted them along a tunnel which opened onto a ledge overlooking what was either a cave or a room. It was at that level in the keep where there was not much difference. This wasn't a laundry. This was clearly some hot, damp afterlife for those who required punishment with extra scrubbing. Steam rolled across the ceiling, condensed and dripped onto a floor that was already running with water. And it went on forever, wash tub after wash tub. Women moved like ghosts through the drifting, tumbling clouds of fog. There you go, ladies, he said, and slapped Blouse on the rump. See you tonight then, Daphne. Oh, yes, trilled Blouse. Five o'clock then, said the soldier, and ambled off down the corridor. Daphne, said Polly when the man had gone. My, uh, nom de guerre, said Blouse. I still haven't found a way out of the lower areas, but the guards all have keys, and I shall have his key in my hand by half-past five. Pardon? I think Tonka, sorry, Magda, just bit her tongue, said Polly. Her? Oh, yes. Well done for staying in character, uh... Polly, said Polly. Good choice of name, said Blouse, leading the way down some steps. It's a good, common, maid servanty sort of name. Yes, that's what I thought, 
said Polly gravely. Ah, uh, Sergeant, Jackram not with you at all? said the lieutenant with a trace of nervousness. No, sir. He said he was going to lead a charge on the main gate, sir, if we could send him a signal. I hope he doesn't try without one. Good heavens, the man's mad, said Blouse. Splendid effort from the lads, though. Well done. You definitely pass for women to the casual observer. Coming from you, Daphne, that is a big compliment, said Polly, thinking, gosh, I'm really good at keeping a straight face. But you didn't need to come after me, said Blouse. I'm sorry I couldn't get a signal to you, but Mrs. Enid allowed me to stay overnight, you see. The guards don't do so many checks at night, so I made use of my time to look for ways into the upper keep. All gated or really heavily guarded, I'm afraid. However, Private Haupt Fiddle has taken a rather a shine to me. Well done, sir, said Polly. Sorry, I want to be clear, sir, said Tonka. You have a date with a guard? Yes, and I'll suggest we go somewhere dark, and then, when I've got what I want, I shall break his neck, said Blouse. "'Isn't that going a bit far on the first date?' said Tonka. "'Sir, did you have any trouble getting in?' said Polly. "'This had been nagging at her. "'No, not at all. "'I just smiled and wiggled my hips, and they waved me through.' "'Didn't they ask you for your papers?' said Polly, horrified. "'Well, they did, but I just said I was such a silly girl I kept on losing them. "'Then I burst into tears, which is very feminine, "'and then the captain lent me his handkerchief and said it was all right.' blouse beamed. What about you? Oh, we had a little bit of trouble, said Polly. It was a bit hair... It was a bit awkward for a moment or two. She fumed inside. It seemed so unfair. What did I tell you? said blouse triumphantly. It's all down to thespian ability, but you are plucky lads to try it. Come and meet Mrs. Enid, a very loyal lady. The brave women folk of Borough Gravia are on our side. And indeed, there was a picture of the Duchess in the alcove that served the laundry mistress for an office. Mrs. Enid wasn't a particularly large woman, but she had forearms like jade, a soaking wet apron, and the most mobile mouth Polly had ever seen. Her lips and tongue drew out every word like a big shape in the air. The laundresses, in a cavern full of hissing steam, echoes, falling water, and a thud of wet clothes on stone, watched lips when ears were overwhelmed. When she was listening, her mouth moved all the time, too, like someone trying to dislodge a piece of nut from a tooth. She wore her sleeves rolled up above her elbows. She listened impassively as Blouse introduced the squad. "'I see,' she said. "'Right. You leave your lads here with me, sir. You ought to get back to the pressing room.' When Blouse had bounced and wobbled back through the steam, Mrs. Enid looked them all up and down and then straight through. "'Lads!' she grunted. "'Ha! That's all he knows, eh? For a woman to wear the clothes of a man is an abomination unto Nuggan.' "'But we're dressed as women, Mrs. Enid,' said Polly meekly. Mrs. Enid's mouth moved ferociously. Then she folded her arms. It was like a barricade going up against all that was ungodly. "'It's not right,' she said. "'I've got a son and a husband prisoner in this place, and I'm working myself to the bone for the enemy, just so's I can keep an eye on them.' They're going to invade, you know. It's amazing what we hear down here. So what good's rescuing your men going to do em when we're all under the heel of the Slovenian hand-painted clog, eh? Slovenia will not invade, said Wazza confidently. The Duchess will see to it. Be not afraid. Wazza got the sort of look she always got when someone heard her for the first time. Been praying, have you? said Mrs. Enid kindly. No, just listening said Wazza. Nuggan talks, do you, does he? No, Nuggan is dead, Mrs. Enid, said Wazza. Polly took Wazza's matchstick thin arm and said, Excuse us a moment, Mrs. Enid. She hustled the girl behind a huge water-driven clothes mangle. It heaved and clanked as a background to their conversation. Wazza, this is getting... Polly's native tongue had no word for freaky, but if she had known about the word, she would have welcomed its inclusion. Strange. You're worrying people. You can't just go round saying that a god is dead. God, then. Dwindled, I think, said Bozza, her brow furrowing. No longer with us. We still get the abominations. Wazza tried to concentrate. No, they're not real. They're like echoes. Dead voices in an ancient cave bouncing back and forth. The words changing, making nonsense. 
like flags that were used for signals but now just flap in the wind. Bossa's eyes went unfocused and her voice altered, became more adult, more certain. And they come from no god. There is no god here now. So where do they come from? From your fear. They come from the part that hates the other, that will not change. They come from the sum of all your pettiness and stupidity and dullness. You fear tomorrow, and you've made your fear your god. The Duchess knows this. The mangle creaked onwards. Around Polly the boilers hissed. Water gushed in the runnels. The air was loaded with the smells of soap and damp cloth. I don't believe in the Duchess either, said Polly. That was just trickery in the woods. Anyone had looked round. It doesn't mean I believe in her. That doesn't matter, Polly. She believes in you. Really? Polly glanced around the steaming, dripping cave. Is she here then? Has she graced us with her presence? Wazza had no concept of sarcasm. She nodded. Yes. Yes. Polly looked behind her. Did you just say yes? She demanded. Yes, said Wazza. Yes. Polly relaxed. Oh, it's an echo. This is a cave after all. Uh, which doesn't explain why my voice doesn't come bouncing back. Was, I mean Alice, she said thoughtfully. Yes, Polly, said Wazza. I think it would be a really good idea if you don't talk too much about this to the others, she said. People don't mind believing in, you know, gods and so on, but they get very nervous if you tell them they're showing up. Er, uh, she's not going to show up, is she? The person you don't believe in, said Wazza, showing a flash of spirit. I'm not saying she doesn't exist, said Polly weakly. I just don't believe in her, that's all. She's very weak, said Wazza. I hear her crying in the night. Polly sought for further information in the pinched up face hoping that in some way Wazza was making fun of her. But nothing but puzzled innocence looked back. Why does she cry, she said. The prayers, they hurt her. Polly spun around when something touched her shoulder. It was Tonka. Mrs Enid says we're to get to work, she says. She says the guards come around and check. It was women's work and therefore monotonous, back-breaking and social. It has been a long time since Polly had got her hands in a wash tub, and the ones here were long wooden troughs where twenty women could work at once. Arms on either side of her, squeezed and pummeled, wrung out garments and slapped them into the rinsing trough behind them. Polly joined in and listened to the buzz of conversation around her. It was gossip, but bits of information floated in it like bubbles in the wash tub. A couple of guards had taken liberties, that is, more than had already been taken, and had apparently been flogged for it. This caused much comment along the tub. Apparently, some big milord from Ank Morpork was in charge of things, and had ordered it. He was some kind of wizard, said the woman opposite. They said he could see things happening everywhere, and lived on raw meat. They said he had secret eyes. Of course, everyone knew that city was the home of abominations. Polly industriously rubbing a shirt on a washboard, thought about this, and thought about a lowland buzzard in this upland country, and some creature so fast and stealthy that it was only a suggestion of shadow. She took a spell on the copper boilers, ramming the stewing garments onto the bubbling surface, and noted that in this place, without weapons of any sort, she was using a heavy stick about three feet long. She enjoyed the work in a dumb kind of way. Her muscles did all the necessary thinking, leaving her brain free. No one knew for sure that the Duchess was dead. It more or less didn't matter. But Polly was sure of one thing. The Duchess had been a woman. Just a woman, not a goddess. Oh, people prayed to her in the hope that their pleas would be gift-wrapped and sent on to Nuggan, but that gave her no right to mess with the heads of people like Wazza, who had enough trouble as it was. Gods could do miracles, duchesses posed for pictures. Out of the corner of her eye, Polly saw a line of women taking large baskets from a platform at the end of the room and stepping out through another doorway. She dragged Igorina away from the wash trough and told her to join them. And notice everything, she added. Yes, Corp, said Igorina. Because I know one thing, 
said Polly, waving at the piles of damp linen, and it's that this lot will need the breeze. She went back to work, occasionally joining in the chatter for the look of the thing. It wasn't hard. The washerwomen kept away from some subjects, particularly ones like husbands and sons, but Polly picked up clues here and there. Some were in the keep, some were probably dead, some were out there somewhere. Some of the old women wore the motherhood medal, awarded to women whose sons had died for Borogravia. The bastard metal was corroding in the damp atmosphere, and Polly wondered if the medals had arrived in a letter from the Duchess, with her signature printed on the bottom, and the son's name squeezed up tight to fit the space. We honour and congratulate you, Mrs. L. Lapchik of Well Lane Munns, on the death of your son, Otto Pyrrhan Lapchik, on June 25 at blank. The place was always censored in case it brought aid and comfort to the enemy. It astonished Polly to find that the cheap medals and thoughtless words did, in a way, bring aid and comfort to the mothers. Those in Munns who had received them wore them with a sort of fierce, indignant pride. She wasn't sure she trusted Mrs Enid very much. She had a son and a husband up in the cells, and she'd had a chance to size up blouse. She'd be asking herself, what's more likely? He gets them all out and keeps them safe, or that there's going to be an almighty mess that might well harm us all? And Polly couldn't blame her if she went with the evidence. She was aware of someone talking to her. Hmm? she said. Look at this, will you? said Shufty, waving a sodden pair of men's long pants at her. They keep putting the colours in with the whites. Well, so what? These are enemy long johns, said Polly. Yes, but there's such a thing as doing it properly. Look, they're putting this red pair and all the others are going pink. And I used to love pink when I was about seven. It is an established fact that despite everything society can do, girls of seven are magnetically attracted to the colour pink. But pale pink on a man? Polly looked at the next tub for a moment and patted Shufty on the shoulder. Yes, it is very pale, isn't it? You'd better find a couple more red items, she said. But that'll make it even worse, Shufty began. That was an order, soldier, Polly whispered in her ear, and add some starch. How much? All you can find. Igorina returned. Igorina had good eyes. Polly wondered if they'd ever belonged to someone else. She gave Polly a wink and held up a thumb. It was, to Polly's relief, one of her own. In the huge ironing room, only one person was working at the long boards when Polly, taking advantage of the temporary absence of Mrs Enid, hurried in. It was Daphne. All the rest of the women were gathered around as if they were watching a demonstration, and they were. "'The collar, do you see?' said Lieutenant Blouse, flourishing the big steaming charcoal-filled iron. "'Then the cuffs, and finally the sleeves. Do one front half at a time. You should hang them immediately, but, and here's a useful tip, don't iron them completely dry. It's really a matter of practice, but—' Polly stared in fascinated wonder. She'd hated ironing. "'Daphne, could I have a word?' she said during a pause. Blouse looked up. "'Oh, per uh, Polly!' he said. "'Um, yes, of course.' "'It's amazing what Daphne knows about pleat lines,' said a girl in awe. "'And press cloths. "'I am amazed,' said Polly. Blouse handed the iron to the girl. "'There you go, Dimpfner,' he said generously. "'Remember, always iron the wrong side first, "'and only ever do the wrong side on dark linens. "'Common mistake. Coming, Polly.' Polly cooled her heels for a while outside, and one of the girls came up with a big pile of fresh-smelling ironed laundry. She saw Polly and leaned close as she went past. "'We all know he's a man,' she said, "'but he's having such fun, and he irons like a demon. "'You won't tell the guards?' "'What?' said the girl, grinning. "'And do the ironing ourselves? "'Anyway, we're dying to find out what happens when Daphne goes on her date.' "'Sir,' "'How do you know about ironing?' said Polly, when they were back in the washing-room. "'Had to do my own laundry back at HQ,' said Blouse. "'Couldn't afford a girl, and the batman was a strict nugganite, and said it was girls' work. "'So I thought, well, it can't be hard, otherwise we wouldn't leave it to women. "'They really aren't very good here. You know, they put the colours and the whites together. "'Sir, you know you said you were going to steal a gate key off a guard and break his neck,' said Polly. "'Indeed. "'Do you know how to break a man's neck, sir?' I read a book on martial arts, Perks, 
said Blouse a little severely. But you haven't actually done it, sir? Well, no. I was at HQ, and you're not allowed to practice on real people, Perks. You see, the person whose neck you want to break will have a weapon at that moment, and you, sir, won't, said Polly. I have tried out the basic principle on a rolled-up blanket, said Blouse reproachfully. It seemed to work very well. Was the blanket struggling and making loud gurgling noises and kicking you in the socks, sir? The socks? said Blouse, puzzled. In fact, I think your other idea would be better, sir, said Polly hurriedly. Yes, my uh, other idea. Which, which one was that, exactly? The one where we escaped from the wash house via the clothes drying area, sir, after silently disabling three guards, sir. There's a kind of moving room down the corridor, sir, which gets winched all the way to the roof. Two guards go up there with the women, sir, and there's another guard up on the roof. Acting together, we take out each unsuspecting guard, which would be more certain than you against an armed man with all due respect, sir, and that would leave us very well positioned to go anywhere in the keep via the rooftop, sir. Well done, sir. There was a pause. Did I, er, uh, go into all that detail? said Blas. Oh, no, sir. You shouldn't have to, sir. Sergeants and corporals deal with the fine detail. Officers are there to see the big picture. Oh, absolutely. Er, uh, and uh, how big was this particular picture? said Blouse, blinking. Oh, very big, sir. A very big picture indeed, sir. Ah, said Blouse, and straightened up and assumed what he considered to be the expression of one with panoramic vision. Some of the ladies here used to work in the upper keep, sir, when it was ours, Polly went on quickly. Anticipating your order, sir, I had the squad engage them in light conversation about the layout of the place, sir. Being aware of the general thrust of your strategy, sir, I think I have found a route to the dungeons. She paused. It had been good flannelling, she knew. It was almost worthy of Dracram. She'd larded it with as many sirs as she dared, and she was very proud of anticipating your order. She hadn't heard Jackram use it, but with a certain amount of care it was an excuse to do almost anything. General thrust was pretty good, too. Dungeons, said Blouse thoughtfully, momentarily losing sight of the big picture. In fact, I thought I said, yes, sir, because, sir, if we can get a lot of the lads out of the dungeons, sir, you'll be in command inside the enemy's citadel, sir. Blouse grew another inch, and then sagged again. Of course, there are some very senior officers here, all of them senior to me. Yes, sir, said Polly well on the way to graduating from the Sergeant Jackram School of Outright Rupert Management. Perhaps we'd better try to let the enlisted men out first, sir. We don't want to expose the officers to enemy fire. It was shameless and stupid, but now the light of battle was in Blouse's eyes. Polly decided to fan it, just in case. Your leadership has really been a great example to us, sir, she said. Has it? Oh, yes, sir. "'No officer could have led a finer bunch of men, Perks,' said Blouse. "'Probably they have, sir,' said Polly. "'And what man could dare hope for such an opportunity, eh?' said Blouse. "'Our names will go down in the history books. "'Well, mine will, obviously, and I shall jolly well see to it that you chaps get a mention, too. "'And who knows? Perhaps I may win the highest accolade that a gallant officer may obtain.' "'What's that, sir?' said Polly dutifully. "'Having either a foodstuff or an item of clothing named after one, said Blouse, his face radiant. General Frock got both, of course. The Frock coat and Beef Frock. Of course, I could never aspire that high, he looked down bashfully. But I have to say, Perks, that I have devised several recipes just in case. So, we'll be eating a Blouse one day, sir, said Polly. She was watching the baskets being stacked. Possibly, possibly, if I may dare hope, said Blouse. Uh, my favourite is a sort of a pastry ring, do you see, soaked in rum. That's a rum barber, sir, said Polly absently. Tonka and the others were watching the stacked baskets too. It's been done. Freight so, sir. How about uh, a dish of liver and onions? It's called liver and onions, sir, sorry, said Polly, trying not to lose concentration. Uh, 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 well... It has struck me that some dishes are named after people when really they just made a little change to a basic recipe. 
We must go now, sir. Now or never, sir. What? Oh, right. Yes, we must go. It was a military manoeuvre hitherto unrecorded. The squad, coming from different directions on Polly's signal, arrived at the baskets just ahead of the women who'd proposed to take them up, grabbed the handles and advanced. Only then did Polly realise that probably no one else wanted the job and were only too happy to let idiot newcomers take the strain. The baskets were big and the wet washing was heavy. Wazza and Igorina could barely lift one basket between them. A couple of soldiers were waiting by the door. They looked bored and paid little attention. It was a long walk to the elevator. Polly hadn't been able to picture it when it had been described. You had to see it. It really was just a big open box of heavy timbers attached to a thick rope which ran up and down in a sort of chimney in the rock. When they were aboard, one of the soldiers hauled on a much thinner rope that disappeared up into the darkness. The other one lit a couple of candles, whose only apparent role was to make the darkness more gloomy. No fainting now, girls, he said. His mates chuckled. Two of them and seven of us, Polly thought. The copper stick banged against her leg as she moved. All the girls carried one somewhere, and she knew for a fact that Tonka was limping because she had strapped a washing dolly under her dress. That was for serious washerwomen. It was a long stick with what looked like a three-legged milking stool on the end of it, the better for agitating clothes in a big cauldron of boiling water. You could probably smash a skull with it. The stone walls dropped past as the platform rose. How oh, thrilling, trilled Daphne. And this goes all the way up to your big castle, does it? Oh no, miss. Got to go up through the rock first, miss. Lots of old workings and everything before we get that high. Oh, I thought we were in the castle already. Blouse gave Polly a worried look. No, miss. There's just the wash house down here, cause of the water. Ah, it's a climb and a half even to the lower cellars. Lucky for you, there's this elevator, eh? Wonderful, Sergeant, said Blouse, and allowed Daphne back. How does it work? It's corporal, miss, said the string puller, touching his forelock. It's pulled up and down by prisoners in a treadmill, miss. Oh, how horrid. Oh, no, miss, it's quite humane. Uh, if you're free after work, uh, I could take you up and show you the mechanism. That would be lovely, Sergeant. Polly put her hand over her eyes. Daphne was a disgrace to womanhood. The elevator rumbled upwards quite slowly. Mostly they passed raw rock, but sometimes there were ancient gratings or areas of masonry, suggestive of tunnels long ago blocked. There was a jerk, and the platform stopped moving. One of the soldiers swore under his breath, but the corporal said, Don't be afraid, ladies, this often happens. Why should we be afraid? said Polly. Well, because we are hanging by a rope a hundred feet up the shaft, and the lifting machinery is thrown a cog. Again? said the other soldier. Nothing works properly here. Sounds like a good reason to me, said Igorina. How long will it take to repair? said Tonka. Ah, last time it happened we were stuck for an hour. Too long, Polly thought. Too many things could happen. She looked up through the beams in the roof. The square of daylight was a long way up. We can't wait, she said. Oh dear, who will save us? Blouse quavered. We'll have to find a way to pass the time, eh? said one of the guards. Polly sighed. That was one of those phrases like, well, looky what we have here, that meant things were only going to get a lot worse. We know how it is, ladies, the guard went on. Your men folk away and all. It's as bad for us, too. I can't remember when I last kissed my wife. And I can't remember when I last kissed his wife, either, said the other guard. Tonka jumped up caught a beam and chinned herself on the top of the box. The elevator shook, and somewhere a piece of rock dislodged and crashed down the shaft. "'Hey, you can't do that,' said the corporal. "'Where does it say?' said Tonka. "'Polly, there's one of those filled-in tunnels here, only most of the stones have been knocked out. We could get in easily.' "'You can't get out. We'll get into trouble,' said the corporal. Polly pulled his sword out of his scabbard. The space was too crowded to do much with it except threaten, but she had it, not him. It made a huge difference. You're already in trouble, she said. Please don't force me to make it worse. Let's get out of here. Is that okay, Daphne? Um, yes, of course, said Blouse. 
the other guard laid a hand on his own sword. OK, girls, this has gone, he began, and then slumped. Shufti lowered her copper stick. I hope I didn't hit him too hard, she said. Who cares? Come on, I can give you all a hand up, said Tonka. Igorina, could you have a look at him? And Shifty began nervously. He's a man and he's groaning, said Tonka from above. That's good enough for me. Come on. The lone guard watched as the others were woman handled onto the beams. Er, uh, excuse me, he said to Polly as she helped Blouse up. Yes, what? Would you mind giving me a wallop on the back of the head? he said, looking wretched, so that it doesn't look like I didn't put up a fight against a bunch of women. Why don't you put up a fight? said Polly, narrowing her eyes. We're only a bunch of women. I'm not crazy, said the guard. Here, yeah, let me, said Igorina, producing her stick. Blows to the head are potentially harmful and should not be undertaken lightly. Turn around, sir. Remove your helmet, please. Would twenty minutes unconsciousness be okay? Yes, thanks very much. The guard folded up. I really hope I didn't hurt the other one moaned Shufti from above. He's swearing, said Polly, removing the sword. That sounds like he's okay. She handed up the candles, and then was hauled onto the trembling roof of the elevator. When she had a firm footing in the mouth of the tunnel, she found a sliver of stone, and stamped it hard into the space between the shaft wall and the wooden frame, which shook. It wasn't going anywhere for a while. Tonka and Lofty were already investigating the tunnel. By candlelight, it looked like good masonry beyond the clumsy attempt at walling it up. "'It must be cellars,' said Tonka. "'I reckon they must have made the shaft not long ago and just walled up where it cut through. Could have done a better job, too.' "'Cellars are close to dungeons,' said Polly. "'Now, pinch out one candle, because that way we'll have a light for twice as long, and then—' "'Pax, a word, please,' said Blouse. "'Over here.' "'Yes, sir.' When he was standing a little apart from the rest of the squad, Blouse lowered his voice and said, "'I don't wish to discourage initiative, Perks, but what are you doing?' "'Er, uh, anticipating your orders, sir.' "'Anticipating them?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Ah, right. This is still small picture stuff, is it?' "'Exactly, sir.' "'Then my orders, Perks, are to proceed with speed and caution to release the prisoners.' "'Well done, sir.' "'We'll go through this... this... crypt,' said Igorina, looking around. The candle blew out. Somewhere ahead of them, in darkness absolute and velvet thick, stone moved on stone. "'I wonder why this passage was sealed up,' said the voice of Blouse. "'I think I've stopped wondering why it was sealed up in such a hurry,' said Tonka. "'I wonder who tried to open it,' said Polly." There was a crash of, as it might be, a heavy slab falling off an ornate tomb. It could have been half a dozen other things, but somehow that was the image that sprang to mind. The dead air moved a little. "'I don't want to worry anyone,' said Shufti, "'but I can hear the sound of sort of feet, sort of dragging.' Polly remembered the man lighting the candles. He'd dropped the bundle of matches into the brass saucer of the candlestick, hadn't he? Moving her hand slowly, she groped for them. "'If you didn't want to worry anyone,' came the voice of Tonka from the dry, thick darkness, "'why the hell did you just tell us that?' Polly's fingers found a sliver of wood. She raised it to her nose and sniffed the sulphurous smell. "'I've got one match,' she said. "'I'm going to strike a light. Everyone try to see a way out. Ready?' She sidled to the invisible wall. Then she scratched the match down the stone, and yellow light filled the crypt. Someone whimpered. Polly stared hypnotised. The match went out. "'Okay,' said the subdued voice of Tonka. "'Walking dead people, so?' "'The one near the archway was the late General Pullover,' said Blouse. "'I have his book on the art of defence. "'Best not to ask him to autograph it, sir,' said Polly, as the squad bunched together. There was the whimpering again. It seemed to come from where Polly remembered was her standing. She heard her praying. There were no words that she could make out, just a fierce and urgent whispering. "'Maybe these washing sticks can slow them down a bit,' Shifty quavered. "'More than being dead already,' said Igorina. "'No!' a voice whispered, and light filled the crypt. It was barely brighter than a glowworm, but a single photon can do a lot of work in chthonic darkness. It rose above the kneeling water until it was woman-height, 
because it was a woman. Or at least it was the shadow of a woman. No, Polly saw, it was the light of a woman. A moving web of lines and highlights in which there came and went like pictures in a fire of female shape. Soldiers of Borogravia, attention, said Water. And underneath her reedy little tone was a shadow voice, a whisper that filled and refilled the long rooms. Soldiers of Borogravia, attention! Soldiers! Soldiers! Attention! Soldiers of Borogravia! The lurching figures stopped. They hesitated. They shuffled backwards. With a certain amount of clattering and tongueless bickering, they formed two lines. Wazza stood up. Follow me, she said. Follow me, me. Sir, said Polly to Blouse. I think we go, don't you? said the lieutenant, who seemed oblivious of Wazza's activities now that he was in the presence of the military might of the centuries. Oh, God, there's Major Galosh, and Major General the Lord Canapé, General Anorak. I've read everything he wrote. I never thought I'd see him in the flesh. Partly flesh, sir, said Polly, dragging him forward. Every great commander of the last five hundred years was buried here, Perks. I'm very pleased for you, sir, if we could just move a little faster. It is my fondest hope that I'll spend the rest of eternity here, you know. Wonderful, sir, but not starting today. Can we catch up with the rest of them, sir? As they passed, hand after ragged hand was raised in jerky salute. Staring eyes gleamed in hollow faces. The strange light glistened on dusty braid and stained, faded cloth. And there was a noise, harsher than the whispering, deep and guttural. It sounded like the creaking of distant doors, but individual voices rose and fell as the squad passed the dead figures. Death to Slovenia! Get them! Remember! Give them hell! Vengeance! Remember! They're not human! Avenge us! Revenge! Up ahead, Wazza had reached some high wooden doors. They swung open at her touch. Polly hurried after her. The light travelled with her, and the squad were on her heels. To be too far behind was to be in the dark. Couldn't I just ask Major General... Blaz began, dragging on Polly's hand. No, you can't. Don't dawdle. Come on, Polly commanded. They reached the doors, which Tonka and Igorina slammed behind them. Polly leaned against the wall. I think that was the most, most amazing moment of my life, said Blouse as the boom died away. I think this is mine, said Polly, fighting for breath. Light still glowed around Wazza, who turned to face the squad with an expression of beatific pleasure. You must speak to the high command, she said. You must speak to the high command, whispered the walls. Be kind to this child. Be kind to this child. This child. Polly caught Wazza before she hit the ground. What's happening with her? said Tonka. I think the Duchess really is speaking through her, said Polly. Wazza was unconscious, only the white of her eyes showing. Polly laid the girl down gently. Oh, come on! The Duchess is just a painting! She's dead! Sometimes you give in. For Polly, that time had been the length of time it took to walk through the crypt. If you don't believe, or want to believe, or if you don't simply hope that there's something worth believing in, why turn round? And if you don't believe, who are you trusting to lead you out of the grip of dead men? Dead, she said. So what? What about the old soldiers back there who haven't faded away? What about the light? And you heard how Wazza's voice sounded? Yeah, but, well, that sort of thing doesn't happen to people you know, said Tonka. It happens to, well, strange religious people. I mean, a few days ago she was learning how to fart loudly. She? whispered Blouse to Polly. She? Why is... Once again, a part of Polly's mind overtook the sudden panic. Sorry, Daphne, she said. Oh, yes, uh, of course. <laughs> Can't be too... Uh, yes, the lieutenant murmured. Igorina knelt down by the girl and put a hand on her forehead. She's on fire, she said. She used to pray all the time back at the grey house, said Lofty, kneeling down. Yeah, well, there was a lot to pray about if you weren't strong, growled Tonka. And every bloody day we had to pray to the Duchess to thank Nuggan for slops you wouldn't give to a pig. 
and that damn picture everywhere, that fishy stare, I hate it. It could drive you mad. That's what happened, it was, right? And now you want me to believe the old fat biddy is here and treating our friend there like some puppet or something? I don't believe it. And if it's true, it shouldn't be. She's burning up, Magda, said Lofty quietly. Do you know why we joined up? said Tonka, red in the face. To get away. Anything was better than what we had. I've got Lofty, and Lofty's got me, and we're sticking with you because there's nothing else for us. Everyone says the Zubinians are terrible, right? But they've never done anything to us. They've never hurt us. If they want to come over here and hang a few bastards, I could give them a list. Everywhere there's something bad happening. Everywhere the small-minded bullies are inventing new cruelties, new ways of keeping us down. That bloody face is watching. And you say it's here? We're here, said Polly. And you are here. And we're going to do what we came to do and get out, understand? You kissed the picture. You took the shilling. I damn well didn't kiss her face. And the shilling's the least they owe me. Then go, shouted Polly. Desert. We won't stop you because I'm sick of your... your bullshit. But you make up your mind right now. Right now. Understand? Because when we meet the enemy, I don't want to think you're there to stab me in the back. The words flew out before she could stop them, and there was no power in the world that could snatch them back. Tonka went pale, and a certain life drained out of her face like water from a funnel. What was that you said? The words, you heard me, lined up to spring from Polly's tongue, but she hesitated. She told herself, it doesn't have to go this way. You don't have to let a pair of socks do the talking. Words that were stupid, she said. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Tonka settled slightly. Well, all right then, she said grudgingly. Just so long as you know we're in this for the squad, okay? Not for the army, and not for the bloody Duchess. That was a treasonable speech, Private Halter, said Lieutenant Blouse. Everyone but Polly had forgotten about him, and he stood there like an easy man to forget. However, he went on, I realise we're all somewhat, he looked down at his dress, uh, confused and uh, bewildered by the pace of events. Tonka tried to avoid Polly's eye. Sorry, sir, she muttered, glowering. I must make it clear that I will not stand to hear such things repeated, said Blouse. No, sir. Good, said Polly quickly. So, let's... But I will overlook it this time, Blaz went on. Polly could see Tonka snap, the head raised slowly. You'll overlook it, said Tonka. You will overlook it. Careful, said Polly, just loud enough for Tonka to hear. Let me tell you something about us, Lieutenant, said Tonka, grinning horribly. We are here, Private, whoever we are, snapped Polly. Now let's find the cells. Um, said Igorina, we're quite close, I think. I can see a sign. Um, it's at the end of this passage. Ah, uh, just behind those rather puzzled armed men with the, um, efficient looking crossbows. Um, I think what you've just been saying was important and needed to be said, only, um, not just now, perhaps, and not so loudly. Only two guards were watching them now, raising their bows cautiously. The other was running away down the passage, shouting. The squad, as one man, or woman, shared the thoughts. They've got bows, we haven't. They've got a lot more swords. They've got reinforcements behind them. All we've got is a darkness full of the restless dead. We haven't even got a prayer any more. Nevertheless, Blouse made an effort. In the tones of Daphne, he shrilled, Oh, officers, we seem to have got lost on the way to the ladies' room. They were not put into a dungeon, although they were marched past plenty. There were lots of bleak stone corridors, lots of heavy doors with bars, and lots and lots of bolts, and lots of armed men whose job, presumably, only became interesting if all the bolts disappeared. They were put into a kitchen. It was huge, and clearly not the kind of place where people chopped herbs and stuffed mushrooms. In a gloomy, grimy, soot-encrusted hall like this, cooks had probably catered for hundreds of hungry men. Occasionally, the door was opened and shadowy figures stared in at them. No one had said anything at any time. "'They were expecting us,' muttered Shufty. 
the members of the squad were sitting on the floor with their backs to a huge ancient chopping block, except for Igorina, who was tending to the still unconscious Wazza. They couldn't have got that elevator up by now, said Polly. I wedged that stone in good and hard. Then maybe the washerwomen gave us away, said Tonka. I didn't like the look of that Mrs. Enid. It doesn't matter now, does it, said Polly. Is that the only door? It's a storeroom at the other end, said Tonka. No exit except a grill in the floor. Could we get out that way? Only diced. They stared glumly at the distant door. It had opened again, and there was some muffled conversation among the silhouettes beyond. Tonka had tried advancing on the open doorway and found men with swords suddenly occupying it. Polly turned to look at Blouse, who was slumped against the wall, staring blankly upwards. I'd better go and tell him, she said. Tonka shrugged. Blouse opened his eyes and smiled wanly when Polly approached. Ah, perks, he said. Well, we almost made it, eh? Sorry we let you down, sir, said Polly. Permission to sit, sir? Treat the rather chilly flagstones as if they were your own, said Blouse. And it was I who let you down, I'm afraid. Oh, no, sir, Polly protested. You were my first command, said Blouse. Well, apart from Corporal Dreb, and he was seventy and only had one arm, poor chap. He pinched the bridge of his nose. All I had to do was to get you to the valley, that was all. But no, I foolishly dreamed of a world where everyone would one day wear a blouse. Or eat one, possibly. I should have listened to Sergeant Jackram. Oh, will I ever look my dear Emmeline in the face again? I don't know, sir, said Polly. That was meant to be more of a rhetorical cry of despair rather than an actual question, Perks, said Blouse. Sorry, sir, said Polly. She took a deep breath, ready for the plunge into the icy depths of the truth. Sir, you ought to know that... And I'm afraid, once they realise we aren't women, we'll be put in the big dungeons, he said. Very big and very dirty, I'm told, and very crowded. Sir, we are women, sir, said Polly. Yes, well done, Perks, but we don't have to pretend any more. You don't understand, sir. We really are women, all of us. Blouse grinned nervously. I think you've got a little confused, Perks. I seem to recall that the same thing happened to Rigglesworth. Sir? Although I have to say he was very good at choosing curtains. No, sir. I was a... I am a girl, and I cut my hair and pretended I was a boy and took the Duchess's shilling, sir. Take my word for it, sir, because I really don't want her to draw you a picture. We played a trick on you, sir. Well, not a trick, really, but we... All of us had reasons for being somewhere else, sir or at least not being where we were. We lied. Blouse stared at her. You're sure? Yes, sir. I am of the female persuasion. I check every day, sir, Polly added. And Private Halter? Yes, sir. And Lofty? Oh, yes, sir. Both of them. Don't go there, sir. What about Shafty? Expecting a baby, sir. Suddenly, Blouse looked terrified. No, no, here. Not for several months, sir, I believe. And poor little private Goom? A girl, sir. And Igor is really an Igorina, and wherever she is, Carborundum is really Jade. We're not sure about Corporal Maledict, but the rest of us definitely have pink blankets, sir. But you didn't act like women? No, sir. We acted like men, sir. Sorry, sir. We just wanted to find our men, or get away, or prove a point, or something. Sorry it had to happen to you, sir. Your sure about all this, are you? What are you expecting me to say, Polly thought. Whoops, now I come to think of it, yes, we're really men after all. She settled for saying, yes, sir. So, you're not called Oliver, then? It seemed to Polly that the lieutenant was having a lot of difficulty with all this. He kept asking the same basic question in different ways, in the hope of getting something other than the answers he didn't want to hear. No, sir, I'm Polly, sir. Oh, do you know there was a song about... Yes, sir, said Polly firmly. Believe me, I'd rather you didn't even hum it. Blouse stared at the far wall, eyes slightly unfocused. Oh dear, Polly thought. You took a terrible risk, he said distantly. A battlefield is no place for women. This war isn't staying on battlefields. But a time like this, a pair of pants is a girl's best friend, sir. Blouse fell silent again. Suddenly, Polly felt very sorry for him. He was a bit of a fool in that special way very clever people have of being foolish, but he wasn't a bad man. He'd been decent to the squad, and he'd cared about them. 
He didn't deserve this. Sorry you have to be involved, sir, she said. Blouse looked up. Sorry, he said, and to her amazement he was looking more cheerful than he had all day. Good heavens, you don't have to be sorry. Do you know anything about history, Polly? Can we stick with perks, sir? I'm still a soldier. No, I don't know much history, sir, at least much that I trust. Then you've never heard of the Amazon warriors of Samothrip, the most fearsome fighting force for hundreds of years, all women, absolutely merciless in battle. They were deadly with a longbow, although in order to get maximum draw they had to cut off one of their, um, uh, I say, you ladies haven't been cutting off your, uh, um, uh, no, we haven't cut off any um errors, sir, only hair. Blouse looked incredibly relieved. Well, and then there's the female bodyguards of King Samuel in Hawondaland, all seven feet tall, I understand, and deadly with a spear. Throughout Clatch, of course, there are many stories of female warriors, often fighting alongside their men. Fearsome and fearless, I believe. Men would desert rather than face females' perks. Couldn't deal with them. Once again, Polly felt the slight unbalanced feeling of having tried to jump a hurdle that turned out not to be there. She took refuge in, What do you think's going to happen now, sir? I haven't a clue, perks. Um, what's wrong with young Goom? Some kind of religious mania? Could be, sir, said Polly guardedly. The Duchess talks to her. Oh, dear, said Blouse. She, uh... The door opened. A dozen soldiers filed in and spread out on either side. They wore a variety of uniforms, mostly Slovenian, but Polly recognised several as Ankh Morporkik, or whatever they called it. They were all armed and held their weapons like men who expected to use them. When they had lined up and were glaring at the squad, a smaller group of men stepped in. Again, there was a variety of uniforms, but they were a lot more expensive. These were worn by officers, high-ranking ones to judge by the expressions of disdain. The tallest of them, made taller by his high, plumed cavalry helmet, stared along his nose at the women. He had pale blue eyes, and his face suggested that he really did not want to see anything at all in this room unless it had been thoroughly cleaned first. "'Who is the officer here?' he said. He sounded like a lawyer. Blouse stood up and saluted. "'Lieutenant Blouse, sir, 10th Infantry. "'I see.' The man looked at his fellow officers. "'I believe we can dispense with the guard now, don't you? "'This matter should be handled quietly. "'And for heaven's sake, can't we find this man a pair of pants?' There were a few murmurs. The man nodded to the sergeant of the guard. The armed men filed out, and the door shut behind them. "'My name is Lord Rust.' said the man. I head the Ankh Morpork detachment here. At least, and he sniffed, the military detachment. You have been treated well. You have not been manhandled. I see there is a uh, the young lady on the floor. She's in a swoon, sir, said Polly. The blue eyes lighted on her. You would be, he said. Corporal Perks, sir, said Polly. There were some barely suppressed smiles from the officers. Ah, I believe you are the one seeking her brother said Lord Rust. How do you know that? said Polly. We are an efficient army, said Rust, and treated himself to a little smile of his own. Your brother's name is Paul? Yes. We shall locate him eventually, and I understand another lady was seeking her young man. Shifty curtsied nervously. Me, sir. Again, we shall locate him if you give us his name. Now, please listen to me carefully. You, Miss Perks, and the rest of you, will be taken from here tonight, entirely unharmed, and escorted back into your country as far as our patrols can take you, which, I suspect, will be quite a long way. Is that understood? You will have what you came for, won't that be nice? And you will not return here. The troll and the vampire have been captured. The same offer applies to them. Polly was watching the officers. They looked nervous, except for one at the back. She'd thought all the guards had gone, and... While this man was dressed like a guard, dressed, that is, like a badly dressed guard, he wasn't acting like one. He was leaning against the wall by the door, smoking half a cigar and grinning. He looked like a man enjoying a show. Very generously, Rust went on. This offer applies to you too, Lieutenant uh, Blouse, wasn't it? But in your case, you would be on parole in a house in Slovenia. Very pleasant, I understand. Healthy walks in the countryside and all that sort of thing. This offer has not been extended to your superior officers here, I may add. So, why make it to us, Polly thought? Are you frightened? Of a bunch of girls? 
And that makes no sense. Behind the officers, the man with the cigar winked at Polly. His uniform was very old-fashioned, an ancient helmet, a breastplate, some slightly rusted chainmail and big boots. He wore it like a workman wears his overalls. Unlike the braid and brilliance in front of her, the only statement his clothes made was that he didn't intend to get hurt. It had no insignia that Polly could see, apart from a small shield hooked onto the breastplate. "'If you'll excuse me a moment,' said Blouse, "'I will consult with my men.' "'Men?' said Rust. "'They're a bunch of women, man!' "'But at this moment, sir,' said Blouse, coolly, "'I would not exchange them for any six men you could offer me. "'If you gentlemen would care to wait outside.' Behind the group, the badly dressed man burst into silent laughter. His sense of humour was not shared by the rest of the group, however. "'You cannot possibly consider refusing this offer,' said Lord Rust. "'Nevertheless, sir,' said Blouse, "'we will take a few minutes. "'I think the ladies would prefer some privacy. "'One of them is expecting a child.' "'What, yeah? As one man, the group drew back. "'Not yet, I believe, but if you would just step outside.' When the officers had retreated to the masculine safety of the corridor, the lieutenant turned to his squad. "'Well, men, for you it's a very attractive offer, I have to say.' "'Not for us,' said Tonka, lofty nodded. "'Nor me,' said Shufty. "'Why not?' said Blouse. "'You would get your husband.' "'That might be a bit difficult,' mumbled Shufty. "'Anyway, what about the invasion?' "'I'm not going to be sent home like a package,' said Igorina. "'Anyway, that man has an objectionable bone structure.' "'Well, Private Goom can't join us right now,' sighed Blouse. "'So that leaves you, Polly.' "'Why are they doing this?' said Polly. "'Why do they want us out of the way? "'Why aren't they just leaving us locked up? "'This place must be full of cells.' "'Ah, perhaps they are sensible to the frailties of your sex?' said Blouse and then fried in their stairs. "'I didn't say I was,' he added quickly. "'They could just kill us,' said Tonka. "'Well, they could,' she added. "'Why not? Who'd care? I don't think we count as prisoners of war.' "'But they haven't,' said Polly. "'And they're not even threatening us. "'They are being very careful. "'I think they're frightened of us.' "'Oh, yeah, right,' said Tonka. "'Maybe they think we're going to chase them "'and give them a big wet sloppy kiss.' "'Good.' "'Then we're agreed that we're not going to accept,' said Blouse. "'Damn right! Oh, I, I do apologise. "'We all know the words, sir,' said Polly. "'I suggest we see how much we frighten them, sir.' "'The officers were waiting with unconcealed impatience, "'but Rust managed a brief smile when he stepped back into the kitchen. "'Well, Lieutenant,' he said. "'We have given your offer due consideration, sir,' said Blouse, "'and our reply is, stick it up your... He leaned down to Polly, who whispered urgently, Who? Oh, yes, right. Your jumper, sir. Stick it, in fact, up your jumper. Named after Colonel Henri Jumper, I believe. A useful woolen garment akin to a lightweight sweater, sir, which, if I recall correctly, was named after Regimental Sergeant Major Sweat. That, sir, is where you may stick it. Rust received this calmly, and Polly wondered if it was because he hadn't understood it. The scruffy man, once more leaning against the wall, had understood it, though, since he was grinning. "'I see,' said Rust. "'And that is the answer from all of you. "'Then you leave us no choice. Good evening to you.' His attempt to stride out was hindered by the other officers, who had less sense of the dramatic moment. The door slammed behind them, but not before the last man out turned very briefly and made a hand gesture. You would have missed it if you weren't watching him, but Polly was watching. "'That seemed to go well.' said Blouse, turning away. "'I hope we're not going to get into trouble for that,' said Shufty. "'Compared to what?' said Tonka. "'The last man out stuck his thumb up and winked,' said Polly. "'Did you notice him? He wasn't even wearing an officer's uniform.' "'Probably wanted a date,' said Tonka. "'In Ank Morpork, that means jolly good,' said Blouse. "'In Clatch, I think, it means I hope your donkey explodes. "'I spotted the man, looked like a guard sergeant to me.' "'Didn't have stripes,' said Polly. "'Why do you want to say jolly good to us?' "'Oh, I hate our donkey so much,' said Shufty. "'How's was her?' "'Sleeping,' said Igorina. "'I think.' "'What do you mean? "'Well, I don't think she's dead.' "'You don't think she is?' said Polly. "'Yes,' said Igorina. "'It's like that. "'I wish I could keep her warmer.' "'I thought you said she was burning up.' "'She was. "'Now she's freezing cold.' 
Lieutenant Blouse strode over to the door, grabbed its handle, and, to the surprise of all, pulled it open. Four swords were levelled at him. We have a sick man here, he snapped to the astonished guards. We need blankets and firewood. Get them now. He slammed the door. It might work, he said. That door doesn't have a lock, said Tonka. Useful fact, Polly. Polly sighed. Right now I just want something to eat. This is a kitchen after all. There could be food here. This is a kitchen, said Tonka. There could be cleavers. But it is always upsetting to find that the enemy is as bright as you. There was a well, but a web of bars across the top allowed for the passage of nothing bigger than a bucket. And someone with no sense of the narrative of adventure had removed from the room anything with an edge and, for some reason, anything that could be eaten. "'Unless we want to dine on candles,' said Shufti, pulling a bundle of them out of a creaking cupboard. "'Stallow, after all. I bet old Scallard would make candles scubble.' Polly checked the chimney, which smelled as though there had not been a fire in it for a long time. It was big and wide, but six feet up a heavy grill was hung with sooty cobwebs. It looked rusted and ancient, and could probably be shifted by twenty minutes' work with a crowbar, but there's never a crowbar when you want one. There were a couple of sacks of ancient, dry and dusty flour in a storeroom. It smelled bad. There was a thing with a funnel and a handle and some mysterious screws. Every long-established kitchen has one of these, and no one ever remembers why. It is generally for something that no one does any more, and even when it was done, it wasn't done with any real enthusiasm, such as celery basting, walnut shredding, or, in the worst case, edible dormouse stuffing. There were a couple of rolling pins, a lettuce strainer, some ladles, and there were forks. Lots of small forks. Polly felt let down. It was ridiculous to expect that someone imprisoning people in some ad hoc cell would leave in all the ingredients to effect an escape, but nevertheless she felt that some universal rule had been broken. They had nothing better than a club, really. The toasting forks might prick, the lettuce strainer might pack a punch, and the rolling pins were at least a traditional female weapon, but all you could do with the thing with a funnel and a handle and the mysterious screws was baffle people. The door opened. Armed men came in to act as protection for a couple of women carrying blankets and firewood. They scurried in with their eyes cast down, deposited their burdens, and almost ran out. Polly strode over to the guard who seemed to be in charge, and he backed away. A huge keyring jingled on his belt. "'You knock next time, all right?' she said. He grinned nervously. Uh, "'Yeah, right,' he said. "'As they said, we weren't to talk to you.' "'Really?' The jailer glanced around. "'But we reckon you're doing bloody well for girls,' he said conspiratorially. "'So that means you won't shoot at us when we break out?' said Polly sweetly. The grin faded. "'Don't try it,' said the jailer. "'What a big bunch of keys you have there, sir,' said Tonka, and the man's hand flew to his belt. "'You just stay in there,' he said. "'Things are bad enough already. You stay here.' He slammed the door. A moment later they heard something heavy being pushed up against it. "'Well, now we have a fire at least,' said Blouse. Uh, this was from Lofty. She volunteered a word so seldom that the rest turned to look at her, and she stopped in embarrassment. "'Yes, Lofty,' said Polly. Uh, "'I know how to get the door open,' muttered Lofty. "'So it stays open, I mean?' Had it been anyone else, someone would have laughed, but words from Lofty had obviously been turned over for some time before utterance. Uh, "'Good,' said Blouse. "'Well done.' "'I've been thinking about it,' said Lofty. "'Good. It will work.' "'Just what we need, then,' said Blouse, like a man trying against all the odds to keep cheerful. Lofty looked up at the big sooty beams that ran across the room. "'Yes,' she said. "'But there'll still be guards outside,' said Polly. "'No,' said Lofty. "'There won't.' "'There won't? They'll have gone away.' Lofty stopped, with the air of one who'd said everything that needed to be said. Tonka walked over and took her arm. "'We'll just have a little chat, shall we?' she said, and led the girl to the other side of the room. There was some whispered conversation. Lofty spent most of it staring at the floor, and then Tonka came back. "'We will need the bags of flour from the storeroom, and the rope from the well,' she said. "'And one of those... what are those big round things that cover dishes with a knob on?' "'Dish covers,' said Shufti. "'And a candle,' Tonka went on. "'And a lot of barrels, and a lot of water. And... "'What will all this do?' said Blouse. "'Make a big bang,' said Tonka. "'Tilda knows about fire, believe me, and flower dust explodes.'
when you say she knows, Polly began uncertainly, I mean every place she worked at burned down, said Tonka. They rolled the empty barrels to the middle of the room and filled them with water from the pump. Under Lofty's monosyllabic direction, using the rope from the well, they hauled three leaking, dusty flour sacks up as high as possible, so that they twisted gently over the space between the barrels and the door. Ah, said Polly, standing back, I think I understand. A flour mill on the other side of town blew up two years ago. Yes, said Tonka, that was Tilda. What? They'd been beating her, and worse. And the thing about Tilda is, she just watches and thinks and somewhere in there it all comes together. Then it goes bang. But two people died. The man and his wife, yes. But I heard that other girls sent there never came back at all. Shall I tell you that Tilda was pregnant when they brought her back to the grey house after the fire? She had it, and they took it away, and we don't know what happened to it. And then she got beaten again because she was an abomination unto Nuggan. Does that make you feel better? said Tonka, tying the rope to a table leg. There's just us, Polly. Just her and me. No inheritance, no nice home to go back to, no relatives that we know of. The grey house breaks us all somehow. Wazza talks to the Duchess. I don't have middle gears, and Tilda frightens me when she gets her hands on a box of matches. You should see her face then, though. It lights up. Of course, Tonka smiled in her dangerous way. So do other things. Better get everyone into the storeroom while we light the candle. Shouldn't Tilda do that? She will, but we'll have to be ready to drag her away, otherwise she'll stay and watch. This had started like a game. She hadn't thought of it like a game, but it was a game called Let Polly Keep the Duchess. And now it didn't matter. She'd made all kinds of plans, but she was beyond plans now. They'd done bloody well for girls. A last barrel of water had been placed, after some discussion, in front of the storeroom door. Polly looked over the top at Blouse and the rest of the squad. OK, everybody, we're uh, about to do it, she said. Are we sure about this, Tonka? Yep. And we won't get hurt? Tonka sighed. The dusty flower will explode, that's simple. The blast coming this way will hit the barrels full of water, which will probably last just long enough to see it rebound. The worst that should happen to us is that we get wet. That's what Tilda thinks. Would you argue? And in the other direction there's only the door. How does she work this out? She doesn't. She just sees how it should go. Tonka handed Blouse the end of a rope. This goes over the beam and down to the dish lid. Can you hold it, Lieutenant? But don't pull it until we say. And I really mean that. Come on, Polly. In the space between the barrels and the door, Lofty was lighting a candle. She did it slowly, as if it was a sacrament or some ancient ceremony, every part of which held enormous and complex meaning. She lit a match and held it carefully until the flame caught. She waved it back and forth on the base of the candle, which she thrust firmly onto the flagstones so that the hot wax stuck it into position. Then she applied the match to the candle wick. Polly and Tonka watched her kneel there, staring at the dancing flame. OK, said Tonka. I'm just going to pick her up, and you just carefully lower the lid over the candle. Right? Come on, Tilda. She raised the girl carefully to her feet, whispering to her all the time, and then nodded to Polly, who lowered the lid with a carefulness that amounted to reverence. Lofty walked as though asleep. Tonka stopped by the leg of a heavy kitchen table, to which she'd attached the other end of the rope holding the flower bags. OK, so far, she said. Now, when I pull the knot, we each grab an arm and we run, Polly, understand? We run. Ready? Got her? She hauled on the rope. Run! The flower sacks dropped, streaming white dust as they fell, and exploded in front of the door. Flower rose like a fog. They raced for the storeroom and fell in a heap past the barrel as Tonka screamed, OK, Lieutenant! Blouse pulled the rope that raised the lid and let the candle flame reach. The word was not woomph. The experience was woomph. It had a quality that overwhelmed every sense. It shook the world like a sheet, painted it white, and then, surprisingly, filled it with the smell of toast. And then it was over, in a second, leaving nothing but distant screams and the rumble of collapsing masonry. Polly uncurled and looked up into Blouse's face. I think we grab things and run now, sir, she said, and screaming would help. I think I can manage the screaming, muttered Shifty. This is not a very nurturing experience. 
Blouse gripped his ladle. I hope this isn't going to be our famous last stand, he said. In fact, sir, said Polly, I think it's going to be our first. Permission to yell in a blood-curdling way, sir. Permission granted, Perks. The floor was awash with water and bits, quite small bits, a barrel. Half the chimney had collapsed into the fireplace, and the soot was blazing fiercely. Polly wondered if, down in the valley, it had looked like a signal. The door was gone, so was a lot of wall around it. Beyond, smoke and dust filled the air. In it, men lay groaning or pitched their way aimlessly across the rubble. When the squad arrived, they did not simply fail to put up a fight. They failed to understand. Or hear. The women lowered their weapons. Polly spotted the sergeant who was sitting and hitting the side of his head with the flat of his hand. "'Give me the keys,' she demanded. He tried to focus. "'What? The keys? I'll have a brown one, please. Are you okay? What?' Polly reached down and snatched the keyring from the unresisting man's belt, fighting down an instinct to apologise. She threw them to Blouse. "'Will you do the honours, sir? I think we'll be having a lot of visitors really soon.' She turned to the squad. "'The rest of you, get their weapons off them.' "'Some of these men are badly hurt, Polly,' said Igorina, kneeling down. "'There's one here with multiple.' "'Multiple what?' said Polly, watching the steps. "'Just multiple. Multiple everything. But I know I can save his arm, because I've just found it over there. I think he must have been holding his sword, and—' "'Just do what you can, okay? said Polly. "'Hey, they're enemies!' said Tonka, picking up a sword. "'This is an eagle thing,' said Igorina, taking off her pack. "'I'm sorry. You wouldn't understand.' "'I'm beginning not to!' Tonka joined Polly in her watch on the stairs. Around them men groaned and stone creaked. "'I wonder how much damage we did. There's a lot of dust up there.' "'There'll be a lot of people here soon,' said Polly, more calmly than she felt. "'Because this is going to be it,' she thought. "'This time there's going to be no turkey to save us. "'This is where I find out if I'm the meat or the metal.' She could hear Blouse unlocking doors and the shouts from those within. "'Lieutenant Blouse, 10th Infantry,' he was saying. "'This is a rescue, broadly speaking. Sorry about the mess.' Probably his inner Daphne had added that last bit, Polly thought. And then the corridor was full of released men, and someone said, "'What are these women doing here, for God's sake? Give me that sword, girl!' And right now she wasn't inclined to argue. Men take over. It is probably because of socks. The squad retired to the kitchen, where Igorina was at work. She worked fast, efficiently, and, on the whole, with very little blood. Her large pack was open beside her. The jars inside were blue, green, and red. Some of them smoked when she opened them, or gave off strange lights. Igorina's fingers moved in a blur. It was fascinating to watch her work. At least, it was if you hadn't just eaten. Squad, this is Major Eric von Moldwitz. He's asked to meet you. They turned at the sound of Blouse's voice. He'd brought a newcomer. The Major was young, but much heavier built than the Lieutenant. He had a scar across his face. "'Stand easy, lads,' he said. "'Blouse here has been telling me what cracking work you've been doing. Well done. Dressed up as women, eh? Lucky you won't find out.' "'Yes, sir,' said Polly. From outside there came the sound of cries and fighting. "'Didn't bring your uniforms with you?' said the Major. "'Could have been tricky if they were found on us,' said Polly, staring at Blouse. "'Could have been tricky anyway, eh, if you were searched?' said the Major, winking. "'Yes, sir,' said Polly, obediently. "'Lieutenant Blouse told you all about this, did he, sir?' Just behind the Major, Blouse was making a universal gesture. It consisted of both hands held palms up and outwards, and waggled furiously with all fingers extended. "'Ha, yes! Still some clothesmen knocking, shop, eh? Young lads like you shouldn't have gone in a place like that, eh? Those places are an abomination if they're run right,' said the Major, wagging a finger theatrically. "'Anyway, we're doing well. Hardly any guards this deep in the keep, you see. The whole place was built on the basis that the enemy would be on the outside. I say, what's that man doing to that man on the slab? Patching him up, sir, said Igorina, throwing his arm back on. He's an enemy, ain't he? Code of the Igors, sir, said Igorina reproachfully. A spare hand where needed, sir. The Major sniffed. Oh, well, can't argue with you fellows, eh? But when you're finished, we've got plenty of chaps out there who could do with your help. Certainly, sir, said Igorina. Any news of my brother, sir? said Polly. Paul Perks? Yes. Blouse here mentioned him, Perks, but there's men locked up everywhere, and it's a little tricky right now, eh? said the Major briskly. 
Ask the rest of you. We'll get you into a pair of pants as soon as possible, and you can join in the fun, eh? The fun, said Tonka in a hollow voice. The fun being, said Polly. We got as far as the fourth floor already, said von Mildwitz. We might not have the whole keep back, but we hold the outer courtyards and some of the towers. By morning we'll control who comes in and who goes out. We're back in the war. They won't invade now. Most of their top brass are in the inner keep. Back in the war, murmured Polly. And we will win, said the Major. Oh, sugar, said Shufty. Something was going to give Polly new. Tonka had that look she got before she exploded, and even Shufty was fidgeting. It would only be a matter of time before Lofty found her box of matches, which Polly had hidden in a cupboard. Igorina packed up a bag and smiled brightly at the Major. Ready to go, sir, she said. At least remove the wig, eh? It's my own hair, sir, said Igorina. Looks a bit sissy, then, said the Major. It would be better if... I am, in fact, female, sir, said Igorina, dropping most of the lisp. Trust me, I'm an Igor. We know about this sort of thing, and my needlework is second to none. A woman, said the Major. Polly sighed. We all are, sir, really women, not just dressed up as women. And right now, I don't want to put any pants on, because then I'd be a woman dressed up as a man, dressed up as a woman, dressed up as a man. And then I'd be so confused, I won't know how to swear. And I want to swear right now, sir, very much. The Major turned stiffly to Blouse. Did you know about this, Lieutenant? He barked. Well, uh, yes, sir, eventually. But even so, sir, I would... This cell was an old guardroom. It was damp and had two creaking bunks. On the hall, said Tonka, I think it was better when we were locked up by the enemy. There's a grill in the ceiling, said Shifty. Not big enough to climb through, said Polly. No, but we can hang ourselves before they do. I'm told it's a very painful way to die, said Polly. Who by? said Tonka. Occasionally the sounds of battle filtered through the narrow window. Mostly it was yells. Often it was screams. Fun was being had. Igorina sat staring at her hands. What's wrong with these? she said. Didn't I do a good job on that arm? But no, they're afraid I might touch their privates. Perhaps you could have promised to operate only on officers, said Tonka. No one laughed. And probably no one would have bothered to run for it if the door had swung open. It was a proud and noble thing to escape from the enemy. But if you were escaping from your own side, where would you escape to? On one of the bunks, Wazza slept like a hibernating bear. You had to watch her for some time to see her breathe. What can they do to us? said Shufti nervously. You know, really do to us. We were wearing men's clothes, said Polly. But that's only a beating. Oh, they'll find some other stuff, believe you me, said Tonka. Besides, who knows what here? But we got them out of prison, our side. Polly sighed. That's why, Shifty. No one wants to know that a bunch of girls dressed up as soldiers and broke into a big fort and let out half an army. Everyone knows females can't do that. Neither side wants us here, understand? On a battlefield like this, who'll worry about a few more bodies? said Tonka. Don't say that. Lieutenant Blouse spoke up for us, said Shifty. What? Daphne? said Tonka. Ha! Huh? Just another body. They probably locked him up somewhere, just like us. There was a distant cheering which went on for some time. Sounds like they've got the building, said Polly. Hooray for us, said Tonka, and spat. After a while, a small hatch was opened in the door, and a silent man handed through a big can of scubbo and a tray of horse bread. It wasn't bad scubbo, or at least not bad scubbo by the standards of bad scubbo. There was some discussion about whether being fed meant you weren't going to be executed, until someone pointed out the tradition of the last hearty meal. Igorina gave it as her professional opinion that the stew was not only hearty, but lungy and livery too. But at least it was hot. A couple of hours later, a can of saloop was handed through, with some mugs. This time the guard winked. An hour after that, the door was unlocked. A young man in a major's uniform stepped inside. Oh well, let's go on as we started, Polly thought. She leapt to her feet. Squad, ten hut! With reasonable speed, the squad at least managed to stand up straight and in a line. The Major acknowledged her by tapping the peak of his cap with a stick. 
It was definitely thinner than an inch. Stand easy, our corporal, isn't it? he said. Yes, sir. That sounded promising. I'm Major Clogston of the Provost's office, said the Major, and I'd like you to tell me all about it. About everything. I will make notes if you don't mind. What's all this about? said Tonka. Ah, you'd be Private Holter, said Clogston. I've already spoken at length to Lieutenant Blouse. He turned, nodded at the guard hovering in the doorway, and shut the door. He also closed the hatch. You are going to be tried, he said, sitting down on the spare bunk. The politicos want you to be tried by a full Nugganite court, but that would be tricky here, and no one wants this to go on for any longer than it has to. Besides, there have been an unusual event. Someone has sent a communique to General Frock, asking about you all by name, at least, he added, by your surnames. Was that Lord Rust, sir? No, it was someone called William de Word. I don't know if you've run across his newspaper thing. We're wondering how he knew you were captured. Well, we didn't tell him, said Polly. It makes things a little tricky, said Cloxton. Although, from your point of view, a lot more hopeful. There are those members of the army who are, let us say, considering the future of Borogavia. That is, they would like there to be one. My job is to present your case to the tribunal. Is that a court-martial? said Polly. No, they're not that stupid. Calling it a court-martial would indicate that they accept that you are soldiers. You did, said Shifty. De facto is not de jure, said Cloxton. Now, as I said, tell me your story, Miss Perks. That's corporal, thank you. I apologise for the lapse. Now, go on. Clogston opened his bag and produced a pair of half-moon spectacles, which he put on, and took out a pencil and something white and square. Whenever you're ready, he added. Sir, are you really going to write on a jam sandwich? said Polly. What? The Major looked down and laughed. Oh, no, <laughs> excuse me, I really mustn't miss meals. Blood sugar, you know. Only it's oozing, sir. Don't mind us, we've eaten. It took an hour with many interruptions and corrections and two more sandwiches. The Major used up quite a lot of notebook and occasionally had to stop and stare at the ceiling. And then we were thrown in here, said Polly, sitting back. Pushed, really, said Egerina. Nudged. Hmm, said Cloxton. You say Corporal Strappy, as you knew him, was suddenly very ill at the thought of going into battle? Yes, sir. And in a tavern in plots, you really need Prince Heinrich and the fracar in or about the fracar, sir. And I didn't know it was him at the time, sir. I see you haven't mentioned the action on the hilltop where, according to Lieutenant Blowers, your prompt work got the enemy code book. Not really worth mentioning, sir. We didn't do much with it. Oh, I don't know. Because of you and that nice man from the newspaper, the Alliance has had two regiments trotting around in the mountains after some guerrilla leader called Tiger. Prince Heinrich insisted, and is in fact in command. He is, you could say, a sore loser. Very sore, according to rumour. The newspaper writer believed all that stuff, said Polly, amazed. I don't know, but he certainly wrote it down. You say Lord Rust offered to let you all go home quietly? Yes, sir. And the consensus of opinion was that he could uh, stick it up his jumper, sir. Oh, yes, I couldn't read my own writing. J-U-M. Cloxton carefully wrote the word in capital letters and then said, I'm not saying this, I am not here, but some senior people on our side are wondering if you would just quietly go. The question hung in the air like a corpse from a beam. I'll put that down as jumper too then, shall I? said Cloxton. Some of us have got nowhere to go to, said Tonka. Or with, said Shufty. We haven't done anything wrong, said Polly. Jumper it is then, said the Major. He folded up his little spectacles and sighed. They won't even tell me what charges are going to be made. Being bad girls, said Tonka. Who are we fooling, sir? The enemy just wanted to be quietly rid of us, and the general wants the same thing. It's the trouble about the good guys and the bad guys. They're all guys. Would we have got a medal, sir, if we'd been men? Shifty demanded. Yep, certainly. And Blouse would have been promoted on the spot, I imagine. But right now we're at war, and this might not be the time to thank a bunch of abominable women, Polly suggested. Clogston smiled. I was going to say, 
to lose concentration. It's the political branch who are pushing for this, of course. They want to stop word getting around, and High Command want this over quickly for the same reason. When is all this going to start? said Polly. In about half an hour. This is stupid, said Tonka. They're in the middle of a war, and they're going to take the time to hold a trial for a few women who haven't even done anything wrong. The General has insisted, said Cloxton. He wants this cleared out of the way. And what authority has this meeting got? said Polly coldly. Thousands of men under arms, said Cloxton. Sorry. The trouble is, when you say to a general, you and whose army, he just has to point out of the window. But I intend to prove that the meeting should be a court-martial. You all kissed the Duchess? You took the shilling? I say that makes it military business. And that's good, is it? Well, it means there are procedures, said the Major. The last abomination from Nuggan was against jigsaw puzzles. They break the world into pieces, he says. That's making people think at last. The army may be crazy, but at least it's crazy by numbers. It's reliably insane. Uh, your sleeping friend, will you leave her here? No, said the squad, as one woman. She needs my constant attention, said Igorina. If we leave her, she might have a sudden attack of vanishing without trace, said Tonka. We stick together, said Polly. We don't leave a man behind. The room chosen for the tribunal was a ballroom. More than half the keep had been taken back, Polly learned, but the distribution of ground was erratic. The Alliance still held the central buildings and the armory, but was entirely surrounded by Borogravian forces. The current prize to fight for was the main gate complex, which hadn't been built to withstand attack from the inside. What was happening out there now was a brawl, a midnight bar fight but on a huge scale. And, since there were various war engines atop the towers, now occupied by either side, the keep was shooting at itself, in the finest traditions of the circular firing squad. The floor in here smelled of polish and chalk. Tables had been pushed together to make a rough semicircle. There must have been more than thirty officers, Polly thought. Then she saw the other tables behind the semicircle, and the maps, and the people scurrying in and out, and realised that this was not just about them. This was a war room. The squad were marched in and stood at attention. Igorina had browbeaten a couple of guards to carry Waza on a stretcher. That circle of stitches under her eye was worth more than a colonel's pips. No soldier wanted to be on the wrong side of the Igors. They waited. Occasionally an officer would glance at them and go back to looking at a map or talking. Then Polly saw some whispering going on. Heads turned again, and there was a drift toward the semicircle of seats. There was a definite sense that here was a tiresome chore that regrettably had to be done. General Frock did not look directly at the squad until he had taken his seat in the centre of the group and adjusted his papers neatly. Even then, his eye passed over them quickly, as if it was afraid to stop. Polly had never seen him before. He was a handsome man and still had a fine head of white hair. A scar down one side of his face had just missed an eye and showed up against the wrinkles. "'Things are moving well,' he said to the room in general. "'We have just heard that a flying column led by the remnant of tents "'are closing on the keep and attacking the main gates from outside. "'Someone must have seen what is happening. "'The army is on the move.' "'There was a certain amount of refined cheering at this, "'none of it from the squad. "'The general glanced at them again. "'Is this all of them, Clogston?' he said. "'The major, who at least had a small table to himself,' stood up and saluted. No, sir, he said. We are awaiting. The doors opened again. Jade was brought in, chained between two much larger trolls. Maledict and Blouse trailed behind her. It seemed that in all the rush and confusion no one had found any pants for Blouse, and Maledict looked slightly blurred. His chains jingled constantly. I object to the chains, sir, said Clogston. The general held a whispered consultation with a few of the other officers. "'Yes, we do not want undue formality,' he said, nodding at the guards. "'Remove them. You trolls can go. I just want the guards to remain on the door. Now, let us proceed. This really shouldn't take too long. Now then, you people,' he settled himself in his chair, "'this really is very simple. With the exception of Lieutenant Blouse, you will agree to be returned to your homes and placed in the charge of a responsible male. Understood?' and no more will be said about this matter. 
You have shown considerable spirit. There is no doubt about that, but it was misplaced. We are not ungrateful, however. We understand that none of you are married, and so we will present you all with suitable, indeed, with handsome diaries. Polly saluted. Permission to speak, sir? Frock stared at her, and then looked pointedly at Cloxton. Uh, you'll have a chance to speak later, Corporal, said the Major. But what exactly have we done wrong, sir? said Polly. They should tell us. Frock looked at the far end of the row of chairs. Captain, he said. A short officer got to his feet. In Polly's face, the tide of recognition raced across the mud flats of hatred. Captain Strappy, political division, sir, he began, and stopped at the groan from the squad. When it had died away, he cleared his throat and went on. Twenty-seven abominations have been committed under Nugganatic law, sir. I suspect there have been many more. Under military law, sir, we have the simple fact that they posed as men in order to join up. I was there, sir, and saw it all. Captain Strappy, may I congratulate you on your rapid promotion, said Lieutenant Blaz. Yes, indeed, Captain, said Clogston. Apparently you were a humble corporal only a few days ago. Plaster dust drifted down again as something heavy struck the wall outside. Frock brushed it off his paperwork. Not one of ours, I hope, he said to a certain amount of laughter. Do go ahead, Captain. Strappy turned to the General. As you know, sir, it is occasionally necessary for us in the political division to assume a lower rank in order to gain intelligence. Covered under the regulations, sir, he added. The look that General Frock gave him stirred a little teacup of hope in Polly's breast. No one could like something like Strappy, not even a mother. Then the man turned back to Clogston. Is this Germain, Major? he said testily. We know they disguise themselves as women, sir, said Clogston smoothly. That's all we know, sir. Apart from Captain Strappy's assertion, and I intend to suggest later that this is tainted, I haven't yet heard any evidence that they have dressed in any other way. We have the evidence of our own eyes, man. Yes, sir, they're wearing dresses, sir, said Clogston patiently. And they're practically bald. Yes, sir, said Clogston. He picked up a thick book dripping with bookmarks. Book of Nuggins, sir. It is a beatitude unto Nuggan that an woman shall wear her hair short, that the amorous propensities of men be not therefore inflamed. I don't see a lot of bald women around, snapped Frock. Yes, sir. It is one of those utterances that people find somewhat tricky, like the one about not sneezing. I should say at this point, sir, that I intend to show that abominations are routinely committed by all of us. We have got into the habit of ignoring them, in fact, which opens up an interesting debate. In any case, short hair is nugganatically correct. In short, sir, and in short hair, the ladies appear to have been involved in nothing more than a little laundry, a kitchen accident, and the release of your good self from the cells. I saw them, snarled Strappy. They looked like men, and they acted like men. Why were you in the recruiting party, Captain? said Major Clogston. I would not have thought one of those would have been a hotbed of seditious activity. Is that a relevant question, Major? said the General. I don't know, sir, said Clogston. That's why I asked. I don't think we would wish it to be said that these ladies had not been given a fair hearing. Said by whom? said Frock. My officers can be relied upon to be discreet. Said by the ladies themselves, sir. Then we must require that they do not speak to anyone. Oh, I say, said Blouse. And how will you enforce this, sir? said Clogston. Against these women who, we have agreed, stole you out of the jaws of the enemy? There was some muttering among the officers. Major Clogston, did you have lunch? said the general. No, sir. Colonel Vester said you become a little erratic when you miss meals. No, sir, I become tetchy, sir. But I think a little tetchiness is called for right now. I put a question to Captain Strappy, sir. Very well. Captain, perhaps you will tell us why you were with that recruiting party, said the General wearily. I was investigating a soldier, sir, said Strappy reluctantly. A non-commissioned officer. 
our attention had been drawn to irregularities in his files, sir, and where there are irregularities we generally find sedition. I hesitate to talk about this, sir, because this sergeant has been of some service to yourself. <coughs> said the general loudly. This is not a matter of discussion here, I think. It was just that, according to the files, several officers had helped, Strappy went on. <coughs> not matter for this court, Captain. Are we agreed, gentlemen? Yes, sir. It was just that the Major asked me, and I... Strappy began, bewildered. Captain, I suggest you learn what a... <coughs> means, roared Frock. So what were you looking for when you rummaged through our stuff? said Polly, as Strappy shrank. M -m 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 my coffee, said Maradit. You used it all, my ca -ca coffee. And you ran away when you were told that you were going into combat, you little dog's pizzle, said Tonka. Polly said you pissed your drawers. General Frock slammed his fist on the table, but Polly noticed that one or two officers were trying to conceal a smile. These are not matters for this inquiry, he said. Well, although, sir, one or two of them seem to be subject for investigation later on, said a colonel further along the table, the personal belongings of enlisted men may only be searched in their presence, General. This may seem a trivial point, but men have mutinied over it in the past. Did you, in fact, believe the, uh, men to be women when you did this, Captain? Oh, Say yes, please say yes, Polly thought as Strappy hesitated. Because when we talk about how those cavalrymen found us so quickly, it'll mean you set them on a bunch of Borogravian girls. Let's see how that one plays in plots. And if you didn't know, then why were you rummaging? Strappy preferred the rock to the hard place. Stone clattered down in the courtyard outside, and he had to raise his voice to make himself heard. I was, uh, generally suspicious of them, sir, because they were so keen. Sir, I protest, said Cloxton. Keenness is not a military vice. In moderation, certainly, said Frock. And you found the evidence of some sort, did you? I did find a petticoat, sir, said Strappy, feeling his way with care. Then why didn't you... Frock began, but Strappy interrupted. I did serve for a while with Captain Rigglesworth, sir, he said. And, said Frock, but the officer on his left leaned over and whispered something to him. Oh, Rigglesworth. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, said Frock. Of course. Fine officer, Rigglesworth. Keen on, uh, amateur dramatics, a colonel supplied in a non-committal voice. Right, right, very good for morale, that sort of thing. <coughs> with respect, General, I think I can offer a way through, said another man with the General's rank. Really, Bob, said Frock. No, oh, well, feel free. The record will show I am yielding the floor to General Gzupi. I'm sorry, sir, I thought these proceedings were not being recorded, said Clogston. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you so much for jogging my memory, said Frock. However, if we were to have a record, that is what it would show. Bob? Ladies, said General Kazupi, flashing the squad a glossy smile. And you too, of course, Lieutenant Blouse. And you too, were, um... He looked quizzically at Maledict, who stared straight back. Sir... General Kazupi, though, was not to be derailed by an eyeballing vampire, even one that couldn't stand still. Firstly, may I offer on behalf of all of us, I think, our thanks for the incredible job you have done, a splendid effort. But, sadly, the world we live in has certain rules you understand. To be frank, the problem here is not that you are women, as such, that is. But you persist in maintaining that you are. You see, we can't have that. You mean, if we put on uniforms again and swaggered around belching and saying, Har, har, fool you all, that would be all right, said Polly. Perhaps I could help, said another voice. Frock looked along the table. Ah, Brigadier Stoffer, yes? This is all rather damn silly, General. <coughs> said Frock. What say? said Stoffer, looking puzzled. There are ladies present, Brigadier. That is <laughs> the problem. 
Damn right, said Tonka. Understood, General. But the party was led by a man, am I right? Lieutenant Blouse tells me he is a man, sir, said Crogston. Since he is an officer and a gentleman, I will take his word for it. Well, then, problem solved. These young ladies helped him, smuggled him in and so forth, assisted him. Fine traditions of Borogravian womanhood and all that. Not soldiers at all. Give the man a big medal and make him a captain, and this will all be forgotten. Strappy rocketed to his feet. General, I protest. It would not be... Protest not accepted, Frock snapped. This is real politics, Captain. It is not about prying and peeking. It is not a matter for the political department. Strappy deflated back into his chair. He caught Polly's eye for a moment and then hastily looked away. Very well, said Frock, looking up and down the table and then smoothing his paperwork and squaring off the edges like a man finishing for the day. This sounds a very sensible and generous proposal to me, Major. Excuse me one moment, General, said Cloxton. I will consult with what we would call the accused, if anyone would enlighten me, as to the precise nature of the charges. He walked over to the squad and lowered his voice. I think this is the best offer you're going to get, he said. I can probably get the money, too. How about it? It's completely ridiculous, said Blouse. They showed tremendous courage and determination. All this would not have been possible without them. Yes, Blouse, and you would be allowed to say that, said Cloxton. Stoffer has come up with quite a clever idea. Everyone gets what they want, but you just have to avoid any suggestion that you were, in fact, acting as soldiers. Brave, Borogravian women going to the aid of a gallant hero, that works. You could take the view that these are changing times, and you are helping them change faster. Well, the squad exchanged glances. Eh, uh, I'd be happy about that, Shifty ventured, if everyone else is. So you'd have your baby without a husband, said Polly. He's probably dead anyway, whoever he was, sighed Shifty. The general has influence, said Clogston. He might be able to... No, I'm not buying into this, said Tonka. It's a gooey little lie. To hell with them. Lofty, said Polly. Lofty struck a match and stared at it. She could find matches anywhere. There was another crump high above. Maledict, said Polly. Let the ball roll. I say no. And you, Lieutenant? Clogston asked. It's dishonourable, said Baz. Could be problems for you if you don't accept, though, with your career. I suspect I haven't got one, Major, whatever happens. No, I will not live a lie. I know, now, that I'm not a hero. I'm just someone who wanted to be one. Thank you, sir, said Polly. Er, uh, Jade? One of the trolls what arrested me hit me with his club, and I threw a table at him, said Jade, looking at the floor. That was mistreatment of a pris... Blaise began, but Clogston said... Uh, no, Lieutenant, I know something about trolls. They are very physical. So, he's a rather attractive lad, is he, Private? I've got a good feeling about him, said Jade, blushing. So I don't want to be sent home. Nothing for me there anyway. Private Igor Ina, said Blouse. I think we ought to give in, said Igorina. Why, said Polly. Because was as dying. She raised her hand. No, please don't cluster round. Give her air at least. She hasn't eaten. I can't get any water down her at all. She looked up with red-rimmed eyes. I don't know what to do. The Duchess talked to her, said Polly. You all heard, and you know what we saw down in the crypt. And I say, I don't believe any of that, said Tonka. It's her mind. They made her crazy enough. And we were all so tired we'd see anything. All that stuff about wanting to get to the high command. Well, here they are, and I don't see any miracles, do you? I don't think she would have wanted us to give in, said Polly. No. Did you hear that? said Polly, although now she wasn't certain if the word had turned up in her head via her ears. No, I didn't, said Tonka. I didn't hear it. I don't think we can accept this compromise, sir, said Polly to the Major. Then I won't said Shufty promptly. I don't... This wasn't... It only came because... But... Look, I, I'm staying with you. Um, what can they do to us, sir? 
put you in a cell for a long time, probably, said the Major. They're being kind to you. Kind, said Polly. Well, they think they're being kind, said Croxton, and they could be a lot worse. And there's a war on. They don't want to look bad, but Frock did not get to be a general by being nice. I have to warn you about that. You're still turning this down. Blouse looked around at his men. I believe we are, Major. Good, said Cloxton, winking. Good. Cloxton went back to his table and shuffled his papers. The allegedly accused, sir, regretfully turned down the offer. Yes, I thought they might, said Frock. In that case, they are to be returned to the cells. They will be dealt with later. Plaster showered down as something hits the outer wall again. This has gone quite far enough. We won't be sent to the cells, Tonka shouted. Then that is mutiny, sir, said Frock, and we know how to deal with that. Excuse me, General, does that then mean the Tribunal does agree that these ladies are soldiers? said Clogston. General Frock glared at him. Don't you try to tie me up with procedural nonsense, Major. It's hardly nonsense, sir, if the very basis— Duck! The word was the faintest, merest suggestion in Polly's head, but it also seemed to be wired to her central nervous system. And not only hers, the squad ducked, Egoina throwing herself across her patient's body. Half the ceiling collapsed, the chandelier fell down and exploded in a kaleidoscope of splintering prisms. Mirrors shattered. And then there was, by comparison at least, silence, broken only by the thud of a few late bits of plaster and the tinkle of a tardy shard. Now! Footsteps approached the big doors at the end of the room, where the guards were just struggling to their feet. The doors swung open. Jackram stood there, shining like the sunset. The light glinted off his shako badge, polished to the point where it would blind the incautious with its terrible gleam. His face was red, but his jacket was redder, and his sergeant's sash was the pure quill of redness, its very essence, the red of dying stars and dying soldiers. Blood dripped off the cutlasses thrust into his belt. The guards, still shaking, tried to lower their pikes to bar his way. "'Do not try it, lads, I beg you,' said Jackram. "'Upon my oath I am not a violent man. But do you think Sergeant Jackram is going to be stopped by a set of bleeding cutlery?' The men looked at Jackram, steaming with barely controlled rage, and then at the astonished generals, and took an immediate decision on their own desperate initiative. Weapons were lowered. "'Good lads,' said Jackram. "'With your permission, General Frock.' He did not wait for the reply, but marched forward with parade-ground smartness. He came to boot-crashing attention in front of the senior generals, who were still brushing plaster dust from their uniforms, and saluted with the precision of a semaphore. "'I beg to report, sir, that we now hold the main gate, sir. Took the liberty of putting together a force of the ins and outs, the side-to-sides, and the backwards and forwards, sir, just in case. Saw a big cloud of flame and smoke over the place, and arrived at the gates just as your lads did. Got them coming and going, sir.' There was a general cheer, and General Kazuppi leaned toward Frock. "'In view of this pleasing development, sir, perhaps we should hurry up and close this—' Frock waved him into silence. "'Jackram, you old rogue,' he said, leaning back in his chair. "'I heard you were dead. How the devil are you?' "'Fighting fit, sir,' barked Jackram. "'Not dead at all, despite the hopes of many.' "'Glad to hear it, man, but while your rosy face is a welcome sight at any time, we are here to—' Fourteen miles I carried you, sir,' Jackram roared, sweat pouring down his face. "'Pulled that arrow out of your leg, sir. Sliced that devil of a captain who pushed an axe in your face, sir, and I'm glad to see the scars looking well. Killed that poor sentry lad just to steal his water bottle for you, sir. Looked into his dying face, sir, for you.' Never asked for nothing in return, sir. Right, sir? Frock rubbed his chin and smiled. Well, I seem to remember there was that little matter of fudging some details, changing a few dates, he murmured. Don't give me that bleeding slop, sir, with respect. That wasn't for me, that was for the army. For the Duchess, sir. And yeah, I see a few other gentlemen around this table who had reason to do the same little service for me. For the Duchess, sir. 
and if you were to leave me one sword, I'd stand and fight any man in your army, sir, be he never so young and full of mustard. In one movement he pulled a cutlass from his belt, and brought it down on the paperwork between Frock's hands. It bit through into the wood of the table and stayed there. Frock didn't flinch. Instead he looked up and said calmly, Hero though you may be, sergeant, I fear that you have gone too far. Have I gone a full fourteen miles yet, sir? said Chakram. For a moment there was no sound but that of the cutlass vibrating to a halt. Frock breathed out. Very well, he said. What is your request, sergeant? I note you have my little lads before you, sir. I'm hearing that they are in a spot of bother, sir. The girls, Jackram, are to be restrained in a place of safety. This is no place for them, and that is my order, Sergeant. I said to them when they signed up, sir, I said, if anyone drags you away, they'll have to drag me away too, sir. Frock nodded. Very loyal of you, Sergeant, and very much in your character. Nevertheless, and I have information vital to these here deliberations, sir. There is something I must tell you, sir. Really? Then by all means tell us, man, said Frock. You don't have to take or it requires that some of you gentlemen quit this room, sir, said Jackram desperately. He was still at attention, still holding the salute. Now you do ask too much, Jackram, said Frock. These are loyal officers of Her Grace. No doubt of it, sir. Upon my oath, I am not a gossiping man, sir, but I will speak my piece to those I choose, sir, or speak it to the world. There's ways to do that, sir, nasty newfangled ways. Your choice, sir. At last Frock coloured. He stood up abruptly. Are you seriously telling me that you'd— This is my famous last stand, sir said Jackram, saluting again. Do or die, sir. All eyes turned to the general. He relaxed. Oh, very well. It can't do any harm to listen to you, sergeant. God knows you've earned it. But make it quick. Thank you, sir. But try this again, and you'll be on the biggest fizzer you can imagine. No worry there, sir. Never been one for fizzers. I will, by your leave, point to certain men, and I'll include Strappy in this category, because I wouldn't dream of calling a captain a dog's todger, sir. They were about half of the officers. They rose with greater or lesser protest, but rise they did under Frock's sapphire glare, and filed out in the corridor. Strappy was among them, trying to stay inconspicuous. General, I protest, said a departing colonel. We are being sent out of the room like naughty children, while these females are— Yes, yes, Rodney. And if our friend the sergeant doesn't have a damn good explanation, I'll personally turn him over to you for punishment detail, said Frock. But he's entitled to his last wild charge, if any man is. Go quietly, there's a good chap, and keep the war going until we get there. And have you finished this strange charade, sergeant? he added, as the last of the officers left. All but one last thing, sir, said Jackram, and stamped over to the guards. They were at attention already, but nevertheless contrived to become more attentive. You lads go outside this door, said the sergeant. No one is to come close, understand? And I know you boys won't try to eavesdrop, because of what'll happen to you if I ever found out that you had done so. Off you go. Hop, 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 hop. He shut the doors behind them, and the atmosphere changed. Polly couldn't quite detect how, but perhaps it was that the click of the doors had said, This is our secret, and everyone present was in on it. Jackram removed his shako and laid it gently on the table in front of the general. Then he took off his coat and handed it to Polly, saying, Hold this, Perks, it's the property of her grace. He rolled up his sleeves. He relaxed his enormous red suspenders. And then, to Polly's horror, if not to her surprise, he brought out his paper screw of foul chewing tobacco and his blackened penknife. "'Oh, I say!' a major began, before a colleague nudged him into silence. Never had a man cutting a wad of black tobacco been the subject of such rapt, horrified attention. "'Things are going well outside,' he said. "'Shame you aren't all out there, eh? Still, the truth's important too, right?' 
and that's what this tribunal is for, I've no doubt about it. It must be important, the truth, else you wouldn't be here, am I right? Course I am. Jackram finished the cut, palmed the stuff into his mouth, and got it comfortable in a cheek, while the sounds of battle filtered through from outside. Then he turned and walked towards the Major who had just spoken. The man cringed a little in his chair. "'What have you got to say about the truth, Major Derby?' said Jackram conversationally. "'Nothing? Well, then, what shall I say? What shall I say about a captain who turned and ran sobbing when we came across a column of Slovenians, deserting his very men? Shall I say that old Jackram tripped him up and pummeled him a bit, and put the fear of Jackram into him, and he went back, and twas a famous victory he had that day, over two enemies, one of them being in his own head?' and he came to old Jackram again, drunk with battle, and said more than he ought. "'You bastard!' said the Major, softly. "'Shall I tell the truth to-day?' "'Janet,' said Jackram. The sounds of battle were suddenly much louder. They poured into the room like the water rushes to fill a hole in the ocean floor, but all the sound in the world could not have filled that sudden, tremendous silence. Jackram strolled on toward another man. "'Good to see you here, Colonel Cummerbund,' he said cheerfully. "'Of course, you were only Lieutenant Cummerbund when I was under your command. Plucky lad you were when you led us against that attachment of Coppelis. And then you took a nasty sword wound in the fracca, or just above, and I got you through with rum and cold water, and found that plucky you might be, but lad you weren't. Oh, how you gabbled away in your feverish delirium! Yes, you did. That's the truth, Olga.' He stepped around the table and started to stroll along behind the officers. Those he passed stared woodenly ahead, not daring to turn, not daring to make any movement that would attract attention. "'You could say I know something about all of yours,' he said. "'Quite a lot about some of you, just enough about most of you. A few of you, well, I could write a book.' He paused, just behind Frock, who stiffened. "'Jackram, I'm—' he began. Jackram put a hand on each of Frock's shoulders. Fourteen miles, sir. Two nights, because we lay up by day, the patrols were that thick. Cut about pretty dreadful you were, but you got better nursing from me than any sawbones, I'll bet. He leaned forward until his mouth was level with the general's ear, and continued in a stage whisper, What is there left about you that I don't know? So, are you really looking for the truth? Mildred. The room was a museum of waxworks. Jackram spat on the floor. You cannot prove anything, Sergeant, said Frock eventually, with the calm of an ice field. Well, now, not as such. But they keep telling me this is the modern world, sir. I don't need proof exactly. I know a man who'd love such a tale to tell, and it'd be in Ankh-Morpork pork in a couple of hours. If you leave this room alive— said a voice. Jackram smiled his evilest smile and bore down on the source of the threat like an avalanche. Ah, I thought one of yous would try that, Chloe, but I note you never made it beyond major, and no wonder, since you always try to bluff with no bleeding cards in your hand. Nice try, though. But first, I could take you to the bleeding cleaners before those guards were back in here, upon my oath, and second, you don't know what I've writ down and who else knows. I trained all you girls at one time or another, and some of the cunning you got, some of the mustard, some of the sense, well, you got it from me, didn't you? So don't any of you go thinking you can be artful about this, because when it comes to cunning, I am Mr. Fox. Sergeant, 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 said Frock wearily, what is it you want? Jackram completed his circuit of the table and finished in front of it, once again like a man before his judges. "'Well, blow me down,' he said quietly, looking along the row of faces. "'You didn't know, did you? You didn't know. Is there a—a a man among you that knew? You thought, every one of you, that you were all alone. All alone, you poor devils. And look at you. More than a third of the country's high command. You made it on your own ladies.' What could you have done if you'd acted to— He stopped, and took a step towards Frock, who looked down at her cloven paperwork. How many did you spot, Mildred? 
That will be general, sergeant. I'm still a general, sergeant. Or sir will do. And your answer is one or two. One or two. And you promoted them, did you, as if they was as good as men? Indeed not, sergeant. What do you take me for? I promoted them if they were better than men. Jackram opened his arms wide, like a ringmaster introducing a new act. Then what about the lads I brought with me, sir? As cracking a bunch of lads as I've ever seen, he cast a bloodshot eye around the table, and I'm good at weighing up a lad, as you all know. They'd be a credit to your army, sir. Frock looked at his colleagues on either side. An unspoken question harvested unsaid answers. Yes, well, she said. All seems clear to us in the light of new developments. When beardless lads dress up as gals, there's no doubt that people will get confused. And that's what we've got here, Sergeant. Mere confusion. Mistaken identities. Much ado, in fact, about nothing. Clearly they are boys, and may return home right now with an honourable discharge. Jackram chuckled and stuck out a palm, flexing the fingers upwards like a man bargaining. Once again there was the communion of spirits. Very well, they can, if they wish, continue in the army, said Frock. With discretion, of course. No, sir. Polly stared at Jackram, and then realised the words had in fact come from her own mouth. Frock raised her eyebrows. What is your name again? she said. Corporal Perk, sir, said Polly, saluting. She watched Frock's face settle into an expression of condescending benevolence. If she uses the words, my dear, I shall swear, she thought. Well, my dear. Not your dear, sir or madam, said Polly. In the theatre of her mind, the Duchess Inn burned to a cinder, and her old life peeled away black as charcoal, and she was flying, ballistic, too fast and too high, and unable to stop. I am a soldier, General. I signed up. I kissed the Duchess. I don't think generals call their soldiers my dear, do they? Frock coughed. The smile remained, but had the decency to be a bit more restrained. And private soldiers don't talk like that to generals, young lady, so we'll let that pass, shall we? she said. Just here, in this room, I don't know what passes and what stays, sir, said Polly, but it seems to me that if you are still a general, then I'm still a corporal, sir. I can't speak for the others, but the reason I'm holding out, general, is that I kissed the Duchess, and she knew what I was, and she didn't turn away, if you understand me. Well said, Perks, said Jackram. Polly plunged on. Sir, a day or two ago I'd have rescued my brother and gone off home, and I'd have thought it a job well done. I just wanted to be safe. But now I see there's no safety while there's all this... this stupidity. So I think I've got to stay and be part of it. Er, try to make it less stupid, I mean. And I want to be me, not Oliver. I kissed the Duchess, we all did. You can't tell us we didn't, and you can't tell us it don't count, because it's between us and her. You all kissed the Duchess, said a voice. It had an echo. You all kissed the Duchess. Did you think that meant nothing? That it was just a kiss? Did you think it meant nothing? Just a kiss? The whispered words washed against the walls like surf and came back stronger in harmonies. Did you kiss? Meant nothing meant a kiss? Just think a kiss meant a kiss? Wazza was standing up. The squad stood petrified as she walked unsteadily past them. Her eyes focused on Polly and then looked down at her own legs. So good to have a body again, she said. I wonder what all the fuss is about. So good a body the fuss is. I wonder the fuss. Something was in Wazza's face. Her features were all there, all correct. Her nose was as pointed and as red, her cheekbones as hollow, but there were subtle changes. She held up a hand and flexed her fingers. Ah, she said, so. There was no echo this time, but the voice was stronger and deeper. No one would ever have said that Wazza's voice had been attractive, but this one was. She turned to Jackram, who dropped onto his fat knees and whipped off his shako. Sergeant Jackram, 
I know that you know who I am. You have waded through seas of blood for me. Perhaps we should have done better things with your life, but at least your sins were soldiers' sins, and not the worst of them at that. You are hereby promoted to Sergeant Major, and a better candidate for the job I have never met. You are steeped in deviousness, cunning, and casual criminality, Sergeant Jackram. You should do well. Jackram, eyes cast down, raised a knuckle to his forehead. Not worthy, Your Grace, he muttered. Of course you aren't, the Duchess looked around. Now where is my army? Ah! There was no hesitancy now, and none of Wazza's cowering and downcast eyes. She positioned herself directly in front of Frock, who was staring with her mouth open. General Frock, you must do one final service for me. The general glared. Who the hell are you? You need to ask. As always, Jackram thinks faster than you. You know me. I am the Duchess Anagovia. But you are— One of the other officers began, but Frock held up a hand again. The voice is familiar, she said in a faraway whisper. Yes, you remember the ball? I remember it too. Forty years ago, you were the youngest captain ever. We danced, stiffly in my case. I asked you how long you had been a captain, and you said, Three days, breathed Frock with her eyes shut. And we ate brandy pillows, and drank a cocktail that I believe was called Angel's Tears, said Frock. I kept the menu, Your Grace, and the dance card. Yes, said the Duchess, you did. And when old General Scaffer led you away, he said, That'll be something to tell your grandchildren, my boy. But you were so dedicated you never had children. And what a man you became, my boy, my boy, my boy. I see heroes, said the Duchess, staring at the tableau of officers. All of you gave up much, but I demand more, much more. Is there any among you who, for the sake of my memory, will not die in battle? Wazza's head turned and looked along the row and smiled. No, I see there is not. And now I demand that you do what the ignorant might feel is the easiest thing. You must refrain from dying in battle. Revenge is not redress. Revenge is a wheel, and it turns backwards. The dead are not your masters. What is it you want of me, ma'am? Frock managed. Call in your other officers. Make what truces are necessary for now. This body, this poor child will lead you. I am weak, but I can move small things, thoughts, perhaps. I will leave her something, a light in the eye, a tone in the voice. Follow her. You must invade. Certainly, but how? You must invade Borogravia. In the name of sanity you must go home. The winter is coming. The trusting animals are not fed. Old men die of cold, women mourn, the country corrodes. Fight Nuggan, because he is nothing now, nothing but the poisonous echo of all your ignorance and pettiness and malicious stupidity. Find yourself a worthier god, and let me go. All those prayers, all those entreaties to me— too many hands clasped that could more gainfully answer your prayers by effort and resolve. And what was I? Just a rather stupid woman when I was alive. But you believed I watched over you and listened to you, and so I had to. I had to listen, knowing that there was no help. I wish people would not be so careless about what they believe. Go! Invade the one place you've never conquered. And these women will help. 
be proud of them. And lest you think to twist my meaning, lest you doubt, let me, as I leave, return to you this gift. Remember, a kiss, a kiss, a kiss, a kiss, return to you, kiss, remember. As one woman, as one man, the crowd in the room reached up hesitantly to their left cheek and Wazza folded up very gently, collapsing like a sigh. Frock was the first to speak. This is... I think we need to... She faltered into silence. Jackram got to his feet, brushed the dust off his shako, placed it on his head and saluted. Permission to speak, sir, he said. Oh, good heavens, Jackram, said Frock distractedly. At a time like this... Yes, yes. What are your orders, sir? Orders? Frock blinked and looked around. Orders, orders. Yes, well, I am the commander. I, I can request a... Uh, yes, I can request a truce, Sergeant. That's Sergeant Major, sir, said Jackram. Right you are, sir. I'll organise a runner to go to the Alliance. I suppose a white flag would be... Good as done, sir. Leave it to me, said Jackram, radiating efficiency. Yes, of course. Uh, before, uh, before we go any further, ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, some of the things said here, the, the whole issue of women joining as women, obviously, Frock raised her hand to her cheek again in a kind of wonderment. They are welcome. I salute them. But for those of us that went before... Perhaps it is not, not yet the time, you understand? What? said Polly. Lip sealed, sir, said Jackram. You can leave it all to me, sir. Captain Blouse's squad, attention. You will obtain uniforms. You can't go around still dressed as washerwomen, oh dear me. We are soldiers, said Polly. Of course you are. Otherwise I wouldn't be shouting at you, you horrible little woman. The world's turned upside down. It's a bit more important than you right now, eh? You've got what you're after, right? Now get hold of a uniform, find yourself a shako, and wipe your face, at least. You are taking the official truce to the enemy. Me, Sarge, said Polly. Right. Just as soon as the officers have done the official letter, Jackram turned. Tonka, Lofty, see what you can find for perks to wear. Perks, don't be cowed and bull yourself up. The rest of you, hurry up and wait. Sergeant Jack, uh, uh, Sergeant Major, said Blouse. Yes, sir. I'm not a captain, you know. Are you not? said Jackram, grinning. Well, leave it to Jackram, sir. We shall see what the day brings, eh? Minor point, sir. I should lose the dress if I were you. Jackram marched off, his inflated chest as red as a robin's and twice as threatening. He shouted at orderlies, harried guards, saluted officers, and despite everything, hammered the blade of purpose out of the red-hot steel of panic. He was a sergeant's major in a room full of confused Ruperts and he was happier than a terrier in a barrel of rats. Stopping a battle is much harder than starting it. Starting it only requires you to shout, Attack! But when you want to stop it, everyone's busy. Polly could feel the news spreading. They're girls! The orderlies scuttling in and out once more kept staring at them, as if they were some kind of strange insects. I wonder how many Jackram missed, Polly thought. I wonder. Bits of uniform turned up. Jade found some pants that fitted by locating a clerk who was Polly's height, lifting him up and pulling them off him. A jacket was acquired. Lofty even stole a shako of the right size and polished the badge with her sleeve until it gleamed. Polly was just doing up the belt when she spotted a figure on the far side of the room. She'd completely forgotten about him. She pulled the belt tight and thrust the leather through the buckle as she walked and then strode through the crowds of figures. Strappy saw her coming, but it was too late. There was no escape, short of running and captains didn't run from corporals. He stood his ground like a rabbit hypnotised by the approaching vixen, and raised his hands as she approached. "'That end, Perks. I'm a captain, and I had a job to do,' he began. "'And how long do you think you'll hold that rank now, sir?' hissed Polly. "'If I tell the General about our little fight, and how you sicked the Prince onto us, and how you bullied Wazzer, and about my hair, you sticky, little, miserable apology for a man.' Shufty's a better man than you, and she's pregnant. 
Oh, we knew there were women getting in, said Strappy. We just didn't know how far the rot went. You took my hair because you thought it meant something to me, hissed Polly. Well, you can keep it. I'll grow some more and no one is going to stop me, understand? Oh, and one other thing. This is how far the rot goes. It was a blow rather than a slap, and it knocked him down so hard that he rolled. But he was strappy, and staggered upright with a finger pointed for vengeance. She struck a superior officer, he screamed. A few heads turned. They looked at Strappy. They looked at Polly. Then they looked back, grinning at what they were doing. "'I should run away again if I was you,' said Polly. She turned on her heel, feeling the heat of his impotent fury. As she was about to rejoin Jade and Maledict, someone touched her arm. She spun round. "'What? Oh! Sorry, Major Clogston,' she said, relaxing. She felt she wouldn't be able to deal with Strappy again, not without committing murder. That would probably get her into trouble even now. "'I should like to thank you for a most enjoyable day,' said the Major. "'I did my best, but I think we were all outclassed.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Polly. "'This was a pleasure, Corporal Perks,' said Clogston. "'I shall watch your future career with interest and envy. Congratulations. "'And since in here protocol seems to be flapping loose, I will shake you by the hand.' They did so. "'And now we have duties.' said Major Clogston, as Jade arrived with a white sheet on a pole. Oh, and, by the way, my name is Christine. But, you know, I really don't think I could get used to wearing a dress again. Maledict and Jade were chosen to see Polly through the castle, a troll because a troll commands respect, and a vampire because a vampire demands it. There were groans and cheers as they elbowed their way along the passages, because news had already got around. That was another reason for taking Jade. Trolls could push. Okay, said Jackram, bringing up the rear. At the bottom of these steps there's a door, and beyond that door is enemy territory. Put the white flag out first. Important safety tip. Can't you come with us, Sarge? Ha! Me? I dare say there's a few people out there who'd take a pot shot at me, white flag or no. Don't you worry, the word's gone out. What word's that, Sarge? Jackram leaned closer. They ain't gonna shoot a girl, Perks. You told them. Let's just say that news gets around fast, said Jackram. Grab the advantage, and I'll find your brother while you're gone upon my oath. Oh, and one other thing. Look at me, Perks. Polly turned in the crowded, jostling corridor. Jackram's eyes twinkled. I know I can trust you, Perks. Make the most of it, lad. Kissin don't last. Well, that couldn't be plainer, Polly thought, as the armed men by the door beckoned them forward. Stick to the walls, okay, ladies, and be quick with that rag. The heavy door swung open. Half a dozen arrows bounced and pinwheeled along the corridor. Another one tore through the flag. Polly waved it desperately. She heard distant shouting and then cheers. Go, go, said a guard, pushing her forward. She stepped out into the sudden daylight, and, to make sure, waved the flag overhead a few more times. There were men in the courtyard and lining the battlements around it. There were bodies, too. A captain, with blood soaking through his jacket, stepped across the fallen and held out his hand. "'You may give that to me, soldier,' he said. "'No, sir. I must deliver it to your commander and wait for his reply, sir. "'Then you give it to me, soldier, and I will bring you back the reply. You have surrendered after all.' Polly shook her head. "'No. This is a truce. That's not the same thing.' I have to hand this over personally, and you aren't big enough. A thought hit her. I demand to take this to Commander Vimes. The captain stared at her, and then looked closer. Aren't you one of those? he began. Yes, sighed Polly. And you locked them in chains and threw the key away? Yes, said Polly, seeing her past life start to flash before her eyes. And they had to hop miles with shackles on and no clothes? Yes. And you're just women? Yes, said Polly, letting the just go for now. The captain leaned closer and spoke while trying not to move his lips. Damn good show. Well done. About time some arrogant bastards here got taken down a hegg. He leaned back. Commander Vimes, it is then. Follow me, miss. Polly felt hundreds of eyes on her as the squad was let into the inner keep. 
There were one or two wolf whistles, because there were more soldiers in there, including quite a few trolls. Jade bent down, snatched up a rock, and hurled it at one of them, hitting him between the eyes. "'No one move!' shouted Maledict, waving his hands urgently as a hundred men raised their weapons. "'That was a troll version of blowing a kiss!' And, indeed, the troll who had been hit was waving at Jade a little unsteadily. "'Can we knock it off with the lovey-dovey, please?' said Polly to Jade as bows were lowered. "'The soft people are likely to get the wrong idea.' "'It's stopped the whistling, though,' Maledict observed. More people watched them as they climbed flight after flight of stone steps. No one could take this place, Polly could see that. Every flight was seen by another one higher up. Every visitor would be sighted on before she'd even glimpsed her face. A figure stepped out of the shadows as they reached the next floor. It was a young woman, in old-fashioned leather and mail armour, with a breastplate. She had long, very fair hair. For the first time in weeks Polly felt a twinge of envy. "'Thank you, Captain. I'll take over from here,' she said, and nodded to Polly. "'Good evening, Corporal Perks. If you would follow me, please.' "'She's a woman and a sergeant,' Maledict whispered, as Angua led them down a wide corridor. "'Yes, I know,' said Polly. "'But she gave an order to that captain. "'Maybe she's apolitical. "'And she's obviously female. "'I'm not blind, Mal,' said Polly. "'I'm not deaf, either,' said the woman, turning and smiling. "'My name is Angua. "'If you will wait here, I'll have some coffee sent in. "'There's a bit of an argument going on in there at the moment.' They were in a sort of ante-room, not much more than a widened area of the corridor, with a few benches. There were big double doors at the far end, behind which voices were being raised. Angua left. "'Just like that,' said Maledict. "'What's to stop us taking over the place?' "'All those men with crossbows we passed on the way up,' said Polly. "'Why us?' she thought, looking blankly at the wall. "'Oh, yes, those, yes,' said Maledict. "'Er, Paul?' Yes. I'm actually maledicta, she sat back. There, I've told someone. That's nice, said Jade. Oh, good, said Polly. I'd be going out to give the latrines their afternoon swill about now, she thought. This has got to be better than that, right? I thought I did pretty well, maledicta went on. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking vampires have a pretty good time of it, whatever sex they are, right? But it's the same everywhere. Velvet dresses, underwired nightgowns, acting crazy all the time, and don't let's even go near the whole bathing in virgin's blood thing. You get taken a lot more seriously if they think you're male. Right, said Polly. All in all, it's been a long day. A bath would be nice. I thought I did pretty well right up until the whole coffee thing. A necklace of the roast beans, that'd be the thing. I'll be better prepared another time. Yeah, said Polly. Good idea. With real soap. Soap? How would soap work? What? Oh, sorry, said Polly. Did you hear anything I said? said Maledicta, looking pained. Oh, that, yes. Thank you for telling me. Is that it? Yes, said Polly. You're you. That's good. I'm me, whoever I am. Tonker's Tonker. It's all just people. Look, a week ago the high spot of my day was reading the new graffiti in the men's latrines. I think you'll agree that a lot has happened since then. I don't think I'm going to be surprised at anything any more. The coffee bean necklace sounds good, by the way. She drummed her feet on the floor impatiently. Right now I just wish they'd hurry up in there. They sat and listened, and then Polly became aware of a little column of smoke coming from behind a bench on the other side of the space. She walked over and peered over the back. A man was lying there, head on one arm, smoking a cigar. He nodded when he saw Polly's face. "'They're going to be ages yet,' he said. "'Are you that sergeant I saw in the old kitchen, making faces behind Lord Rustramank Morpork?' "'I was not making faces, Corporal,' said the man, sitting up. "'That's how I always look when Lord Rusty's talking. And I was a sergeant once, it's true, but look, no stripes.' "'Make the faces once too often.' said Jade. The man laughed. He hadn't shaved today, by the look of it. Something like that, yes. Come along to my office, it's warmer. I only came out here because people complain about the smoke. Don't worry about that lot in there, they can wait. I'm only down a passage. They followed him. The door was, indeed, only a few steps away. 
The man pushed it open, walked across the little room beyond, and sat down in a chair. The table in front of it overflowed with papers. "'I think we can get enough food up here to see you through the winter,' he said, picking up a sheet of paper, apparently at random. "'Grain's a bit short, but we've got a handy surplus of white drumhead cabbage, keeps wonderfully, full of vitamins and minerals, but you might want to keep your windows open if you follow me. Don't stare. I know the country's a month away from starvation.' "'But I haven't even shown this letter to anyone,' Polly protested. "'You don't know what we—' "'I don't have to,' said the man. "'This is about food and mouths.' "'Good grief, we don't have to fight you. "'Your country is going to fall over anyway. "'Your fields are overgrown. "'Most of your farmers are old men. "'The bulk of the grub goes to the army. "'And armies don't do much for agriculture "'except marginally raise the fertility of the battlefield. "'The honour, the pride, the glory, none of that matters. "'This war stops, or Borough Gravia dies. "'Do you understand?' "'Polly remembered the gale-swept fields, "'the old people salvaging what they could. "'We're... "'Just messengers,' she said. "'I can't negotiate.' "'You know your God's dead,' said the man. "'Nothing left but a voice, according to some of our priests. "'The last three abominations were against rocks, ears, and accordion players. "'Okay, I might be with him on the last one, but rocks? Ha! "'We can advise you if you're going to look for a new one, by the way. "'Om's very popular at the moment. "'Very few abominations, no special clothing, and hymns you can sing in the bath. "'You won't get off of the crocodile god up here with your winters.' "'and the unorthodox potato church is probably a bit too uncomplicated for, uh... "'Polly started to laugh. "'Look, sir, I'm just a... what is your name, please? "'Sam Vimes. Special envoy, which is kind of like an ambassador but without the little gold chocolates.' "'Vimes the butcher,' said Maledicta. "'Oh, yes, I've heard that one,' said Vimes, grinning. "'Your people haven't really mastered the fine art of propaganda, "'and I'm telling you because... well...' "'Have you heard of Om?' "'They shook their heads. "'No? "'Well, in the old book of Om "'there's a story about some city full of wickedness, "'and Om decided to destroy it with holy fire, "'this being back in the old smiting days "'before he'd got religion. "'But Bishop Horn protested this plan, "'and Om said he'd spare the city "'if the bishop could find one good man. "'Well, the bishop knocked on every door "'and turned up empty-handed.' It turned out, after the place had been reduced to a big puddle of glass, that there were probably plenty of good people there, and, being good, they weren't the sort to admit it. Death by modesty. Terrible thing. And you, ladies, are the only Borogravians I know much about, apart from the military, who, frankly, aren't chatty. You don't appear to be as insane as your country's foreign policy. You're the one piece of international goodwill it has. A bunch of young boys outwitting crack cavalrymen, "'Kicking the prince in the fork? "'People at home like that. "'And now it turns out your girls. "'They'll love that. "'Mr. DeWord is going to have fun with that when he finds out, "'and I'll see he does. "'But we don't have any power. "'We can't negotiate a... "'What does Borough Gravia want? "'Not the country. "'I mean the people.' "'Polly opened her mouth to reply "'and then shut it again and thought about the answer. "'To be left alone,' she said. "'By everybody. For a while, anyway. We can change things. "'You'll accept the food. We are a proud country. "'What are you proud of?' "'It came swiftly, like a blow, and Polly realised how wars happened. "'You took that shock that had run through her and let it boil. "'It may be corrupt, benighted and stupid, but it's ours.' "'Vimes was watching her face. "'From this desk here,' he said, "'the only thing your country has to be proud of right now is you women. Polly stayed silent. She was still trying to cope with the anger. It made it worse to know that he was right. We have our pride, and that's what we're proud of. We're proud of being proud. Very well, then. Will you buy some food? said Vimes, watching her carefully. On credit. I suppose you still have someone in your country who knows about the kind of international affairs that don't involve edged weapons? People uh, would accept that, yes said Polly hoarsely. Good. I'll send a clax back tonight. And why would you be so generous, Mr. Rank Morpork? Because I'm from a wonderfully warm-hearted city, Corporal. <laughs> no, no, I can't say that and keep a straight face, said Vimes. Do you want to know the truth? Most people in Ank Morpork hadn't even heard of your country until the clax went down. There's dozens of little countries around here selling one another hand-painted clogs or beer made from turnips. 
Then they knew you as the bloody mad idiots who fight everyone. Now they know you as, well, people who do just what they do. And tomorrow they'll laugh. And there are other people, people who sit and think about the future every day, who believe it's worth a little to be friends with a country like that. Oh, why? said Maledicta suspiciously. Because Ank Morpork is a friend to all freedom-loving people everywhere, said Vimes. Ha! Gods, it must be the way I tell them. Ze ji borogrisha proshtvik. He saw their blank expressions. Sorry, I've been away from home too long, and frankly, I'd rather be back there. But why did you say you were a cherry pancake? said Polly. Didn't I say I'm a citizen to Borogravia? No. Brogosha is the cherry pancake. Borogvia is the country. Well, I made the effort at least. Look, we'd rather Prince Heinrich wasn't ruler of two countries. That'd make one quite big country, much bigger than the other ones round here. So it'd probably get bigger still. He wants to be like Ank Morpork, you see. But what he means is, he wants power and influence. He doesn't want to earn them. He doesn't want to grow into them or learn the hard way how to use them. He just wants them. Well, that's playing politics, said Maledicta. No, it's just telling the truth. Make peace with him by all means. Just leave the road and the towers alone. You'll get the food anyway at whatever price. Mr. De Word's article will see to that. You sent the coffee, said Polly. Oh, yeah, that was Corporal Buggy Swire's My Eye in the Sky. He's a gnome. And you set a werewolf on us. Well, set is a bit strong. Angua followed you just to be on the safe side. She's a werewolf, yes. The girl we met, she didn't look like one. Well, they don't, usually, said Vimes. Right up until the moment when they do, if you see what I mean. And she was following you because I was looking for anything that had stopped thousands of people dying, that's why. And that's not politics either, said Vimes. He stood up. And now, ladies, I have to go and present your document to the Alliance leaders. You came out for a smoke at the right time, didn't you? said Polly, slowly and carefully. You knew we were on our way, and you made sure you'd get to us first. Of course! I can't leave this to a bunch of... Oh, yeah, Rupert's. Where is my brother, Mr. Vimes? said Polly stiffly. You seem very sure I know, said Vimes, not looking her in the face. I'm certain you do, said Polly. Why? Because no one else does. Vimes stubbed out his cigar. Angua was right about you, he said. Yeah, I uh, arranged for him to be put in what I like to call protective custody. He's fine. Angua will take you to him now, if you like. Your brother. Possibility of revenge, blackmail, who knows what. I thought he might be safer if I know exactly who holds the keys. The end of the journey, Polly thought. But it wasn't. Not any more. She got the distinct impression that the man opposite was reading her thoughts. That's what all this was about, wasn't it? He said. No, sir. It's just how it started, said Polly. Well, it continues like this, said Vimes. This is going to be a busy day. Right now I shall take this offer of a truce in the room down the passage and present it to the very important men his voice went flat to say those words, who are discussing what to do about Borogravia. You'll get a truce, the food, and probably some other help. How do you know that? said Polly. They haven't discussed it. Not yet. But, as I told you, I used to be a sergeant. Angua! The door opened. Angua came in. As Vimes had said, you couldn't tell who was a werewolf until you found out. And now I'd better have a shave before I go to see the very important men said Vimes. People set a lot of store by shaving. Polly felt embarrassed walking down the steps with Sergeant Angua. How did you start a conversation? So, you're a werewolf, then, would be sort of idiotic. She was glad that Jade and Maledicta had been left in the waiting room. Yes, I am, said Angua. But I didn't say it, Polly burst out. No, but I'm used to situations like this. I've learned to recognise the way people don't say things. Don't worry. You followed us, said Polly. Yes, so you must have known we weren't men. Oh, yes, said Angua. My sense of smell is much better than my eyesight, and I've got sharp eyes. Humans are smelly creatures. 
For what it's worth, though, I wouldn't have told Mr. Vimes if I hadn't heard you talking to one another. Anyone could have heard you. You don't need to be a werewolf for that. Everyone's got secrets they don't want known. Werewolves are a bit like vampires in that way. We're tolerated if we're careful. That we can understand, said Polly. So are we, she thought. Angua stopped by a heavy, studded door. He's in here, she said, producing a key and turning it in the lock. I'll go back and chat with the others. Come and find me when you're ready. Polly stepped inside, heart-pounding, and there was Paul. And there was a buzzard on a perch by the open window. And on the wall, where Paul was working so intensely that his tongue was sticking out of the corner of his mouth, and he hadn't even noticed the door opening, was another buzzard, flying in the heart of the sunrise. Right now, Polly could forgive Ank Morpork anything. Someone had found Paul a box of coloured chalks. What was a long day began to get longer. She had a kind of power. They all did. People gave them space, watched them. The fighting had stopped, and they were the cause, and no one knew exactly why. There were lighter moments. They might have power, but General Frock gave the orders. And General Frock might give the orders, but it was permissible to suppose that it was Sergeant Major Jackram who anticipated them. And perhaps that was why Shufty asked Polly and Tonka to go with her, and they were ushered into a room where a couple of guards stood on either side of a sheepish young man called Johnny, who had fair hair and blue eyes and a gold earring and his pants around his knees in case Shufty wanted to check his other distinguishing feature. He also had a black eye. Is this the one? said Major Clogston, who was leaning against the wall, eating an apple. The General has asked me to tell you that there will be a dowry of five hundred crowns with the army's compliments. Johnny brightened up slightly when he heard that. Shufti gave him a long and careful look. No, she said at last, turning away. That's not him. Johnny opened his mouth, and Polly snapped. No one asked you to speak private. And such was the nature of the day that he shut up. Oh dear, <clears throat> I'm afraid he's the only candidate, said Clogston. We've got any amount of earrings, heads of fair hair, blue eyes, Johnny's, and, surprisingly, a fair number of carbuncles. But he's the only one with everything. Are you sure? Positive, said Shufty, still staring at the boy. My Johnny must have been killed. Clogston walked over and lowered her voice. In that case, sir, the General did say, informally, that a marriage certificate, a ring, and a widow's pension could be arranged, she said. Can she do that? whispered Polly. For one of you, today, you'll be amazed at what can be done, said Clogston. Don't think too badly of her. She means well. She's a very practical man. No, said Shifty. I... it's... well, no. Thank you, but no. Are you sure? said Polly. Positive, said Shifty, looking defiant. Since she was not naturally a defying kind of person, it was not quite the look that she thought it was, and ought to have been, having overtones of hemorrhoid sufferer. But the effort was there. Clogston stepped back. Well, if you're certain, Private, fair enough, then. Take that man away, Sergeant. Just a moment, said Shufty. She walked over to the bewildered Johnny, stood in front of him, held out her hand, and said, Before they take you away again, I want my sixpence back, you son of a bitch. Polly held out her hand to Clogston, who shook it and smiled. There had been another little victory of sorts. If the landslide is big enough, even square pebbles will roll. Polly headed back to the rather larger cell that had been made available as the women's barracks, or at least the barracks for the official women. Men, grown men, had fallen over themselves to put cushions in there and bring in wood for the fire. It was all very strange. Polly felt they were being treated as something dangerous and fragile, like, say, a huge and wonderful jar full of poison. She turned the corner into the big courtyard, and there was de word with Mr. Sheik. There was no escaping them. There were definitely people looking for someone. The man was dragging out his notebook even as he came toward her, and gave her a look in which reproach was mingled with hope. Er, uh, so, you're women, then, he said. Er, uh, yes, said Polly. That seemed to cover it. But you didn't tell me when we met before, said de word as if there was some dereliction of manners. Sorry, 
But we didn't tell you we were men either. De Word, a man who wrote things down, found a nice new page in his book. This is an amazing story, he said. You really fought your way here and got in disguised as washerwomen? Well, we were women, and we did do some washing, said Polly. I suppose it was quite a cunning disguise, really. We got in by not being disguised, you could say. General Frock and Captain Blouse say they're very proud of you, De Word went on, scribbling. Oh, he has got promoted then, said Polly. Yes, and Frock said you did wonderfully well for women. Yes, I suppose we did, said Polly. Yes, very well, for women. The general went on to say, De Word consulted his notebook, that you are a credit to the women of your country. I wonder if you'd care to comment. He looked innocent, so possibly he didn't understand the raging argument that had just broken out in Polly's head. A credit to the women of your country. We're proud of you. Somehow those words locked you away, put you in your place, patted you on the head and dismissed you with a sweetie. On the other hand, you had to start somewhere. That's very nice of them, said Polly, but we just want to get the job done and go home. That's what soldiers want. She thought for a moment, and then added, and hot sweet tea. To her amazement, he wrote this down, too. Just one last question, miss. Do you think the world would be a different place if more women were soldiers? De Word asked. He was smiling again, she noted, so this was probably a jokey kind of question. Oh, I think you'd have to ask General Frock that, said Polly, and I'd like to watch her expression if you do. Yes, but what do you think, miss? That's Corporal, please. Sorry, Corporal. And? The pencil was hovering. Around it the world turned. It wrote things down, and then they got everywhere. The pen might not be mightier than the sword, but maybe the printing press was heavier than the siege weapon. Just a few words can change everything. Well, said Polly, I... There was a sudden bustling around the gates at the other end of the courtyard, and some cavalry officers arrived. They must have been expected, because the Slovenian officers were converging in a great hurry. Ah, I see the prince is back, said De Word. He's probably not going to be happy about the truce. They sent some gallopers out to meet him. Can he do anything about it? De Word shrugged. He left some very senior officers here. It would be rather shocking if he did. The tall figure had dismounted, and was striding toward Polly, or rather, she realised, the big doorway next to her. Frantic clerks and officers trailed after him, and were brushed off, but when a white oblong was waved in front of his face by one man, he grabbed it and stopped so quickly that several other officers bumped into him. Um, said De Word, the addition with the cartoon, I expect. Um, the paper was thrown down. Yes, probably that was it, De Word went on. Heinrich advanced. Now Polly could make out his expression. It was thunderous. Beside her, De Word turned over to a fresh page in his notebook and cleared his throat. You're going to talk to him, said Polly. In that mood, he'll cut you down. I have to, said De Word, and, as the prince and his retinue reached the doorway, he took a step forward and said, in a voice that cracked slightly, hey, Your Highness, I, I wonder if I can have a word. Heinrich turned to scowl at him and saw Polly. For a moment their gazes locked. The prince's adjutants knew their master. As the man's hand flew to his sword, they closed on him in a mob, completely surrounding him, and there was some frantic whispering, in which some rather louder injections from Heinrich on the broad theme of, What? could be heard, followed by a toccata on, The hell you say? and a riff in the key of, What? Seriously? The crowd parted again. The prince slowly and carefully brushed some dust off his spotless jacket, glanced only briefly at Otto and De Word, and, to Polly's horror, strolled toward her, suddenly all shiny smiles, and with one white-gloved hand extended. Oh, no, she thought, but he's cleverer than Vimes thinks he is, and he can control his temper, and suddenly I'm everyone's mascot. For the good of our great countries, said Heinrich. It is suggested that we publicly shake the hand of friendship. He smiled again, or at least allowed the corners of his mouth to turn up. Because she could think of no other way out, Polly took the huge hand and obediently shook it. Oh, very good, said Otto, grasping his picture box. 
I can only take the one, of course, because, unfortunately, I shall have to use flash. Just one moment. Polly was learning that an art form that happens in a fraction of a second nevertheless needs a long time to take place, allowing a smile to freeze into a mad grimace, or, in the worst cases, a death rictus. Otto muttered to himself as he adjusted the equipment. Heinrich and Polly maintained the grip and stared at the picture box. So, muttered the prince out of the corner of his mouth, the soldier boy isn't a soldier boy. That is your good luck. Polly kept her fixed grin. Do you often menace frightened women? she said. Oh, that was nothing. You are only a peasant girl after all. What do you know of life? And you showed spirit. Everyone say cheers. Otto commanded. One, two, three, oh, bug! By the time the after-images had died away, Otto was back on his feet again. One day I really hope to find a filter that works, he muttered. Thank you, everyone, nevertheless. That was for peace and goodwill between nations, said Polly, smiling sweetly and letting go of the prince's hand. She took a step backwards. And this, your highness, is for me. Actually, she didn't kick. Life was a process of finding out how far you could go too far, and you could probably go too far in finding out how far you could go. But a mere twitch of a leg was enough, just to see the idiot collapse in the ridiculous knock-kneed protective crouch that is as instinctive to a man as saving half an onion is to a woman. She marched away, singing inside. This was not a fairy tale castle, and there was no such thing as a fairy tale ending. But sometimes you could threaten to kick the handsome prince in the ham and eggs. And now there was one other little thing. The sun was setting before Polly found Jackram again, and blood-red light shone through the high windows of the keep's biggest kitchen. He was sitting alone at a long table by the fire in full uniform, and he was eating a thick slab of bread plastered with pork dripping. A mug of beer was not far from his other hand. Jackram looked up as she approached and nodded companionably toward another chair. Around them women ran to and fro. "'Pork dripping with salt and pepper and a mug of beer,' he said. "'That's the ticket. You can keep your cuisine. Want a slice?' He waved a hand at one of the kitchen girls who was dancing attendance on him. "'Not right now, Sarge.' "'Sure,' said Jackram. "'There's an old saying, kissing don't last, cooking do. I hope that it's one you don't have cause to reflect upon.' Polly sat down. "'Kissing is lasting so far,' she said. "'Shufty gets sorted out,' said Jackram. He finished the beer, snapped his fingers at the serving girl, and pointed to the empty mug. "'To her own satisfaction, Sarge,' said Polly. "'Fair enough. You can't get fairer. So what next, Perks?' "'Dunno, Sarge. I'll go with what? With Alice and the army, and see what happens.' "'Best of luck. Look after them, Perks, cos I ain't coming,' said Jackram. "'Sarge?' said Polly, shocked. Well, looks like we're going to be short by one war at present, eh? Anyway, this is it. The end of the road. I've done my bit. Can't go on now. Shot me quiver with the general, I dare say he, ahem, <clears throat> will be glad to see the back of me. Besides, old age is creeping on. I killed five poor devils when we attacked today, and afterwards I found myself wondering why. Not good, that. Time to get out before I blunt me own edge. You're sure, Sarge? Yeah. Seems to me the old my country right or wrong thing is at its day. Time to put my feet up and find out what it is we've been fighting for. Sure you won't have any dripping? It's got crunchy bits. That's what I call style in dripping. Polly waved away the proffered slab of grease-smeared bread and sat in silence while Jackram engulfed it. Funny thing, really, she said at last. What's that, Perks? Finding out that it's not about you. You think you're the hero? and it turns out you're really part of someone else's story. Was Alice will be the one they remember. We just had to get her here. Jackram said nothing, but, as Polly would have predicted, pulled his crumpled bag of chewing tobacco out of his pocket. She slipped her hand in her own pocket and pulled out a small packet. Pockets, she thought. We've got to hang on to pockets. A soldier needs pockets. Try this, Sarge, she said. Go on, open it. It was a small, soft leather pouch with a drawstring. Jackram held it up so that it twisted this way and that. "'Well, Perks, upon my oath, I am not a swearing man,' he began. "'No, you're not. I've noticed,' said Polly. "'But that grubby old paper was getting on my nerves. 
Why didn't you ever get a proper pouch made for yourself? One of the saddlers here sewed that up for me in half an hour. Well, that's life, isn't it? said Jackram. Every day you think, ye gods, it's about time I had a new bag. But then it gets all so busy you end up using the old one. Thank you, Perks. Oh, I thought, what can I give the man who has everything? And that was all I could afford, said Polly. But you don't have everything, Sarge. Sarge, you don't, do you? She sensed him freeze over. The noises of the kitchen went away, beyond a dome of frigid silence. "'You stop right there, Perks,' he said, lowering his voice. "'I just thought you might like to show someone that locket of yours, Sarge,' said Polly cheerfully. "'The one round your neck. And don't glare at me, Sarge. Oh, yeah, I could walk away, and I'd never be sure, really sure, and maybe you'd never show it to anyone else ever, or tell them the story. And one day we'll both be dead, and, well, what a waste, eh?' Jackram glared. "'Upon your oath you are not a dishonest man,' said Polly. "'Good one, Sarge. You told people every day.' Around them, beyond the dome, the kitchen buzzed with the busyness of women. Women always seemed to be doing things with their hands, holding babies, or pans, or plates, or wool, or a brush, or a needle. Even when they were talking, busyness was happening. "'No one would believe you,' said Jackram at last. "'Who would I want to tell?' said Polly. "'And you're right.' No one would believe me. I'd believe you, though. Jackram stared into his fresh mug of beer, as if trying to see the future in the foam. He seemed to reach a decision, pulled the chain out of his noisome undershirt, unfastened the locket, and gently snapped it open. There you go, he said, passing it across. Much good may it do you. There was a miniature painting in each side of the locket. A dark-haired girl and a blonde young man in the uniform of the ins and outs. "'Good one of you,' said Polly. "'Pull the other one. It has got bells on,' said Jackram. "'No, honestly,' said Polly. "'I look at the picture and look at you, and I can see that face in her face. Paler, of course. Not so... full. And who was the boy?' "'William, his name was,' said Jackram. "'Your sweetheart?' "'Yes.' "'And you followed him into the army?' Oh, yes, same old story. I was a big, strong girl, and, well, you can see the picture. The artist did his best, but I was never an oil painting. Barely a watercolour, really. Where I came from, what a man looked for in a future wife was someone who could lift a pig under each arm. And a couple of days later, I was lifting a pig under each arm, helping my dad, and one of my clogs came off in the muck, and the old man was yelling at me, and I thought, The hell with this! Will he never yelled? Got all of some men's clothes? Never you mind how cut my hair right off, kissed the Duchess, and was a chosen man within three months. What's that? It's what we used to call a corporal, said Jackram. Chosen man. Yeah, I smiled about that, too. And I was on my way. The army's a piece of piss compared to running a pig farm and looking after three lazy brothers. How long ago was that, Sarge? Couldn't say, really. I swear I don't know how old I am, and that's the truth, said Jackram. Lied about my age so often I ended up believing me. She began, very carefully, to transfer the chewing tobacco into the new bag. "'And you're a young man?' said Polly quietly. "'Oh, we had great times, great times,' said Jackram, stopping for a moment to stare at nothing. He never got promoted on account of his stutter, but I had a good shouty voice and officers like that. But Willie never minded, not even when I made it to sergeant. And then he got killed at Seppel, right next to me. "'I'm sorry.' "'You don't have to be. You didn't kill him.' said Jackram evenly. But I stepped over his body and skewered the bugger that did. Wasn't his fault. Wasn't my fault. We were soldiers. Then a few months later, I had a bit of a surprise, and he was called William, too, just like his father. Good job I had a bit of leave, eh? Me gran raised him for me, put him to a trade as an armourer over in Skritz. Good trade, that. No one kills a good armourer. They tell me he looks just like his dad. A captain I met once had bought a bloody good sword off him. Showed it to me, not knowing the history, of course. Damn good sword. It had scroll work on the hilt and everything. Very classy. He's married with four kids now, I heard. Got a carriage and pair, servants, big house. Yeah, I see you're paying attention. Was her? Well, was her and the Duchess said? Yes, yes, they talked about scrits and a sword, said Jackram. That's when I knew it wasn't just me watching over you lads. I knew you'd survive. The old girl needed you. So you've got to go there, Sarge, said Polly. 
got to. Who says? I served the old girl the whole of my life, and she's got no call on me now. I'm my own man, always have been. Are you, Sarge? said Polly. Are you crying, Perks? Well, it's a bit sad, Sarge. Oh, I dare say I sobbed a bit, too, once in a while, said Jackram, still tucking the tobacco into the new pouch. But when all's said and done, I've had a good life. Saw the cavalry break at the Battle of Slump. I was part of the thin red line that turned aside the heavy brigade at Sheep's Drift. I saved the imperial flag from four real bastards at Raladan, and I've been to a lot of foreign countries, and met some very interesting people, who I mostly subsequently killed before they could do me over good and proper. Lost a lover, still got a son. There's many a woman who's faced worse, believe me. And you spotted other girls? Ha! <laughs> Became a kind of hobby, really. Most of them were frightened little things, running away from God knows what. They got found out soon enough, and there were plenty like Shufti chasing their lad. But there were a few who had what I call the twinkle, a bit of fire, maybe. They just needed pointing in the right direction. I gave them a leg up, you might say. A sergeant's a powerful man sometimes, a word here, a nod there, sometimes even doctoring some paperwork, a whisper in the dark. A pair of socks, said Polly. Yeah, that sort of thing said Jackram, grinning. Always a big concern to them, the whole latrine business. Least of your worries, I used to say. In peace no one cares. In battle everyone takes a piss the same way, and damn quickly too. Oh, I helped them. I was their what's it, their eminence grease. And grease it was, too, sliding them to the top. Jackram's little lads, I called them. And they never suspected. What? Suspect jolly Jack Jackram, so full of rum and vinegar? said Jackram, the old evil grin, coming back. Jack Jackram, who could stop a bar fight by belching? No, sir. I dare say some of them suspected something, maybe. I dare say they worked out there was something going on somewhere. But I was just the big fat sergeant who knew everyone and everything, and drank everything, too. Polly dabbed at her eyes. What are you going to do now, then, if you don't go to Scritz? Oh, I've got a bit put by, said Jackram. More than a bit, in point of actual fact. Pillage, plunder, loot, it all adds up, whatever you call it. I didn't piss it all up against a wall like the other lads, right? I expect I can remember most of the bleeding places I buried it. Always thought I might open an inn or maybe a knocking shop. Oh, a proper high-class place, you don't have to look at me like that. Nothing like that stinking tent. No, I'm talking about one with a chef and chandeliers and a lot of red velvet, very exclusive. I'd get some knobby lady to front it, and I'd be the bouncer and run the bar. Here's a tip, lad, for your future career, and it's one some of the other little lads learn for themselves. Sometimes it'll help if you visit one of them naughty places, otherwise the men'll wonder about you. I always used to take a book to read and advise the young lady to get some sleep, because he does a tough job. Polly let that pass, but she said, You don't want to go back and see your grandchildren? Wouldn't wish myself on him, lad, said Jackram firmly. Wouldn't dare. My boy's a well-respected man in the town. What have I got to offer? He'll not want some fat old biddy banging on his back door and gobbing backy juice all over the place and telling him she's his mother. Polly looked at the fire for a moment and felt the idea creep into her mind. What about a distinguished-looking sergeant major, shiny with braid, loaded with medals, arriving at the front door in a grand coach and telling him he's his father? She said. Jackram stared. Tides of war and all that, Polly went on, mind suddenly racing. Young love, duty calls. Families scattered, hopeless searching, decades pass, fond memories. Then, oh, an overheard conversation in the bar, yeah, that'd work. Hope springs, a new search, greasing palms, the recollections of old women, at last, an address. What are you saying, Perks? You're a liar, Sarge, said Polly, leaning forward. Best I've ever heard. One last lie pays for all. Why not? You could show him the locket. You could tell him about the girl you left behind you. Jackram looked away, but said, You're a shining bastard of a thinker, Perks. And where would I get a grand coach, anyway? Oh, Sarge, today there are men in high places who'll give you anything you ask for right now. You know that. Especially if it meant they'd see the back of you. You never put the bite on them for anything much. If I was you, Sarge, I'd cash in a few favours while you can. That's the ins and outs, Sarge. Take the cheese while it's there, because kissing don't last. Jackram took a deep, long breath. I'll think about it, Perks. Now you push off, all right? 
Polly stood up. Think hard, Sarge, eh? Like you said, anyone who's got anyone left is ahead of the game right now. For a grandchildren? I'd be a proud kid if I had a granddad who could spit tobacco juice far enough to hit a fly on the opposite wall. I'm warning you, Perks. It was just a thought, Sarge. Yeah, right, Jackram growled. Thanks for getting us through it, Sarge. Jackram didn't turn round. I'll be going then, Sarge. Perks, said Jackram as she reached the door. Polly stepped back into the room. Yes, Sarge. I expected better of them, really. I thought they'd be better at it than men. Trouble was, they were better than men at being like men. <laughs> they do say the army can make a man of you, eh? So whatever it is you are going to do next, do it as you. Good or bad, do it as you. Too many lies, and there's no truth to go back to. Will do, Sarge. That's an order, Perks. Owen oh, Perks. Yes, Sarge. Thanks, Perks. Polly paused when she got to the door. Jackram had turned her chair to the fire and settled back. Around her, the kitchen worked. Six months passed. The world wasn't perfect, but it was still turning. Polly had kept the newspaper articles. They weren't accurate, not in the detail, because the writer told stories, not what was actually happening. They were like paintings, when you had been there and had seen the real thing. But it was true about the march on the castle, with Wazza on a white horse in front carrying a flag, and it was true about people coming out of their houses and joining the march, so that what arrived at the gates was not an army but a sort of disciplined mob, shouting and cheering. And it was true that the guards had taken one look at it and had seriously reconsidered their future, and that gates had swung open even before the horse had clattered onto the drawbridge. There was no fighting, no fighting at all. The shoe had dropped. The country had breathed out. Polly didn't think it was true that the painting of the Duchess, alone on its easel in the big empty throne room, had smiled when Wazza walked toward it. Polly had been there and didn't see, but lots of people swore it had, and you might end up wondering what the truth really was, or whether there was the truth. And then again, if there was also the truth, and of course, the truth. Anyway, it was the stuff of legends where accuracy is not required as a major ingredient. Anyway, it had worked. And then they went home. A lot of soldiers did, under the fragile truce. The first snows were already falling, and if people had wanted a war, then the winter had given them one. It came with lances of ice and arrows of hunger. It filled the passes with snow. It made the world as distant as the moon. That was when the old dwarf mines had opened up, and pony after pony emerged. It had always been said there were dwarf tunnels everywhere, and not just tunnels. There were secret canals under the mountains, docks, flights of locks that could lift a barge a mile high in busy darkness, far below the gales on the mountain tops. They brought, indeed, cabbage and potatoes and roots and apples and barrels of fat, things that kept. And the winter was defeated, and the snow melt roared down the valleys and the Kneck scrawled its random wiggles across the flat silt of the valley. They'd gone home, and Polly wondered if they'd ever really been away. Were we soldiers, she wondered? They'd been cheered on the road to Prince Marmaduke Piotr Albert Hans Josef Bernhard Willemsberg, and had been much better treated than their rank deserved, and even had a special uniform designed for them. But the vision of Gummy Abins kept arising in her mind. We weren't soldiers, she decided. We were girls in uniform. We were like a lucky charm. We were mascots. We weren't real. We were always a symbol of something. We'd done very well for women. And we were temporary. Tonka and Lofty were never going to be dragged back to the school now, and they'd gone their own way. Wasser had joined the General's household, and had a room of her own and quietness, and made herself useful, and was never beaten. She'd written Polly a letter in tiny, spiky handwriting. She seemed happy. A world without beatings was heaven. Jade and her beau had wandered off to do something more interesting, as trolls very sensibly did. Shufti had been on a timetable of her own. Maledicta had disappeared, and Igorina, at least, had set up by herself in the capital, dealing with women's problems, 
or at least those women's problems that weren't men. And senior officers had given them medals and watched them go with fixed, faint smiles. Kisses don't last. And now, it wasn't that good things were happening, it was just that bad things had stopped. The old women still grumbled, but they were left to grumble. No one had any directions, no one had a map, no one was quite certain who was in charge. There were arguments and debates on every street corner. It was frightening and exhilarating. Every day was an exploration. Polly had worn a pair of Paul's old pants to clean the floor of the big bar, and had got barely a harumph from anyone. Owen, the girls' working school, had burned down, and on the same day two slim masked figures had robbed a bank. Polly had grinned when she heard that, and hoped that Tonka and Lofty would one day find a way to eat chocolates in a great big room where the world was a different place. Shufty, who'd somehow always be Shufty to Polly, even if the rest of the world now called her Betty again, had moved into the Duchess. Her baby was called Jack. Paul doted on it. And now... Someone had been drawing in the gent's privy again. Polly couldn't wash it off, so she contented herself with correcting the anatomy. Then she swooshed the place clean, at least by pub urinal standards, with a couple of buckets, and ticked off the chore, just as she did every morning. When she arrived back in the bar, there were a group of worried men there talking to her father. They looked mildly frightened when she strode in. "'What's happening?' she said. Her father nodded to Gummy Abbins, and everyone stepped back a little. What with the spittle and the bad breath, you never wanted a conversation with Gummy to be particularly intimate. "'The sweet eaters is at it again,' he said. "'They're going to invade cause the prince says we belong to him now.' "'It's all down to him being the Duchess's distant cousin,' said Polly's father. "'But I heard it still wasn't settled,' said Polly. "'Anyway, there's still a truce. Seems like he's settling it,' said Gummy. The rest of the day passed at an accelerated pace. There were groups of people talking urgently in the streets, and a crowd around the gates to the town hall. Every so often a clerk would come out and nail another communique on the gates. The crowd would close over it like a hand, open again like a flower. Polly elbowed her way to the front, ignoring the mutterings around her, and scanned the sheets. The same old stuff. They were recruiting again. The same old words. The same old croakings of long-dead soldiers inviting the living to join them. General Frock might be female, but he was also, as Blouse would have said, a bit of an old woman. Either that, or the heaviness of those epaulets had weighed her down. Kissing don't last. Oh, the Duchess had come alive before them and turned the world upside down for a spell, and maybe they had all decided to be better people, and out of certain oblivion had come a space to breathe. And then, had it really happened? Even Polly sometimes wondered, and she had been there. Was it just a voice in their heads, some kind of hallucination? Weren't soldiers in desperate straits famous for seeing visions of gods and angels? And somewhere in the course of the long winter the miracle had faded, and people had said, Yep, but we've got to be practical. All we were given was a chance, thought Polly. No miracle, no rescue, no magic, just a chance. She walked back to the inn, her mind buzzing. When she got there, a package was waiting. It was quite long and heavy. "'It came all the way from Scritz on the cart,' said Shufty excitedly. She'd been working in the kitchen. It had become, now, her kitchen. "'I wonder what it can be,' she said pointedly. Polly levered the lid off the rough wooden crate, and found that it was full of straw with an envelope lying on top of it. She opened it. Inside was an iconograph. It looked expensively done, a stiff family group with curtains and a potted palm in the background to give everything a bit of style. On the left was a middle-aged man looking proud. On the right was a woman of about the same age, looking rather puzzled, but nevertheless pleased because her husband was happy and here and there, staring at the viewer with variations of smile and squint, and expressions that ran from interest to a sudden recollection that they should have gone to the toilet before posing, were children, ranging from tall and gangly to small and smugly sweet. And, sitting on a chair in the middle, the focus of it all was Sergeant Jackram, shining like the sun. Polly stared and then turned the picture over. On the back was written, in big black letters, S. M. Jackram's Last Stand. 
and underneath, don't need these. He smiled and pulled aside the straw. In the middle of the box, wrapped in cloth, were a couple of cutlasses. Is that old Jackram? said Shufty, picking up the picture. Yes, he's found his son, said Polly, unwinding a blade. Shufty shuddered when she saw it. Evil things, she said. Things, anyway, said Polly. She laid both the cutlasses on the table, and was about to lift the box out of the way when she saw something small in the straw at the bottom. It was oblong, and wrapped in thin leather. It was a notebook with a cheap binding and musty yellowing pages. What's that? said Shufty. I think it's his address book, said Polly, flicking through the pages. This is it, she thought. It's all here. Generals and majors and captains, oh my! There must be hundreds, maybe a thousand. Names, real names, promotions, dates, everything. She pulled out a white pasteboard rectangle that had been inserted like a bookmark. It showed a rather florid coat of arms, and bore the printed legend, William de Word, Editor, The Times of Ankh Morpork. The truth shall make ye frep. Gleam Street, Ankh Morpork, Sea Mail, WDW at Times dot AM. Someone had crossed out the P in frep and pencilled in an E above it. It was a sudden strange fancy. How many ways can you fight a war? Polly wondered. We have the clacks now. I know a man who writes things down. The world turns. Plucky little countries seeking self-determination. Could be useful to big countries with plans of their own. Time to grab the cheese. Polly's expression as she stared at the wall would have frightened a number of important people. They would have been even more concerned about the fact that she spent the next several hours writing things down, because it occurred to Polly that General Frock had not got where she was today by being stupid, and therefore she could profit from following her example. She copied out the entire notebook and sealed it in an old jam jar, which she hid in the roof of the stables. She wrote a few letters, and she got her uniform out of the wardrobe and inspected it critically. The uniforms that had been made for them had a special additional quality that could only be called girly. They had more braid, they were better tailored, and they had a long skirt with a bustle rather than pants. The shakos had plumes, too. Her tunic had a sergeant's stripes. It had been a joke. A sergeant of women. The world had been turned upside down, after all. They'd been mascots. Good luck charms. And, perhaps, on the march to Prince Marmaduke Piotr Albert Hans Josef Bernhard Willemsberg, a joke was what everyone needed. But maybe, when the world turns upside down, you can turn a joke upside down, too. Thank you, Gummy even though you didn't know what it was you were teaching me. When they're laughing at you, their guard is down. When their guard is down, you can kick them in the fracar. She examined herself in the mirror. Her hair, now, was just long enough to be a nuisance without being long enough to be attractive, so she brushed it and left it at that. She put the uniform on, but with the skirt over her pants, and tried to put aside the nagging feeling that she was dressing up as a woman. There. She looked completely harmless. She looked slightly less harmless with both cutlasses and one of the horse bows on her back, especially if he knew that the inn's dartboards now all had deep holes in the bull's eyes from all the practising. She crept along the hall to the window that overlooked the inn yard. Paul was up a ladder, repainting the sign. Her father was steadying the ladder and calling out instructions in his normal way, which was to call out the instruction just a second or two after you'd already started doing something and Shufty was watching them, holding Jack. It made a lovely picture. For a moment, she wished she had a locket. The Duchess was smaller than she'd thought. But if you had to protect it by standing in the doorway with a sword, you were too late. Caring for small things had to start with caring for big things, and maybe the world wasn't big enough. The note she left on her dressing table read, Shufty, I hope you and Jack are happy here. Paul, you look after her. Dad, I've never taken any wages, but I need a horse. I'll try to have it sent back. I love you all. If I don't come back, burn this letter and look in the roof of the stables. She dropped out of the window, saddled up a horse in the stables, 
and let herself out of the back gate. She didn't mount up until she was out of earshot, and then rode down to the river. Spring was pouring through the country. Sap was rising. In the woods a ton of timber was growing every minute. Everywhere birds were singing. There was a guard on the ferry. He eyed her nervously as she led the horse aboard, and then grinned when he saw what he thought were stripes that didn't really mean much. "'Morning, miss,' he said cheerfully. "'Well, time to start,' Polly marched in front of the puzzled man. "'Are you trying to be smart?' she demanded, inches from his face. "'No, miss.' "'That's sergeant, mister,' said Polly. "'Let's try again, shall we?' "'I said, are you trying to be smart?' "'No, sergeant.' Polly leaned until her nose was an inch from his. "'Why not?' The grin faded. This was not a soldier on the fast track to promotion. "'Huh?' he managed. "'If you are not trying to be smart, mister, you're happy to be stupid!' shouted Polly, and I'm up to here with stupid, understand? Yeah, but... But what, soldier? Yeah, but... Well, but, but nothing, sergeant, said the soldier. That's good, Polly nodded at the ferryman. Time to go, she suggested, but in the tones of an order. Couple of people just coming down the road, sergeant, said one of them, a faster man with an uptake. They waited. They were, in fact, three people. One of them was Maledicta, in full female uniform. Polly said nothing until the ferry was out in midstream. The vampire gave her the kind of smile only a vampire can give. It would have been sheepish if sheep had different teeth. "'Thought I'd try again,' she said. "'We'll find Blouse,' said Polly. "'He's a major now,' said Maledicta, "'and happy as a flea, because they've named a kind of fingerless glove after him, I heard. What do we want him for?' He knows about the clacks. He knows about other ways war can be fought, with intelligence, for one thing. And I know people, said Polly. Ah, do you mean the upon my oath I am not a lying man, but I know people kind of people? Those were the kind of people I had in mind, yes. The river slapped against the side of the ferry. Good, said Maledicta. I don't know where it's going to lead, though, said Polly. Ah, even better. At which point... Polly decided that she knew enough of the truth to be going on with. The enemy wasn't men, or women, or the old, or even the dead. It was just bleeding stupid people, who came in all varieties, and no one had the right to be stupid. She looked at the other two passengers who'd sidled aboard. They were country lads in ragged, ill-fitting clothes, keeping away from her and staring intently at the deck. But one glance was enough. The world turned upside down, and history repeated itself. For some reason, that suddenly made her feel very happy. "'Going to join up, lads?' she said cheerily. There was some mumbling on the theme of yes. "'Good. Then stand up straight,' said Polly. "'Let's have a look at you. Chins up. Ah, well done. Shame you didn't practice walking in pants, and I noticed you didn't bring an extra pair of socks.' They stared, mouths open. "'What are your names?' said Polly. "'Your real names, please. Don't look so worried. You can tell me the truth.' And don't try cunning on me, because I was trained by Mr. Fox. Er, uh, Rosemary, one of them began. I'm Mary, said the other. I heard girls were joining, but everyone laughed, so I thought I'd better pretend to— Oh, you can join as men if you want, said Polly. The girls looked at one another. You get better swear words, said Polly, and the pants are useful, but it's your choice. A choice, said Rosemary. Certainly, said Polly. She put a hand on a shoulder of each girl, winked at a valedictor, and added, You are my little lads, or not, as the case may be, and I will look after you. And the new day was a great big fish.